My Life, My Tunisia Testimony from Sulla Carker's brother-in-law, former leader of Inadida Written by Ma Sin Kevin Labidi Book sponsored by M. Can Website, mcantimes.com To Infinity Notice the emotions and hopes of a personal experience are as extraordinary and moving as the one you are about to discover in the following pages. My Life, My Tunisia, Testimony of the Brother-in-Law of Sulla Karkar, former leader of Anadida and former follower of Shurism, is a poignant and deeply unsettling narrative that plunges us into the heart of a reality far too little known. This book recounts my life within a Mahdist Islamist movement in Iran between 1983 and 1990. At a time when the world was in the grip of numerous conflicts and upheavals, this personal experience took on an incredibly intense and devastating dimension. The rise of the Ayatollahs in Iran from 1979 saw the emergence of a sacred war machine preparing for the return of the Savior, according to mystical Shiite precepts. It is an enlightened warning about the dangers that threaten humanity due to the plans and objectives of these Mahdiist movements. Often remaining in the shadows, these movements are based on sacred texts and pursue a short-term and long-term plan to impose their vision of the world globally, in the name of Allah. All these movements rely on the same sacred texts and work to achieve goals that, although they may vary in details and methods, converge towards a common objective, to dominate the world under the banner of Islam. Their strategy does not shy away from the idea of annihilating two-thirds of humanity and causing blood to flow knee-deep because they believe that blood always triumphs over the sword, provided that the remaining third is in accordance with the divine will. I will guide you through the intricacies of this complex reality, where religious beliefs intertwine with political and ideological ambitions. You will discover how these movements spread, influence, and seek to destabilize entire regions, while manipulating Muslim populations that fall into the darkness of ignorance. Through this exceptional account, you will understand the stakes behind religious discourses and power ambitions, as well as the disastrous consequences this can have on our world. I invite you through this book to discover the hidden face of Islam, especially the iceberg of Iranian shurism that exploits religious sentiments to expand its influence, whether in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, Europe, as well as the rest of the world. This testimony is a living example of the Shiite Iranian infiltration within Islamist movements, aiming to destabilize states and infiltrate the populations of the Muslim world, with the goal of becoming the dominant force everywhere. They seek to act in one stroke to destroy what they call the Satanic Judeo-Christian Alliance. My Life, My Tunisia, is a call to vigilance, a heartfelt cry to raise awareness in the world about the insidious threats that weigh on our civilization. I hope that this testimony will contribute, even if only a little, to the fight against the danger represented by the Iranian Shiite Ayatollahs for our countries, our populations, and our human achievements. You will not emerge and scathe from this reading, but you will undoubtedly be more aware of the challenges that surround us. Happy reading, and may the light always shine above the shadows. Dedication I dedicate this book, to Queen Amazai Dahiya Tadmet, beheaded by the Arab Islamic occupier for her struggle for freedom and dignity. To my late mother, for her patience in her fight for the success of her offspring. To my late father, with all my esteem and respect. To my children, with my deep affection and love. Special dedication, to Madame Shiraz Rahul. An extraordinary woman without whom this book would never have come to light. Our sincere thanks for her attentive review and invaluable correction of the content. Introduction I was born in Tunisia into a traditional Muslim family of nine children, like any other Tunisian family in the 60s. In my innocent childhood, I viewed life with purity and optimism, guided by a strong faith in God, which brought me peace and confidence. Unfortunately, everything changed when Islamists infiltrated my family between 1975 and 1980. Looking back, I realized that my childhood was taken away from me, 
and I endured five years of nightmarish experiences. The lightness of my youthful spirit vanished, replaced by fear and darkness that haunted my every step. The trauma from that period left a lasting mark, and I couldn't help but see parallels with the unsettling events that unfolded in Tunisia in 2011. It became evident to me that the actions at the state level have a profound impact on local communities, and our history and beliefs play a significant role in shaping the present. Moved by my experiences, I feel compelled to shed light on my encounter with the Islamist movement. I will explore the mechanisms and tactics that led my family to embrace Islamist ideologies, ultimately causing its disintegration. Additionally, I will share my personal involvement with the international Shiite movement and its messianic ideology, which continues to operate today with impunity, having relocated its bases from Iran to Syria and Iraq. My attention is to expose the strategy of the Islamist attack through the example of this elite Shiite network, Risali. This network is no different from other Islamist movements that exploit naive youth in their quest of identity. I use it as an example because I know all its tricks, ideologies, and methods, having been an active member myself. Since breaking free from its grip, I have consistently emphasized the danger posed by these movements. I hold a firm belief that it is crucial for the world to recognize the influence exerted by Islamist networks, taking advantage of an uninformed public about the genuine history of Islam. They employ deceptive language and utilize diverse methods, which include promoting their cause through charitable activities while also resorting to physical, intellectual, and political terrorism. Furthermore, they enforce censorship, deny the right to individuality, and impose a singular mode of thinking, all in the name of Allah. It is essential to shed light on these tactics to raise awareness about the true nature of these networks. Muslims, from the most radical to the most pacifist, share a dream expressed in the Quran, Surah 21, the Prophets, verse 105, and we have written in the Psalms, Zabur, after the reminder, Torah, my righteous servants shall inherit the earth. Every school, sect, or Islamic movement considers itself as the saved sect, following the right path through obedience to Allah's rules. The promised land mentioned here is interpreted in various ways by different exegetes. It could refer to the earthly world in general, specifically to Jerusalem, or the paradise promised to the righteous after death, as taught in pre-Islamic traditions. However, the Islamists firmly exceed the last interpretation, when they oppose the globalization stemming from the Western world, it is not out of love for humanity, but because they believe they possess the absolute truth regarding this verse. According to them, Islam is meant to subjugate the earthly world. Driven by a relentless desire for power, fueled by blind persuasion, Islamism employs a ruthless strategy that will be explored in detail throughout this book. This ideology infiltrates internal opposition movements, Arab nationalistic sentiments, and anti-Western attitudes in third world countries. The recruitment of potential Islamists or pro-Islamist individuals is carried out on a global scale, spanning across families, streets, public and private institutions, and the Internet. It primarily targets vulnerable and indoctrinated youth, driven to confront an uncertain destiny on their own. These young individuals have been stigmatized and rendered completely submissive under the mercy of a sacred authority, in the absence of proper guidance within their families and society. The underlying objective of this recruitment effort is to combat what they see as Judeo-Christian imperialism oppressing the weak. Islamism positions itself as the liberator of the oppressed, while paradoxically imposing its own form of imperialism through its cultural and ideological dominance. It is essential for us to unite as governments, society, and individuals to confront those who, under the banner of Allah, perpetrate nothing but crimes, primarily against themselves, and secondarily against their own society and humanity. Their higher-ups within the Islamist hierarchy manipulate them, instilling fear of divine retribution solely to further their own political and personal interests. My motivation to write after all these years stems from the prevailing state of insecurity witnessed across the world. The situation began to deteriorate following the events of September 11th in the United States, which triggered collective anger among the people. 
This anger subsequently led to the Tunisian uprising on January 14, 2011, followed by protests and violent upheavals in Egypt, Yemen, Libya, and Syria. Moreover, Iraq and Syria witnessed the rise and eventual downfall of the so-called Islamic State, ISIS. The hidden influence of Arab hegemony, particularly the Iranian Shiite influence, has resulted in the loss of identity and grave decadence among forcibly Arabized and colonized peoples under the guise of Arab Islam. Presently, there is a notable crackdown on freedoms, coupled with a growing appeal of conservative political parties with nationalist and sectarian leanings. This phenomenon is occurring as a response to the challenge of Islamist terrorism worldwide. One illustrative example of this trend is the state of affairs in the United States following Donald Trump's assumption of power. The purpose of this book is to caution young individuals against blindly falling into an infernal spiral from which they will find it challenging to break free. I hope that this testimony will dissuade some readers from treading a disastrous path and enable others to understand the ominous reality of Islamist agendas and the darker aspects of Islam. It is of utmost importance that we reach out to the youth who feel marginalized by society, listen to their stories, help them in rebuilding their lives, and restore their hope and sense of purpose to prevent them from becoming victims of humanity enemies. Their rehabilitation is essential for the greater good. This work expresses my modest perspective on international conflicts involving Islam's central role. These rivalries have the potential to trigger a global catastrophe if urgent actions are not taken to de-escalate tensions. Let us hope that developed nations, promoting secularism, freedom, equality, and humanity, stand in support of loyal freethinkers within their own countries, rather than aligning with dictators seeking agreements for self-serving interests. May they actively support underdeveloped countries in achieving civility and modernity without demanding submission to their own economic or political systems. It is important to recognize that the progress of these nations benefits all of humanity. Through the narratives shared in these pages, my objective is to clarify the difference between genuine Islam and orthodox Islam. I advocate for a greater awareness of the rights to diversity, freedom, and embracing differences. The decision to write this new version of my testimony is also driven by my dissatisfaction with the previous publication. I began the first version in Arabic during my detention when Ben Ali came to power in 1987. In 1990, after returning to France from Syria, I made the choice to share my experiences with readers, fueled by the anger of a wounded heart that refuses to surrender. Due to the instability in my life, I couldn't publish it alone, so I entrusted this task to one of my sisters before retreating to Tunisia and later Morocco, believing she would faithfully pass on my testimony. Sadly, that was not the case. The French version, titled, Karim, Mon Frère Exintegrist Terrorist, which was published in 1997 by Flammaria, deviated from the message I wanted to convey. The information was manipulated and interpreted to serve political and personal interests. This time, I have chosen to release this testimony under my own name and in the first person. I have eliminated anything that did not come directly from me and was unrelated to my experiences, character, and objective which is the exposure of political Islam. I want to emphasize that this testimony is purely autobiographical, reflecting my personal experiences and viewpoint. Other characters are mentioned only when their actions are relevant to the narrative, and I merely cite public figures of that era without any ulterior motive. Despite the potential adverse repercussions for me, I am committed to speaking out in the hope of contributing to global peace. As the saying goes, the earth is round, and the sun shines above everyone. Unyielding joy is what we should believe in to bring about a brighter future for all of humanity. Chaotic Childhood My story takes root from my birth, a trajectory unfolds, taking an unexpected turn at the age of three with a car accident. The fragile balance of my world is shaken, and a veil of autism extends over my reality. Sensations intensify, sounds become enchanting melodies, and social interactions transform into captivating puzzles. My parents, caught in their own relational turmoil, face unforeseen challenges. 
The rare presence of my father creates a void in me, despite the large sibling circle surrounding me. But this is only one element of the complex puzzle. The infiltration of Islamism into my family adds layers of anxiety to my troubled world. School, once a place of learning, becomes a battleground where I struggle to understand myself. As the chapter reaches its climax with a radical move to France, a new country, a new culture, new apprehensions, it concludes in a duality of excitement and apprehension. This prelude foreshadows the adventures and challenges to come in this narrative of resilience, growth, and transformation. My Heritage Throughout North African families, dreams and premonitions have always held a prominent role. My childhood was enveloped by the oral traditions of ancient tales, legends, the remedies of wise women, and the deciphering of omens and signs. In the household where we all lived, my grandmother was a constant presence, never seen without her traditional attire. Though she was of petite stature, one wouldn't notice, as her gentle and round face framed two piercing eyes that seemed to see through one's innermost thoughts. When listening to a child, her gaze exuded warmth and tenderness, yet keen and insightful when expressing her opinion, leading it towards a distant where destinies converge. She would fervently recount her memories to her children, drawing inspiration from the enchanting tales of One Thousand and One Nights. Her expressions were like a canvas painted with a multitude of colors, adorned with proverbs and metaphors, and enriched with visions and glimpses of the future, almost prophetic in nature. Even though she couldn't always put her feelings into words, she had a remarkable ability to sense things deeply. A mere glance at a house's facade allowed her to discern the history of its past inhabitants. To me, she resembled a historical monument, having witnessed the repetitive events of the ages, from the most insignificant to the most extraordinary. While this impression may sound peculiar, I believe that everyone, at some point, has experienced a similar feeling about one of their ancestors, making them seem surrounded by a magical aura and transcending the confines of time. It is this sentiment that makes them beloved and deserving of immense respect. In 1910, in Tunis, my grandmother was born into a Moroccan Jewish family that had embraced Islam and moved from Fez to Tunisia in the 18th century. Her mother had served as the cook for the Bay of Tunis. At the time she met my grandfather, she was divorced and had two daughters. They eventually married each other for love. My maternal grandfather, born in Tunis in 1903, hailed from Turkish roots. His father, originally a Jewish man who later embraced Islam, had come from Izmir to work as an accountant in Tunis. He found delight in life's simple joys, like smoking the hookah under the night sky while gazing at the stars. I never witnessed him lose his temper, and his smile was always genuine and radiant. His outlook on life was to seize the moment and not worry about what the future might bring. His mantra was, what's done is done. Why fear the uncertainties of tomorrow when each passing minute holds its own happiness? His slender, nimble body moved with remarkable grace, deftly navigating through obstacles as if guided by some mystical force, always reaching his objectives with the certainty of a stream flowing into a river. He resembled a blind man led by the hand of a benevolent angel. To him, the universe was a harmonious whole, where people were intertwined with life itself, and pleasures found their essence in the places where they blossomed. That was the philosophy he lived by. My father, born in Bu Salem near Jenduba, came from a wealthy landowning family. He was remarkably secretive about his family background and origins. Perhaps he had chosen to erase that part of his past from his memory. His life began tragically when his mother passed away during childbirth on March 28, 1928. A few years later, his father also passed away, leaving behind four orphans. The boy and his three older brothers were then taken in by their uncle, the family's eldest, who inherited the entire estate, following the rural tradition. Back then, Guardians had the authority to hand over the children under their care to affluent adoptive families in exchange for money. In the case of these boys, they were given away, thus being deprived of their rightful inheritance, and ended up as boys for everything in a family of Turkish origin living in Tunis. 
the patriarch who adopted them taught them the textile trade. The eldest of the four, closest to this adoptive father, held him in great admiration and willingly embraced the responsibilities. The second brother didn't shine with any qualities, he was not mischievous, he remained quiet and self-contained, often looking downward as if life only existed at the tip of his shoe. He rarely spoke, and when he did, it was only to convey essential information. The third brother joined the resistance and tragically lost his life during the Independence War. The fourth, my father, was a rebellious boy, causing his adoptive father a great deal of trouble. During the French protectorate, education was a privilege reserved for a small elite residing in the larger cities. My father lacked literacy skills, and this was a source of distress for him. The luminosity of the capital city held him in its spell, enticing him towards the unknown, and he consistently allowed himself to be drawn into adventurous pursuits instead of adhering to schedules. At the age of twenty, he would escape from his responsibilities, spending his nights wandering the streets of Tunis and leading a life marked by disorder. He indulged in smoking and drinking, behaviors that were incongruous with his religious beliefs. It's likely that he engaged in clandestine dealings within the concealed corners of gambling establishments. During his nighttime escapades, he frequented the cousin of his adoptive father, who often welcomed him into his home in the old city and would eventually become his future father-in-law. They shared a mutual enjoyment of life's pleasures, yet they held differing viewpoints on a significant matter, my maternal grandfather embraced the comforts of life while also displaying respect for others, whereas my father had poor listening skills. My grandmother felt compassion for this uprooted boy who hadn't known his parents, had left his native countryside, and was living in Tunis like an exile. He became close to the family and endeavored to be helpful in every way, until he was granted permission to settle permanently. He was then adopted as a full-fledged member of the family. A forced marriage. From the union of my grandparents, a girl and a boy were brought into the world. The girl, Wasala, inherited her mother's resilience and culinary talents. Born on May 6, 1938, during the era of the French protectorate, she pursued her studies under the guidance of the White Fathers, whose quality of education was highly regarded at the time. There, she acquired various skills, including sewing and embroidery. In the realm of embroidery, her expertise was unparalleled. She crafted genuine pieces of art that garnered her a reputation throughout the entire neighborhood. This was not just a job, but also a passion, a way for her to find solace through a labor that demanded both dedication and skillfulness. During her adolescence, Wasala was known for her enchanting beauty. She had a tall and graceful figure, her stature accentuated by a slender neck, and lips that resembled a ripe fruit. What made her beauty even more appealing was her seeming unawareness of it. Often, excessive vanity can diminish the allure of beauty, but Wasala's modesty seemed to enhance it. At a young age, Wasala developed a deep affection for her paternal cousin. Her love was profound, the kind that engulfs both mind and body with intense fervor. If allowed to flourish, it could have been the love story of her life, filled with beauty and passion. Unfortunately, my grandmother opposed this relationship, claiming that the young man her daughter had chosen lacked a promising future. My grandmother held strict beliefs, and she wasn't willing to easily entrust her daughter to a man whose priorities centered around his own desires. From her perspective, without a doubt, her daughter's husband needed to be protective. The reasons that supported the latter choice could be summed up in three words. Firstly, he was a mature man, a decade older than her daughter. Secondly, he had practically grown up within the family, and my grandmother always maintained that someone you're familiar with is far superior to a stranger. Thirdly, he held my grandmother in high regard and diligently followed all her directives. She repeatedly advised her daughter, marry him, and you'll be performing a noble act. You'll guide him away from his reckless life. Through you, he'll discover the right path, and you'll help shape him into a responsible man. When my father sought her daughter's hand in marriage, she readily consented. Despite her daughter's vehement objections, she pushed for this union, resulting in their marriage in the early 1950s. 
As my father reached the age of 25, my mother was a mere 14 years old. Given her status as a minor, my grandfather, who rarely opposed his wife's wishes, personally affixed his signature to the marriage contract, leaving their daughter without a voice in the decision. Forced marriage is a common practice in Orthodox Islam, especially when the bride is a child. This criminal and demeaning act is a tradition that persists in several Muslim countries, following the example of the Prophet of Islam, who married Aisha at the age of 51 when she was only six years old, and consummated the marriage when she reached nine years old. Borguiba fought against this practice. He enshrined in the Tunisian constitution the legal marriage age as 18 for both women and men. Below this age, marriage can only occur with a special authorization from a judge, granted for serious reasons and in the best interests of both prospective spouses. The consent of the guardian and the mother is also required for minors under 18, such as in cases of rape where the young girl becomes pregnant. A law inspired by Islamic Sharia then allows the rapist to be exempted from punishment if he marries his victim. The wedding celebrations spanned three consecutive days and nights in the old city. The bride had donned a black gown, using it as a symbol of her resistance and sorrow. Her hips were gracefully adorned with a belt, accentuating the curve of her lower back in a movement imbued with allure. Bracelets of gold jingled on her wrists, their melodious sounds touched the heart, akin to the gentle murmur of a fountain muffled by a cushion of foam. Completing the poignant crowning of the bride was a pearl necklace gracing her neck. Laughter permeated the surroundings as guests reveled, their songs weaving an atmosphere of cheerfulness, while their dances carried them into an exuberant state, light and unburdened, inviting the rediscovery of the enchantment of innocence. During that entire time, Wasala struggled to suppress her distress. In the wedding photographs, her composed smile thinly veiled her inner turmoil. Her face emanated an immeasurable sorrow, one that still makes me shiver when recalling. It seemed as she had just lost her soul, as if a somber vortex had swept her away to an unfamiliar and hostile world. She cried so much that her makeup had to be reapplied three times in succession. How she must have despised this unending ceremony. Out of the blue, her forthcoming life unfolded before her like a grim nightmare, and all at once, she envisaged the worst, the private moments she would have to share with her husband while concealing her bitterness, the compromises she made under the weight of humiliation, the ceaseless sacrifices. Suddenly, she saw doors closing, and her dreams of happiness faded away. When I browse through our family photos, I am consistently taken aback by how much she changed after her wedding. Her radiance seemed to have vanished. She was no longer the young woman with her vibrant and clear gaze, and her slender figure. Her face had dulled, slowly succumbing to an emotional setback from which she struggled to recover. Yet, beneath this facade, there was a feeling that a mere whisper could rekindle the grace she once embodied. The young couple took up residence with my grandmother. The initial years of their married life unfolded much as one might have expected, my father clung to his bachelor life. He was always out and about. Having left behind his rural roots to embrace urban life, he somewhat viewed himself as a heroic figure. A skilled athlete, particularly adept at gymnastics, he trained the resistance members he was a part of before the country gained independence. Following independence, he continued to serve this role for the official Tunisian army during the Bourguiba era. His most cherished pastime was photography, he excelled as an expert photographer. His professional life was also thriving, well-versed and talented in textiles, he specialized in silk production and enjoyed a comfortable income. Nonetheless, he didn't contribute financially to his family, using his earnings elsewhere for personal indulgences. He appeared to have scant concern for the future, harboring minimal ambition and making no arrangements to bring happiness to his spouse. He seemed oblivious to the distress caused by his fickle and immature conduct on my mother's side. So many dreams wasted. So much energy squandered on mere frivolities. My mother was able to read and write in French. She was a genuine Tunisian, taking pride in her affiliation with the capital city. 
she embraced the customs, philosophy, and mindset characteristic of Tunis. She held on to her own sense of dignity. Despite residing with her parents, she had the desire to contribute to the household expenses. She was determined that her marital life wouldn't burden the family, even though her parents lacked for nothing. My grandfather indeed held a substantial real estate portfolio that yielded monthly rents. Given his aversion to work, he refrained from it. Similarly, my father earned a comfortable income and could have offered his family a life of ease, yet he never considered it. Frustrated by this situation, my mother engaged in embroidery work to earn her livelihood. Though demanding, this pursuit provided her a certain tranquility that helped her endure the routine of daily life. As I mentioned, my father couldn't read or write. It was challenging for him to distance himself from his rural background. The idea of planning his life eluded him. He had embraced the enjoyable yet shallow aspects of city life, he lived like a pasha. This marriage made no sense, it was a complete failure, a mistake with far-reaching consequences that are still hard to measure. The troubles this situation caused within the family were immense. Thankfully, sometimes suffering can lead to a fresh start, and good can emerge from adversity. Tragedy, no matter how persistent, ultimately gives way in the face of the unwavering resolve of those who remain courageous. In any case, that's my utmost wish. I don't hold grudges against my grandparents for arranging this marriage. The weight of tradition and societal norms led them astray. While tradition is significant, it should serve as a source of learning rather than be blindly adhered to. They struggled to reinvent a way of life and reshape a culture in line with the emerging modern era. What was my father's perspective? What were his desires? Did he contemplate the future and his married life? What efforts did he make to bring about change? Indeed, his lack of literacy presented a significant challenge. It wasn't the sole cause, merely a part of the situation. The most poignant aspect is his lack of awareness. Does he comprehend now the extent of his poor judgment and how his lack of inner strength contributed to the fracture of our family? Though there were occasional moments of happiness, they always existed alongside the fear of what the next day might bring, the fear of an irreversible catastrophe or an irreparable rupture. What do you have to do today? Asked my mother. I don't know, I'm probably going to visit your father. You're going to spend your day lazing around, right? While I have to clean the house. Poor man, how I pity you. You think I don't care about you? She remained silent, aching to respond and show acceptance of her fate. Yet, her thoughts were entangled in a confusing maze, and words struggled to escape her lips. Could time mend the wound? Unlikely. Despite the ceaseless embroidery stitches, a glimmer of hope lingered. A voice within her whispered that someday, sooner or later, she would rediscover the one she had cherished. Despite the challenges in her marriage, my mother held a strong desire for children above all else. Perhaps seeking their support amidst her struggles within an unwanted marriage. Maybe she aimed to guide them towards freedom and the ability to shape their destinies, in contrast to her own experiences. Even though her romantic life had faced setbacks, she hoped her children would find success in theirs. That's likely how my mother saw it. Finally, the long-awaited joyous occasion arrived in early February 1955, approximately three years after her wedding. She gave birth to a daughter. At that time, she was not yet 17 years old. The birth of their first child exhausted my mother. It took her several months of recovery to regain her energy. My grandmother cared for the baby as if it were a precious wonder, and this experience made her feel young again. My father wasn't happy about the birth of his daughter. This might sound strong, but even with time, the upset feelings are hard to smooth over. His upbringing, influenced by Orthodox Islam, played a role. In his rural hometown, he had been considered important due to his family being landowners, demanding respect and obedience. He carried over these attitudes. 
His own laziness didn't change the proud way he acted, which sometimes seemed disrespectful. In tradition, passing on the family name is important. So, he blamed my mother for not giving him the son he wanted. He completely lost interest in his family. He would escape, rushing toward the illusory pleasures of Tuna Streets, seeking an unlikely paradise with companions in meaningless conversations. The arguments escalated, mixing fire and ice, violence and deceit, savagery and hypocrisy. These conflicts wore on my mother. Her expression revealed immense despair, and her body had undergone a transformation. Amidst this distress, the beauty of Tunis, its illustrious past interwoven with oriental tales, its markets, the intoxicating aroma of spices and jasmine in spring, all came to comfort my mother and alleviate her torment. Above all, she cherished the radiant abundance, the serene sun casting contemplative shadows in the alleys of the old city, between the walls of houses, mystical and virtuous shadows whose subtle movements one would await, languishingly secluded in the coolness of the bedrooms. My grandmother tried to comfort her. Mom, I'm lost and don't know what to do. Hang in there, things will get better. Did she regret arranging this marriage? I'll never find out. Her sympathy for my father blinded her. Because of that, I can't hold it against her. Repelled by the situation, my mother initially contemplated divorcing her husband. However, as she watched her daughter share her first smiles and embrace life's sensations, the idea pained her deeply. Out of love for her daughter, she abandoned the thought. Instead, determined to preserve her freedom and demonstrate her resilience to the family, she transformed her skills in embroidery and sewing into a genuine profession. It was then that she began to earn her living through her craft, and her reputation extended across the entire old city. Why did she continue to have children even though her marriage was in such a difficult state? This was a mystery to me for a long time. Was the desire for procreation so strong? Was it a way to make up for the lack of connection in their relationship? Did she have a form of masochism within her? Or was it a type of revenge, like, you wanted to marry me, so now deal with this? One day, she explained it to me, she was trying to create distance from my father. She had never experienced love or pleasure with him. Each one of us was born as a result of a violation she couldn't speak of or prevent, given that in Islamic tradition, a husband has the right to force himself upon his wife and she doesn't have the right to refuse. But with each pregnancy, she could be free from him for a few months. That's why she kept having children. In early April 1956, she gave birth to a second child, another girl. Then, at the end of December 1957, she had another daughter. The following December, a fourth daughter arrived. Was this some sort of irony on her part? My father's anger was like an overflowing river. Their fights never stopped. They came close to divorce multiple times, yet my grandmother always stepped in during the height of the turmoil to mend their relationship. The escalating tension between my parents was worsening day by day. The situation had become unbearable. As my sisters were growing up, the ongoing conflicts had the potential to deeply affect them. Action was needed to prompt my father to realize the seriousness of the situation. Once again, my mother took the lead. She decided to make a move, a somewhat risky move as a last-ditch effort. They left the old city and settled into a house owned by my grandmother, in the Zayadeen neighborhood, just outside the capital. Although my mother's decision was driven by desperation and she had doubts about its success, my father's behavior began to change gradually, which was surprisingly positive. He managed to find steady work, finally. He secured a job at the Ministry of Equipment, working in the photography department. This stable employment compelled him to think more seriously about the future, marking his first true engagement with reality. His regular income allowed him to meet the family's needs, representing a significant shift in his approach. Strangely, this new phase of their lives coincided with the birth of a boy in December 1961. Finally, my father's desire to carry on his family name was fulfilled. 
One morning, he arrived full of joy, pulling a rope with a sheep at the other end. He was planning to sacrifice the sheep in celebration of his son's birth, which would become a significant family occasion. The yearly practice of sacrificing a sheep during Eid al-Adha, meant to uphold the tradition of Abraham, is actually an act of bravery showcasing the father's masculinity and his ongoing willingness to take action when necessary. In many societies, the sacrifice of the animal is carried out by a butcher, but among Muslims, every father is required to embody this role, even if just once a year, to exhibit his submission to the divine message. The birth of a boy in Muslim countries differs significantly from that of a girl. This discrimination, which begins at birth, continues into upbringing. In Islamic tradition, boys and girls are educated differently. My mother didn't believe in these outdated norms. She suffered due to this tradition. To her, there was no difference between a girl and a boy. With the birth of their first son, the arguments between my parents became less frequent. Additionally, Tunisia's independence had become a reality after the treaty led by Mendez France in July 1954. Bourguiba now held the reins of the country. He ordered the nationalization of agricultural lands, aiming to distribute them among Tunisians, especially those who had been part of the resistance and were among the first beneficiaries. Was my father finally stepping into the shoes of a responsible man? He thought it was high time to settle his family into their own space. He asked my mother to approach my grandmother about selling the house in Goulette, our cherished spot for summer breaks. Should my grandmother agree to contribute the proceeds from the sale, he could then purchase one of the affordable plots assigned by his ministry and construct a spacious, beautiful home. My grandmother agreed, and she initiated the process of selling the Goulette house. Meanwhile, our family returned to live in the old city. Thanks to his job at the Ministry of Equipment, my father was granted a plot of land in Ariana, a nearby suburb of Tunis. Later on, he secured a loan from the Ministry of Housing. My mother took on the essential responsibilities in our household, caring for the children, managing maintenance, handling grocery shopping, and dealing with administrative matters related to securing the building permit for the forthcoming house. Not only did she contribute financially to the project, but she also visited Ariana frequently to coordinate with the contractors and prepare the construction site. However, with the birth of a fifth daughter, my father's attitude began to change. He, who had been carefree all along, now started to feel overwhelmed by the responsibilities he had assumed. As his sense of freedom gradually dwindled, he began to direct his anxiety towards my mother, targeting her vulnerabilities. He especially criticized her for the multiple pregnancies she had gone through. He was adamant about not wanting more children. He even pressured my mother to use contraception, as per the recommendations of Bourguiba's government during that time. Despite this, my mother refused this option, finding it against her natural beliefs. I came into the world in 1966. She then gave birth to a third son in 1969 and a fourth child in 1973. Islam and Arabization Bourguiba's decisions to permit contraception and abortion, as well as promote education and awareness in schools and media to curb births in Tunisia, went against the principles of Orthodox Islam. This was driven by a linguistic and religious belief that aimed to Arabize peoples, particularly in North Africa and the Northern Middle East. This belief held that the Arabic language, used by the Prophet, the Quran, and Islam, was also the sacred language of Allah, Paradise, and its angels. It was considered the original language of Adam and Eve, from which all other languages in the world originated. Consequently, this language was seen as destined to spread across the world. Arabic Islam emerged in the harsh terrain of the Arabian Peninsula, a land marked by tribal conflicts, diseases, and short lifespans. During that time, a society's strength was often determined by its population. Orthodox Islam provided a practical solution to the challenges of that era and region. Many hadiths encouraged procreation. For example, this hadith from Muhammad, marry and beget children for I'll be proud of you before the nations on the day of resurrection. 
this principle became deeply ingrained in the minds of Orthodox Muslims, even if not taken literally. Bearing many sons continued to be a way of advancing the expansion of Orthodox Islam, such as in Europe, where growing the Muslim population aimed to ensure future dominance. Throughout history, spanning over a thousand years of invasions and forced colonization, Islam eradicated various cultures, societies, and beliefs. This colonization in the name of Allah persists to this day. Arabization and Islamism are like two sides of the same coin, they cannot be separated and naturally converge despite efforts to the contrary. In the 1970s, Islamism took root in North African societies. The consequences of policies promoting Arabization and uprooting are evident today, with identities often tied solely to Islam, what is considered sacred becomes a symbol of identity, sometimes with menacing undertones. The widespread Arabization that accompanies the rise of radical Islam, bringing along both physical and intellectual terrorism, reveals a significant goal, the subjugation of communities by the Arab world. This charade requires exposure and restraint. People should have the freedom to access their heritage, original language, and traditions, enabling them to reclaim their identity, bridge divisions, and regain self-confidence to contribute to the advancement of humanity. The Time of Lethargy I was born on August 4, 1966, a day when Tunis was under the grip of intense heat, an ambivalent sign of both hope and apprehension. I can imagine that, just like any other day, the bustling sounds of the markets, the aroma of spice stalls, and the laughter of children filled the old city's narrow streets as evening approached, gradually fading into the distance. The night likely enveloped the mosques and whitewashed houses, while a vast expanse of sparkling stars adorned the sky above. During my early years, I was a quiet and unsocial child. Later, I would hear stories that described me, a child, often nestled in the house's courtyard at night, spending hours observing the stars, much like a wanderer quenching their thirst at an oasis spring. By the age of two, despite the dedicated attention from my mother and sisters, I still didn't respond when my name was called. I hadn't yet begun using words to communicate, raising concerns that I might be facing a significant delay in language development. Our family doctor suggested that I might be dealing with a form of autism. Omi Zora, my grandmother, applied her age-old remedies to the situation. Every Friday during prayer time, she would have me turn a key in my mouth seven times. Even more intriguingly, on Eid al adha she would collect the tongues of the sacrificed sheep from neighbors, string them together into a necklace, and use them to prepare a dish for me to eat regularly. At one point, she advised my mother, find a bird and place its head in your child's mouth. When the bird sings, your son's tongue will be set free. My mother followed this peculiar remedy in the hopes of helping me find my voice. When I turned three years old, I began to speak my first words. My mother was overjoyed, even though my utterances consisted of phonetic units repeating at regular intervals and following a logic that no one around me comprehended. During that year, as I played with my turtle in the courtyard, I took advantage of an open door and ventured outside, trailing after the turtle. By the time my absence was realized, it was too late, as none of our neighbors had seen me. Panic gripped the household. My mom shouted, and my sisters rushed around, not knowing what to do. There was a short period of confusion as everyone tried to help. Eventually, we split into groups to search for me. One of my sisters went far down the street near the busy road. Suddenly, she spotted me about fifteen steps away, walking on the sidewalk. Kareem! She shouted. Come here. Oh no! The worried tone of those words got me all worked up. I quickly dashed onto the road and got hit by a car, right in front of my frozen sister, who seemed rooted to the spot. I was bleeding a lot, but I was still alive. In situations like this, it's usually best not to move the injured person and wait for help. But the driver took a big risk and put me in his car to rush me to Charles Nicole Hospital in the Bab Sadown neighborhood. At the hospital, the doctor had good news, I was incredibly lucky because the head x-rays showed no damage. 
I was a survivor. After a few days of being watched over, I was taken back home. From then on, my mother and the whole family were extra careful with me. However, the shock from that accident probably made my speech problems last longer. By the time I turned four, I still wasn't speaking clearly. Our family doctor suggested enrolling me in a school for deaf and mute children, but my mother said no. With help from a friend who worked in education, she managed to get me into a regular primary school before the usual age. The teacher really liked me and did her best to help me, but progress was slow. At the end of my first school year, the principal agreed to let me stay, but with a condition, if I didn't start improving, they might have to move me to a specialized school for deaf and mute children. With the help of my teacher, I made noticeable progress and moved on to second grade. While I began to speak words and form sentences, only those close to me could understand what I was saying. I distanced myself from my classmates, and no one attempted to communicate with me. The world I existed in seemed shut off from the outside. I don't recall anything from that time. My first year of school is a blank memory, and how I advanced to the next grade remains a mystery, details later filled in by my mother and sisters. The construction of our house in Ariana continued, though not without its share of difficulties and delays. The ground turned out to be quite damp, causing problems for the stability of the foundation. My father was slow in progressing the work, whether due to lack of effort or indifference. Even though he showed some improvement, a hint of selfishness mixed with fear of confronting reality still lingered in him. It seemed he cared little about anything and was unable to grasp the essence of life. He consistently evaded self-reflection, fearing he might have to acknowledge his limitations. Naturally, this rekindled disputes between my parents. My mother aimed to finish the construction quickly, yearning for independence and the ability to raise her children in peace, her sole purpose in life. Exploring Self-Consciousness Because humans can sometimes see the real as unreal and mistake the imaginary for truth, they often find themselves torn between what's real and what's not. This is how my childhood started, on the day I turned seven and realized my existence. I remember that moment so clearly. I was in a dark, empty room at my grandmother's place in the old city. I felt a tingling in my hands and feet, like I was discovering them for the first time. Lost in the confusion between reality and fantasy, I heard a voice without really understanding it. Then, somehow and for reasons I couldn't explain, I realized it was my mother's voice calling my name. Panic surged through me, and I flailed around like a bird struggling to break free from its cage, bumping into the walls. It took me a while to find the door. I rushed out into the courtyard and paused in front of a pile of boxes. Everyone around me was bustling with an energy I hadn't seen before. What was going on? Where were you? My mother asked urgently. I looked everywhere and called for you so many times. Come with me quickly. Her words echoed in my mind and seeing her wearing the sefsari added to my confusion. Thoughts rushed through me as if memories of words and speaking were coming back, and suddenly, I understood everything she was saying, as if I'd experienced it before. I climbed into the truck with her, sitting close to the driver who was moving our furniture to our new house in Ariana. Along the way, I stared into the distance, pondering those big questions, who was I? What was I doing here? Where were we going? Finally, we reached our new house. My mother opened the truck door for me and told me to go play in the garden until it was time for dinner. I dashed outside, my understanding of the situation around me still hazy. I made my way to the far end of the garden, where I discovered a sizable well. I perched on its rim, observing the well's depths reflect the vivid blue sky. My gaze alternated between the heavens above and the watery bottom below, engrossed in the interplay of reality and its reflection. I lingered in this state for more than an hour until a firm hand jolted me, and an irritated voice addressed me. What are you doing here? Go join your brothers for dinner. And so began my life of self-consciousness. 
It was as though I had never truly existed before. My knowledge of events prior to my seventh year comes solely from the stories recounted by my family, particularly my mother. The sensation of discovering my newfound consciousness was an unparalleled delight. I reveled in sensing and grasping the world around me for the very first time. Every aspect was an adventure, an exploration, a revelation. I awakened to my five senses, exploring them with intrigue, attempting to touch and comprehend all that surrounded me. Beneath this placid exterior, I was a calm child, yet my mind was brimming with curiosity and exploration. This profound feeling of existence, of inhaling life itself, that exhilarating liberation of the mind, I've experienced it only twice more after that pivotal moment, on December 8, 1998, following my mother's passing, when I took the monumental step of departing from Orthodox Islam, openly professing my atheism to my family and friends, and on January 14, 2011, the historic day when Ben Ali relinquished Tunisia, leaving the nation to its destiny, and I, at last, sensed freedom within my homeland. Among those around me, no one realized that I had no memories prior to the age of seven. Except for my mother, nobody in my family noticed the transformation, as she consistently asked me, Kareem, what's on your mind? I consistently responded with silence. Only when I turned 21 and was released from prison in December 1987 did I finally reveal this impactful experience to my close ones. Here is the content of that confession that I read aloud to them, I am truly happy to finally muster the courage to narrate this painful phase of my childhood. Bearing the weight of having no memory during the most crucial years of my life is an enormous ordeal, a truly dreadful experience. No one can truly grasp the suffering I underwent before evolving into the boy capable of expressing himself in the language of people. The most agonizing aspect was the sensation that those around me were light years apart on some distant shore. When I recaptured my memory at the age of seven, I was taken to a house. Who were those people laughing, playing, referred to as, the children? Why did the grown-ups carry me, their faces darkening when I couldn't respond to their calls? The world I was entering wasn't familiar. Yet, it felt like I had known it forever. My family embraced me as I was. They seemed like companions from nowhere. I recognized their faces, understood their conduct, their gestures. However, I still struggled to understand why we lived together. I couldn't figure out where the thoughts flooding my mind originated. I had lived through this before, but when and where? I strained with all my might, perpetually pulling myself from the darkness to reach a slightly thinner, yet at times more biting twilight. Mornings found me at school. Other kids stared at me, turned away, spoke softly when I approached. My stomach churned. How would I manage to grasp the teacher's lessons? I endeavored to link his questions to the students' answers. Slowly, the significance of certain words, certain concepts became clear, even if the rest remained shrouded. I absorbed numbers and letters without certainty, often misconstruing. The following day, I'd nearly forgotten everything. Gradually, the scattered fragments of my past life started falling into place. I began deciphering and recalling without effort what was being discussed around me. What sheer elation! You cannot fathom the immense pleasure I felt in those instances. Nonetheless, I didn't feel compelled to proclaim my joy aloud. I believe, quite the opposite, I'd rather keep the inferno I'd just escaped forever hushed. That is how I was born into consciousness at the age of seven. I don't precisely know what triggered this sudden return of memory and immediate recollection. Was it the move? The void I sensed in the room? A union of both. The riddle remains unsolved for me. After making that confession, I felt relieved and freed from a secret that I had kept within me all that time. Since then, I never engaged in hidden behavior again. I entered a phase of my life where I could openly share what I thought and felt, express my viewpoint aloud without fearing others. I had finally grasped that sharing is a natural human behavior, and that social life forms the basis of a balanced existence for an individual. 
These profound sensations I experienced for the first time, consciousness, reflection, aggression, still intrigue me after all these years, could they be the fundamental elements that set humans apart from the animal world? I'm not certain whether I was aware of my existence before that. Did I contemplate, ponder questions? Could I differentiate between an aggressive gesture and an affectionate one? What I am sure of is that, following that sudden awakening of consciousness, I began to question myself and everything around me. I sought to understand and compare things, sorting them into pairs of opposites, me and others, high and low, and so forth. I understood my mother's affectionate distress over my disappearance before the move, and my father's frustration and irritation when he nudged me to join my brothers. Discovering Space At first, Ariana looked like the countryside. It was a new and open place, not heavily populated, with olive fields all around, some houses being built here and there, some occupied, some not. The sea wasn't far, and you could smell its freshness in the air. There's a saying in Tunisia that, if the sea were in Ariana, no one would go to the grave. Nearby, in front of our house, there was a hill with two big water tanks on top that supplied the town. And behind that was a big fortress. Ariana is called the City of Roses because of the gardens it had during the Hafsids period. In the old part of the city, there's still the Sidi Amar Mausoleum. It's next to Tunis in the south, and to the north, there used to be fields all the way to Carthage. The government started dividing these fields to make residential areas. Our family house was in the Anuza neighborhood, very close to the old city. The Ariana house had numerous rooms, with three bedrooms in total, one for my parents, another for the boys, and a separate one for the girls, where boys were restricted from entering, except for me. I had the run of the entire house. The house also featured a kitchen, dining area, a spacious living room, and a bathroom, although these weren't fully finished at the time. Some doors and windows were still missing, and the painting was incomplete. Outside, a semi-oval veranda adorned the front, while a second veranda at the back extended into a generous garden. Its lush vegetation stoked my curiosity to uncover hidden treasures that only nature could offer to imaginative children. During the daytime, I'd explore the area around the house, gradually venturing farther each day. However, nighttime was my refuge. I'd peer at the sky from the boy's bedroom window, losing myself in the inky vastness and the glittering stars. After we settled in, our initial dinners were illuminated by oil lamps. My mother blocked the entrance with large barrels and improvised wooden covers for the windows. The evenings were electrifying, as everything was novel to us. Our joyful noise reached new heights of excitement. Amidst this, my parents' quarrels were exceptionally intense. My father was against the move, fearing the loss of his old routines, friends from the old city, and the challenges of managing a new, unfinished independent dwelling. Yet, my mother's word always held sway, leaving my father with the option of stepping out and returning late at night, somewhat more at ease after sharing a few glasses of wine with friends at a bar in Tunis. My mother always looked out for our well-being. We were dressed tastefully, not to make an impression, but to teach us respect for our bodies and cultivate discipline. In her opinion, clean and simple attire, free from excessive style, went hand in hand with good mental hygiene. The moral values she instilled in us were based on common sense, maintaining courage in all situations, even the toughest ones, and showing love and respect for others. However, she placed a special emphasis on our education. To her, it was crucial, true mental wealth couldn't exist without a strong intellectual foundation. Above all, she was determined to shield us from the difficult life she continued to endure. On matters of education, my parents were in full agreement. This was, in fact, one of the few areas of accord I observed between them. While my father had his shortcomings due to his rough nature, he shared my mother's sentiment that girls should have the same opportunities as boys, even though deep inside, he favored his sons. His rural background sometimes influenced him, 
much like his illiteracy created a complex he wouldn't have wanted to see in his children. Only your studies can help you, he often said. The top students get what they want. Our move occurred toward the end of the winter break, at the start of 1973. A few days passed, and school resumed. My older sisters hadn't switched schools, they had to travel to Tunis every day. At noon, they'd have lunch at the old house in the old city, which was close by, and in the evening, they'd return tired, to study. As for my youngest sister and me, my mother had enrolled us in a primary school not far from our home. I was in the third grade class. Even though I had regained a significant portion of my intellectual abilities before school resumed, I remained rather quiet. My face and manners were still confined to my inner world. What frightened me the most was the number of children my age. Why was my mother putting me in this place? I was perfectly fine at home. The love my family had for me was eminent. I never quite knew if it was a natural love or pity, compassion, because I was the most fragile. I spent most of the lunch break in the classroom, away from the others' commotion, after eating alone in a corner of the schoolyard, the sandwich my mother prepared for us daily. In class, the teacher treated me somewhat differently. I was always seated in front of his desk, under his watchful eyes. I later understood that my mother had asked him to look out for me because I had a solitary, unsocial behavior and struggled with articulation. The first days of school were quite tough, but as the days went by, I started to develop good habits. As soon as I got home, I worked hard to catch up, erase my numerous gaps and improve my focus. I had noticed that everyone was taking care of me, especially my second sister, Samira, who paid me great attention and patiently helped me revise my lessons with delicacy, as if she were my second mother. Unlike my siblings, I enjoyed being alone, away from the crowd. Paying attention to my surroundings was something I started doing early on. In our new Ariana house, I often found myself hiding in the cellar, spending hours lost in thought, trying to make sense of the world around me. I always had a longing to be more than just an ordinary person. I envisioned myself as a night owl, active when others slept. I mostly kept to myself, finding comfort in my own private space that no one else could enter, and this shaped me over the years. While life's bumps and bruises, big or small, are just part of the journey, they quietly influence us and gradually change us. I had a fondness for playing with animals the most. I carried out experiments as if I were a scientist. As time went by, my ability to observe things improved. I could spend a lot of time watching a leaf on a tree or a twig, without saying anything or showing any emotions. It was like having my own world where I was the ruler, secret hideouts, and imaginary friends I chatted with in my mind. I still didn't mingle with boys my age. If a curious kid came over because of my unique games, I'd chase them away, wearing a fierce expression. My family was like many other middle-class Tunisian families. We valued our culture, loved our country, and kept our heads high despite financial struggles. Raising and educating nine children and meeting their needs wasn't easy. Thankfully, Borguiba had made education free for all. I rarely saw my father, as he lingered at work or with his friends. It was my mother with whom I spent most of my time. When I was at home, I stuck close to her, eagerly observing her every word and gesture. Taking care of her nine children seemed to cause her no fatigue. Her determination rarely wavered, and even if it did, she would mock it right after. Her persistence was immense, almost obsessive. What was she seeking in this determination that bordered on obsession? Idleness wore her out. She never rested, constantly busy. In addition to her household chores, she would go to the market in the old city. I accompanied her to help carry bags and, at the same time, to explore this world, full of surprises, into which I found myself parachuted. My mother didn't ask my sisters for help with household tasks. When one of them offered assistance, she would say, go review your lessons, it's better for you. 
she did everything to ensure her daughters led modern and independent lives. Outside, she habitually wore the traditional sefsari, even though Borguiba encouraged Tunisian women to remove it. However, for her daughters, that was out of the question. She bought them jeans, miniskirts, and stylish shirts. They were young women immersed in the emerging modernity, determined to challenge the conservative constraints of the traditionalists who confined women's roles to that of servants. Discovering the Afterlife The days went by quickly between school and home. Each day brought a new sensation or concept that had been unfamiliar to me before. My maternal grandmother came to visit us to experience my mother's life in her new home. One late afternoon, with the sweet aroma of freshly made pastries drifting from the kitchen, I found her kneeling in prayer, performing the Salat Lasr prayer. I approached her and asked. What are you doing? I'm praying to Rabbi, asking him to accept me by his side and to ease my suffering, as I will be leaving soon. Does God grant all your requests? I continued. Of course. He gives us everything we ask for. With those words, I settled onto the prayer mat, mimicking her actions, and fervently exclaimed. My God, make me a monkey. Omi Zora thought I was asking for yogurt, as yogurt and monkey sound quite similar in our dialect, especially from a child who articulates imperfectly and a grandmother whose hearing isn't much better. Consequently, she fulfilled my request by giving me some coins and said. Go buy your yogurt, my child. I followed her instructions, fearing to upset her. However, upon returning home, I asked my mother. Does God answer all our requests? Without a doubt. She responded. Why didn't he transform me into a monkey as I asked in my prayer? You've forgotten the essential part. After the prayer, you need to wash yourself with milk and then sleep naked. When you wake up, you'll be transformed into a monkey. I thought that this procedure was far too complex to carry out. I would tackle it when I was older. I would become a monkey, and then I could climb everywhere. The next day, my grandmother felt extremely downcast. She decided to return to Tunis. Before leaving, she turned around one last time to look at our house. Sadness filled her eyes. She uttered a few incomprehensible words and then kissed us. A few days later, she took to her bed. Her condition worsened day by day, to the point that she lost the ability to speak. My mother had to go to her bedside. Listen to me, Karim, she told me. I need to go to Tunis. Your grandmother is very ill. I trust you to take care of the house. Stay calm and don't leave here. When your father comes back, tell him to join me. Suddenly, I found myself alone. All this turmoil had left me unsettled. Making the most of my solitude, I began wandering in the garden following my instincts, paying no attention to the passing time. I walked back and forth, crossed the garden several times, returned to the veranda, went back near the trees. I saw my grandmother's face among the branches. I remembered our last conversation on the prayer mat. Now, I linked her image with that of God, and I had never felt so close to her. I was afraid of the vastness of this new dimension opening up to my consciousness, yet simultaneously, it stirred a feeling of well-being within me. As the light dimmed, I sat on the steps in front of the house and watched the sunset behind the mountain, observing the twilight gradually unfold until my father arrived. I delivered my mother's message to him. He waited for one of my sisters to arrive, instructed her to look after me, and then hurriedly left. The following day, a blanket of sorrow covered every face. Omi Zora had passed away. It was February 20, 1973. Everyone went to attend her funeral except me. As far as I understood, my grandmother had advised my mother not to bring me along, she didn't want me to see her either before or after her passing, considering me too fragile for such an experience and fearing it might deeply affect me. I struggled to comprehend the concept of death. 
I repeatedly questioned my mother. All she could tell me was that Omi Zora had ascended to heaven, up there near God. Who is God? Why in heaven? What was she doing near God? How did she manage to join him? These questions swirled within me, yet I lacked the courage to voice them. All I comprehended was that I would never lay eyes on her again, or perhaps only after my own demise. Still, I persisted in contemplating the question, what does death mean? The questions I pondered, I kept mostly to myself, fearing that I might not express them well. Indeed, they were clear in my mind, but transforming them into words and sentences was difficult. I only asked the questions that I could articulate properly. Sometimes, I would isolate myself and ask the question aloud to myself before posing it to my mother or someone else, just to make sure I could manage it. Eventually, I came to agree with my mother's belief that death is an irreversible journey to heaven. The discovery of death and God led me to contemplate the relationship between these two words. By connecting my grandmother to death, she had gone near God, the God who fulfills all our desires. I wish to die to also go near God, to join Omi Zora whom I loved so much. Looking back, I realized that I loved God through the image of her that I held in my mind, her tenderness and her affection towards me. A few months later, my mother gave birth to my very little brother. I didn't understand anything. My mother was in the kitchen preparing lunch. She had a stomach ache. She rushed out and came back a few hours later, holding a little baby wrapped in a white blanket, which she placed on the sofa. She surrounded him with cushions and told me to be very careful not to harm my little brother while she prepared dinner. I stayed beside him, staring at him in amazement. As far as I can remember, it was a surprise for everyone, on the 28th of May, 1973. The whole family was delighted with this unexpected newborn, no one was expecting his arrival. The arrival of my little brother marked the final addition to our family. My mother didn't have any more children after him. She wasn't expecting to become pregnant again because, when she was about to give birth to her second-to-last child, my father had asked the doctor on duty at the hospital to perform a tubal ligation on her without her knowledge. The doctor had agreed, crossing ethical boundaries. After the delivery, he had operated on my mother. However, by a miracle I can't explain, the operation had failed, and my youngest brother came into the world. Naturally, I asked my mother the usual questions any child of my age would ask, where did this little brother come from, and how did he arrive? My mother had always trained us to answer our questions, each answer tailored to our age and level of understanding and thinking. I observed that when one of my sisters posed a question to her, she sometimes responded with, I don't know, while other times, she would provide an answer. And whenever we sought her opinion, she always gave it, adding, it's up to you. However, when it came to me, she consistently offered a response. This encouraged me to summon the courage to inquire further. But this time, her response wasn't very convincing. Your brother was in my belly, she told me. He was sleeping. When he woke up, he came out to join us. I understood this with the reasoning of a young child, if we go to God when we die, logically, we come from him when we're born. So, my little brother had come from God into my mother's belly. Discovering Life At the end of the school year, I managed to achieve an average, and I was promoted to the fourth grade. Summer arrived, and along with it, the holidays. The school routine was over. There was a festive atmosphere at home, and everyone was in high spirits. I vividly remember the summer of 1973 when I could truly enjoy myself, swimming, playing, evening strolls on the beaches of La Goulette, Sidi Boussed, Carthage, or Hammam Liff, and daydreaming about countless possibilities. Frequently in the mornings, a friend of my father would drive by with his daughter, who was the same age as my sisters, to take us to the sea. Swimming was pure delight. We relished the waves, the wind, and the salt water. Feeling the sun warming our bodies, rolling in the sand, and sharing laughter, it all seemed to matter more than anything else. 
It was a time of carefree living, with tomorrow seeming so distant. The days I cherished the most were when my mother accompanied us. The day before, she would prepare everything needed for a long day at the beach. We set off early in the morning to secure a good spot on the sand. Once settled, my mother would arrange a large umbrella as a landmark, where she'd be with my little brother in her arms or by her side. My sisters would put on their bikinis and go for a walk. As for me, I would stay back, playing in the sand with my brothers, all under my mother's watchful gaze. Her discreet glances in my direction provided a sense of security and protection that was always with me. Despite that, I felt an absolute freedom without boundaries, much like the sea stretching out to the horizon. Upon our return, the evenings would pass peacefully in a blend of joy and shared affection, akin to any typical Tunisian family, with a touch of conservatism. The new school year starting in September marked the end of our games and regular swims. We had to confront new realities and continue expanding our intellectual horizons. For both my sister and me, a primary school opened just two minutes away from home, saving us from a long commute, El Ferdius School. The instruction was divided between French and Arabic. I had a French teacher with whom I developed an excellent rapport. On the other hand, my Arabic teacher, a tall man with a mustache, would arrive every morning on his bicycle, sitting upright on the saddle as if in a horse-riding competition. He would then meticulously adjust his trouser cuffs, grab his satchel, and head to the teacher's room. He didn't hold me in high regard, considering me a dreamy and lazy child by nature. Instead of offering compliments when the opportunity arose, he would often label me as foolish, if this one manages to accomplish anything, I'll happily quit teaching. Certainly, during Arabic classes, I spent most of my time gazing out of the window. The world outside was so captivating. In contrast to the French classroom that overlooked the courtyard, the windows of the Arabic classroom offered a view of a vast field of olive trees, accompanied by a few goats and sheep that I would follow with my eyes. My mind functioned with its own distinct logic, far removed from conventional criteria. How could my teacher possibly detect the visions in which I continued to be immersed? Except for mathematics, where I excelled, and the dictation and recitations in which I ranked first, Arabic was my weak point. My teacher summoned my parents several times to complain and discuss strict measures with them. However, these efforts were futile, as it was my mother who managed all communication and matters related to our schooling. My father never attended these meetings, he wouldn't even have been aware if she hadn't informed him of my issues. And apparently, he paid little attention to what she told him. As the end of 1973 approached, preparations were underway to celebrate New Year's Eve at home. I couldn't recall the New Year's Eves of previous years, but I understood that our family marked the occasion annually, much like in Europe. This year was going to be special, as my father had decided to invite his friends over to our house instead of going to their places. My mother was in favor of the idea, in fact, she had encouraged him to do so, just to have him close by. The house was filled with a festive atmosphere. Everyone had their role to play. My mother was busy preparing dinner and the cake, my sisters took charge of decorating the house with balloons and motifs, and my father went out to buy wine. As for us boys, we helped set up the tables and chairs and participated in all the arrangements. We were the most open family in the neighborhood. My sisters had invited their friends, my mother did too, and of course, my father. Everyone was in high spirits. My father's closest friend had gifted a large Christmas tree. We positioned it in the spacious living room, adorned with colorful lights. As night descended, music reverberated, and the festivities kicked off. At midnight, there were exchanges of hugs and mutual wishes for a happy 1974. The celebration continued nearly until dawn. I was witnessing such a moment for the first time, and it felt to me as if life had always been joyful. The next morning, my mother woke up early to tidy up the house, and when we rose around noon, everything was back in order and breakfast was ready. Smiles lit up every face, and the new year promised happiness and hope. 
After a few days of vacation, each of us returned to our usual school rhythm. The school year went by as usual. Often, on Sundays, my mother would take us for picnics in the Belvedere Park in Tunis, which had a zoo. We spent the day outdoors, and it was a big day for me, running on the grass, climbing trees, and, most importantly, observing the zoo animals. We returned home tired in the evening, each of us getting ready to face a new week. For me, going to school was a challenge, but I had no choice. I eagerly awaited the end of classes or short breaks, but my ultimate goal was the start of summer vacation. The construction of the house continued at full speed. Before the end of the school year, the work was nearly finished, at least on the inside of the house. The doors were installed, along with the windows. Everyone was pleased with these developments, and we were getting ready for summer, beach trips, and late-night excursions to the coastline, the blissful life of summer holidays, where everyone has fun and does what they please. My mother gave us a lot of freedom, she preferred to teach us responsibility rather than imposing restrictions. She always said, try things on your own to form your judgment. That summer, my father began inviting his friends over on Saturdays to enjoy wine and play cards at home. On those days, my mother would prepare dinner and everything they needed before going to bed, while my brothers and I played outside until exhaustion took over. My father's best friend was a generous and kind-hearted man. He ensured we lacked nothing and frequently showered us with gifts. Everything we desired, he would buy for us. I remember a phrase he often repeated, which I only understood twenty years later, life is short, make the most of it. One day, coming back from the beach, I noticed a little goat among a herd. I grew fond of this adorable creature that embodied pure innocence. My father's friend, giving in to my whim, caught the animal and bought it before putting it in the car. I adored my new friend. I climbed on its back, kissed it, told it stories, and it never left my side. We became inseparable. Until the day my father grabbed the goat and slaughtered it for dinner with his friends. I screamed, raged against my father, and cried the entire day. On that day, I grasped the meaning of the word, hate. In an instant, I understood all the dangers and power of hatred, and how it can stir the soul. The September 1974 school year began in a special way as my older sister was taking her baccalaureate exams. We, the boys, weren't allowed to play inside the house. My mother would have us go to the garden so as not to disturb her. She doubled her efforts so that my older sister could focus solely on her studies. She would bring her breakfast in bed and prepare her things. She lived like a princess, and every whim was catered to. That year, she corresponded with a girl her age named Wendy who lived in America. She eagerly awaited her letters and tasked me with checking if the mailman had come. She invited Wendy to spend a few weeks with us during the summer holidays. My mother wasn't against the idea, and Wendy accepted. As the holidays approached, an unusual tension hung in the house. We awaited the results of my older sister's baccalaureate, and nobody paid attention to me, despite the difficulties I had overcome in school. My older sister didn't pass her baccalaureate. It was a huge shock for my mother. I saw her face go pale when she heard the news. Yet, she didn't want to show her disappointment. It's not a big deal, she said. You'll have fun this summer to forget the stress, and I want you to study hard from the start of the term to earn your diploma next year. Your sister will take it alongside you, so it'll be a double celebration. On the day of the American friend's arrival, my mother prepared her bed in the girl's room, and my two elder sisters went to pick her up from the airport. Joy filled the air when they returned with her. They spent the entire night laughing and chatting in their room, and the next day they set out to show her around Tunis. They conversed in English amongst themselves, a language I naturally couldn't understand but I recognized the evident pleasure on my sister's beaming faces, stemming from the hospitality of Tunisia. One would have searched in vain for any distinction between them and their guest, be it in appearance, attire, or mentality. 
all three had been educated within the same modern framework. Wendy stayed with us for about a month, and I recall the somber atmosphere and my sister's misty eyes on the day of her departure. Besides the gifts she had brought, Wendy left almost all of her alluring attire behind as a gesture of gratitude. After seeing her off at the Tunis Carthage airport, they returned downcast and quietly withdrew to their room. That summer, the days sped by, and I didn't get to see my elder sisters much, as they were engaged with their guest. However, I felt that something had shifted within the family. There were now two worlds, that of the grown-ups and that of the little ones. It was as if they were no longer part of our world, they had their own commitments, went out with their friends, and sometimes brought them home, as if their world was separate. Even for beach outings, they no longer joined us. Consequently, I had more time to pursue my own dreams. Yes, that summer, each of us began to grow and construct our own world. But it didn't bother anyone, quite the contrary. We remained united, and everyone was fulfilled. In September 1975, I entered the fifth grade. This year appeared challenging for me, as my second sister would no longer have the time to take care of me and assist me in catching up. I had only myself to rely on. Of course, my mother attended to me a little in place of my sister, but it wasn't the same. My second sister understood me and had the patience to calmly and wisely explain everything to me, and sometimes she would play with me. My mother was a different matter. Her household responsibilities left her with little time. All she could do was assist me a bit in the evening with French language lessons. As for Arabic, she knew nothing about it, as her studies were under the Christian sisters. In Arabic, my grade quickly dropped. My teacher hated me even more, to the extent that he compelled me to sit at the back, declaring that at the back of the class, I could take the opportunity to sleep and rest. In the first term, I scored below the average. My father, furious, yelled at me, calling me a donkey, and began punishing me every evening by making me copy a text in French and another in Arabic, which I mindlessly transcribed without understanding. My isolation in the face of this tense situation led me to withdraw into myself, and I started disliking everyone. I had created my own characters in my mind, my own friends among the animals. Upon returning from school, I would toss my bag, take refuge in the basement with the dog and the chickens, and talk to them. Then, before my father arrived, I would rush up to my room, open a book, and pretend to study. It was enough for him to see me with a book or a pen in hand to close the door, thinking that I was studying. I feigned copying the texts he gave me, but as he couldn't read, I showed him texts that I had already transcribed previously, and he left me alone. The winter holidays were approaching, along with the New Year's Eve that I awaited eagerly. That year, the celebration was even more magnificent than the previous year, as our house was fully completed, including the house's fence. Thus, two years of happiness had just passed. The greatest joy of my mother. The return in January 1976 after the winter vacation was tough for the two baccalaureate candidates. This year, my mother didn't want any failures. Everyone had to provide them with calm and serenity so they could revise well. Even my father didn't bring friends home on Saturdays anymore. After work, he joined them at the bar in Tunis and returned home late at night. As for my mother, she woke up at 6 a.m. to bring them breakfast in bed and stayed up with them in the evening until they almost fell asleep over their studies. And after turning off the lights in the girls' room, she would still come to the boys' room to take a look at each of us and cover us. For me, this January return was even more difficult. Hardly anyone paid attention to me anymore. I didn't achieve the passing grade in the second trimester. Even my father was now indifferent. I won't bother with him anymore, he said. Whether he studies or not, he won't pass this year. Becoming increasingly isolated at home and at school, I immersed myself in my dreams. The household pets were the only friends left to me. I spent most of my time with them, even at night. I waited for everyone to be asleep before slipping out the window. 
I would sleep in the basement with them and wake up at sunrise to return to my bed. At the end of the 1976 school year, the verdict came, I had to repeat my fifth grade class. That's when I began to lose my footing. Studies no longer intrigued me. Around me, the family only cared about my two sisters' results. When they found out I was repeating a grade, there was no reaction, as if it was normal and everyone expected it. A bit of attention would have helped me, but I resigned myself. Everyone was waiting for the success of the girls. Finally, the news arrived, my two sisters had obtained their diplomas, and the second one with the distinction of, very good. As soon as my mother heard the news, a loud ululation resonated throughout the house. We hadn't seen her so joyful since the passing of her own mother, tears in her eyes as if she were the one who had received the diploma. After all those years of hard work, she truly deserved this joy. Everyone was thrilled with their success. For several days, visitors streamed into the house to congratulate my sisters. My mother welcomed them enthusiastically, offering Tunisian pastries with green or red pine nut tea. I had to run to the corner store several times to get what was needed. A busy week had just passed. My older sisters were becoming more distant, living in their own world of grown-ups. As for us, the younger ones, we had our own world. My mother didn't change her routines. She took us to the beach as she did every summer. My father had resumed the habit of inviting friends over in the evenings. Life was returning to normal after all that tension. On Wednesday, August 4, 1976, I turned 10. The day of my birthday held a significant place in my mind since the beginning of my new life. As with each of our birthdays, my mother baked a large cake, and it was a special day for me. I didn't have friends to invite, but I was very happy to spend this day with family, and everyone embraced me, wishing me a long life, a joyful birthday, and success for the year ahead. I had failed my school year, but thanks to my two sisters' success, it seemed like everyone had forgotten about it. The Islamist Infiltration of the Family At the end of the summer vacation, I began my fifth grade year again with the same teachers. The students had changed, except for those like me who were repeating the grade. This return to school was so difficult for me that I no longer wanted to go to school, but my mother worked to convince me that she would take better care of me from now on and that, in the end, I would also reach the baccalaureate. This reassured me a bit, but deep down, I no longer believed in my ability to succeed. My two older sisters were enrolled in university. The first one wanted to become a teacher. As for the second one, she was starting mathematics studies. After a few weeks, I noticed that she was smiling less and beginning to change her behavior. I had known Samira since I opened my eyes to this world, and she had taken care of me the most since my birth. So, if there was anyone in the siblings who was close to me, it was her. Up until then, I knew her by heart, I could sense everything she felt. She exerted considerable and natural energy to brighten our lives. Her dedication had contributed to my happiness and to maintaining an open-minded spirit among us. She always found new game ideas. She liked dressing fashionably and creating a lively atmosphere at home. She was a young woman steeped in modernity. She had inherited from our mother her strong character that never gives up regardless of the circumstances. She was known for her free and critical spirit, her humor, her warmth. She was always ready to embrace new experiences. But since she had joined the university, she seemed to be losing the cheerfulness that was the charm of her personality. She wasn't the same anymore, she isolated herself more and more, locking herself in her room when she returned from the university. One day, I overheard this strange conversation between her and my mother, Mom, do you know that we are surrounded by forces of evil? What do you mean, my child? Samira started pacing back and forth in the kitchen. Her excitement carried a kind of discomfort that she was trying unsuccessfully to hide. There are many people who want to divert us from the path that leads to Allah. What you're saying worries me. Is someone trying to harm you? 
Oh no. I feel strong, mom. Allah is with me. Allah is so good. I've never felt so close to his heart. Sensing that her daughter wasn't in her normal state, my mother abandoned the lunch preparations and sat down. This is the first time I've heard you talk about Allah with such passion. I commend you for that. But why are your hands trembling like that? What's happening to you? Are you unwell? Am I unwell? Not at all. On the contrary, I feel as strong as a block of granite. But then, why are you trembling? I tremble because my love for Allah is immense, and I know He's watching me. He watches over all of us, my mother retorted placidly. You're wrong, mom. Allah only watches over those who sacrifice everything for Him, those who place themselves body and soul under His light. Since you've been at the university, Samira, your words have changed a lot, and I feel you've lost some of your zest for life. I've never been happier. I've met new people who have opened my mind and given me back my freedom. I appreciate your sensitivity, my daughter. Did I raise you under a glass bell? You didn't raise me to access the true word of God. My sister exclaimed with fervor, as if my mother had hidden the truth of Allah from her. She sat down in turn, rubbing her face with her hands. For a few seconds, her mind seemed lost in silence, then she fixed her gaze on my mother. We all must learn to listen to the word of Allah. What we've done for him so far is nothing. From now on, all our actions, deeds, and thoughts must be turned toward him, otherwise the gates of paradise will remain closed to us. Be quiet. Your words hurt me. As if I'm not a Muslim. I don't want to listen to you anymore. Yet, you'll have to, because it's the will of Allah. This discussion sent chills down my spine. Why was Samira so adamant in her words? My mother practiced daily prayers, she raised us without making distinctions between us, giving each of us equal attention, fulfilling her motherly role to the best of her ability. She had nothing to be ashamed of, except for her numerous arguments with her husband. But she wasn't responsible for them as she hadn't chosen this marriage. On the contrary, she accepted her fate despite her pain and worked tirelessly for the well-being of the family. She fought for us to have our own roof over our heads. What more could she do to deserve Allah's love? My sister was taking a turn that foretold difficult days. Her change in attitude was reflected in her clothing, within a few months, their attractive colors shifted to gray, and surprisingly, for someone who usually dressed rather short, her skirts now reached her calves. She would lock herself in their room with her two younger sisters to discuss Allah and Islam in hushed voices. I noticed that the younger ones were starting to imitate her. As for the eldest, she refused to listen to her younger sibling. Their disagreements escalated. The younger one wouldn't give up and applied pressure. She opposed her way of dressing, intervened in her private life, and behavior. The atmosphere had become charged. My mother had to intervene to calm them down. Previously, there were trivial, daily arguments, like, why did you take my jeans without asking? Now, I heard my older sister shouting, mind your own business and let me live my life. My older sister had been raised to be free and independent, she couldn't stand others making decisions for her. The attire of my second sister became the embodiment of her new discourse, but that wasn't enough. She transformed into a true proselytizer. She set her sights on our family, and of course, soon it was my turn. Tell me, Kareem, do you know who Allah is? My sister asked me. Someone who wishes us well, and one day, will depart to his abode in the sky. That's good, I see you've grasped the core, real life doesn't unfold on earth but in the heavens, alongside Allah. That's what we refer to as paradise. Oh, I know about the things that transpire in the sky. I quite enjoy gazing at the stars, I comprehend when they converse with me. What are you saying? Stars don't speak. Of course they do. 
you simply don't know how to listen. Behind them, there exist entities resembling animals and trees, and they converse with us. And I also perceive the countenance of Grandma Zora who speaks to me and accompanies me from above. You possess a vivid imagination, Karim. However, you must heed my words. When you were a little boy, I took care of you, you ought to place trust in me. Beyond these entities you speak of, Allah exists. All of us must head towards him, as our rightful place lies beside him. Our terrestrial existence is merely fleeting. There is nothing good in this world. To aspire to reach Allah, we need to adhere to a set of regulations. Among them, prayer holds the utmost significance. From this point onward, I recommend that you perform it each day. Prayer. But it feels like I've been praying for a considerable time already. You are mistaken, Karim. I shall educate you on the proper method of prayer. If it brings you contentment. Yet, tell me, why do you engage in so many disputes with mother? They are not disputes. I solely intend what's best for her. Still, it brings her sorrow. Be at ease, we shall all transform into devout and true Muslims. For the reason that we are not authentic Muslims. No, a genuine Muslim must fully submit to Allah to attain his paradise. And how does one submit to Allah? That's what I am going to teach you. And the entire family will surrender to Allah. Fueled by her initial successes, my sister became more active than ever. She attended meetings with her new friends to discuss religion and politics. At home, she started spouting frenzied declarations about hell, paradise, and the West, Islam's supposed great enemy, at the drop of a hat. Her gaze was no longer the same. Was someone manipulating her from behind? My mother's worry grew. She saw that her daughter was going through a delicate phase, that she was falling victim to bad influences, but she held on to the hope that she would soon revert to her true nature. It seemed implausible to her that a well-educated person with a good level of education could be so easily manipulated. She didn't want to impose anything on her children, preferring that they make their own choices, with full responsibility. I remember when my little brother wanted to touch the hot water in the bathroom, she let him do so. When he got burned, she comforted him with laughter, saying that now he wouldn't touch it again. She had raised us this way. She didn't want us to experience what she had experienced, not having a say in her experiences and her partner. She had suffered all her life from her forced marriage and refused to let her children face the same fate. No, that couldn't happen in her family, she had done everything to shield us from that. The major mistake my mother made was not acting in time against this danger, because she believed in everyone's freedom of conscience. Alas, she underestimated the danger. She couldn't fathom the various methods of infiltration and manipulation through which Islamism maintains its grip on those who fall into its trap. My sister had fallen into one of these traps, the love of an Islamist and the aspiration to become an exemplary woman in Allah's service through marriage, which is the dream of every girl at that age. This method has been used, among others, by Muhammad himself, to secure an alliance with a family or tribe and propagate Islam, he would marry one of their daughters. We also see this among many converts to Islam in Europe, love and marriage are among the tactics of Islamism to infiltrate society. Today, I can't help but think that this situation, which was the source of our family's misery, foreshadowed what Tunisia is experiencing today. Ben Ali's departure allowed an Islamist-oriented political party to act with impunity on a still fragile Tunisian population, lacking experience in the realm of democratic freedom and predominantly influenced by Islam. This party took advantage of this religious sway to deceive thousands of families like ours and rise to power. Therefore, my mother didn't want to intervene in my sister's choices, and things got worse. This toxic atmosphere led to another event. My elder sister was being courted by one of her friends, a tall man with western features and appearance, he could have been mistaken for a German. As he was kind, well-mannered, and had a stable job, my mother encouraged my sister to marry him. 
Unable to bear the tension prevailing at home any longer, she agreed quite quickly. He came with his family to ask for her hand, and my parents agreed for the marriage to take place at the end of the year 1976. The wedding ceremony organized by my parents at home delighted us. It was a modern Tunisian wedding. My elder sister wore a white dress, a symbol of light and joy. After the three days and three nights of festivities, she left home with her husband to build their family life. My mother was overflowing with joy as this union promised great happiness for her daughter. She was thrilled to see her finding her path and becoming independent. However, these wedding celebrations were only a momentary respite. The very next day, the extremist regime resumed its hold in our home. My second sister found herself without a rival to oppose her purpose, to compel us to become good Muslims in Allah's service according to her own ideas. The Cyclone of the Islamic Revolution As the end of the year 1976 approached, my sister expressed her opposition. For her, there was no question of celebrating the end of the year, it was a Western holiday and Islam forbade it. Of course, my mother didn't listen to her. If you don't want to celebrate with us, you're free to stay in your room, my mother retorted. My sister replied sharply. No way am I going to witness sin right in front of my eyes and do nothing. It's up to you to leave the house for that, I don't want to see this house tainted by sin. But seeing that she couldn't convince my mother, she changed her strategy. She skillfully exploited my father's weaknesses. Dad, do you really think you're the master of the house? You know your mother's character. She's rebellious, my father grumbled. What does the Quran and the Hadiths tell us about the role of a wife in the household? You won't have to wait long for me to tell you. The woman can't act without the consent of her husband. The woman is the right hand of the husband. She suggests, her husband decides and commands. The Hadith is accurate, my father acknowledged. And what does your wife do? Have you ever been able to control her actions? You know that as well as I do, my daughter. But that's not all, my sister continued. Does a master of the house spend his time away from his wife? Does he constantly go out with his friends? Does he drink alcohol? If that's the life of a master of the house, when could he pray? You're asking a lot of me, my child. It's not me who's asking you, it's Allah. And what should I do to please Allah? You have a lot to do. I will teach you the path of Allah that will make you the master of your family, but you'll have to follow what I tell you. I agree, if it's going to please Allah. We almost heard him add in his mind, and if it allows me to subdue their mother and make myself the true master of the house. After this discussion, my father changed his habits. He was almost always at home, shouting and imposing his will like a chief of a barbaric tribe. His orders had to be executed to the letter, without discussion. Disputes between my parents became daily occurrences. Tension was extremely high in the house. The girls would hide in their room, and my younger brother and I would escape to the garden. As for my mother, she would either be in her room crying or in the kitchen preparing meals, her face pale and tears in her eyes. Despite all of my sister's efforts to prevent it, New Year's Eve was celebrated, but in a modest manner. My mother had prepared a large cake and candles, and we spent the evening in front of the TV. This end of the year was one of the saddest I had experienced, and it was the last time we celebrated New Year's Day at home. The atmosphere was tense. My mother forced herself to smile. My three older sisters present chose to stay in their room, away from us, so as not to sin and participate in what they saw as a betrayal of Islam. As for my father, instead of inviting his friends over as he had been doing since we moved to Ariana, he preferred to go out and spend New Year's Eve with his friends without telling anyone, completely forgetting what my sister had told him. He came back early in the morning, completely drunk, walking on tiptoe so that no one would know. It was the first time I saw my father hide like a thief. Usually, when he came home drunk, he would wake everyone up with his restlessness. 
That night, I sensed a deep fear within him, the kind that Islam instills in an individual's heart. The next morning, I woke up hearing my second sister performing the morning prayer with the other two. I heard her loudly asking Allah for forgiveness for the great sin committed in the house the previous evening. She asked for the support and strength of Allah to combat sin wherever it may be. Since the boy's room was adjacent to the girl's room, I could hear all of her supplications. It gave me goosebumps. I felt that this New Year's Day wouldn't pass without consequences, especially when I heard her say she was ready to give her life for Islam to be implemented in the house. A major Islamic revolution was brewing. I crossed my fingers, waiting for what would happen on this first day of 1977. When my mother got up, I could no longer hear Samira imploring Allah, but my three sisters were whispering so that no one could hear them. I waited a little before getting up to join my mother in the kitchen. She was cleaning, as usual. She seemed pleased to have allowed us to celebrate the new year despite Samira's opposition, but there was also sadness in her eyes because the three eldest girls hadn't participated in the celebration. When I entered the kitchen, she was surprised. Why are you getting up so early? She asked when she saw me. Go back to rest, I'll wake you up when breakfast is ready. No, I replied, I can't sleep. I'd rather go see my animals. I opened the door leading to the garden and went outside to take care of my animals until I heard loud voices in the kitchen between my mother and my father. My mother was reproaching him for showing weakness in front of his daughters. Instead of facing the situation with courage and spending New Year's Eve together as usual, he had chosen to run away and spend the evening outside, like a coward, to avoid confronting his daughter who was trying to impose her rules in the house. My father couldn't bear this honesty. Feeling guilty, he decided to shout, insulted my mother with all sorts of names, and then stormed out, slamming the door. Shortly after, seeing my father's friend's car parking on the street, I ran to open the gate before he rang the bell, but I was intercepted by Samira, who had seen him from her bedroom window and ordered me to tell him that our father wasn't there. Without fully understanding, I went to carry out this task. As soon as he saw me, our friend embraced me and asked for my assistance in carrying the gifts he had brought for the new year. When I informed him that my father wasn't at home, he smiled. I didn't come to see your father, I spent the entire night with him. I came to see all of you. Not knowing what else to say, I joined him in taking the gifts, and we entered the house. He rapped on the garden door with rhythmic knocks while singing. Happy New Year 1977 to my dearest friends in this world. However, there was no response. He turned to me, appearing perplexed. Is there no one home? Yes, I replied, everyone is here except my father. Thus, he continued knocking with increasing force until we heard Samira's voice from behind the door. Return to your home, you have no business left here. Do not return to this house to sully it, you devil. Depart from us and our father and permit us to live on the righteous path of Allah. My father's friend was visibly surprised. What is happening here? He exclaimed, turning to me. I struggled to find words to say to him. I observed his countenance grow serious. He arranged the gifts in front of the door and bade me farewell with a hug, stating, send my regards to your mother. He then drove away without looking back. A few minutes later, Samira came out, her head covered with a veil and her body wrapped in a sort of cloak to conceal her form, leaving only her face and hands visible. I didn't recognize her immediately. I had never seen such a tire in my life. I was familiar with the traditional Tunisian sefsari that my mother wore when she went out, like many women of her age, but the outfit my sister was wearing was entirely new to me. But what shocked me the most was seeing my sister, in a state of anger, demolishing and breaking the gifts that my father's friend had brought. We don't need gifts from a demon. She shouted. We don't need gifts from an impure man. Afterward, she collected everything in a trash bag and told me to throw it away. Terrified, I complied without questioning. 
I was shocked, but I couldn't do anything about it. I returned home with my head down. I looked for my mother, but she had locked herself in her room and didn't want to see anyone. As for my siblings, they were in the kitchen having breakfast. Samira called me to eat as if nothing had happened, and I sat at the table without saying a word. No one spoke. The tension was palpable. When my father came back, my second sister rushed to the hallway to talk to him. We don't want to see your friend or any of your friends coming to our house from now on. Do you forget that you have daughters and that you should protect them? Exactly, my daughter, I wanted to tell them. It's just that I didn't find the time to do so. No need, I did it for you. Your best friend just came by, and I sent him away. This way, he'll tell the others, and you just have to confirm it for them. No problem, so be it. Dad, did you understand what we talked about the other day? Yes, of course, my daughter, and I'm making efforts. What efforts? Yesterday, you left in the evening and only came back in the morning. You know, my daughter, the devil tempts me. Pray to Allah to help me. You need to want it, Allah doesn't change people who don't want to change. May Allah help me to be in his service. Where is your mother? She's in her room. My father went into the room and closed the door. Apparently, he was trying to calm things down with my mother. Indeed, she came out to prepare lunch, and we all had lunch together. But the atmosphere remained tense. After lunch, my sisters wanted to help my mother with the housework, but she sent them away, and they returned to their room to pray the midday prayer together. The afternoon passed quietly until around 4 p.m. Samira called my younger brother and me into their room. Are you ready to do something that will bring a lot of pleasure to Allah? What for? I asked cautiously, not quite understanding her intentions. Do you not trust me? I do. I just want to know precisely what you're planning. It's not me who wants this, it's Allah. What exactly does he want from me, Allah? Not just from you, but from all of us. And if you want to please Allah, you must join us in what we're about to do to make him pleased with us. What are you planning to do? Well, let me explain. Islam triumphed only after our beloved Prophet decided to conquer Mecca and destroy the idols around the Kaaba. That purified Allah's house. So, we're going to name this New Year's Day, the Day of Statue Demolition, and we'll purify our house to make it a clean and sacred space for Allah alone. You'll light a large fire. Creating a fire in the garden sounded harmless to me. It was like a simple child's play. My younger brother and I collected branches and papers, and I ignited the fire while shouting in excitement, not realizing what was about to happen. Then my sisters emerged, carrying suitcases full of clothes. Samira proclaimed that these were Satan's garments, and she began to burn them, one by one. Allah is great. The truth has come, and evil has departed. She cried out. Among these clothes were the ones the American guest had gifted the previous year. After the clothes, it was the turn of their makeup kit and everything that enhances a woman's beauty. They then proceeded to burn paintings that Samira herself had created. She, who adored drawing and painting so passionately. My mother observed everything in silence from the kitchen window. As for my father, he didn't intervene. These were their personal affairs that the girls were discarding, so he saw no reason to interfere. But once the purging began, it didn't stop there. After burning all these items that contradicted Islamic principles, Samira instructed me to gather all the bottles of wine, whether full or empty, along with the wine glasses in the kitchen, and even the corkscrew. My younger brother and I went about her request. In the kitchen, my mother interjected. Do not touch anything before asking your father's permission. He didn't object, and he even accompanied us to hand over everything. We began smashing these items with stones, while my second sister chanted Islamist slogans. When she noticed that my father was silently observing this destruction without any opposition, 
she grinned. The good has arrived, and the evil has departed, she declared triumphantly. Glory to Almighty Allah. Anyway, it's over. My father muttered. I won't consume this filth anymore, may Allah aid me in following the righteous path. Starting today, I'll start praying. It was a somewhat unique scene, but I genuinely felt a sense of satisfaction. I believed that a new chapter had been initiated, and from that New Year's Day of 1977, I anticipated that our family would step into a happier phase. My second sister didn't stop there. She went into the house to remove the paintings and family photos that adorned the walls of the rooms and the hallway. She explained that angels don't enter a house where there are pictures. She clarified that creating portraits and taking photos is forbidden in Islam because it amounts to attempting to imitate the all-powerful Allah. The person who takes a photo or draws a living being, be it an animal or a human, will be commanded by Allah, on the Day of Judgment, to give life to this representation. If they fail, they will be cast into hell. My sisters were also avid about drawing at school, particularly portraits. They possessed beautiful drawings. They cast these into the fire while seeking forgiveness from Allah. Upon seeing them beginning to burn the photos, my father's face turned pale. However, my sister's explanation about Allah's punishment for photographers and artists intensified his trepidation. All right, he declared. Starting today, I won't capture anyone's image anymore. It's finished. I hope Allah forgives me for all the wrongs I've committed. My sister cast him a stern look. To demonstrate to Allah that you're remorseful and for him to pardon you, you must burn all the photos you've taken, she said unwavering. Photography was my father's preferred hobby. He had carried a camera since his youth. He photographed us almost every day and took pictures at every place he visited, especially on special occasions. Over nearly 30 years, he amassed tens of thousands of photos along with their negatives. He even had daguerreotypes, very old glass negatives, because in addition to taking his own photos, he collected photos dating back to the early century. He also possessed a significant number of photos featuring Borguiba, captured during the independence events. The sheer quantity of photos my father had amassed was almost unimaginable. In the hallway, two sizable closets stood, each boasting at least six shelves packed with photo albums, prints, and negatives. A collection of immeasurable historical value. I observed my father accompanying my sister to retrieve all these photos and tossing them into the fire while echoing the same slogans. The glass negatives shattered due to the heat. Everything was consumed by the flames until nothing remained, and the closets were entirely empty. Twenty years later, I discovered that my mother had secretly stashed three sets of photos under her bed. Subsequently, she removed them from our home without anyone's knowledge and concealed them at her sister's house in the Tunis Old City. When she informed me about their existence, I collected them to preserve them with me. Regrettably, two sets were lost, but I still have one today, containing glimpses of hundreds of photos. Samira burned everything conflicting with Allah's law, including books. My sisters were enthusiastic readers of novels, and on that day, hundreds of books were consigned to the flames in the name of Allah. Except for the Quran, study books, and those pertaining to Islam that my sister had brought into our home, nothing survived. This process persisted for hours, concluding at sunset. It seemed never-ending. I remember that day as the longest in my life. The cyclone of the Islamic revolution had just swept through our family home. After that day, nothing was the same. What had just happened in our home mirrored what occurred in the time of Muhammad in thousands of families. Destroying anything that contradicts Islam, regardless of its historical, emotional, or cultural significance, erasing the past completely to construct a new history. Annihilating identities to forge a single and unified Islamic identity. I understood all of this much later from books about Islamic history. I then fully grasped historical events through what my family had experienced. 
we had suddenly transitioned from a traditional and tolerant Islam that was passed down through generations to an extremist Islam that respects nothing, that condemns and destroys everything in its path. Before, in our family, only my mother prayed, and she was the only one who covered herself in traditional clothing. Despite this, we never saw any signs of extremism. Quite the opposite, she was tolerant, never forced my sisters to wear such clothing, and didn't impose prayer on any of us. For her, everyone was free and responsible for themselves. She had instilled this spirit of tolerance and love in us from a young age. Nobody doubted her Islamic faith or sincerity until Islamism entered our family, the aggressive, violent Islam of its beginnings, the Islam of hatred and submission that coerces others to follow it by destroying and burning anything that contradicts it. After that day, my mother became the non-believer in the family. She lost her authority, and my father seized the opportunity. Gradually, he raised his voice, positioned himself as the rectifier of wrongs, and began monitoring his wife's every move. Through my sister's influence, he assumed the role of the leader he had secretly dreamed of being. My mother's autonomy diminished. Soon, she couldn't make any decisions without her husband's consent. Raising the children, managing the household, selecting meals, expenses, all required the approval of the master. After her romantic disappointment, this was her second, devastating failure. Her children no longer supported her, except reluctantly, fearing my sister's anger, who had become the household's representative of God. The unhealthy marital climate that prevailed had weakened us. As impressionable children, we lacked critical thinking. Extremism had infiltrated our family. My sisters also decided to wear the Islamic attire, known as Zai Islami. My second sister began teaching us how to pray. She talked about it as if it were a financial balance sheet, the more prayers you accumulate in a day, the higher your chances of gaining paradise. According to her, what distinguished a Muslim from a non-believer was the frequency of prayers. So, now everyone had to submit and perform as many daily prayers as possible to please the Almighty Allah. I, too, got caught up in the cycle. I started praying, just like the others. Family life amidst Islamic dictatorship. The maneuver of my sister had succeeded perfectly. She was now imposing all her wishes through the intermediary of paternal authority. This system boosted my father's self-esteem, he believed he was acting as a true Muslim by disciplining us at the slightest deviation. Deep down, his religiosity was driven by self-interest. My siblings and I lived in fear. Samira kept a close watch on us, intervening whenever anyone did or said anything. If we lied, didn't pray, or didn't strictly follow Allah's will, we would burn in the flames of hell. Like everyone else, I was terrified. My heart leaned towards the idea that she was mistaken, but my adolescent reasoning advised me to obey her orders to avoid the worst. Despite my young age, I clearly sensed the irreversible fracture she had caused within the family. The house now resembled a prison-like environment, with walls and furniture laden with the darkness of our relationships. Previously, Sundays were dedicated to the beach or the viewpoint for a change of scenery and fun. But that had changed, the day of rest had become Allah's day. On that day, my sister would take us to the mosque for lessons on Halakha, the Islamic legislation, equivalent to Christian catechism. There, the religious teachers instructed us on how a Muslim should behave. In reality, the topics covered contained the seeds of extremism. This education aimed to shape the new generation that would soon confront the traitors, Muslims westernized in their ways, and the conspirators, in plain terms, the westerners. All of this was done in subtle increments. Remaining true to her combative spirit, my mother battled against her husband's despotism. She also stood up fiercely to sweep away the extremist wave initiated by my sister. Where was she drawing such strength from after enduring so many humiliations? Let the women suffering in the shadows of tyrannical husbands look at her and follow her example. Unfortunately, her attempts remained fruitless. Her own mother, her sole support, 
was no longer there. Her isolation was too great. The family was sinking into the quagmire of Inquisition. Times had changed. After the winter holidays, my second sister announced to my parents that she had met the man of her life at university and wished to get married. She described him as an exceptional person, both brilliant and kind-hearted, who had deeply contemplated the history of the country. He harbored grand plans for the future of Islam. His study of sacred texts had infused him with a profound sense of religion. Furthermore, his expertise in economics enabled him to fuse religion with the realities of the modern world. He aligned with the Islamic movement and advocated religious revolution as the only conceivable solution to lift North Africa out of its troubles. My sister had met this exceptional man during feminist gatherings held on the university campus. Initially, when she converted to Islamism, she hadn't envisioned the political dimension that a certain extremist elite would bring to the women's movement. At first, the women's movement coalition aimed to combat the objectification of women perpetuated by Western ideology. It was a pseudo-feminist movement, akin to those that had emerged in European countries in the early 1960s. The founders of this line of thought were distinguished by their high level of education. Mistakenly, they saw a return to Islamic values as a means to restore women's dignity. Encouraging the wearing of the veil and traditional attire was, above all, a political act. The aim was to eradicate the image of women as mere sexual objects and establish recognition as fully-fledged individuals. Religion served feminism. But this movement was gradually infiltrated by religious extremists. Ironically, this political feminism succumbed to religious fanaticism due to male influence. This man, Sulla Carker, changed her life and that of our family for the worse. It's likely that he took the initiative to meet my sister, who was noted by all for her vivacity and enthusiasm. This alliance fit well with his strategy. When my mother learned about her future son-in-law's affiliation with the Islamist movement, she tried to convince her daughter to reconsider the marriage. If you marry him, you'll ruin your life, just as you've already begun to do. He will confine you to his home. You'll be subjected to his will until the end of your life. Open your eyes, my daughter. There's still time to back out. I fought for you to become a free and independent woman. How can you allow yourself to be deceived like this? My child, you're meant for love and to bring happiness to your children. Please give up this marriage. Otherwise, you'll experience eternal torment. Mama, I am a fulfilled woman. I know where to find my happiness. Samira retorted. Allah has entrusted me with a mission. If I don't fulfill it, my life will have no meaning. May God protect you, my child, that's all I can say. I don't want to impose anything on you, as was done to me. But I hope you'll find your path before it's too late. I imagine my mother must have retreated to her room after that and cried for hours in the face of the resounding failure that had struck her dearest loved ones. I remember distinctly the impression that my future brother-in-law left on me when he came to introduce himself to us. At first, I didn't see him well because he stood back behind my sister, like a raptor that knows patience guarantees a royal feast. He was of short stature, well-built, with a sparse beard. The thin, withdrawn line of his lips suggested the dryness of his soul. His broad forehead sweated, wetting the roots of his hair. His gaze contained an opaque strength, something tenacious that mixed iron and reed. When he looked at me, his eyebrows seemed to move very slowly, like a spider's legs. To greet me, he crushed my hand in a way I will never forget. After the customary pleasantries, he poured himself another cup of tea, chatting about various topics, entirely at ease. Do you want to marry our daughter? My mother addressed him. Yes, indeed, he replied. I wish to be her husband. I am confident I will make her happy. Based on what my daughter told me, you're an Islamist and a revolutionary. My mother continued. The latter word is a bit strong. I am indeed a devout practitioner, proud of my religion, just like you. 
I am also studying economics because I want to contribute to my country's development. I find that my daughter has changed a lot recently. Her practice of religion certainly doesn't match mine. I don't share her ideas. Your daughter is an admirable person. Now that I know you, I realize this even more. Your daughter is brave. In her everyday work, she defends the rights of women, which are unfortunately often violated in our country. I will do everything to protect her, as prescribed in Islam. I don't know how to believe you. I want my daughter to continue her studies and be able to freely pursue the career she chooses, my mother said. The man nodded his head for a prolonged period, seemingly to emphasize his response. Of course. That's also my view of modern life. I am in favor of gender equality. If your daughter wishes to have a profession after her studies, she will be free to choose. Enough with your questions. My father said. This man is a devout Muslim, a serious student, destined for a great career. Let them get married. That's my decision. The prospective groom was eager to celebrate the marriage. After obtaining my father's initial approval, he returned a week later with his parents for an official agreement and to set the wedding date. According to him, there was no reason to wait. If everyone agreed, the sooner the better. Long engagements were part of the negative traditions that needed to be changed to better align with the Islam transmitted by the Prophet. My father wasn't opposed to it. They settled on a wedding date two months before the end of the academic year, during the spring break, allowing time to prepare everything. In reality, the future groom had been meticulously brainwashing my sister for several months. She was now devoted to him body and soul, deprived of all critical thinking and freedom of expression. Through her future husband's coercive efforts, Islamist propaganda had become her sole interest. Worse, a genuine obsession. When it came to instilling a political message within our family, he never appeared in person. For that purpose, he systematically used my sister's voice. She took the forefront, thus adopting the image of an extremist zealot. In this context, his psychological destabilization method was inspired by the most sophisticated techniques. This is how Sulla Karkar became the true master of the house. He visited our home regularly. He clung to our walls and minds like a leech. Protected by my father, he controlled our days with the systematic cooperation of his future wife. A climate of suspicion settled in the house. Everyone watched and distrusted one another. As for me, I remained suspended in my dreams, there was always a part of my mind wandering in some remote region of the universe. But his arrival made my skin crawl. I expected the worst. What kind of moral torments would he subject us to this time? He always put on a friendly demeanor to talk to us, as if we were innocent lambs, but his rhetoric revealed his true intentions. His lessons on the Quran, the interpretation of Muhammad's words, the history of Muslim civilization, all converged toward the same goal, to prove that only the Islamist religion could save humanity and to instill in us a hatred of the West. His project aimed to transform us into obedient soldiers of the war machine planned for the upcoming Islamist crusade. Our strong religious passion would become even stronger and more persistent, as he had sown these deadly poisons in our hearts beforehand, the sense of persecution and the spirit of revenge. Every time my future brother-in-law came to the house, he observed everything, and before leaving, he gave instructions to my sister on what she should do. I noticed that each time he visited, my sister would lecture us on morality and issue orders. I also recall that, under the pretext of preparing the house for her marriage, she changed all the curtains in the house, as well as the covers of the benches and cushions. No one paid much attention to this act, which seemed to be well-intentioned, but I realized later that it was simply because the house's furnishings featured colors and patterns, something abhorred by Islam. Sulla Karkar must have noticed this, and he tasked Samira with rectifying it. She replaced everything with plain fabric in a single color. Afterward, the house seemed even more drab, lacking color and life. 
My mother, even though she disagreed with this marriage, was pleased that her second daughter was getting married. After all, it was her choice. Like any mother preparing her daughter's wedding, she suggested embroidery designs for Samira's bedroom and pillow, as is customary. However, my sister stated that it wasn't necessary and she didn't want it. To her, all of that was just a waste of time and money. Having a husband who was a true believer was enough for her. With her love for Allah, she could sleep and eat anywhere. The most important thing was that Allah was pleased with her, because life is transient and the true life is with him. My mother was deeply hurt by not being able to participate in preparing her daughter's wedding. But she still held hope that things would improve with time, and she encouraged us to do everything we could to succeed in our studies, which, in her view, was the main path to living freely and independently. She outwardly appeared to step back to allow us to study without too much disruption. In the worst-case scenario, when Samira was married and had left the house, she would regain control and set things right. Losing a daughter was preferable to losing all her children. However, this reasoning was in vain, as my sister's fiancé took charge in the meantime of the romantic relationships of my two other sisters who were reaching marriageable age. Trustworthy husbands had to be found for them, faithful to the teachings of the Prophet. He even went so far as to compile a list of my sister's preferences and expectations, creating a sort of composite portrait of the man each one dreamed of marrying. In this way, he introduced a career military man to my third sister and a bookseller involved with the El Marifa newspaper, the first Tunisian Islamist newspaper published by MTI, to the fourth sister. Both engagements were swiftly concluded. My father, whose foolishness continued to grow, accepted their engagements and, to celebrate the happy occasion, decided to slaughter the rooster for which I had great affection. I pleaded with him to spare the animal's life, but he paid no heed and carried out the deed in front of my tearful eyes. My mother was beginning to lose hope that her three daughters would be more liberated than she was. Despite that, she tried in every way to ease the atmosphere. But my second sister gave her no chance, she was always behind her. The family space had transformed into a sort of prison where no one could express their viewpoint. Only the word of Allah was meant to be heard, nothing else. My second sister's wedding took place in April 1977. The Islamist regime didn't allow music or traditional extravagance, so the ceremony unfolded in immeasurable sadness. Women were separated from men, and the bride was covered from head to toe. It resembled more of a funeral. Taking photos was prohibited, as was the three-day, three-night ceremony that is customary in Tunisia, since it wasn't part of Islam, it went against Islam. Everything happened in a single afternoon, the time it took for the bride and groom to stand before an imam friendly to my future brother-in-law and read a bit of the Quran, and the wedding was over. There was a meal, a couscous made with the sheep's meat that my father had slaughtered, and then everyone returned home, including the newlyweds. My sister moved in with her husband not far from us. They had settled in a modest, discreet house in line with Islamist conduct, where luxury was prohibited, nothing free there either. And it only took a few steps for my sister to cross our threshold and continue her undermining work. After Samira left home, my mother believed she could regain control of the family. Unfortunately, it only lasted a few days. She returned to visit us almost every day, closely monitoring whether we were observing true Islam. Our house had become a stopping point on her tours to spread Allah's word. Sometimes, she invited sisters in Islam from the neighborhood to our house to discuss and spread Allah's message around her. Worried about her neglecting her studies, one day my mother expressed her thoughts to her sister. Do you have nothing else to do but go door to door? Focus on your studies, it would be better for your future. You never know, with a husband like yours, you might find yourself alone one day. This enraged her sister. And what will I do with my studies? Find a job. Studies are a waste of time for a woman who must establish a household and raise her children according to the principles of Islam. 
what I've studied is enough for me to raise my children well, and what I'm doing now will serve me after my death. Continuing my studies would be of no use to me. When Allah asks me what I've done for him in this life, do you think he will ask for my diplomas? My mother was left astounded, wondering if she truly had her daughter in front of her, the one she had raised to be a rational and educated woman. The soothing words her husband had spoken were nothing but a web of lies. Driven by him, she had dropped out of her studies without her parents' knowledge. She now spent her days spreading Allah's word among her neighbors. Not long ago, she had been a brilliant student, and now she was embarking on a career as a speaker while her husband continued his university education. My recruitment Amidst the turmoil, I grew tougher. Faced with the harshness of reality, dreams became my sanctuary. Often, I would try to imagine Allah. One day, during an Arabic class, the teacher asked each student what they wanted to become in the future. Some wanted to become doctors, soldiers, or police officers, while others aspired to be architects. When it was my turn to express myself, I blurted out without thinking that I wanted to become like Allah. A dreadful silence descended, and all eyes turned toward me. Petrified, I saw the teacher turn red, his eyes flashing with anger. What? He shouted angrily. What do you aspire to become? Out of fear, I changed my answer and stated that I wanted to become closer to Allah. You, close to Allah? He exclaimed mockingly. Yes. Well, first learn to use your mind and think. After that, you can ask to be close to Allah. Because Allah will never accept a fool like you near him. Those words stung me. From that day on, I resolved to change. No more childhood dreams, no more wasting time. I had to do everything to prove to Allah that I wasn't the fool they thought I was. And the most apparent way to get closer to Allah seemed to be completely submitting myself to whatever my sister and her husband would command. They had to be the closest to Allah. So, I would do everything they told me without questioning. I can confidently say today that I left my childhood behind forever to enter this other world that was supposed to bring me closer to Allah. By the end of the school year in 1977, I was starting to lose my footing. Studies didn't excite me. My past was like a long sleep filled with visions, my present resembled hell, and the future only offered me hazy and tedious prospects. The only silver lining of that year was that I moved on to the next grade, normal for a repeater. In fact, I just managed to advance to the sixth grade class. However, since I had passed, Sulla Carker took an interest in me and encouraged me to continue my studies, the more I learned, the better I could serve the Islamist cause and fight the enemy. The family around me was tearing apart. Disheartened, my mother began to let go. My father had acquired a new tool to turn his children against her, aware of our family's dire situation, he turned a blind eye. He no longer paid attention to their studies, allowing them to pursue other activities. Through this thoughtless tactic, he bolstered his control over them. The role of an uncontested leader was evidently satisfying. Amidst this chaos, only my older sister managed to stand out. She had successfully completed her teacher training exams and would assume her first position in the upcoming term. The start of the summer of 1977 was rather bleak. We were barred from swimming. My younger brother and I were obligated to attend a Quranic school each morning, followed by mosque prayers. On my eleventh birthday, my second sister prohibited celebrating it, claiming it was a distinctly European custom unworthy of adopting. During that summer, her husband frequented our home. The process of psychological destabilization accelerated. He asserted that Bourguiba was subservient to France and other Western nations. Consequently, he was unable to liberate the people from neo-colonial enslavement. Though he may have been accurate on certain points, his arguments were intentionally exaggerated, distorting reality and, as a result, molding my impressionable mind. With the incessant repetition of this discourse, it began to infiltrate my subconscious. 
His words immersed me in the imagery of jihad, the holy war, arousing a morbid fascination within me and convincing me that Westerners relentlessly sought to demean Muslims, subjugate them, and plunder their possessions. Today, this indoctrination leads me back to my grandmother's sagacity. Monsters like jinns and devils, Omi Zora, do they exist? The only monster in this world, my child, is the one who walks on two legs. During the summer, my older sister's husband invited my older brother and me to spend three weeks at a military-run summer camp near Bizerta, in northern Tunisia. This allowed us to escape the clutches of the infernal couple. In Bizerta, we stayed in a barracks close to the sea. While my brother was interested in barracks life, I fully enjoyed the sea air. Finally, I understood what freedom meant. This revelation imprinted deep within me, probably even saving me a few years later. I loved this feeling so much that I forgot about the burden of prayer. However, almost as if by design, our surroundings bore all the signs of the impending war, rifles, machine guns, fighter jets, combat boats, all this warlike gear also left an impression on my subconscious. Feelings of freedom and visions of war coexisted within me throughout those weeks, blending exaltation with fear. Back in Ariana, the fundamentalist beasts pounced on me once again, stoking my guilt for having breathed freedom and abandoned prayers, especially when my second sister had warned so much about this danger before our departure. With the start of the 1977-1978 school year, my academic performance appeared mediocre. I had to go to Samira's house every evening for private lessons. These lessons covered the school curriculum as well as Islam and the behavior of a good Muslim. She emphasized the religious content most, even though I was in my last year of primary school before moving on to middle school. She kept repeating that it was the only thing one took with them after death. She linked everything to death, the day of judgment, and eternal life, rather than encouraging my studies. As for my older brother, he was indirectly advised by my father to enter a military secondary school. My second sister's husband was knowledgeable in the art of warfare. The plan was simple, infiltrate henchmen into strategic sectors of the country, the military, the media, etc. Recruit followers who would spread Islamist propaganda to all neighborhoods to incite a genuine popular uprising. This didn't only apply to our family. Thousands of others across Tunisia underwent similar fates to varying degrees. Many Tunisians who were adolescents in the 1970s will recognize themselves in this narrative. In any case, my disinterest in studies deepened to a critical point. Between my father's boorishness and the moral sedition imposed by my brother-in-law, the chances of renewal seemed non-existent. With my mother's increasing withdrawal, as she was more and more belittled and humiliated, my sister took her place, and I could no longer rely on any dependable shoulder. Feeling harassed from all sides, I retreated within myself once again to immerse in dreams, my life buoy. In the face of family turmoil and prevailing tyranny, this allowed me to survive. I fashioned my own world with rules and laws of my own. In my delirium, I even devised a secret language, creating an alphabet using symbols of which only I held the key. I also focused on the history of Islam, which my sister compelled me to recite. I developed a passion for its great adventurers, especially Ibn Battuta, whose thrilling life kindled in me a love for travel, far from the situation I was living. You must succeed in your studies at all costs to become a commercial pilot, one day my third sister reiterated. You'll have a lot of money, and you can serve the cause of Islam. I'll do it like Ibn Battuta, I retorted. He wasn't a pilot, he wasn't rich, he wasn't studious, yet he traveled all around the world. In such a mindset, my poor academic performance worsened. My father openly mocked me. He said, if you don't pass this year, I'll throw a big celebration for your repetition. Tortured internally, I didn't express my suffering, letting the forces within me marinate, which would later come to consume my revenge on the adult world. The December 1977 holiday was even sadder than the previous year, but this year was going to be more eventful. 
Sulla Karkar began organizing secret meetings at our house with other Islamist members under the pretext that his own house was being watched by undercover police. He came in the afternoon with my sister, and other people would discreetly arrive at our house. At nightfall, the meeting would begin. They reported on their activities, devised action plans, and assigned tasks. They stayed until late at night, discussing what each person should do, then left the house in small groups. The meetings became regular, and the number of participants grew. My mother was very upset about it, she struggled with this intrusion into our home. But she couldn't do anything. You see that house? You count up to the tenth house, you knock on the door, and you ask for Sheikh Abdel Fattah. As soon as he says, yes, this is Abdel Fattah, you tell him that I send my regards, and you give him this paper. No problem. He walked away, and I did as he had asked. When I reached the tenth door, I knocked. A young unveiled woman opened the door. I was surprised and thought I had mistaken the house. I almost left, but the young woman held me back with a smile. Are you looking for someone? I want to see Sheikh Abdel Fattah. As soon as I mentioned that name, a man appeared at the doorframe. Yes, it's me. Come in, my son, you're in the right house. I'm here on behalf of Sulla Karkar, who sends his regards. I gave him the paper, which he read and promptly tore apart. Come in and have something to drink, he said with a smile. I didn't dare accept. I thanked him politely and returned to my brother-in-law. I was only twelve years old when I started carrying out these missions. Honestly, at that time, I was truly beginning to believe what my second sister and her husband were saying. It can be said that I was actively involved in the Islamist cause daily. Samira or her husband would ask me for information about the students and their parents. My sister had told me, when a teacher wants to summon your parents, don't tell mom, tell me instead. Thus, she attended parent-teacher meetings in my mother's place, forging friendships with the mothers of students she was trying to bring into the fold of the Islamic cause. Our house had become a real den of Islamists, with Sulla Karkar being the only master. When there was a major meeting at the house, would count the number of shoes in front of the main living room door to know how many people we needed to prepare dinner for. Sometimes, there would be up to a hundred people. The meetings happened about three times per week, to the extent that our house was nicknamed the House of Al-Arkham Ibn Abi Al-Arkham, a reference to the one where Muhammad and the early Muslims secretly gathered for three years before making Islam public. Why had Islam been kept secret for all that time? This point wasn't clear in my mind. Today, I no longer question it. Based on my experience, movements that operate in secrecy for a period are either terrorist, sectarian, or mafia-related. This point and many others show that Islam is a sectarian political ideology before it is a religion. Its primary goal is power, even if it emphasizes faith. Studying Islam and its history is enough to understand that it's inseparable from Islamism. Same tactics, same strategy. My brother-in-law, like Islamists in general, used the same methods as Muhammad to spread Islamism. My older brother was studying at the military school, so we saw him rarely. After the weddings of my third and fourth sisters in April and July 1978, there were only four of us children left at home, my two younger brothers, me, and my fifth and youngest sister Samia, who was two years older than me in turning sixteen. One day, Samira announced that they had found a suitable Muslim husband for her, a fighter pilot in the military. It was Saeed Firjani, the future shadow man of Inadida. Fortunately, this attempt failed as Samia was still very young. In June 1978, despite the evening classes taught by my second sister, my very poor grades didn't allow me to advance to the next grade. I had to repeat my last year of primary school. It was normal for me to repeat because I was constantly on missions. My mind wasn't focused on studies, I was busy running errands for my sister and brother-in-law. The house became their preferred meeting place, along with their Islamist friends. 
The veranda was transformed into a feverish room for political and religious meetings, filled with hatred for the West. My two sisters who had recently married decided to quit their studies and stay at home. My mother couldn't take it anymore. She had already left the marital home several times. Seeing that the situation was deteriorating, her authority wasn't respected anymore, and all she had done to educate and empower her daughters had gone down the drain, she decided to leave for good. Torn, she held me tight in her arms, sobbing. Listen to me, my son. Don't give up on your studies. Persevere, and heaven will reward you. I had just turned twelve. I tried in vain to wipe away her tears. I had never seen her cry like this before. Once she found refuge with her family, she let my father know that she wanted a divorce, but he refused. She stayed away from us for over a month. However, as the 1978 to 1979 school year approached, she returned to the family home, concerned about protecting the remaining brood. But her return was as fleeting as a lightning flash, as the house had fallen under the control of Sulla Karkar and Samira. Our home had turned into a meeting center and now resembled a bustling fairground. The veranda was weighed down by rows of kneeling bodies. The number of participants in the Islamist meetings organized by my brother-in-law had grown to around 300. People came and went day and night, it looked like a political party headquarters. She found the courage to joke. They're not Muslims, she said, they're Musramin. Which meant zombies, people without heads or tails. My poor mother. Driven away from her own home, returning because of her guilt, leaving again defenseless, tossed between mountains of despair and remorse. She had become a sort of living dead in the house. She couldn't bear to leave us alone, always holding on to the hope of saving us from these leeches that were bleeding our family. For her, saving even one of us would have been worth it. She never gave up, she spoke her mind whenever she had the chance, confronting my sister time and time again. I remember her mocking my sister about her Islamic veil. My sister would respond that her own Sefsari had nothing to do with the true Islam of Muhammad's time. Why? My mother retorted. Were you there with him to see how women dressed in his time? The attire I'm wearing is described in history books. You wouldn't know since you can't even read Arabic. Oh really? Well, the attire I'm wearing, I inherited it from my mother, and all Tunisian women inherited it from their mothers. I keep it out of tradition, even though Borguiba asked women to remove it. Don't talk about Borguiba, that enemy of Allah and Islam. This guy shouldn't govern a Muslim country, he's a Kafir, non-believer, a murtad, apostate, a traitor. He should die for all the harm he's done to Tunisia. Knowing that the discussion wouldn't end if my sister got agitated, my mother shrugged and resumed her activity, lamenting softly. My poor daughter. She's talking nonsense. She doesn't even know what she's saying. She's just repeating what she's been told. Poor thing, she's lost her mind to the point of parroting words that have been put into her head. My sister, rolling her eyes, would walk into another room, leaving my mother to talk to herself. Sulla Karkar's hatred for Borguiba had no bounds. In every meeting, he disparaged and insulted him whenever he got the chance, calling him an apostate, a traitor, a Zionist Jew, and so on. The Tunisian mentality is generally favorable to foreign support, but according to him, they should only deal with Arab Muslim countries, any other alliance was considered a betrayal. The Politics of Bourguiba Indeed, Habib Bourguiba was captivated by the West due to his French education. A lawyer trained in the 1920s, upon his return to Tunisia, he engaged in the nationalist milieu comprised of three groups, the Islamists guided by the sheikhs of Zidouna and the imams, the pro-Arab factions led by the Eastern Arab nationalists, and the left led by the workers' syndicate. All these groups advocated for Tunisia's military and, most importantly, cultural independence, while the Bey in his circle, the Francophones, the wealthy, and the intellectuals were in favor of the French protectorate. 
In 1934, at the age of 31, Bourguiba established the Neo Destour. This movement for Tunisia's military independence, however, considered France as the model to follow. Given its alignment with the West, Tunisia would be counted among the developed countries. To achieve this, French interests needed to be managed, and an independent Tunisia had to be presented as a reliable ally of Europe. However, these values also needed to be tailored to Tunisian society and account for the composition of the Tunisian population, which could only be accomplished with a territorial military force. Bourguiba's nationalist approach introduced something novel. The concept of achieving military independence without causing economic and cultural ruptures united both the affluent and the intellectuals, including modernists and nationalists. Bourguiba convinced the French political establishment of his vision, secured Tunisia's independence on March 20, 1956, and became the leader of the entire Tunisian population. A unity that France had failed to achieve since its protectorate in 1881. According to Bourguiba, what hindered Tunisia from reaching the level of so-called civilized nations was its archaic form of Islam. The significance of Quranic schools needed to be diminished and efforts needed to be made for Western-style education. After gaining independence, the emphasis shifted towards developing the education system. The budget allocated to national education continued to grow, reaching 32% by 1976. Education became public, free, and compulsory, including for girls. During the French protectorate era, education, on par with the French standards, was accessible primarily to the upper urban classes. Bourguiba extended it to the entire territory, acknowledging the rural population component. Furthermore, he integrated Islamic education into the national education system, modernizing it and reducing the influence of Quranic schools. The modern constitution he established eliminated the confusion between Islamic and civil laws. He put an end to the influence of religious figures on the judiciary by implementing courses in civil law. In 1958, Arabic education at Zidouna University was integrated into the bilingual education system. He prohibited polygamy and advocated for gender equality. He discouraged women from wearing the sefsari and banned it in the public administration. Women became eligible to vote and stand for office as early as 1957, an unprecedented development in the Muslim world. Except in Turkey. Tunisian women still take immense pride in these advancements to this day. Lastly, rebelling against backward mentalities, archaic behaviors, and inherited flaws from the past that contributed to the misery, he challenged one of the most sensitive aspects of religious practice in the Islamic world fasting during Ramadan. On February 5, 1960, three weeks before the sacred month, in a speech to the members of the neo Destur, the ruling party at that time, he invoked the right to interpret the Quran, reminding his astonished listeners that the Prophet had eaten during Ramadan to combat the adversary, I also tell you not to observe fasting in order to confront your enemy, which is poverty, destitution, humiliation, decadence, and underdevelopment. At a time when we are doing the impossible to increase production, how can we resign ourselves to seeing it collapse for a whole month, dropping to a value close to zero? Whether you are in the military, civil service, or students, I demand that you not neglect your duty. Administrative and school schedules will no longer be adjusted based on Ramadan. I am merely interpreting the message of the Quran. I declare that this is my personal opinion. If you are not convinced, you are free not to adopt it. Bourguiba claimed his own interpretation of Islam influenced by believing authors favorable to evolution. For him, Muhammad preached to warring tribes. The only thing to borrow from that time was the fight against ignorance and foolishness. Despite protests in favor of Ramadan fasting that erupted on January 17, 1961, Notably in Kerwa where they escalated into bloody clashes, he urged his fellow citizens in February 1961 to abandon fasting to combat underdevelopment. And in March 1964, in the midst of Lent, he drove the point home by ostentatiously drinking a glass of orange juice on television in broad daylight.
Since then, no other Muslim head of state has displayed such audacity to challenge traditions. This policy brought change to Tunisians. My mother considered Bourguiba as the father of modern Tunisia. But this policy infuriated conservatives, Islamists, and pro-Arabs. Especially the scholars of Zidouna saw their religious dominion over the masses weakening. For them, Bourguiba was an enemy of Allah, selling the country to the West, about to destroy the Arab Muslim identity, the root of our people. They forgot that Tunisia's history goes beyond the Arab Muslim period and that this latter era, in fact, disconnected Tunisia from its Amazigh origins and multicultural history, imposing Arab culture and religion on it. Annoyed by the rise of Arab nationalism from Egypt, Bourguiba won this battle by destroying the Sulla ben Youssef movement in Tunisia, which had infiltrated Arabism at the country level. Before the formation of the Arab World Union, he sought progress. For him, the battle was cultural and economic. After education and economic progress, democracy was the third step he reserved for his people. In that sense, it can be conceded that he was a stern father for Tunisia, in other words, a good dictator who led it with a single objective, to make it a sovereign country within its territory and borders. Before the French occupation, Tunisia, although belonging to the Ottoman Empire, was already relatively independent. Minister Karadine Pasha made radical changes in the educational system, opening the country to the West and in favor of Western markets. This led to French colonization. France greatly influenced the Tunisian mindset. It couldn't fully Europeanize it due to fierce opposition from Islamists and the ulama of Zidouna, but the introduction of exact sciences into the university allowed the rise of a few intellectuals. Mohammed Tahar ibn Akur, Tahar Haddad, and others sought a balanced approach in the dual obligation to evolve and preserve cultural identity. The Tunisians themselves willingly adopted certain aspects of European culture, even though Islamists attributed this solely to Bourguiba. What Bourguiba achieved in liberating from religious influence, gender equality, and education cannot be denied. The Western model brought concrete benefits socially and intellectually. The only other Arab Muslim president who dared was Ataturk. What they accomplished in their time would be impossible today as the situation has changed both externally and internally in our countries, but it was the right thing to do then. Today, Tunisia and Turkey are exceptions in the Muslim world. One can criticize their policies, but they are the most advanced countries in terms of their tolerance, open-mindedness, and education level. Tunisia is more advanced socially, Turkey politically, Turkish society has changed little but has strong government institutions. In contrast, the mentality of Tunisians is more advanced, but their government and political class are as fragile as in other Muslim countries. These two nations, which followed the Western model to escape backwardness, thereby exhibit their distinctive character. Given his age, Bourguiba did not witness the economic progress materialize. Tunisia entered this stage after the arrival of Ben Ali. Under his rule, Tunisian society disintegrated. He damaged the education sector by Arabaizing it. We saw censorship take hold and the economy stagnate under the mafia-like control of his associates. State-level corruption, the deterioration of education, social injustice, and a military state eroded the achievements that had been gained. Since democratic principles are scarcely compatible with poverty and ignorance, this led to the abandonment of the democratic project with Ben Ali's 98% victory in the 2009 elections. The announcement of a new mandate in 2014 triggered an uprising that ousted the Ben Ali family. The dire situation they left behind after their escape allowed Islamists to come to power and destroy what little remained of modern Tunisia. The question is whether the Tunisian people were ready to live in freedom at that time. Personally, I don't believe so, not as long as religion took precedence over everything else. The current turmoil of the Tunisian people reminds me of my family's downfall despite all that my mother did to ensure her children's independence, when Islamism is in control, one must brace for the worst, regardless of the proclaimed ethics. In his early days, Muhammad stood for differences and the rights of all, 
but once in power, he turned into a monster. How can we believe that Islamists would do better, even if they claim to stand for tolerance and openness? The Iranian Islamic Revolution At the end of 1978, my first quarter grades were at their lowest, even though I was repeating the school year, but nobody cared anymore. My Islamic activities had intensified to the point where I completely disregarded my studies. My goal was to please Allah. Entering paradise after my death was the only victory I awaited. My mother would leave the house during every argument. We would end up alone, and I had to take care of everything then. I was on the brink of collapse. During the winter vacation, I ran away. One night, I headed towards the coast with a stick and a bundle, just as I had often dreamed of doing. I reached the port of La Goulette, facing the sea. The starlight shimmered on the waves. I spent the night imagining distant shores. When I returned in the morning, with my head down and hungry, my father pounced on me. He didn't even bother to reason with me. As soon as he saw me, he grabbed me like a sheep and began hitting the soles of my feet. He wanted to know where I had gone. Of course, I refused to tell him. While he was hitting me, I clung to the thought of Bilal ibn Rabah, the companion of Muhammad, when he was tortured to renounce Islam. He resisted by repeating, Allah is one, Allah is one. I did the same, repeating in my mind, Allah is one, Allah is one. My father was sitting in a chair, smoking his pipe. He continued like that for hours until my mother came to rescue me from him. Since I hadn't cried, she didn't realize he was hitting me. After that, I couldn't stand on my feet for a week. My hatred towards my father escalated even further. At the beginning of 1979, Sulla Carker gave us a gift, a color television. My brothers and I were very happy with this gift. I was watching television in color for the first time. Before, we had a black and white TV. Since the infiltration of Islamists, Italian channels were forbidden to us. When my older brother came home, he would secretly watch them, and sometimes we would too. With color, it would be a thousand times better. I appreciated this gesture from my brother-in-law, but I quickly understood why he had done it. It was to come every evening with his friends to watch the news about the Islamic Revolution in Iran. So, when the Shah of Iran left the country in early 1979, we were all in the living room shouting, Allah is great, with dozens of other Islamists. The Iranian Islamic Revolution had just triumphed, placing the reins of the country in the hands of Khomeini. From then on, the cry of fundamentalism echoed throughout North Africa. Sulla Karkar, who had gone to Tehran during his economic studies, had witnessed the beginnings of this revolution firsthand. He was very moved and followed every moment of what was happening. For him, this was the example to follow in Tunisia. This atmosphere of uprising, combined with my brother-in-law's proselytizing and family conflicts, heightened the psychological turmoil I was struggling with. This bundle of events was imprinted on my subconscious, making me the prey of all contradictions. For the better, but mostly for the worse. I had finally grasped Sulla Karkar's ambition, to incite a popular uprising against Bourguiba's government. Since the beginning of 1978, his Islamist activity had intensified and become more official. He was part of the leadership of the MTI, the political movement preaching a return to Orthodox Islam in Tunisia. By the end of the 1970s, the Tunisian authorities were turning a blind eye to their activities because they countered the rise of communism in universities. Indeed, for the Islamists, the communists represented the most dangerous faction since they openly declared themselves atheists, worse than Bourguiba, who was, but didn't dare say it publicly, according to my brother-in-law. I now understood his determination. But where did this excessive insistence on implementing Arab Islam in Tunisia come from? To understand this, we need to go back to the origins of the MTI, the Association for the Preservation of the Quran, founded in 1969 by three men. Rajd Ghanouchi, a philosophy professor, led the Al-Ma'arifa magazine and spoke in mosques. 
his sermons were increasingly followed by the youth. Abdel Fattah Muru, a theology and law student at the University of Tunis, led discussion circles, as did Maida Enafer, a doctor from the University of Zidouna in Tunis and the Sorbonne in Paris. It is these three individuals who are responsible for the emergence of the Islamist movement, inspired by the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood movement, aiming to counter the westernization of Tunisia. At the beginning, the Tunisian state tolerated their activities, which were limited to promoting good behavior and Islamic teachings. When they emerged in the highly politicized universities in 1970, numerous debates and confrontations with left-wing political parties occurred. The MTI created significant room for theoretical and political debates. It began to formulate an Islamic political line. Recognizing this politicization, the government encouraged them to counter the left-wing parties, especially the communists who had control over the university. This government approval allowed the movement to grow. In a matter of a few years, the MTA became the major political rival to the left-wing parties in an era when they dominated most of the socio-political space. By around 1974, it had become highly influential in universities and Tunisian society. Veiled female members were multiplying. Their distinct veil, the same one my sister wore, proclaimed their affiliation. It was a kind of banner. Men, too, exhibited a distinct style, with my future brother-in-law leading the way. Sulla Karker, born in 1948 in Bowder in the Sahel, came from a peasant family. The Tunisian Sahel region had long experienced poverty. The centuries-old lack of consideration from the state had instilled in the Sahel residents a spirit of revenge and even a fascination with power. Bourguiba was also from the Sahel, as were the majority of his ministers and political officials who followed him. Remarkably, most of the key positions in the administration were held by Sahel residents. The people from Tunis, more laid back, seldom accessed these spheres. My future brother-in-law, a brilliant student, joined the university to achieve his share of glory and power. Upon his arrival, he aligned himself with the Islamists who echoed his line of thinking. He had a strong personality. He eventually became one of the leaders of the MTI. Persistent and unwavering, he was later seen as its Iron Man. It was during his preparation for a master's degree in economics that he met my sister and drew her into the movement. In 1975, the movement wasn't yet officially recognized by the law. In fact, the Tunisian constitution didn't clearly permit political pluralism before the 1980s. However, the MTI pulled all the levers in mosques, universities, and society. It strategically infiltrated families across the country, as we observed in our own case, not only in major cities but also in the overlooked interior localities due to Bourguiba's policies. Following the Iranian Islamic Revolution, the government finally began to take the potential threat of the MTI seriously. The movement had surpassed the left-wing parties and posed a challenge to the Bourguibist achievements. The police started collecting information about its members. El Ghazali Secondary School At present, my sister and her husband didn't come over as often. With the family now on their side, they spread the Islamic message elsewhere, apart from the Islamist meetings. The increasing number of participants forced them to revert to our house where space was abundant, both indoors and outdoors. The house resembled Mecca at times, given the multitude of people. Only men were present. Women were there solely to assist my sisters in the kitchen. And of course, my brothers and I managed the service between the kitchen and the numerous men seated on the floor throughout the house, veranda, and garden. Around April 1979, my mother reached her breaking point. She left the house again, this time for an extended period, and my father entrusted me with the daily tasks. You have no future since you won't move on to secondary school. So, take care of the household and your brothers. At least, you'll serve some purpose. From then on, in addition to studying Islam in the evenings at the mosque or at my sister's place, I took care of housekeeping, shopping, meal preparation, and attending to my younger siblings. 
school became the least of my concerns. For me, education was forever over. I assumed my mother's role at home and tended to the garden, cultivating vegetables and tending to the animals. At the end of the 1979 school year, I refused to repeat the sixth grade once more and declared that my dearest wish now was to till the land. I would tend to the beasts and the humble. Seeing the opportunity to firmly establish his authority over me, my brother-in-law proposed that I work on agricultural land he owned, and this plan was easily endorsed by my father. But my joy dwindled when I realized that this supposed future was a laughingstock to the entire family. This deeply shocked me and caused me to abandon my intention. This new wound added to the previous ones. My sister then suggested enrolling me in a one-month catch-up course leading to an entrance exam for a private school. My father wasn't opposed, especially since my brother-in-law offered to pay for my education if I succeeded as the school was run by Islamists and affiliated with the MTI. This institution catered to academically challenged youth, aiming to shape the warriors of tomorrow. During the summer of 1979, I worked tirelessly to catch up. My confidence was restored as all the exam questions were related to Islam, and months of Islamic lessons and teachings had given me a foundation in Islam and its history. Eventually, the administration of El Ghazali Secondary School accepted me into the seventh grade. I was rather proud, though I suspected my advancement to the next grade had been made possible by my brother-in-law's intervention. The dice were now loaded. In September 1979, I began the seventh grade at the private secondary school located in the old city, not far from my grandmother's house, on Sidi Abdul Salem Street, almost as if fate had determined that I return there after all these years. I took the bus in the morning. At noon, I would eat at my aunt's house, which was my grandmother's home, and there, I would reunite with my mother, who stayed with her sister when she wasn't in Ariana. In the evening, I would return home. This change allowed me to mature a little. El Ghazali Secondary School resembled a modern Quranic school. The teachers were all Islamists, mostly men, with only two or three veiled women. The students were also predominantly boys. There were a few girls too, whether veiled or not, but over time, they all began wearing veils. The curriculum revolved entirely around Islam. Not only were there classes on the Quran and Islamic education, but also French and Arabic. Even in mathematics, we mostly learned about ancient Muslim mathematicians, and the same applied to the physical sciences. It wasn't too challenging for me due to the foundation I already had in Islam. During prayer times, we would gather behind the teacher. Some students didn't initially participate in prayers, but over time, they joined in as well. In summary, the school served as a recruitment ground. It welcomed everyone, but its true purpose was to recruit future Islamists. One morning in February, I woke up as usual to head to school. That day, I was a bit late. When I reached the bus stop, there was a large crowd. The first bus that arrived was packed, people were squeezing in to get on. I managed to hold on to the bus, as did others. We had to squeeze in so the door could close. At the next stop, the door got stuck and couldn't open. I was pressed against the door when suddenly it got unstuck. My right arm got crushed. I blacked out and don't recall what happened next. I regained consciousness in the ambulance. A nurse was searching through my belongings to inform my parents. I told them to inform my mother. She joined us at the hospital, panicked. We arrived in ten minutes, but we waited for over eight hours before the doctor could examine me, despite the urgency. After seeing my arm, he ordered that a cast be placed on it. Two months later, when the cast was removed, my right hand wouldn't open, and I couldn't move it. The doctor said they shouldn't have casted it as the arm had multiple fractures. To fix it all, an operation was needed, which was costly and difficult to perform in Tunisia. So, I kept my hand in that state. Fortunately, after a few months, I was able to move my fingers and hold a pen to write, albeit with difficulty. 
At the end of the 1980 school year, I moved on to the 8th grade with a good average, even though it wasn't at the level of public school. This success boosted my confidence. That summer, despite the usual family tension, I was full of hope. My objective was to study and serve the Islamist cause. My mother rarely visited us now, but I saw her at her sister's place in the old city. Among the children, I was the only one maintaining a good connection with her. When she learned that I had progressed to the next grade, she hugged me tightly, as if I were her last hope. She then informed me that she was planning to divorce my father because she couldn't bear the atmosphere at the house in Ariana and needed a place of her own. Journey to the Unknown Since I had regained consciousness, I had begun to find a taste for life, to appreciate the world and everything around me. My curiosity had developed, adventure, risk, the unknown, and even mystery attracted me. I wanted to know everything. However, the imposition of Islamism within my family, at the heart of my social nucleus, prevented me from asking questions freely. My sister Samira kept telling me that Islam prohibits questions that lead to doubting the truth of Islam, as well as dreams and imagination. At an age when I needed it so much, this deprivation pushed me to create an inner world that was undetectable and to withdraw into myself. But now, my mother's top priority was for me to escape the prevailing Islamism. She devised a thousand plans to pull me out of it. An idea finally imposed itself in her mind, as clear as crystal, my broken arm from the bus accident had been poorly treated, and it was urgent to send me to Paris to be examined by a specialist. Building on this obvious fact, she concocted a plan that gave me hope for embarking on a new life and new adventures in complete freedom. Once again, pain was the driving force of my destiny. My mother's plan. My uncle Larby, my mother's brother, had been living in the suburbs of Paris, in Argentite, for several years. He would regularly return to our homeland for vacations. With a tough character, not hesitating to raise his voice to assert his authority, he was also a helpful man like me because he thought I resembled him. His wife also had a fondness for me. In June 1980, they invited me to spend a few days under their roof, not far from our place, along with their children who were nearly my age. My father didn't object, after consulting my second sister and her husband, who were heavily engaged in their Islamist activities. This was an unexpected escape for me. I hastily packed my belongings, and my uncle came to pick me up in his car. Those days filled me with joy. I saw different faces, breathed freely, and momentarily forgot the gloomy life at the Ariana house. And above all, through my uncle's accounts of life in France, I began to dream about the European continent. My uncle had seven daughters and only one son. His daughters, most of them older than me, were quite modern and spoke French better than Arabic. Of course, at the age of fourteen, I felt a bit awkward around my cousins. I performed my prayers on time every day, read the Quran, and avoided looking at or chatting with them. I stuck close to my uncle all the time. He wasn't an Islamist but rather a traditional Muslim, like my mother. In fact, like her, he despised the Islamists. Yet, he trusted that I would evolve over time. So, he welcomed me into his home as one of his own children, to the extent that he asked my father if I could stay with him and his family for the entire summer, which was accepted. During this stay, my mother came to visit us and had a private discussion with my uncle about my future. It was then that I understood that his invitation hadn't been a coincidence, she had orchestrated everything from the very beginning. The matter shocked me a bit, as did the fact that she had removed the traditional sefsari and was now dressing in a modern manner. When I saw her like this for the first time, I initially thought it was just within the house, but when she invited me to go out with her, I noticed that she was going out without wearing the headscarf. Mom, I asked, are you not wearing your sefsari anymore? She responded promptly and firmly. No, I don't wear it anymore. Now, I dress like everyone else. I've left the veil to the extremists. Ah. Uh. And why? 
This time, she looked straight ahead and took a while before replying. They've made me grow to detest Islam with their intolerance, she finally murmured. I don't want to hear about it anymore. She was visibly at her wit's end. Listen, my son, she said suddenly, I want to talk to you about something important, but until you tell me if you're in agreement, it must remain between us. No one should know what I'm going to tell you, not even your sister. No problem, mum. For several months, since I left the Ariana house, I've been in contact with your uncle by phone. He told me he's coming to Tunisia this summer, and I've arranged with him for you to spend the summer with him. Look, my son, I know you achieved a good average at the private school, but between us, I don't have confidence in that school or those Islamists for your future. So, you need to escape and leave Tunisia. Leave Tunisia. But where to? Are you willing to leave Tunisia or not? I don't have a problem with it. But will my father and sister accept it? Leave that to me, I have a plan. I only want to know if you're on board. I agree, mum. But where would I go? To France, with your uncle. To treat your arm and at the same time continue your studies. Uncle Larby was returning to Argentai in a few weeks, he could be a reliable guardian during my stay in France. Additionally, there, I could study and learn a real trade. Given such arguments, my father couldn't help but side with my mother. Logically, my sister and her husband, who now saw me as a future warrior of the Islamist revolution, initially opposed my departure. They tried to dissuade me, describing Europe as a realm of inequality, racism, and decadence. But I replied that my faith was strong, and no force could deviate me from my path towards Allah. I managed to convince my sister that this stay would allow me, while treating my arm, to spread Islam from there. I presented it to her as a mission to serve Almighty Allah, and she accepted the omen. In truth, my demeanor was merely a ploy suggested by my mother to convince my sister and her husband to ease their moral pressure on me. Deep down, I doubted their version of Islam. I had witnessed my sister and her husband destroy our family, robbing us of the most precious days of our childhood. I had seen my mother suffer, and my brother-in-law had tarnished our family's reputation. Our surroundings viewed us as religious fanatics and anti-Europeans. Our family came under authority surveillance, and our vague pro-Islamist reputation began to cause serious problems. I was no longer entirely convinced that they had brought us closer to Allah. Throughout that year, I had stayed in contact with my mother, and she had made me realize that an Islam that seeks to impose itself through force and lacks a love for life isn't true Islam. My doubt about the Islamic religion dates back to that year. My sole concern was now to venture towards new horizons. As the time for my departure approached, Samira finalized her advice. You're still very young, my brother. You'll need many years to discern all the dangers that will arise on your journey. Remain vigilant at all times. Allah willed this journey to test your faith. Never forget that Europeans have one goal in mind, to divert Muslims from their religion in order to dominate them. Your only weapon is your faith. Therefore, never cease praying and implore Allah to grant you strength and faith to confront any temptation that might lead you astray from the true path. On the eve of the big day, there was a farewell dinner prepared by my mother's expert hands. I was at the peak of my joy. What a feast! The pleasure of the food mingled with countless images swirling in my mind, the boat, the crossing, the port of Marseille, Provence, the countryside landscapes, the road to Paris, all that wonderful unknown I sensed, like an unfamiliar body about to be embraced. During this meal, my brother-in-law looked downcast. I was slipping through his fingers. How would he be able to control me from a distance? In the end, he leaned towards me gently. Islam will need you in the future. It's Allah's will that you go, so study well and pray tirelessly. Those were the last words he said to me before leaving the house with my sister. Through her cunning, my mother had achieved a significant victory over them. 
Did she imagine how many disappointments the coming years held in store for her? The education an adolescent receives from their family generally enables them to make correct choices, to ponder before venturing or taking risks. An isolated adolescent without knowledge or experience can stray from the right path, and the missteps they make can upheave the rest of their life. Between 1980 and 1983, I would experience what every North African immigrant encounters upon arriving in France, the fear of the West, doubts about this new people, and then the identity crisis after returning to Tunisia for summer holidays, a homecoming that prevents immigrant children from integrating into their host country. It periodically rekindles the rift between Europe and Africa, resulting in a renewed identity crisis within the North African milieu, familiar with racism and hatred. Lastly, my time in Paris would lead me to discover Shurism. This would trigger my escape to Iran to study Islam and my immersion in the international Islamist network, leaving behind what I had built in France. The Distrust of the West On the night preceding my departure, I couldn't sleep. From dusk until the sunrise of September 12, 1980, I remained leaning against the window. For anything in the world, I wouldn't have wanted to miss the birth of that day, and my mouth smiled ceaselessly until dawn. With eyes wide open, I relived the seven years that had passed since the day I regained consciousness, the beautiful days lived before the infiltration of Islamism into our family and the years of nightmares lived because of Islamism. But all of that was about to change, my dreams of travel were about to come true. In a few hours, I would be taking the boat to Marseille. I was setting out towards new horizons, new hopes, and an entirely fresh life. I lingered in the garden for over two hours, waiting for my uncle. I sat on the edge of the well and recalled the scene I had experienced there seven years earlier, upon arriving in Ariana. When I heard my uncle's car stop in front of the house, before rushing towards him, I mentally said goodbye to everything that had surrounded me until then, the house, the walls of my room, the scents, the trees, the familiar animals, the faces of my family, all my childhood memories. I will never forget that moment. My uncle stepped out of his car and greeted my mother, who was running from the kitchen. She embraced me tightly, tears in her eyes. She kept telling me to take very good care of myself. Come on, get in. My uncle called to me. I sat next to him. The car started, heading towards La Goulette, relegating all of this to the past, and the house disappeared around the corner of the street. I knew that, as tradition dictates, my mother would pour a bucket of water in front of the door so that I could return one day. So, my nephew, are you happy? My uncle asked. More than you can even imagine. I'm warning you, you'll have to obey me. Otherwise, my anger will be fierce. Yes, uncle. I know you're a good lad. While my uncle recited passages from the Quran, I remained silent, my eyes on the road, remembering the time I had walked it on foot, at night, with my pilgrim staff during my escape to reach the other continent, far beyond the waves. When we arrived at the port of La Goulette, I craned my neck to see the jetty at the end of which I had to halt my journey in the face of the sea, that impassable barrier. Today, it was no longer impassable. The ship on which we were embarking was named the Liberty. In this case, one couldn't dream of a more symbolic name. As we moved away from the coastline, I remained on the deck for a long while, watching the strip of land vanish into the distance. Leaving one's country and loved ones, even for the most thrilling of adventures, doesn't come without some heartache. Tearing myself away from this unique family atmosphere, I was conscious that it was still mine and I wouldn't find it anywhere else. Despite the misfortune of my childhood, I was now feeling a bitter nostalgia. Surely, there was an unknown land on the other side of the Mediterranean where I hoped to be reborn, but what would I find there? Would I truly no longer be oppressed? I remained cautious, with questions crowding my mind. I thought about everything my sister and her husband had told me about this West that seeks to destroy us and erase our Arab Muslim identity. Yet, I could see that my uncle had retained his identity while living in France for a long time. 
Certainly, he was a Muslim by tradition and not by extremism, like most, but France had never forced him to abandon his faith. I've always believed that what saved me throughout my life is my critical thinking, despite my naive appearance that might suggest I easily give my trust and believe everything I'm told. Because in a second phase, I reflect, examine the issue from all angles, and if I'm not convinced, I change direction. During my childhood, I was fascinated by the idea of an all-powerful God who possesses all the powers of this world, from whom we come and to whom we will return. A simple belief learned or inherited from my grandmother and mother. I didn't doubt the existence of this force that watches over us and guides us in life as its children. I used to talk naturally to this merciful God, asking for help and to show me the right path. I believed at that time that the name of this God was Allah, but I have learned since that each belief names its own God and that the name of Allah was specific to the Arabs before being propagated by Islam. Despite the appearances I presented to my sister, which led her to believe I was following her, I was never convinced of the value of the Islamism imposed by her husband and herself. I saw it as too rigid and harsh, hindering living and leading to hypocrisy towards others and oneself. Thus, the fear my sister inspired in me was greater than my fear of Allah himself. Rules, nothing but rules. This is forbidden, this is obligatory, this is allowed, this should be avoided. In this form of Islam, the believer is conditioned in every action and gesture, they can't do, say, or think anything without being guided to please Allah. I was already wondering why this Allah demanded prayers five times a day. I had even asked my sister this question. Why do we pray? To thank Allah for everything He gives us. But why thank Him five times a day, wouldn't once be enough? She hadn't immediately found a response. It's Allah who demands us to pray five times a day. We must obey and submit to Him, she declared in conclusion. This answer didn't convince me. So, when I couldn't find the opportunity to pray, I wouldn't do it, because for me, prayer wasn't about thanking Allah, as my sister said, but about feeling close to Him. Therefore, I only prayed when I needed to, and the rest of the time, I just pretended. The ship entered the port of Marseille. I had wide open eyes. How immense this city seemed to me. Something mysterious emanated from the oddly shaped rocks along the shore, but the foliage on the heights reminded me of Tunis. It was still the spirit of the South speaking. The customs clearance represented my first contact with the Western world. Timidly, I expected to hear harsh words, but not at all. These men in regulation uniforms were smiling, performing their duty seriously, without seeking to harm foreigners. Had I been lied to about the cruelty of the Westerners? I took a deep breath and relaxed a bit. The long journey to Paris began. I discovered the variety of French landscapes, the small provincial towns, the isolated villages, the farms lost in the middle of fields, the woods, the forests, but also the factories, the multi-story buildings, the enormous cranes, the shopping centers. France appeared to me as a very modern country that had managed to preserve its past, its characteristics. There was nothing devilish about these architectures, these landscapes. Certainly, people seemed very busy, but their faces appeared serene. In the courtyards, on the sports grounds, the children were playing, laughing freely. In just one day, I stored so many new images that my head felt all fuzzy when we arrived in St. Gradient. My uncle lived in an apartment, in an area where all the neighbors were Europeans. The family welcomed us with hysterical joy. Shouts, tears, embraces, laughter. With the tiredness of the journey, I felt very weak, as small as a fly, barely daring to open my mouth. I reunited with my maternal grandfather who had joined his son after my grandmother's death. It was the first time I had seen him since. I barely remembered him, but his presence reassured me because he reminded me of my grandmother whom I had loved very much. My uncle's wife brought my belongings to his room and showed me my bed not far from his. Here's your room, my son, rest well. Thanks to my grandfather, the link with Tunis was maintained. 
The wisdom of this majestic man created around him a sort of native land where I could set foot without fear. But the next day, I would have to face the reality of an unknown world, far from what I had been taught until then. I only found sleep with difficulty, despite the fatigue of those forty-eight hours spent almost without sleeping, part of which was on the boat, in the excitement of discovery. The next day, my uncle took care of enrolling me in a vocational school. As my parents had wished, he began by contacting vocational high schools, which wasn't my own preference. I dreamt of becoming a veterinarian. For that, I first had to follow the traditional path to the baccalaureate. Fortunately, the registration dates for technical courses had passed, so my uncle had to enroll me at Jean Zay College in St. Gradian, where all his children were studying. I was enrolled in the fifth grade, equivalent to the second year of secondary school in Tunisia, at the same level as my cousin who was my age. The first days of classes were terrifying, and I had to show great courage. Alone, with a poor understanding of the French language, compelled to quickly adapt to a new mentality and fight against my natural shyness, I couldn't manage to connect with my classmates. My complexes hindered my interactions, and I also felt an inexplicable sort of discomfort. The presence of my cousin in the establishment comforted me a little. During break time, I searched for her desperately in the chaotic crowd of students, and as soon as I spotted her, I went to her and eagerly shared my impressions. The teachers were particularly understanding towards me. Conscientious, they dedicated their free time between classes to support me in my work, especially the French teacher. I will never forget their kindness and dedication. However, during these delicate and hesitant beginnings, I remained wary of them. The satanic image of Europeans instilled in me by my brother-in-law and the Islamists continued to influence me. The time of innocence in me had been so ephemeral. Despite the language barrier, I got off to a good start. At the end of the first trimester, my academic results were very satisfactory. To improve my French, I frequently went to the college library. I devoured novels, newspapers, science books. My thirst for learning was such that the librarian took a liking to me. One day, I stumbled upon a French translation of the Quran. Strange. Why would the enemies of Islam publish such a work? Was it a trap? I confessed my surprise to the librarian. There's nothing very surprising about that, she told me. A good library is impartial, it must offer the widest possible choice to everyone. Like all sacred texts, the Quran belongs to the history of humanity, so it's normal that you find it here. It's my role to make the entirety of human knowledge available to students, even if this book is rarely consulted. But you're Christians, why would you be interested in Islam? You see, this college is secular. Teachers can teach students about the history of religions, even though they won't force them to practice them in any way. Do you understand the distinction? Yes, it seems so, I mumbled, not very convinced. And then, in the college, there are students of North African origin who were born in France and who don't know the Arabic language. This translation is also intended for them. My thoughts remained confused. What was the difference between studying a religion and practicing it? Why seek to understand a religion when you don't believe in it? For me, there was no difference. The words of the librarian seemed suspicious to me. How could Christians, who fought Islam in the past, allow students to read the Quran? Why had they translated the Quran into French? Perhaps to understand us and know how to fight us. In that case, we also had to understand them to protect ourselves from them. This allowed me to be more open to understanding and knowledge of European culture. The librarian was amazed at the number of books I read, whether those I consulted in the library during break hours or those I borrowed to read at home. I focused on history and natural science books, particularly about animals, which fascinated me. The winter holidays were approaching, soon it would be Christmas. My uncle bought a large tree. This reminded me of the early days in Ariana when we celebrated the end of the year. This time, 
I would celebrate it on western soil. In the streets and stores, everyone was getting ready for this festival, there were decorations everywhere, Santa Claus was moving around and distributing gifts to the neighborhood children. This end of the year 1980 remains unforgettable for me. During those first months, nothing could distract me from my goal, to succeed in my school year. I dedicated myself exclusively to my studies. The atmosphere at home was good despite my uncle's fits of bad mood, usually related to money matters. He was frugal. For him, everything was calculated down to the last penny, the lights had to be turned off by 11 p.m., mealtimes had to be adhered to down to the exact minute. It was a kind of military regime at home, everyone had to obey without discussion, or else they would be locked in a room or thrown out into the street. Everyone feared him. Children could only find a bit of freedom outside the house. As soon as they returned, everything had to go back to normal. My aunt kept a close watch to ensure he wouldn't notice anything. When one of us did something wrong, she often took the blame. It was her who was punished, and sometimes even beaten. All of this didn't bother me too much because everyone liked me, and my uncle treated me somewhat differently. But when I needed something, I would ask my grandfather or my aunt rather than him directly. My grandfather liked me as well. Of course, I was the child of his favorite daughter. I spent good moments with him since we shared the same room. He loved giving me advice. My boy, he would say, I'm almost a hundred years old. I've had plenty of time to learn a lot in my life. So, take advantage of it while I'm still alive. As the proverb goes, seek advice from someone with experience. My grandfather had nothing in common with my grandmother. I saw him as a stern and proud man at the same time. He had no friends in the neighborhood and didn't want any. For him, it wouldn't have served any purpose. He was always in his room, but he sometimes went out to the market, took a walk, or sat in the public garden. I accompanied him several times. He was as punctual as a clock. He did the same things every day in a well-structured routine. I had never seen anyone so punctual in all their actions. I learned a lot from him, he told me about his youth. He had hardly ever worked in his life because his parents left him a large fortune, but now he had not a penny left due to his former Arab friends. Grandfather hated Arabs. Certainly, in North Africa, it's common to insult Arabs, and there are even proverbs about it. But my grandfather's hatred towards them was boundless. When I went out with him and we encountered an Arab beggar, he gave them money. On the other hand, when he saw a French beggar, he gave them nothing. Why do you give money to Arabs you don't like, and not to the French? I asked him. I give money to Arabs so that they remain beggars their whole lives. I don't give to the French so that they go and find a job. My grandfather's behavior and his hatred towards Arabs were incomprehensible to me. Was it because he was of Turkish origin, and his Turkish pride pushed him to act this way, or was it due to his Jewish background? Look, my son, he told me one day, I'm telling you the truth, non-Arabs, in general, won't say hello to you, but the day one of them greets you, he does it sincerely. On the other hand, when an Arab says hello to you, it's because he has some interest or benefit in it. When an Arab doesn't say hello to you, it means he doesn't need you. So, be cautious of Arabs who greet you and try to talk to you. He even once entrusted me with a secret. When I want to insult Arabs, I pretend to insult my son Larbi, whose name means, the Arab, and no one knows that I'm insulting Arabs. My grandfather prayed every day on time, even the dawn prayer, and he read the Quran every day. He never abandoned his traditional Tunisian attire, even in France, but he despised Islamism. When we saw news about the Iranian revolution on TV, he would call Khomeini a devil who thinks he's a god, he cursed him and his followers, and he would retreat to his room, refusing to see any more. In my uncle's house, only he, my grandfather, and I prayed every day. The children didn't pray, or rarely did so when their father asked them to. 
I was used to this situation too, I prayed when I was obligated to or when I wanted to ask for Allah's help. I was well integrated into the family's way of life and considered myself one of their children. Even the neighbors believed I was my uncle's son, as I was the one who accompanied him most of the time when he needed it. He wasn't such a difficult man, deep down. He hated being contradicted, but a simple pretense was enough, and everything would be fine. At the end of the school year, I was promoted to the fourth grade. The average of my grades was even higher than that of my cousin. I could already envision myself at the end of the road in my white veterinarian coat, but my uncle congratulated me in his own way. I'm proud of you, my boy, but it's not enough. You must do even better starting next September. Integration Nearly a year after my arrival in France, I was already speaking French quite well. At least, everyone understood me. I had integrated well and didn't feel any racism towards me. In my class, I was considered just like the other students. My cousin was also there, along with two Africans. Everyone else was Spanish and French. In our neighborhood, I never felt any injustice or racist behavior. This situation gave me confidence and gradually convinced me that my sister and her husband had told me lies. Despite this, deep down, I remained cautious. I told myself that all of this was too good to be true. The beginning of summer 1981 brought good news, my mother was coming to St. Gradian for a few weeks. I counted the days nervously. My mother finally arrived, without a sef sari and dressed in European clothes, well coiffed and wearing makeup. At first, I didn't even recognize her. At 43 years old, she looked like a young girl. What joy to embrace the one I loved so much. My mother cried tears of joy and looked at me for a long time, as if she couldn't get enough of seeing me. You've grown so much, my son, she finally said, with a hint of sadness in her voice. Her face still bore the marks of a life marked by constant disappointment. Her strength was the same, the weight of her defeat unchanged. The situation had continued to deteriorate with my father, and she had finally obtained a divorce. She hoped to find some respite at her brother's place. My injured arm still hadn't healed. If this wound had opened the doors to travel for me, it was important to get it treated quickly. My uncle had waited until I was enrolled in health insurance to take me to see a doctor. After a consultation, it was determined that surgery was necessary. A few days later, I entered the hospital, my heart pounding. The surgery went well. Once the cast was removed, I had to attend daily rehabilitation sessions for several weeks. I followed this diligently, but it didn't yield any positive results. A second surgery was scheduled for the end of 1981. During the summer vacation, I devoted myself intensively to studying the French language. My determination had never been stronger. The future held strange surprises for me, I instinctively sensed it, like an animal sensing the approach of a natural catastrophe. Learning was my best weapon, a way to get closer to God, my God, the one my grandmother believed in. On August 4, I turned 15. A big celebration was organized, and my mother made wonderful pastries, just like in the good old days in Ariana. At the end of the summer, my mother decided to stay permanently in Paris. I'm pretty sure she had made this decision from the moment she left for France. This choice was driven by a desire for freedom. Her forced marriage had stripped her of her dignity as an independent woman. By taking the risk of breaking it, she was finally regaining that dignity, except that the world of work was entirely unfamiliar to her, and she was starting from scratch. The benefit of this sought after freedom began with learning French, it was crucial for her to speak the language of our host country well enough to hope for employment. She already had a good foundation since she had studied in a French school before her marriage. I accompanied her three times a week to evening classes where she improved her French. We were inseparable, and her courage strengthened my determination to overcome. She and I, my uncle and his family, grandfather, 
we should have all come together in the spacious apartment in St. Gradient to recreate the family harmony that the house in the Medina had known under the guidance of my grandmother. But my uncle's anger would erupt at any moment and wasn't conducive to a serene atmosphere. Worn out by years of disputes with my father, my mother found it hard to tolerate her brother's mood swings and his stinginess. Moreover, my privileged relationship with her sparked jealousy in my uncle. The presence of his sister cast a shadow on his role as the dominant male, a role in which he was never happier than when others lived under his dependence. Sure of his judgment, he couldn't accept that anyone could act without seeking his advice beforehand. His experience seemed irreplaceable to him. The old demons of tradition, poorly digested, spoke louder than reason. In September, I entered the fourth grade, more motivated than ever. But the relationship between my mother and her brother deteriorated each day. My mother hadn't left my father to relive the same conflicts. Naturally, I supported her, which fueled my uncle's anger. You, a boy, you're taking the side of a woman who knows nothing about life here. Eventually, my mother moved into a small room located in the 19th arrondissement of Paris, at the Jean Jower station. She, who had lived among her children, in a spacious villa surrounded by a beautiful garden, now found herself in a rabbit cage, alone and without friends. What irony of fate! She was finally achieving her independence, but at the highest cost. It was as if you have to hit rock bottom before you can rebuild a life. She couldn't even take care of me until she obtained her resident card, found a job, and a larger place to live. So, she would call me regularly to ask about my well-being. At the end of 1981, I returned to the Argentine hospital. There, I befriended a very young nurse with a delicate face and almond-shaped eyes. When she entered my room for the first time, I was immediately moved by her presence. The gentleness of her gestures and attentiveness revealed an open spirit. On Christmas Eve, we had one of those rare and profound conversations that leave a mark for the rest of one's life. How are you feeling? She asked, smiling. I feel good, but I'm a little scared. Don't worry, everything will go well. Dr. Four is an excellent physician. He's very experienced with this kind of surgery. You're kind, I mumbled. According to your records, I see that you were born in Tunis. How long have you been living in France? I've been living with my uncle since September 1980. Is life here not too difficult? At first, you feel lost. But since my mother came to live here, I feel better, I answered. A little surprised by her show of interest. I might be prying, but what does your mother do? She's looking for work, I said. Lowering my eyes. I imagine it's not easy every day. And why did both of you leave your country? It's a long story. Life there was very difficult, forgive me, I'm being quite nosy. Oh no. It's good for me to talk. You know, in my country, there are many believers, but some Muslims try to control others. That's why my mother and I left the country. I see. Religion is sometimes a source of conflict. There are all sorts of things said about Islam, especially concerning women being mistreated, she said with unease. According to the Quran, men and women are equal. But some Muslims, the extremists, have a false idea of life and want to reform everything. For instance, they claim that a woman who is alone in a room with a man attracts evil spirits. It's ridiculous. I share your opinion. And why do women have to wear the veil? Isn't that a way to demean them? I sat up on my bed with fervor. There are a thousand ways to wear the veil. I burst out. Above all, it's a sign of nobility and courage. Are you a believer? The nurse observed a moment of silence and sat on the chair next to my bed. That's a question to which I don't have an answer. You know, in the West, religion has lost many followers. The desire to consume, to become rich, to climb higher and higher on the social ladder, diverts people from the church. 
I believe primarily in reason, in logic. But respecting others and their beliefs is fundamental to me. I am a humanist, that's why I'm learning this profession. I'm on an internship. Later, I plan to work for a humanitarian organization in Africa to care for the sick, Muslims, Christians, and animists alike. Suddenly, I thought of my sister and brother-in-law, of their intolerance, and I felt ashamed for them. You must love God, seek the path, I muttered. There was a long silence, as if our unspoken thoughts were secretly communicating. Christians and Muslims have hurt each other a lot, she resumed. It's probably a utopia, but I wish so much for peace to settle among peoples. Me too, I'm for peace. But I wonder. Can a Muslim marry a Christian? It seems difficult. In that case, religion would be an enemy of peace. We exchanged an understanding look, and I suddenly realized how much this young girl resembled the images from my dreams. I would have liked to hold her hand, to embrace her. But this gesture filled me with immense fear, and I lacked the courage for it, knowing that it was forbidden by Islam and considered a grave sin. I closed my eyes for a moment. Maybe, I said with a sigh. The age I was at the time, fifteen, was premature for a boy to experience the emotion of love for the first time. Such feelings were a taboo for me, I mustn't think about them, let alone mention them. I had to reject them because, in principle, a woman is a devil who tries to tempt a man and lead him away from Allah's path. However, I didn't feel any distance from Allah in the presence of this kind nurse. Her behavior was entirely natural and good. On my part, I felt more than that, an upsurge of love, but I couldn't express it, mainly because she was older than me. Before she left, she wished me good luck. I remained speechless, watching her leave my room. I would have liked her to stay with me longer. Of course, that wasn't possible, she had other patients and work to do. You too, I hastened to reply before she disappeared. She turned back to give me a knowing smile, and I waited for her to visit me again for a good part of the night. In vain. The next day, I learned that she had finished her shift after leaving me. A week later, on New Year's Day, I found a love novel on my bedside table, along with her wishes. A love novel. I reread it several times, still hoping to uncover a hidden meaning. I waited for her in vain in the hallways. Would I see her again someday, that young girl with such moving eyes? This conversation had loosened some restraints within me. Staying away from people was clearly a sterile attitude, truth could be found everywhere. My wariness toward Europeans had receded, I wanted to integrate into society, become a full-fledged citizen of the world, live as an adventurer of the human soul, not just a mere visitor. On January 1, 1982, I felt free and strong to face the world. Humanism couldn't be just a pretense. I sensed sincerity and transparency in the minds of the people I encountered everywhere, at school, on the street, in the neighborhood, among the elderly, the young, women, and men. I was increasingly convinced that the West didn't wish harm upon Muslims, and that Muslims imagined such things just to complicate their lives. With the plaster on my arm removed, Dr. Four was unpleasantly surprised to find that the fracture hadn't healed. Despite numerous tests, no medical explanation was found to clarify this mystery. The rehabilitation sessions changed nothing. Clearly, there was something strange about this non-healing fracture, as if destiny forbade it. Soon, I gave up on physical therapy. At least, I could use my fingers normally. As I approached my 16th birthday, my relationship with my uncle began to seriously darken. Since my mother's departure, he had wanted to strengthen his authority, but I was no longer a timid young boy, and I was achieving good results in school. Consequently, his anger was unjustified, and I stood up to him. One day, unable to tolerate my defiance, he raised his cane to strike me. I pushed him aside with a sudden shoulder movement, gathered my things, and joined my mother in Paris in her tiny apartment. 
I had to go back to St. Gradian every day to finish the last trimester. We both lived a life of hermits, simple and hardworking but happy. In the summer of 1982, I successfully passed into the third grade and received a certificate of encouragement. Summer in the country To reward me for my excellent work, my mother had offered me the trip to Tunis. The family reunion was joyful, as blood ties prevailed over past wounds. Moreover, my success in foreign land made me a true hero, I had experienced solitude, conquered my fear, defied the madness of the Western world. I was now shown a new respect. My second sister prepared a feast, and I was placed at the head of the table. Everyone looked at me with consideration, as if I had come from a distant planet. Meanwhile, things had taken a new turn, my brother-in-law was spending his days in prison temporarily. The authorities had deemed his politico-religious activities dangerous, capable of jeopardizing the stability of the state. He was accused of planning an Islamist revolution inspired by the Iranian model. The main leaders of the MTI had been arrested and detained. The political climate was tense. The Iranian revolution had echoed in all the North African countries, stirring minds, awakening passions, giving weight to Tunisian Islamists. The government remained constantly on guard, and the police dispatched agents to infiltrate various places to nip the Islamist serpent in the bud, a serpent that slithered in the shadows. Soon, the West would experience bloody attacks indirectly or directly orchestrated by the Islamic International. The Islamic War of the Enraged of Allah was being organized despite the noise of politicians. Nothing indicated the time or place where it would start to blaze, but there was a smell of death in the air. Samira's changed appearance had shocked me upon my arrival. She was poorly dressed, resembling a servant. She was no longer the strong woman I knew. She was alone with two children, a boy and a girl. She gave private math lessons to earn some money, but as it wasn't enough to pay the rent, she had to move into the house in Ariana. She occupied one of the rooms with her children and took care of everything at home. With her husband in prison, she had to visit him every week to bring him food. She deprived herself to keep the little money she received as charity from the Islamists. The Samira I had always known to hold her head high now walked with her head down and avoided eye contact with others. She no longer found time to propagate Islamism or discuss Islamic morality, being preoccupied with her children, her husband, her father, and the rest of the family. She was resigned, a true doormat. When I talked to her about this, all she could say was that it was a trial ordained by Allah to test our belief and strengthen our faith. But I could tell that she wasn't convinced and was only repeating it to convince herself. Did she regret following the Islamists? Was she aware of all the harm she had caused to our family? Was she aware of the tears she had wrought in each of us? These questions, I still ask myself, and I don't know if I'll ever have the answers. That summer, while I was in Tunis, we learned that my mother had remarried her cousin, her first love, the one she had always loved. He had come to France, completely ruined and seriously ill, for a treatment that unfortunately proved ineffective. But it didn't matter to my mother, she was able to surround him with her affection until the end. She had found a job and had moved into a bigger place. Nothing was stopping her now. Her sole obsession was to do everything she could to save those of her children she could still rescue from the grip of Islamism. In preparation to head to Paris, my brothers were getting ready. They too wanted to experience Western life, to go through this unique journey that would shape their minds with new realities. So, my father was soon going to be left with most of his children absent, surrounded only by my younger brother and my second sister, whose religious fanaticism had significantly worsened. To avoid escalating matters, I refrained from expressing to her my favorable judgments about Europeans. She, who still considered me a naive being, would have easily reproached my weakness, my failure in front of the enemy. But Samira was no longer the woman I had known, and her words no longer touched me or made me afraid, neither for me nor for the rest of the family. Even my father no longer treated her as before. 
Sometimes he spoke to her like a slave, and she couldn't say anything since she lived in his house and depended on him economically. The situation had turned around. She was at his mercy and had to obey him without opposition, as Islam had taught her, a woman must obey a man, whether it's her husband or her father. After a few days, she took me to Bizerta, to El Nadawar prison, where her husband was incarcerated along with his Islamist comrades. The place was filled with armed guards. On one of the roofs at the entrance of the camp, there was a machine gun ready to open fire at the slightest suspicious movement. This significant security deployment testified to the severity with which the authorities now viewed religious extremism. We passed several checkpoints before reaching Sulla's cell. My sister and her husband greeted each other without excessive emotion. Affection had no place in this location or in a revolutionary's life. Ah! Kareem, finally! exclaimed Sulla Karkar. He didn't seem to have suffered mistreatment. His face only bore a slight sign of fatigue. His faith in the Islamic revolution had shielded him from physical and moral decay, belief is the best remedy against deprivation. His calm gaze displayed the firmness of his patience, the determinism of his struggle. So, did you resist the European devils? He asked me. I had now mastered the art of avoiding confrontation. I told him what he wanted to hear without getting involved. I let them come to me to observe them better. They revealed themselves, but they never knew I understood their game. Good. I'm very pleased. Listen to me carefully now. The Tunisian state has transformed into a hellish despotic machine. The politicians imprison me while I am an honest man. They threw me behind bars like a common dog just because I defend the freedom of believers. Is it a crime to want to live in the love of Allah? I am a victim of the greatest injustice. But my imprisonment serves the cause of Islam. Know that other fighters have taken up the torch. Soon, the Islamic State will be victorious, it's the will of Allah. Until that glorious day comes, relentlessly pursue your learning so that tomorrow you can participate in the revolution. Then my brother-in-law took my sister aside, and they began a hushed conversation. They spoke as discreetly as possible, but I still heard despite that. He gave her instructions, a list of contacts. Sulla Karkar evidently continued to communicate with the Islamist party through my sister. This weekly meeting allowed him to direct the movement. From what I understood, he was in conflict with Rached el Ganuchi. He accused him of high-level treason concerning the Islamist cause, told my sister that Ratched was likely a spy for the Tunisian state, and that she should warn the party's people against him and his circle. He also discussed negotiations with the state for the release of Islamist detainees. He was furious, saying he'd prefer to die than to abandon or change their plans, and there was no need to negotiate with the enemy. The detainees were divided between pro ganucci and pro karkar that is, between those who wanted to negotiate with the state and those who refused any discussion. The divide was growing, which would change the course for the future of the Islamist movement. The visit over, we headed back home. My sister didn't say a word on the way back, as if she no longer believed in her husband. But it was clear that she would continue to follow him to the end. She would return to her miserable present life only to bring him the food he demanded the following week. Two days before the prison visit, I had seen her prepare all kinds of food, chicken, meat, three to four types of fruits, a real feast. Indeed, each political prisoner was entitled to one visit per week, so the families of seven detainees organized themselves to cover all seven days of the week. They prepared meals fit for kings. Hence their good appearance, they had nothing else to do but eat, sleep, talk, and pray. On the other hand, Samira and her children didn't taste this food, they had to make do with a meager soup. I felt sad to see her in such a precarious situation, but everything my mother had predicted was true, my sister was without work or support. Anti-Islamic practice or not, I celebrated my 16th birthday on August 4th, 
1982, my own way, without asking anyone's permission, not even my sister's, who said nothing as she was too busy securing her own survival and that of her children. This stay in Tunisia, though short, reminded me that I was Tunisian and that, whatever I did, I would always remain so. That, I had somewhat forgotten, as I had integrated so well into France that I almost considered myself French. But this return to the homeland reminded me of my origins and what I truly was, inducing doubt about my identity. I asked myself the big question, what am I? Who am I? Indeed, this return once again shuffled all the cards in my mind. And the worst was seeing what had become of my second sister. Despite all my resentment towards her, her distress shocked me, and at that moment, I blamed neither Islam nor Islamism. In my eyes, the culprit was the government. Why did Bourguiba hold such animosity towards Islamists? I knew my mother had feared these same Islamists, but due to my young age, I couldn't connect my mother's fear for her children with Bourguiba's fear for his people. It was only later that I managed to do so. Bourguiba had taken strong measures against Islamists. My mother had witnessed, powerless and defenseless, the tearing apart of our family. If she hadn't used cunning to save what she could of the family from Islamism, and especially to save herself, she would never have succeeded. Unfortunately, by placing her trust in French society, she was wrong once again. Believing that in France, we would be safe from Islamism, she didn't watch over us enough, thinking that the most important thing to achieve independence was to have money. Thus, she was wrong multiple times, like those governments that failed to overcome this globally transmissible disease called Islamism. Despite the difficult situation my sister found herself in after her husband's arrest, she still believed in Islam. Throughout my stay in Tunisia, she kept urging me not to forget my origins and my faith in Allah. And above all, she advised me to enroll in a school where Arabic is studied. All this influenced me and once again raised doubts in me about the French. Moreover, seeing her situation and that of her husband, I couldn't help but feel revolted with her against this pro-Western government that sought to uproot the Tunisian people from their roots and strip them of their identity. Samira repeated that the West couldn't achieve this goal through direct colonization, but it left our countries through the door only to return through the window by putting governments in power that served its interests and made us submissive slaves. To hear her speak, the only thing that could save us was holding on to our faith in Islam and spreading it in Europe. In reality, these ideas didn't originate from her but from her husband, every time she visited him in prison, he filled her head and gave her directions on everything she should do and say, like a puppet. She had become a faded person, without her own personality. Islamism had achieved from her what it imposes on all its followers, complete erasure. The Delinquency Late August, I returned to Paris. On that day, a storm was brewing. Dark clouds gathered on the horizon like an endless funeral procession. Around 5 p.m., lightning tore through the sky, and torrential rain poured down on the city, slowing down traffic, driving pedestrians off the streets. When the rain ceased, a smell of soot filled the air. My mother's new home was in Huil's Carriers, in a quiet neighborhood in the western suburbs. It was a house without a garden, with a ground floor shop. The first floor accommodation included, apart from the kitchen and bathroom, two bedrooms and a living room. This tight space forced the partially reassembled family unit into a certain solidarity. However, everyone had their own activities and organized their days freely. As a half-bored student, I only came home late in the day, sometimes very late. To ensure that we lacked nothing, my mother took on several jobs. For the first time, Signs of fatigue were showing on her. Her eyes were circled, her complexion gray, her breath short. In addition to her role as head of the family, urban stress contributed to wearing her down. She left early in the morning and often returned after 10 p.m. When she arrived, she cleaned the house because no one else took care of it, except for me when I found the time. Each of the others only cared about themselves. 
After cleaning, she prepared food for the next day, washed the dishes, and went to bed after midnight. She was up again at 6 a.m. to prepare breakfast for us before going to work. She did this every day, even on Sundays. She regained her freedom and her little family, which she had lost in Tunisia due to Islamism. She wanted to rebuild a family in exile, giving more importance this time to money than to education. Yes, she had indeed changed. She no longer believed that only education could provide a decent living, now, money also mattered. She encouraged us to work as early as possible, and she offered new proverbs, with money, you leave a good trail in the sea, or, with money, the tail becomes the head. Due to the change of residence, I could no longer continue my studies at Jean Zay Middle School. So, I had to change schools. Since I knew Arabic, I asked to enroll in a school where Arabic could be chosen as the first language. The closest school to us with this option was André Doucette Middle School in Nanterre. The students there were mostly Algerian. I thought that I would easily adapt to this new life, where I would find North African camaraderie again. One of the reasons that had led me to choose a school where Arabic was taught was my sister's recommendation to associate with Muslims and not forget my origins. Moreover, since I already knew Arabic, I would have a good level that would strengthen my overall average. Earlier, I would have never thought about it. I didn't even know that you could study Arabic in France. But after my summer stay in Tunisia, several things had changed in me as I witnessed my sister's distress following her husband's imprisonment. I couldn't accept this, and I decided to empathize in my own way by enrolling in a school where I would study Arabic. It was only later that I understood that Islamists tend to position themselves as victims to gain the support of the naive. With my enrollment in this school, I discovered another side of France. I expected French racism against foreigners, and it was quite the opposite. Strong racism towards France and the French had developed among the students, especially the Algerians. This racism wasn't concealed behind diplomatic or veiled words, as is often the case. On the contrary, it was openly displayed without shame, sometimes even shouted out loud. Within the walls of this institution, I found the hatred that my brother-in-law kept harping on and had tried to instill in me in the past. This deeply shocked me. In my class, four Algerians spent their time disrupting and causing chaos during lessons. They couldn't sit still, gesticulating in all directions. Their nervousness showed an internal turmoil, a glaring psychological instability. Uprooted, lacking ambition, constantly convincing themselves that they had no future, they filled the void of their existence by swearing all day long against the French, whom they blamed for their misfortunes. Where did this resentment come from? Apparently, it originated from the numerous traumas resulting from the Algerian War. It seems that this wound never healed. These adolescents were drowned in the hateful words of their parents, who themselves were engulfed in the bloody memory of the war. Vengeance, death to the French who burned our brothers and our land. This is what they heard daily from their earliest childhood. Moreover, the urban environment did not aid their integration. They lived in housing projects where the concrete-colored buildings stood like pylons. Boredom lingered everywhere, it saturated the walls of the complex, the stores, the parking lots, the stairwells, the hallways. In the courtyards, on the plazas, young people of North African origin seemed to endlessly circle, their demeanor as gloomy as the faded facades of the buildings. They engaged in disorderly games that often ended in confusion, revealing a profound idleness. It was at this moment that the drift began that would lead me back to Islamist circles. It's a natural behavior for a North African to side with their fellow people, even if they're wrong. I had to choose my side, and I couldn't agree with a foreigner, especially a French person, even if they were right. Otherwise, I would have been considered a traitor, a sellout. I didn't have a choice. And then, while condemning deep down the racism of these four boys, I felt irresistibly drawn to them by a force I couldn't resist. Evil is as attractive as good. Did the intensity of their words evoke a kind of exhilaration in me? 
A vibration of rebellion. A dark romanticism. I became friends with them and soon tragically slipped to the wrong side. Initially just acquaintances, we became inseparable friends. Very quickly, I gained their trust, and even faster, I became their accomplice. Strangely, my companions had not yet been touched by Islamism. They had certainly heard the word, which sometimes circulated in conversation, but they had never sought to know its meaning. Islamist agents had not yet come to exert their deleterious influence in their suburban community. Their hatred was expressed through acts of vandalism, threatening words directed at any European-looking passerby. They incited fights, threw stones at cars, showing no fear in the face of danger, as if to make it clear to their victims that they were capable of the worst. French students, young Algerians hit them, stole their school supplies, their cafeteria meals, under the pretext that the French didn't want our success, that they hindered us, that they were traitors. The others were terrified, they didn't dare to complain out of fear of new reprisals. Caught in such turmoil, I lost interest in my studies. In the family, with each occupied by their own studies, my descent into violence went unnoticed. Teachers tried to reason with me, but nothing worked. I was literally enchanted by these reprehensible acts, the tormented expressions of our victims exhilarated me. How could I give up such power? Most teachers couldn't control the unruly behavior of the gang. Only the history and geography teacher managed to maintain relative calm in her class. Attentive to students, never giving up, smiling when some minds began to heat up, this woman had managed to assert her authority gently through the simple power of her kindness and her words. When she spoke, there was an extraordinary grace in her that enchanted even the most stubborn. One day, while discussing the Nazi period, one of my companions uttered hateful words about Jews. Concealing her anger as much as her disgust, she tried to open his mind by recounting the genocide of Jews in all its ignominy, explaining how his words could someday turn against his own people to the point of provoking a new massacre. Hatred begets hatred, she reminded us. She also explained the equality of peoples, the foundations of human rights, and the meaning of the word tolerance. For over half an hour, she lectured with incredible rigor, supporting her arguments with specific examples. The power of her speech was such that we all remained speechless. I was captivated. We received an immense lesson in humanism there, realizing the horror of the Holocaust. However, it wasn't until years later that I would grasp its true significance. Something beneficial was taking shape within me, which would continue to mature even as I followed the path of violence. I found myself caught in the grip of opposing forces. My quest for absolutes had yet to find the breath that would allow me to flourish. I felt it without being able to explain it. The sufferings endured during my childhood continued to affect me internally, to the point that I delighted in reproducing them onto others. My violence further debased me, granting me a perverse pleasure, an infernal cycle of masochism. Lastly, the brainwashing done by my brother-in-law contributed to my downward spiral. My quarterly school report was more than mediocre. My mother didn't realize. She was tired, lacking the will to oversee her children's education. Her mind was elsewhere, searching for the peace she had been deprived of until then. The years passed, she hadn't had her share of dreams, her happiness had repeatedly been postponed to tomorrows that had come too late. It was time for her to take care of her own life. I found myself left to my own devices. A new event marked me to the point of pushing me further onto the wrong path. While we were in the neighborhood where my friends lived, suddenly the sound of a gunshot rang out. On the ground, a young North African lay in a pool of blood, his abdomen pierced by a bullet. Hypnotized by the sight of the corpse, I began to tremble, my anxiety mixing with the sorrow felt over the loss of a Muslim brother. The ambulance arrived in moments and left with the body. In the afternoon, it was learned that the murderer was a Frenchman who lived nearby. In the evening, the news on TV announced the tragedy. 
the assassin claimed to have shot because he couldn't stand to hear the young people making noise outside his windows. Deemed mentally ill, he was placed in a psychiatric hospital by the court. The swift handling of the case by the authorities caused a deep sense of injustice within the entire North African community of Nanterre. A protest demonstration was organized. I took part, along with students, teachers, the school principal, and the mayor of Nanterre. But it changed nothing, the case was closed. It was then that my four Algerian companions and I decided to avenge this unjust decision. We would wage this war in the name of the murdered young brother, but also in the name of the resistance fighters killed during the Algerian war. The infernal spiral of violence was accelerating. This time, it took the form of a genuine plan of destruction. Each member of the gang received a daily mission. Telephone booths, RR trains, warehouses, cars, shop windows, and more were all vandalized with meticulous care, the city walls were covered in offensive graffiti. Each person contributed to an internal fund to purchase the necessary materials. As for me, I assumed the coordination of all the operations. I no longer know what personally drove me to continue these delinquent acts. In matters of violence, logic often fades, leaving dark forces to take hold of one's being. In a nameless blindness, I began to transform this anarchic gang into an organized, structured movement, equipped with an effective strategy in carrying out actions on a regional scale. From petty delinquency, I now claimed to enter the realm of politics, our movement would defend the sacred cause. Victims would no longer be chosen at random but according to precise criteria, particularly for their displayed hatred towards the Muslim world. We needed to quickly come up with a symbol, a secret code, rules of conduct, funding, establish a manifesto, annual objectives, in short, transition from amateurism to professionalism. Intoxicated by these acts of violence, I was like a madman, devoid of any reference points, having lost the sense of values. I acted unbeknownst to my family, never displaying my disdain for the French at any moment. To my family, I was still a teenager with a gentle character. Suddenly, I realized that I had crossed the limits of tolerance, all of this was leading to disaster. Our blind hatred had led us to attack innocence. This war we were waging against the French would turn its victims into martyrs, forcing them to take up arms in return. Remorse tore at my soul, but how could I turn back? It was too late, evil wore its wicked grin. I was like a child struggling amidst contradictions. Not knowing how to return to normalcy, I plunged into distress. Strangely, the shame of these excesses seized our group as quickly as the spirit of vengeance had ignited it. Almost without needing to consult each other, we completely stopped these activities. What has become of my former companions today? Have they truly realized the madness that hatred led us into? I have never crossed paths with them again. Our friendship had rested on a bad foundation. We had wasted that school year. Idleness plunged me into incredible sadness. My shame was immense, I no longer ate and remained huddled in my room, fearing the wrath of hell. I was seized by dizziness, spasms that lifted my heart to the point of vomiting. At night, I sank into dreadful nightmares, from which I woke up in a startle, panting and covered in sweat. In the surrounding neighborhoods, delinquency triumphed. Families were breaking apart, academic failure, drugs, unemployment, idleness. For thousands of teenagers, the horizon was clouded with black. Elders set a bad example for the younger ones. Everyday life was steeped in insults, the poverty of language the only means of expression reflecting misunderstood sensitivities, while the state allowed the situation to deteriorate. A windfall for the Islamist networks. Soon, all these youths would swell the ranks of Islamist warriors, the hatred of the suburbs would spread to the gates of the capital. And France would tremble from this boundless delinquency that nothing could contain except Islamism a more organized and dangerous Islamism because it directed a sacred and thoughtful delinquency. My mother's exhaustion worsened. Her new husband was in agony at the hospital. 
I had changed, but no one noticed or suspected the drama of my drift. As often happens in families, tragedies unfold right under their noses, but they don't see them. I had to bear the weight of my own life, which made me less clear-sighted towards the outside world. Since the death of that young Moroccan, I could no longer look at the French as before. I had already begun to focus only on their negative aspects. I had become attentive to all words, gestures, and behaviors that could contain racism towards Arabs and especially Islam. At first, I also saw the racism of Muslims towards the French, but after this crime, I only saw the racism of the French towards Muslims. A simple look, gesture, or word from a French person, and for me, it was a racist act. I became paranoid and hypersensitive, and I began to think that my place was no longer in France. I lost interest in my studies, especially with my poor results and no family supervision. Sometimes, I didn't even go to school. I found myself wandering alone in Paris. Paris and Christianity During the school year 1982-1983, since no one was asking me where I was or what I was doing, I truly began to explore Paris. I had a Zone 4 orange card, which allowed me to travel anywhere, and I could wander the streets and admire the landmarks from morning till night if I wished. I first explored the Montmartre district, Place du Tertre, the Esplanade. I also enjoyed slipping into the Sacre-Cœur Church, where I marveled at the beauty of the blue and gold stained glass windows that reminded me of the wings of the giant birds from my childhood dreams. One day, I turned into Martyr Street, headed towards the opera, passed by the Louvre, crossed the Seine, and stopped for a long while to watch the boats facing the Isle St. Louis. Then I reached the St. Germain district, where I was surprised to find so many bookstores. I perused many books, measuring with astonishment the extent of human knowledge, philosophy, anthropology, sociology, literature, law, marketing, occult sciences, management, so many specialized and varied fields. What was all this knowledge for? Was it for the sake of domination? The Western man didn't pray, he raced in all directions, mastered interest rates, spoke of economic warfare, created material wealth, comfort, leisure, and always seemed unsatisfied. Toward what ideal was he striving? All of this remained confused in my mind, torn by contradiction. I had a special fondness for the Georges Pompidou Center District, and I made it my headquarters. One afternoon, I saw a gathering of people on the esplanade of the Beaubourg Museum. They were Christians who called themselves the Children of Christ. One of them, with long hair and an exalted face, was preaching with remarkable fervor. His hands kept tracing movements filled with his religious passion. Mysticism suddenly awakened deep within me. In fact, anything related to spirituality immediately transported me. Nothing else truly interested me, my dreams and gazes would eventually merge into the idea of God. Fascinated by this young man's words, I decided to talk to him, and soon we moved to a cafe to continue our discussion. I don't see people praying around me, I pointed out. Have Christians lost faith? People are preoccupied with the problems of daily life, the young man retorted. They live far from the principles of love and respect for their neighbors, which are the only path to happiness. They fail to see that Jesus' words are the answer to all their woes. In truth, they are lost in a world of doubt. Love and respect for one's neighbor are also at the core of Islam. Of course. Because our two religions come from the Old Testament, which establishes love as a universal truth. Every person seeks God in their own way, the forms of belief are manifold, but their goal is identical, to merge with heaven, that is, to love infinitely. The diversity of worship attests to the richness of man. This richness is in the image of God. Then why did Christians once fight Muslims? Because evil exists and it is inseparable from truth. Evil is a mirror, a tool. God leaves us free to choose our actions, for man must find his own path to redemption through his battle against evil. The Crusades responded to political and economic ambitions. 
evil also acted by cultivating in man a taste for power. This is part of the trial we will one day overcome. In Islam today, there is also this desire for domination. That's why I preach the rapprochement of all humanist believers. The conversation lasted until late afternoon, and it continued on the following Saturdays. I always emerged from it deeply moved, my imagination ablaze. After these discussions, I reconsidered my judgment of Christians and the French. It was during this period that I began reading the Bible and the Gospels. The history of religions became my passion. I delved into Judaism, Buddhism. My readings led me to recognize that Islam didn't hold a monopoly on truth, contrary to what I had always been told. Far from wanting to abandon Islam, I tried to highlight the commonalities or divergences between different religions without subjecting them to any order of preference. I learned from then on that the word God is a general term, that each belief has its God, and that Allah is the God that Muslims want to impose on the world. At Christmas 1982, I broke a serious taboo, I attended a Christian Mass. The fervor of the songs and the sermon washed over me like a crashing wave. But even though I felt great joy in experiencing this religious practice, I decided to set it aside for the moment, deeming it essential to preserve my roots above all. Because I believe that an individual without roots is a dead person. What I liked most about the Christians I interacted with was, on one hand, their warmth, and on the other, their faith. With them, I felt in a very special way the faith in a God of tenderness and forgiveness that my grandmother had instilled in me. This divine tenderness, this forgiveness, I would have needed so much during that period. It was a revelation for me. Not to the extent of converting to Christianity, but at least I had this spiritual revelation of a God of love, a notion unknown in Sunni Islam. Because, I still affirm today after all these years, I have never detected an ounce of spirituality in Sunni Islam, except for that of my grandmother, inherited from distant traditions that have little to do with Orthodox Islam. This group of Christians, the Children of Christ, I don't know if they were a sect or just a group, as my interactions with them were personal relationships with some of their members. But I didn't feel any racism from them. On the contrary, I sensed a very elevated humanism, a love for human beings, and a strong spirituality directed toward God. And I must say that associating with them prevented me from sinking into delinquency and helped me maintain my distance from the Algerian group, to which I still maintained a friendship. I even tried to calm them down, to talk to them about Islam and its principles of tolerance, as I believed before. Despite their rebellious spirit, when I talked to them about it, they showed great respect, as if it were a sacred thing not to be touched or discussed. They felt like sinners and hoped to one day find the path to peace. Discovery of Shurism I had never finished exploring Paris. One Saturday, as I was passing through the Barbes district, I heard a clamor rising from Boulevard Magenta. I seemed to recognize Arabic words. I took a few steps, turned, and stopped in amazement. In front of me, a crowd of Muslim religious figures were shouting in unison, Allahu Akbar, God is great, Khomeini has won the victory of Islam. He is our leader. Down with despots. At the forefront of the demonstration, there were women dressed in black fabrics. Their graceful stride expressed the grandeur of mysticism. I was captivated. There was an intense spiritual emotion emanating from these religious figures. I had never experienced such strength before. Besides their mystical fervor, they seemed bound by a fraternal bond. Their powerful voices intoxicated my soul. Passers-by couldn't help but watch the religious procession. They were intrigued, irritated, but ultimately they stopped for a long moment, unable to utter a word. After all the doubts that had poisoned my life, I felt a sense of well-being at the sight of these believers. It was as if they were calling me to join them. I had finally found what I had always been looking for, a certainty, a tranquility, a sort of paradise on earth. Seeing that I was about to follow their march, a young protester broke away from his group and approached me. Forgive me, he said, 
are you a Muslim? Yes, I replied timidly. Would you be willing to sign a petition against the war Saddam Hussein is waging against Iran and its people? He is a criminal wasting the blood of Muslims. How will my signature help you? The more signatures we have, the better we can pressure the international opinion and end this war. All right. Then, I would be happy to participate in your movement. By agreeing to join this cause, I had no idea that I was fulfilling the wish of my sister and my brother-in-law. This encounter would indeed have dramatic consequences. The protester was Algerian. I walked alongside him, proud to share his struggle. During the march, the procession stopped in front of a synagogue. The protesters began to shout anti-Semitic words and recite verses from the Quran. We all clung to each other's arms to move forward in unison and shout slogans like, Kabar, Kabar, O Jews, the army of Muhammad is thirsty for you. The battle of Kabar was fought during the time of Muhammad by the Muslim army against the Jews. The defeated Jews were reduced to servitude, and this became a symbol of Muslim victory over the Jews. At the end of the demonstration, the Algerian who recruited me held me back gently. Would you be interested in visiting our cultural center? Oh yes. I responded enthusiastically, unknowingly signing my allegiance to Shiite political Islam. In the middle of the reception hall of the Iranian cultural center El Kanaun, an immense portrait of Khomeini seemed to radiate a magical aura throughout the room. His white beard and piercing eyes commanded respect. The Algerian led me to the first floor, where about 30 people were engaged in conversations in small groups. One of them gave me a suspicious look. He stared at me for a moment so intense that I had to lower my gaze. The atmosphere of the place was strange, despite the lingering spiritual ambience. I was offered to watch a film about the Iranian Revolution. The lights went out, and the image of Khomeini appeared on the screen. Soon, a mystical fervor took hold of me. My hands were trembling, I felt both hot and cold at the same time. On the screen, the faithful were seen raising their fists, marching in the streets of Tehran, chanting the victory of their spiritual leader. The portrait of the Shah was burning amidst the believers' cries. The people were finally liberated from the monarchist dictatorship, secretly supported by Western countries. The people would live in Allah's will, experiencing happiness on earth. Religious schools were being organized, and the new society was setting in motion. Like most propaganda films, this documentary aimed to awaken forms of primal patriotism, except that it was a religious patriotism. The array of lyrical imagery was deployed to touch the viewer's sensitive chord. In one hour, I experienced centuries of religious fervor. I was in a trance. When prayer time arrived, the believers headed to the restroom for ablutions. I noticed that the rituals of ablution and prayer were different from what I had known until then. What is this way of performing prayer? I asked. You know there are two doctrines in Islam, I was told, one Sunni, which is widespread in North African regions and the majority of Muslim countries, and the other Shiite, which is mainly in Iran and some Middle Eastern countries. We follow the Shiite tradition. I was then asked to introduce myself. Remaining reserved, I told the story of my family while softening certain facts, especially my brother-in-law's activities. I also shared my ideas, plans, how I envisioned the future, emphasizing my ambition to contribute to the construction of a just and spiritual society, as well as a society concerned with maintaining peace among peoples. Except for my naive pacifism, which provoked a few ironic smiles in the assembly, my declaration of faith was not displeasing to my interlocutors. My admission to the center was accepted unanimously, and the religious figures warmly welcomed me as a brother and invited me to share their dinner. We sat on the linoleum floor for the meal. The atmosphere was joyful, without departing from a spirit of discipline and seriousness that seemed to be their common motto. I was asked to join them at the center the following Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Returning home, I was exhilarated with happiness. I had found a second family where I could freely express myself, 
surrounded by my Muslim brothers. What's the matter, my son, that you're so excited? My mother asked me. I'm just as happy as a bird flying in the blue sky. It's strange, your attitude reminds me of your sister's before her marriage. Rest assured, mom, I'm a free man, and I will always remain one. She said the same thing, and you know how far she went. Yes. But I'm not like her. I'm not imposing anything on you. Thankfully. She said. We know where this madness led us. The following Saturday, I arrived at the Iranian Cultural Center well before the scheduled time. I had to pace up and down the street out of fear that arriving too early would reveal to my new companions my lack of serenity. In the early days, I was tasked with preparing banners for protests against the war led by Saddam Hussein against Iran. While working, I conversed with my Algerian interlocutor. These discussions made me realize the gap between Sunnis and Shiites in terms of their approach to the Islamic revolution. From the Shiite perspective, here's how a Sunni Islamist behaves, once religious practice and learning are assimilated, they engage in the fight to convince the unbelievers to join their faith. To do this, they use indirect language, avoiding direct confrontation. Family members are their first targets, any rebellious element is avoided. Then, the circle widens to neighbors, friends, and ascends to regional and national representatives, and finally to state representatives and the supreme leader. International war can then take place. Sunni Islamism thus starts with the individual and reaches the state. Once it becomes the majority, it imposes its rules through elections or by force if refused. This method was indeed the one used by my brother-in-law. Suddenly, my family's past took on a new light. The Shiite approach in this matter is the opposite, it's the enemy states that are subjected to relentless attacks first, namely the United States, Israel, and European countries. Political action is dominant. All human, strategic, military, economic means, etc. must be used to annihilate them from within. On a daily basis, the Shiite revolutionary's mission is to convince those around him of the political and economic failure of the country's leaders, then to train new fighters on the ground, who will replicate the same process according to the principle of the pyramidal system. This is primarily an ideological war aimed at creating a dissenting opinion current within countries, leading to the overthrow of states. Religion doesn't play a role during this initial phase. Convinced of the political power of Shia Islam, the revolutionary can then begin converting Sunni elements to this doctrine. Religion comes into play then, without attempting to impose worship practices like prayer, fasting, etc. On the prospective converts, the political tool becomes the major weapon of the Shia revolutionaries. This Shia method of focusing on the common enemy and immediately targeting a political objective to topple, with everyone participating, believers and non-believers, practitioners and non-practitioners, reminded me of the Iranian revolution, where veiled and unveiled women, Christians, Jews, Islamist and communist Muslims all stood against the Shah of Iran. For the Shia, bringing down the head is the first step. The rest follows gradually, as per a precise plan. It brings to mind what's happening today in the Arab Muslim world, where it seems like we're witnessing many Islamic revolutions, like in Tunisia. Certainly, neither the situation nor the time allows for a repeat of the Iranian example, but isn't the goal the same, to establish Islamic states through means other than elections? How sad it is to see supposedly free countries, progressive political parties, and humanitarian organizations believing in an Islam of freedom. Listening to the Shia comrades, I was discovering a new perspective. In its complexity, Shurism addressed what I had always dreamed of, both in terms of politics and religion, unifying humanity beyond its contradictions. Through these conversations, I absorbed this idea a bit more. I didn't yet perceive the true intentions of the advocates of this doctrine, who ultimately covet global power. At times, I had moments of clarity and kept some distance. But the persuasive force of my interlocutors always pulled me back into their ranks. 
I was caught in the trap of political Islam, as I would come to realize later on. My Conversion to Shurism In the evenings after class, I regularly headed to the Iranian Cultural Center, and also on weekends. Initially, my younger brother willingly accompanied me, but he quickly grew bored of these meetings. This period allowed me to shape my political thoughts. Through interactions with my newfound brothers, I sharpened my arguments, enriched my vocabulary, and read numerous books, to the point where I soon possessed the entire arsenal of revolutionary rhetoric. One day, I hung a poster of Komiani in my room. When my older brother woke up in the same room, he thought he saw the devil himself above his bed. He found the religious leader's head horrifying, to the extent that he had nightmares. The poster, however, remained in its place. I was drawn to this spiritual leader, even if I didn't follow the religious practices he advocated. It might sound paradoxical, but a part of my consciousness refused to submit, instinctively. I was both curious and skeptical. These two tendencies constantly clashed within me, sometimes plunging me into deep confusion. Truth be told, I may not have met the criteria of the perfect practitioner as my Shiite companions understood it, but religious practice took a back seat for them. This continued for more than six months, an intensive training, reading, videos, audio materials, not to mention speeches and private discussions to thoroughly inform myself, especially in terms of politics. Whether one was Shiite or not, prayed or not, wore a veil or not. The important thing was to be part of the Islamic Ummah against everything Western and Zionist. Throughout the 1982-1983 school year, I was guided and trained, body and soul, toward one goal, hatred of the West and the promotion of the Islamic nation. At the beginning of the summer of 1983, Prokomiani demonstrations were taking place in a tense atmosphere. The police closely monitored the activities of the Iranian Cultural Center and intervened most of the time to disperse the protesters. This didn't change my habits. One day, when I had settled into the library on the first floor of the center, I met a young man from southern Tunisia. The conversation with him started quickly, as if we knew each other, or rather as if he already knew some things about me, which has made me think since then that my Algerian friend was the initiator of this encounter. Why are you living in Paris, Karim? Well, it's a long story. I initially came to have my injured arm examined by a specialist. What's wrong with your arm? It's fractured. I've had two surgeries at the hospital in Argentite, without success. As you can see, my arm doesn't fully extend. Does it bother you in performing everyday tasks? No, not really. I've gotten used to it. But why this question? I'm always concerned about my brother's health. Tell me about your family. We're a Tunisian family with nine children. I live in a suburb with my mother and siblings. My father lives in Tunis in the Ariana neighborhood. One of my sisters is the wife of a leader of the Islamist movement in Adida, previously known as MTI or El Idija El Islami. The authorities have imprisoned him. I believe he will be released soon. Ah. That's interesting. Are you close to your brother-in-law? Let's just say that certain aspects of his character strongly displease me. Which ones? His interpretation of religion is not quite the same as mine. Your brother-in-law is Sunni, I suppose. That's probably why you can't fully embrace his ideas. That's right. Plus, I fear he's not a trustworthy person. Power is all that matters to him. I see, my interlocutor said thoughtfully. But you should still maintain contact with him. Now tell me, what are your plans for the future? To build a better world. So, you're a brother. You know, I used to be part of the Tunisian Islamic movement too. Oh really? And now you're not a part of it anymore. No. Now I'm Shiite, the young man concluded. Actually, I'd like to know how to become Shiite because, honestly, I've read a lot about their ideas and I'm drawn to them. 
it seems to me that Shurism is the true Islam. Everything in due time, my brother. If you'd like, I'll personally take care of you. With my new Tunisian friend, we met several times at the same place. However, he quickly advised me to definitively leave the Iranian Cultural Center, which was under close surveillance by the French police. This warning was well founded, as a few days later the police expelled the Iranian religious figures and shut down the center. This proved that this young friend had first hand information. From then on, we met either at the Beaubourg district or on the Champelassis. He provided me with the documentation and books I needed to fully understand Shurism and convert. In reality, he belonged to the Islamist network in which he was notably responsible for recruitment. Unbeknownst to me, I was on the list of future agents for this organization. My familial connection with a high-ranking leader of MTI was of great interest to the leaders of the Islamist network based in Iran. Through this connection, they saw a means to infiltrate existing Tunisian Islamists, given that Tunisia played a central role in the international Islamic network strategy. As the days went by, our friendship solidified. This young Tunisian displayed a strong sense of organization and quick decision-making skills. The time and location of our meetings were decided at the last moment and changed each time. When we walked together on the street, he preferred walking to talk, as walking attracted less attention, he would frequently stop in front of a shop window to check if we were being followed. He lived in a small room that he shared with two other Tunisians who were part of MTI and who were unaware that he had become Shiite. He had asked me to never mention this fact. Our discussions often revolved around the differences between Sunnis and Shiites. My friend used great finesse to guide me toward embracing the Shiite doctrine, with the art being that the initiative should come from me. After a few weeks, I clearly voiced my support for the Shiite doctrine, convinced that it aligned with my deep-seated convictions. My Tunisian friend had achieved a first victory, the hardest part was done. The next step was to convince me to undergo special training in Iran to attain the status of an agent in the International Islamist Network. According to my friend, a good Shiite should know the names of the twelve imams descending from Imam Hussein, son of Ali and his wife Fatma. Only they can perpetuate the word of Allah, for there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. The twelfth Imam, Mehdi, who disappeared in a cave in Iraq, is supposed to return among men to save humanity. For me, this was a significant revelation. From that day forward, I began studying the foundations of the Shiite doctrine in depth, unbeknownst to my instructor. My academic results were mediocre that year. I didn't repeat the grade, but I also didn't pass the exams to continue my studies up to the baccalaureate level. So, against my wishes, I had to steer towards a technical track. This saddened and discouraged me. My mother, however, wasn't upset, quite the opposite. She said it would allow me to learn a trade, find a job, and build my future more quickly. So, I was enrolled to start in September 1983 in a vocational high school, in the electronics section. But I was beginning to see my future not in a trade, but rather as a soldier of Allah. If you only knew how bored I am with electronics. I confided in the young Tunisian. These vocational studies won't bring me anything. This isn't the way I'll achieve my goals. I have to take action quickly. What would you like to do exactly? You know as well as I do. Be patient, the horizon should clear up soon. My friend obviously had an idea in mind. In July, my older brother left home to live with his girlfriend, the rest of the family went on vacation to Tunis, and I found myself alone in Paris. As I was alone, I invited the young Tunisian to stay at my place. Several peaceful days passed, during which we were able to strengthen our ties around the Shiite doctrine, and then we organized our first meeting. The neighborhood was discreet, and the house could serve as a meeting place for Shiites, we organized several gatherings the following week. Unfortunately, this disturbed the neighbors, especially the landlords. One evening, while we were having dinner together, someone knocked on the door. Who's there? 
I asked. The landlady. Will you please open the door? My friend hid behind the partition while I opened the door. The landlady, a well-dressed woman in her forties, was impatiently standing on the doorstep, a man by her side. The man, a real Hercules, was her new Prince Charming. So, young man, he started, are you the one collecting Khomeini posters? How do you know? I replied, offended. Listen, the lady intervened, I'm asking you to vacate the premises immediately. Pack your things and leave. What's this? What's the reason? The man stepped forward, looking threatening. He was blocking the doorway, ready to burst inside the apartment. No arguing. I refuse to leave. I shouted. We'll see about this when my mother returns. The man began pushing me when the young Tunisian burst forward to stop him. The assailant stepped back but pulled a revolver from his jacket and aimed it at us. She told you to leave, clear. He thundered. It was the first time I saw a firearm pointed at me, but I felt no fear, I was so consumed by anger. No way. I yelled. We are at home here. Fine, my Tunisian friend said, raising his hands. Come on, Karim, pull yourself together, we're leaving. We found ourselves on the street, where I let out my rage and swore to get revenge. France is a sick country. Something must be done. Calm down, shouting won't help, my friend retorted. You need to learn to control yourself, otherwise, you're heading towards great danger. I can't stand injustice. He then took me by the arm and looked into my eyes. You want to do something? Well, here's what I propose, I have connections with the leaders of a religious school near Tehran. You would receive thorough religious education there. I'm sure they would be happy to welcome you. I'm in. When can I leave? Give me a few days, and I'll tell you more. And so, on a whim, I truly entered the Islamist network. Of course, this couldn't have happened without the preceding tragic events in my life. Nevertheless, I needed this final shock to bring me to this point. My Tunisian friend left me in a public garden, saying he would come back to get me. The wait felt endless. I waited and questioned myself. What was he doing all this time? I had been waiting for hours. I returned home to check if everything was okay and discovered that the landlady had changed the locks. Enough was enough. I went straight to the nearest police station to file a complaint. The landlady and her friend were summoned and flatly denied the alleged incidents, including the attempt at intimidation with a firearm. Informed of the incident, my brother went to the police station. According to the commissioner, the only alternative was for me to be placed in a boarding school for minors until my mother returned. As for the landlady and her friend, they were severely reprimanded, if they repeated such actions, they would face legal consequences. I was pleasantly surprised by the police's loyalty. I couldn't believe that it might be in my favor. Was the law truly equal for everyone? In the car that took me to the boarding school, one of the officers reassured me, saying he would intervene at the slightest misstep by the landlady. I settled my things in my new room. Two days later, I asked the headmaster for permission to leave for a few hours. He agreed. Immediately, I went to Paris to reassure my older brother and, above all, to find the young Tunisian. So, I pressed him, do you have any news about Iran? When can I leave? You'll have to wait a few more days, my friend retorted. Ah! I'm so happy. I'm so eager. Hey, a little patience. You know, the landlady changed the locks at the house. I had to complain to the police. The police? He breathed, looking alarmed and scanning his surroundings. What happened? Did they ask you about your family, your friends? Not really. Why, does that worry you? 
the police don't like Muslims, you know that well. They look for all ways to drive them out of the country. Once they've gained your trust and you're off guard, that's when they trap you. Do you understand? Yes. But I assure you, the commissioner was very kind to me. That confirms what I just told you, idiot. Where are you living now? I've been placed in a boarding school for minors. Better and better. The young man became agitated. Now, the police can monitor you as they please. I told you to wait for me and not move. When I came back and couldn't find you, I thought you might have gone home. I was waiting for you to contact me. You're really too suspicious. Well, here I am, I came to see you as soon as I sorted out my problems. Never forget that the Europeans want the destruction of Islam. Behind them are the forces of evil conspiring to turn them against the Muslim people. What are you talking about? You'll learn about it later. For now, watch your actions and your words, okay? This conversation left me puzzled. I didn't feel that the police had intended to trap me, I had behaved normally, and so had they. Moreover, the people at the boarding school had been courteous and hadn't asked any intrusive questions. My friend's attitude was curious. I visited him every two days, hoping to finally get a positive answer. When would I leave for Iran? The agreement from the religious school seemed to be undergoing a very lengthy consideration. Luckily, life at the boarding school was pleasant. I often went to the pool or on outings with the other boarders. The atmosphere was friendly, filled with games. And even on August 4th, my 17th birthday, the people at the boarding school surprised me, the monitor took us out to dinner in Paris and even treated us to ice cream. We had a lovely evening before returning to sleep. In this boarding school that housed a cosmopolitan youth in exile, all the conditions were met for optimal integration. We learned about communal living, mingled with other cultures. In short, I recharged, lived happy days, and regained a promising balance. Then the long-awaited answer arrived, I had to prepare to leave French soil to join a religious school in Iran, the name of which would be revealed to me later. Last Days of Freedom The day of departure was not yet set, I was waiting for the final instructions. Overjoyed, I called Samira to share the happy news with her. She encouraged me to follow this path which, according to her, was, the true path leading to Allah. My sister's blessing reassured me in my decision. Nothing could stop this journey now. However, faced with the proposition from the boarding school director to spend the end of summer in a holiday camp in the Lion countryside, I found myself caught in a dilemma. The camp offered a wide range of appealing sports and cultural activities. If I refused, I would have to explain myself, potentially raising suspicions. On the other hand, if I accepted, it would jeopardize my departure to Iran. I had 24 hours to decide. What should I do? My confusion made me nervous, I envisioned several courses of action, chose one, then reconsidered. Frustrated, I postponed my decision until the next day. They say the night brings counsel. Allah would surely guide me. However, upon waking up, things weren't any clearer. I entered the director's office without knowing what I would say, and ended up accepting while stuttering. Are you sure? The director insisted. I nodded, unable to look him in the eye. Afterward, I went to the Tunisian's place, who couldn't hide his irritation. What's this about you going to Lyon? Are you backing out after all? No, no, not at all. I'm going to Lyon, but I'll be back whenever it's necessary. Listen carefully, Karim. Your trip to Iran is finally ready. You'll be taking the plane next Saturday. You need to come to my place at 7 a.m. I'll give you your ticket and the final instructions. So, what's your decision? That's perfect. Trust me. I'll be there next Saturday at 7 a.m. sharp. God willing. All right. I feverishly prepared my belongings. 
I sandwiched my passport between piles of clothes, then moved it, struggling to control my nervousness. I felt like my life was on the edge of change. It seemed like the slightest misstep could have dire consequences for the events to come. On Sunday, a train took us toward Saint Etienne, myself and about ten other boys. Unable to focus, I spoke little to my new comrades. I kept to myself, my face glued to the train window, lost in thought. I couldn't shake off my anxiety. My feverish thoughts were already in the streets of Tehran, the faces of those waiting for me there, the walls of the religious school where I would enhance my knowledge of the Shiite doctrine. Would I become a hero? A great theologian? The future was brimming with mysteries. Upon arrival, a bus took us a few kilometers outside the city, deep into the countryside. In the middle of the holiday camp, there was a football field where the boys immediately began to run around, releasing their joy. I started preparing my escape, which I scheduled for the night between Thursday and Friday. In the following days, the group went on long hikes under the sun, enjoying picnics in the countryside. During these few days, I appreciated the landscapes of rural France, with its forests, meadows, and hamlets. Far from the hustle and bustle of big cities, there were families living peacefully, in harmony with the land. Doubt occasionally crossed my mind, making me hesitate about leaving, but curiosity remained stronger. On Thursday, at dawn, I paced back and forth like a caged lion. Anxious, I waited for nightfall away from my comrades. Finally, after hours of anguish, I fled around 2 a.m. The half-full moon gently illuminated the road. I walked briskly, nothing else mattered, I was now certain of my good fortune. Freedom was mine. Two hours later, I reached a village and hitchhiked on the national road. A van stopped next to me. I got in, intrigued by the Italian driver who looked like an adventurer. I had a distinct feeling of knowing him, though it was probably my heightened imagination. After a few kilometers, he dropped me off at an SNCF train station on the outskirts of Saint Etienne. As the day was breaking, I spotted the car of the camp supervisor, likely searching for me. Caution. Nothing was certain yet. I turned back and arrived at a freight train station. There, a railway worker allowed me to climb into a wagon heading to Lyon. I thanked him profusely. He was a local man, short, round, full of kindness. Understanding that I was on the run, he probably wanted to help me see this through. The rest was easy, and I knocked on my Tunisian friend's door at 5 a.m. Ah, there you are. He said. This means Allah is with you. Allah is everywhere. I replied, smiling. I almost thought you wouldn't come. Know that when I give my word, I follow through. Hmm. Now, listen carefully. Here's your flight ticket. Takeoff is scheduled for 10 o'clock. Before boarding, avoid moving around the airport. Buy a French newspaper and focus on reading it. Don't cast suspicious glances at others. You'll have a layover in Rome, where you'll board for Istanbul. There, you'll call the Marmara Hotel and ask for an Iraqi named Saeed on my behalf. He will then give you further instructions. Here's the hotel's phone number. Memorize it. I understand. Are you sure you've memorized the number well? Don't worry, dear brother, I have an elephant's memory. I can retain several pages of text in a single reading. It's a gift. Thank Allah, for your memory will be your best weapon. When will I see you again? Only Allah knows. A revolutionary's life is subject to many uncertainties. Now, take courage and good luck. I arrived at Charles de Gaulle Airport and patiently waited for boarding, following my friend's instructions. By late morning, I landed in Rome. There, making the most of a few hours of transit, I called my second sister. I'm proud of you, she said. So, what's this religious school you're joining? It's near Tehran, but
but I can't tell you more. Take good care of yourself, little brother. When I think that just a few years ago, I used to hold you in my arms. All that's in the past, sister. Now, we need to look at the future with a new perspective. Reflect on your actions, for I'm not certain you're on the right path. You hurt me, she said. Listen, the whole family knows you're on the run. Our mother is very worried. I'll reassure her, tell her you've gone on a trip and everything's fine. I send my regards, sister. Same to you. May Allah be with you. The Road to Turkey Istanbul, the ancient Constantinople, magnificent Byzantium, the Suleymanai Mosque, the crescent of religious passions. I exulted as the plane touched down on this land with an incomparable past. At seventeen, turning away from my contradictions, I had abandoned everything to live this beautiful adventure. I was embracing my dream. Outside, the heat was stifling, but instead of calling the Marmara Hotel, I decided to walk there to familiarize myself with the area. It turned out to be a very long walk. The hotel was luxurious. I couldn't imagine my contact staying in such a place. Strange. I slipped inside the building and asked for Saeed, the Iraqi. The receptionist told me she didn't know this person, that it was probably a mistake. My confusion made me nervous, and I insisted, almost creating a scene. Then another receptionist informed me that there was a second hotel with the same name located in the old quarter of Istanbul, near the Blue Mosque. I walked out, red-faced with embarrassment. I had indeed gotten the address wrong, and my clumsiness could have ruined everything. I had just landed in a world that was foreign to me, and I suddenly realized it. I allowed myself to be carried by the crowd for a long moment, disoriented and undecided. Night fell. I spent the night in a public park. When I woke up, I returned to the airport, where I called my contact. Hello, my name is Karim, I come on behalf of someone from Tunisia in Paris. Very well. Have you encountered any difficulties? No, everything is fine. Make sure you're not being followed and call me back in an hour from a different phone booth. The Iraqi hung up. I was a bit stunned. I expected a warmer welcome. Did Islam have so many enemies? I looked around, took a few steps, trying to spot possible spies. How to recognize them in this immense crowd? The few European tourists sweating like miserable creatures, their faces flushed, seemed solely occupied with finding a taxi, retrieving their luggage, or examining the city map. An hour later, I called again. Is everything normal? The Iraqi inquired. Yes, I believe so. You believe, or you are sure? Well, how can I possibly assure you? Keep your calm, young man. And stay where you are. We have your description, someone will come to pick you up. Two hours later, a man approached me. He was small, with decayed teeth, his left eye was wandering. In short, one would feel inclined to give him alms. Follow me, he said. As we left the airport, we got into a taxi whose driver seemed to know my mysterious companion. We roamed the city. The man beside me remained expressionless. A bit annoyed by this frosty welcome, I kept my gaze fixed on the window. My bad mood even prevented me from fully enjoying the spectacle of the street. The taxi stopped at a bus station. A person with fiery eyes dressed in western attire approached us. You must be Kareem, I suppose, said the stranger. Yes. But what a welcome, tell me. Don't be offended, it's the usual procedure. We are always on guard, especially in Turkey, a country sold to the West and an indirect enemy of the Islamic Revolution. The religious revolution led by our great Imam Khomeini disrupted their plans in the region, and Western intelligence services are tracking us. That's why. I thought I recognized the voice of the Iraqi. Who are you? I asked. 
It doesn't matter. How do I know you're not an imposter? Congratulations. I see you have good reflexes. A hesitant smile appeared on my lips. I regretted my somewhat aggressive attitude. Alone, without true friends, I couldn't do without the help of my interlocutors. I wasn't out of the woods yet. Are you daydreaming, Karim? The stranger said to me. Um. No, I'm listening. You'll take the next bus to Tehran, which leaves in half an hour. The stranger verbally gave me a phone number to call upon my arrival in Tehran. He didn't give me any name, I just had to present myself on behalf of Saeed. He also provided me with a visa in my name to present with my passport at the Iranian border. If I was asked why I was coming to Iran, I had to say that I was coming to study in Qum and that I was a Shiite. He emphasized not to talk too much and to answer questions briefly. If I had a problem, I was to tel them to contact the office of El Said Al Sharazi in Qum. After that, he bid me farewell and wished me good luck. Wait, I said to him, I don't have much money left. You have your bus ticket, that should be enough. The stranger got into a taxi and turned one last time to give me a smile full of ambiguity. The car started and disappeared into a cloud of dust. I settled into the bus, soon filled with travelers. There were no Europeans on board, most were Iranians and Iraqis, all Muslims. Some women were not veiled, but as we approached the Iranian border, they put on their veils, a sign that we were entering the realm of believers. I had taken a seat on the bus next to an Iranian Kurd who spoke some Arabic, he kept me company the whole way and told me about the suffering of the Kurds. It was the first time I had heard about the Kurdish people. The journey lasted two days. The bus, which wasn't very comfortable, first reached Ankara, then skirted the northern Taurus Mountains and then crossed Malatya. When it was time to cross the Iranian border, my companion became very nervous and stopped talking to me. For me, there was no problem, as soon as the customs officer saw my visa, he waved me through with a big smile, and I went back to my seat on the bus. However, my Kurdish friend and several other people were detained by the revolutionary guards, and the driver had to leave without them. Either they were wanted, or there were doubts about them. I felt sorry for him. We continued the journey to Tabriz, Kazvin, and finally arrived in Tehran. At last, Iran. I got off the bus, feeling numb as if in a dream. The journey had left me drained, my back was sore, my legs weak, and the scorching heat was further dulling my senses. But what a joy it was. Finally, I was reaching my destination. I dozed off for a while on a shaded bench, then explored the surroundings before considering contacting my contact. The street was filled with many women wearing loose black tunics, all donning the chatter. They seemed cheerful, free in their movements. Men were dressed in Western attire, except for some who wore the clothing of religious scholars. Contrary to my expectations, the markets were brimming with a variety of food items. The economic war waged against Iran by Western powers since the rise of Khomeini had, at least, not hindered the flow of goods and commodities in the country. The population appeared captivated by the Islamic Revolution, patiently abiding by the discipline imposed by the Revolutionary Guards. Tehran's architecture was not what I had imagined. The capital had retained few ancient monuments, the buildings were rather modern. During the reign of Muhammad Reza Shah, 1941-1979, significant urban development had transformed the city's appearance, removal of city walls, construction of wide avenues. After this pleasant rest, it was time to get to the heart of the matter. Before me, I read a sign indicating the direction to the airport. I decided to head there. Inside, I entered a phone booth and dialed my contact's number. My name is Kareem, I come on behalf of said. Welcome, my young friend. I am at the airport. Don't move, someone will come to pick you up soon. Two hours later, no one had come to meet me. Hunger began gnawing at my stomach. 
I had almost no money left in my pocket, and I preferred not to spend it, guessing that a ruthless tug-of-war had just begun. Had my interlocutors decided to play tricks on me? Eventually, I gave in to my impatience and called again. So, what's happening? I asked. Nothing serious, just a delay. Please wait a little longer, your guide is on the way. Oh. I almost forgot, did you have a good journey? I almost hung up on him. Excellent, thank you. I'll wait here for years if necessary, even if I die of hunger. I retorted in an ironic tone. Absolutely not. We need you, my friend. See you very soon. Regretting the arrogance of my reply, I tapped my foot, throwing dark glances around. How many faces did I not scrutinize, hoping to find a kindred soul as lost as I was? But no, nothing except the numerous, flat crowd, indifferent to my miserable fate. At one point, my empty stomach gave me dizziness, and I thought I might faint. I took a few steps to stretch my legs, then decided to call again. It's me, Kareem, I began weakly, eliciting pity. So, are you feeling better? What do you mean? I assume you're now comfortably seated, enjoying a good meal. No, I'm still at the airport. What? Your guide didn't come to pick you up. No, sir. And I'm spending my last coins to call you. All right, I'll inquire. Call me again in ten minutes. I was despairing. Perhaps the leaders of the religious school had reconsidered my application only to ultimately reject it. My interlocutor's evasive tone indicated his discomfort, he probably didn't know how to break the news to me. It was over, I would have to sleep outside, call my sister in Tunis as a last resort for help, go back home, ashamed, ridiculed, under the mocking laughter of my father. Suddenly, I saw a man heading towards me, smiling, arms outstretched. I lit up at his approach. But the man brushed past me without stopping, going to embrace a little girl jumping for joy, Daddy, Daddy. My God, I was losing my mind. It had been over half an hour of waiting. Quick, the phone. My interlocutor provided me with the address of a hotel where I had to go immediately. There, someone would take care of me. Finally, I would be leaving this accursed place. Revitalized, I hopped into a taxi driven by an Iraqi who spoke Arabic fluently. I arrived in Tehran this morning to study at a religious school, and I have no more money to pay for my fare, I told the driver once we reached the destination. I pulled out a shirt from my bag. Take it, if it suits you. All right, young man. May Allah be with you. With a peaceful mind, I watched the vehicle disappear around the corner of the street. What a kind man. But as I turned towards the hotel entrance, my stomach nodded. My first interactions with the religious had been so difficult. What would I find now? I pushed the door open and stepped inside. In front of me, a man sat in a chair, arms crossed, gaze fixed. As I stopped in front of him, he became animated and stood up. Short, brown hair, dressed in Islamic attire and a white turban, he moved with delicacy. Kareem, it's you, right? He asked with a warm smile. Yes, I timidly replied. Delighted to meet you. I'm El Sheikh Ahmed. You are my guest. Please, have a seat. With intense relief, I sank into a chair. My nerves suddenly relaxed, and I felt like I had lost control of my muscles. It all felt so unreal. Did the journey tire you out? El Sheikh Ahmed continued. A bit. But I'm eager to begin my learning. Religion is a serious matter. We're looking for strong men who can adapt to any situation. The road to the universal revolution is still long. Courage and patience are qualities to cultivate. I understand. You need to eat and rest. Tomorrow, 
one of our companions will contact you. I fell asleep like a log. Early in the morning, just after finishing my ablutions, I heard a knock on my room door. Come in. A man entered wearing the same religious attire as my host, a little younger. Good morning, young man. El Sheikh Ahmed invites you to follow me. I need to take you to a place where you'll spend a few days. All right. When can I join the religious school? I cannot tell you that. This non-answer frustrated me. I had hoped to meet my future religious teachers during the day. The vagueness of my interlocutor's speech was testing me severely. Apparently, this deliberate ambiguity was intentional, I had to endure it patiently and await the conclusion of the assessment procedures. Despite my motivation, my instinct advised me to remain reserved, after all, who were these religious individuals? Did they hold the truth? Wasn't my desire to sacrifice myself for God's work evidence of my sincerity? And why were some of them refusing to reveal their identities? How is El Sheikh Ahmed? I inquired. Why would you assume he's not well? My interlocutor retorted with a touch of arrogance. I simply wanted to be polite. That's to your credit, young man, he interrupted me, as if putting a subordinate in his place. Certainly, this man blew hot and cold. I decided to keep quiet. From now on, the religious continued, forbid yourself from revealing your true identity to anyone. I proposed the pseudonym Falahi Hassan Mohammed for you. This name is dear to me. It's the name of a recently deceased Iranian fighter pilot in combat against the Iraqi enemy. A martyr. Be proud to perpetuate his memory by taking this name. I followed my guide without a word. We left the hotel to head north in Tehran to a three-story villa. This once luxurious residence had belonged to an Iranian Shah's general and had been requisitioned at the beginning of the revolution. A sprawling, tree-filled garden extended to the back, surrounded by a wall tall enough to prevent intrusion or indiscretion. Amidst the self-sustaining vegetation, an out-of-service pool testified to the former owner's wealth. I'm Saudi, the religious confided in me. I abandoned the Sunni doctrine for Shia. I hope you will follow the same path. I came to Iran for that, I replied coldly. You'll remain in this house until further notice. Goodbye. And the Saudi man left, dragging his feet like a disenchanted child. This man, visibly from a wealthy family, did not inspire confidence in me. He seemed to be serving Allah on a whim. I took possession of my room, which faced the garden, to the south. The occupants of the two upper floors, the active members of the El Rasali network, whose name hadn't yet reached my ears, stood out for their calmness. They spoke in hushed tones, never laughed, and seemed absorbed in matters of the highest importance. In contrast, about ten Afghan families lived on the ground floor. Children ran everywhere, mothers chasing after them. These people were also dependent on the network. The leaders placed them there to train them before sending them on missions. In the afternoon, a man entered my room, dressed like his predecessors in Islamic attire, a thin beard, and an intense gaze. Without the faintest smile, he stared at me straight in the eyes for several seconds that felt like centuries. He didn't seem to be joking. I remained still, straightening my shoulders to hide my anxiety and muster courage. My destiny was at stake. Outside in the garden, children played, their high-pitched cries filling the air. My thoughts briefly drifted to my mother, who must be worried sick. So, young man, you want to learn the Shiite doctrine? The religious man began. Yes, and many other things as well. And why? Because I believe in the all-powerful twelve infallible imams descending from Ali and Fatma. I also believe in the salvational return of Imam el-Mehdi. Return. But Imam el-Mehdi has never stopped speaking to us. Ah, uh, I see. What do you see, my young friend? I see nothing. 
I'm just seeking the path of the Lord, I replied. I can only encourage you in that. Tell me about your parents now. My parents are humble believers. I have great admiration for my mother, a little less for my father. Yet your father is a good man. Don't you owe your life to him? I prefer to speak with honesty rather than lie. I exclaimed. Ah, lying, the religious man repeated with a kind of delight. A fascinating subject. Don't you think that lying, in certain circumstances, can lead to the truth? No, I don't believe so. Isn't it a sin? Certainly. But let's pose the question from a different angle, wouldn't you be willing to lie to save Allah's word? I don't know what to say. Don't worry, you'll have time to think about it. In a few months, I'm convinced you'll better grasp the multiple meanings contained within the concepts of lying and truth. I hope so, I cautiously responded. First, learn the fundamentals of the Shiite religion. Afterward, I'm sure you'll find your true path. Can I join the religious school quickly? I inquired after a hesitation. How would I know, young man? It depends on you. What do you mean? Are you truly certain that you want to learn in our school? I left my family, left my mother in sorrow. Isn't that enough for you? I exclaimed furiously. We'll talk about it another day. The religious man greeted me with a gentle gesture and then left. I threw myself onto the bed, head in my hands. I cursed him with rage, ready to pour out the most despicable insults. But wasn't this man right to ensure the validity of my approach? The West had already shown its strength in the past, it possessed powerful weapons, and it desired the death of Muslims. Therefore, no security measure should be dismissed. I was the innocent victim of a paradox, both eager to dedicate myself entirely to Islam and suspicious in the eyes of my brethren. I could do nothing but wait for the sincerity of my intentions to finally be acknowledged. I was forced to stay in this magnificent house, transformed into a gilded prison for young recruits, for more than a month. I underwent numerous interrogations, never knowing at any moment what was truly thought of me. The trial was exhausting, humiliating, I was tormented by doubt and dismay. Then, one morning, the Saudi religious man came to announce that I would be transferred to the religious school El Kame El Mehdi. Finally, I was accepted. But, already trained to control my emotions during psychological tests, I refrained from showing my joy. Indoctrination the majority of Muslims denounce the Zionist and Western conspiracy and manipulation. According to them, the Judeo-Christians shamelessly plot against the Muslim world to destroy it. Islam, their rival, is the absolute truth. Allah is the true God, and Muslims represent the force of good and justice. In contrast, Judeo-Christians represent Satan, the source of evil and injustice. During my stay in Iran, I observed an opposite reality, cunning, lies, and scheming are fundamental elements within global Islamist movements. In Islam, life cannot be conceived outside of spirituality and mystery. This partly explains why some believers get drawn into the most radical Islamist extremism without truly being aware of it. Added to this is the perfidy of professional extremists, advancing with covered faces to indoctrinate people subtly, through insidious touches. This is how they manage to exert their influence on dreamers, malleable souls, as well as those who have not yet gained enough perspective in life, a category to which I belonged. The El Came Religious School We first went to the offices of Mohammed Taqi El Mudarisai, not far from Maiden Ferdowsi Square, south of Tehran. I had a feeling that he was an eminent figure. Indeed, this man, the right-hand man of a party affiliated with the El Risali network, was responsible for political strategy. There, I had to wait for a large part of the day, forced to answer all sorts of tricky questions, always with the aim of verifying my sincerity. After that, the Saudi religious leader took me to the El Kame school, 
located about 15 kilometers from Tehran between the cities of Mamazand and Parchin, on the road to Mashhad. During the journey, my guide bombarded me with recommendations, the most important of which was to only trust my religious supervisor. Since I had come to Tehran precisely to study and live my faith in Shurism, I couldn't understand the reasons for these quasi-military instructions. But when we arrived at the El Kame school after changing taxis in Mamazand, my incomprehension reached its peak, the entrance to the building was guarded by an armed sentinel with a Kalashnikov. Did this weapon prevent people from entering the school or leaving it? This sight sent shivers down my spine, but I remained under the sway of my desire to discover a new source of the Muslim religion. The exploration of Shurism produced a kind of constant ecstasy in me. At that moment, I had no idea that I had now become a part of the oldest and largest Islamist network. It would only be in the following months that I would fully grasp the extent of this, especially through reading the countless activity reports gleaned from the network's archives. For now, I was intoxicated with joy. Under the beautiful early September sun, my dream was becoming reality. After the obligatory visit to the school's administrative offices, I settled my belongings in the room I shared with three other students, and I familiarized myself with the premises, happy and confident. The El Kame School's compound covered about 10,000 square meters. The main building had three levels. On the ground floor, there were classrooms, a dining hall, a theater, a library, administrative offices, and a prayer room. The dormitories were located on the upper two floors. The site presented a pleasant setting, likely to excite the enthusiasm of the students. On one side, there was a swimming pool, and on the other, a garden adjacent to the forest. Before Khomeini's revolution, the school used to admit young girls from wealthy families under the direction of the Shah's sister. They were taught the art of social and diplomatic receptions, intended for their marriages to future political, military, or administrative leaders. After the fall of the Shah, heated negotiations took place between the El Risali network and Khomeini for the sharing of power. Among the resolutions made during these discussions was the creation of the El Kame Religious School. Its objective was to train young Muslims from all over the world for international Islamic warfare. With supreme skill, this school that advanced under the veil of religious education did not create cannon fodder, experts in handling weapons and bomb making, but rather, thought terrorists, exceptional organizers capable of forming networks, manipulating information, and stirring up crowds. The school produced white collar terrorists, the elite of El Risali. In contrast, a few kilometers away, in a secret camp located on the border with Afghanistan, the network trained soldiers who would directly engage in combat. During the year 1980, when the Iranian Cultural Center in Paris was visited by Hedi El Mudarisai, the right-hand man of the network responsible for the military aspect and the creator of the movement for the Islamic Revolution in Bahrain, a large number of North Africans took part in demonstrations supporting the Islamic Revolution in Iran, to the point that the network decided to recruit from this source. The first three recruits from this region were Sheikh Jamal, a Moroccan born in Meknes better known by the pseudonym Mehdi Atlas, Abed El Rahman, my Algerian recruiter from Paris, and Falahi Hassan Mohammed, my assumed name. The three North African countries were thus represented. When I entered the school in September 1983, it had about a hundred students, mainly Saudis and Afghans. It also welcomed a few Arab Iranians, Tanzanians, and Comorians. We were divided into groups of around 20 students. I was part of the El Imam El Qadim group. Between strict teachings and cultural activities, Everything was designed to instill revolutionary ideas into the minds of future fighters, making them enlightened and easily manipulable. After their training, these recruits would open offices in strategic capitals to serve Islamist propaganda and action. The day after my arrival, my awakening within the El Kame school compound was marked by a first disappointment, when I presented myself at the prayer room for the morning prayer, the place was deserted. Naively, I thought there was some sort of rebellion. But as I went up to the dormitories, I realized that all the students were sleeping like logs. 
Was this how faith was lived here, at the L. Came School? Later, I questioned my fellow students, who mocked me. A revolutionary needs to sleep to recover his strength. I was taken aback by this infidel-like response. From then on, my suspicion towards our leaders continued to grow. We didn't have time to get bored. Classes started at 8 in the morning and ended at noon. Five subjects followed one another. The first lesson was dedicated to the study of the Quran. The second covered Islamic jurisprudence, al fiqh which encompasses the reference works of the great religious scholars. In the second year, this course involved studying the teachings of Jafar el Sadiq, the sixth Imam descended from Ali in Fatma, condensed into six volumes that formed the synthesis of Shiite positions in numerous fields. The study of the Arabic language came in third position. The fourth course was devoted to the analysis of Hedi el Mudarisai's Book of Beliefs. In the second year, we studied the history of Islam written by his brother, Muhammad Taqi el Mudarisai. The fifth and final lesson involved a debate on general culture, moderated each time by a different sheikh presenting a current topic. Under the pretext of objectivity, most Shiite schools of thought were covered in this program, those championed by prominent members of the network, of course, the one of Imam Khomeini, the Grand Master of the Iranian Revolution, and that of Imam Kui, advocate of apolitical peaceful shurism. Each student had to choose their spiritual guide among three prominent names, Muhammad al-Husayni al-Shirazi, the public face of the El risali network, responsible for the social aspect, Imam Khomeini, and Imam al kui This pluralism flattered the sensitivity of each student, pushing them to defend a particular opinion leader. At the end of their training, they would join the circle corresponding to their favorite faction and infiltrate it on behalf of the network. Before lunch, students observed the second and third prayers of the day. At 2 p.m. The program continued with various sports and cultural activities. Students could choose between team sports, the library, or theater arts, very useful for developing propaganda and oratory skills. The day ended with the fourth and fifth prayers. Students' lives were governed by about ten committees. The most important, El Tekthir, managed video cassettes containing the key speeches of network thinkers, masterpieces of propaganda skill. Located on the second floor of the school, this committee had thousands of hours of videotapes and highly sophisticated equipment. The library committee managed a multitude of religious and political works, including a section of secret documents about the network's activities, accessible only to a select few. Authorization was required for each requested book. There were also various other committees, cleaning and maintenance of the school, mosque, el masjid, art, cooking, gardening, sports, and finally, security. Each student had to spend an hour and a half daily on rotation to supervise the establishment. This unit always had 16 armed individuals patrolling the perimeter day and night. I, for my part, continued my practices as a devout Muslim. Early in the morning, I would rise and head straight to the prayer room. Kneeling in the direction of Mecca, I would offer to the Lord what was rightfully His, while most of my companions indulged in their last hours of sleep. On my way back, I would cross paths with the group of guards, rifles in hand, finishing their patrol. They would sometimes address me with friendly or sarcastic remarks, so, Falahi, was the prayer good? I would return to the dormitory to read the works of the great religious scholars. It was around seven in the morning that my comrades would wake up. Some mumbled, dragging their feet, expressing their lack of enthusiasm for the morning program. Attending classes didn't please them much. What they were waiting for was to go and fight the enemy. Killing, that was the exciting program they wanted to follow. An hour later, the first class would begin. The teacher would teach the students how to read and interpret the Quran. Gradually, the sacred text would be sieved through the Islamist ideology. This was done gently, tactfully, meticulously. The teacher would appeal to each individual's sensitivity, awakening their warrior instincts. At the end of the discussions, everyone would feel honored, entrusted with an exhilarating mission, 
they became lords in the noble circle of heroes of the ongoing history. They were princes under the authority of the teacher, who knew how to step back at the right moment to let collective pride emerge. Because the idea that we belonged to a sacred caste was also widely developed to cement the group. Thus, individual hatred found its place within the community spirit. By the end of the morning, the students would be in a state of almost hysterical excitement. They couldn't be contained anymore. I myself was caught up in the extremist contagion, a real drug. I was ensnared by the fervor of blood-colored religious devotion. In the afternoon, most students engaged in soccer. More than just a release, it was a challenge, a way to rile up nerves in anticipation of upcoming battles against the Western enemy. I rarely participated in these games, preferring to join the school library, where I quickly gained access. At first, the teachers looked at me with indulgence, but by the end of my stay, they were monitoring my every move, any soldier who approached the sensitive core of the network's underground activities was subject to close surveillance. At night, I would fall asleep, numbed by revolutionary slogans and indoctrination. Awareness came step by step. My doubts would dissipate, only to return. I was engaged in a terrible internal conflict, gradually discovering the demons hiding behind the personalities and organs of the network. I remained inert, unable to relinquish my belief in the revolution, as that would have meant the end of my dream of a rediscovered humanity. Torn from my naivety, I inevitably sank into a nightmare where every word uttered by my mentors became threatening, revealing to me the foul stench of the wildest ambition, the pursuit of global power. On the other hand, it was almost enchanting. I had a salary, I enjoyed a comfortable living environment in a pleasant place, bordered by splendid trees under whose shade I could seek refuge and meditate. My mentors, with their scientific rigor, allowed me to glimpse the resolutely heroic lines of an exceptional life. Sometimes, I even imagined benefiting from it personally by playing on the weaknesses of my superiors. I had a purpose, a story that was shaping itself day by day, worthy of being recorded later in the Golden Book of Mythical Religious Leaders. I was in Allah's wake. I was respected, I was feared, at least, I believed so. It flattered me, reassured me, placed my future under very favorable auspices. However, when I subjected the teaching offered by the school to an objective critique, and when I thought about the bloodthirsty acts of the Rasali leaders, even if I refused to fully believe it, at those moments, I felt disgust. I enjoyed the privileges, but my conscience was burdened with unspeakable shame. I felt lost, powerless, just like in the past when, as a memory-deprived child, I couldn't communicate with the outside world. I was caught in the gears of terrorism. The path to rebirth was still very far away for me. Death loomed over me. Pages and pages of hesitant commentary would likely be insufficient to explain the dilemma in which I found myself, as emotions and religion, history and education, utopia and reality intertwined within me. Where was this truth I was searching for? And then, there's a dimension that often eludes us, as those who have experienced it only express it in half-words, or they perish because of it. I'm talking about the devil's beauty. The leaders of El Risali, Muhammad al-Husayni al-Shirazi or Muhammad Taqi el mudarisai to mention just these two names, were fiery, bloodthirsty, and luminous figures. They combined brutality and savagery, but also the mystery of faith, the brilliance of a diamond. From the height of their stature as great religious scholars, they reconciled the magnificence of speech and the harmfulness of thoughts. Their words annihilated us. They didn't call for any response, so everyone ended up finding the crimes they mentioned acceptable. Hence the terrible power of attraction they had on us, even though they were actually incurable madmen, bloodthirsty psychopaths with whom it was impossible to negotiate. This point cannot be emphasized enough, religion, once perverted, can turn the fear of the unknown into a fountain of false pleasures in which those who doubt existence willingly drown. If the Risali leaders manipulated through politics and religion, they also dabbled in the occult sciences. I attended a course on magic intended to ward off the evil eye from packages rigged for enemies of the network. 
Similarly, when a soldier was about to plant a bomb, his master had to provide him with charms, recite lengthy incantations, anoint his body with a special oil that would render him invincible. I even heard that they conducted experiments in remote enchantment. For the network, anything was fair game to drag others into supernatural madness. This explains the sometimes strange atmosphere that prevailed in the school. Everything was monitored in a thousand ways. We couldn't leave the school premises without permission. Solo outings were an exception. The students were subject to strict chaperoning by an escort who took their task very seriously, as per the strict regulations. Excursions were generally done in groups of around 20 students to visit religious or governmental sites, like the National Assembly. On the other hand, we had free access to official buildings upon presenting our student ID cards, which demonstrated the good relations between the network and the Iranian government, at least during the years 1984 to 1985. Sometimes, we were introduced to prominent figures. It was at the assembly, where he was presiding, that I got to know Hachimi Rafsanjani, who was accused by the German justice of ordering the assassination of Kurdish opponents. In this way, I often had the opportunity to roam the streets of Tehran. Every time, the abundance of foodstuffs and other goods in the market surprised me. The Iranians lacked nothing, even though the country was excluded from global trade under the pressure of the international community. This was even more striking as the purchasing power of the inhabitants was practically non-existent. Certainly, a parallel economy based on bartering had been established, but Iran also received support from friendly states, like Syria. The second striking fact was the participation of women in all sectors of activity, whether in administration, trade, or political organizations. In this regard, the current government had for a time improved the status of women compared to other Muslim countries. Another peculiarity was that the population of Tehran included Christian and Jewish communities that seemed to be subject to no persecution. I thus met a young Christian woman in a bookstore. She invited me to share tea to continue our conversation, and she didn't hesitate to criticize the power of Khomeini, without considering fleeing the country. Out of fear of hurting her, I didn't tell her about my affiliation with Shia Islam and El Qaim school. I absorbed the lessons from my masters perfectly in the realm of espionage, simulation, and counterfeiting. I learned to be a true chameleon, capable of constructing a new personality in the blink of an eye. It must be said that I had possessed this psychological ability from an early age that some individuals have to instinctively blend into their environment. At school, from the very first days, I chose to mingle with the Saudi students, the majority group. I dressed like them in a white jalaba, I grew a beard, mimicked their speech patterns, their customs, their quirks. It was a warlike mimicry, a feline strategy, for every situation, there was a corresponding maneuver. The Rebellion However, I wasn't fooled by the perverse effects that my mentor's speeches could trigger in my mind. The tireless discussions, the frenzied debates among the students, the propaganda films extolling revolutionary globalization replayed and commented upon a hundred times, the apocalyptic prophecies, the calls for hatred and revenge, the religious justifications, the plundering of God's word, the false prayers, the pretension, the desire for dominance, all this sulfurous atmosphere prompted me to remain reserved. My internal rebellion, which I painfully suppressed, made me silent and irritable. As the days went by, I sought refuge in silence, broken only by sudden outbursts of temper at the most unexpected moments. The personal mentor assigned to each of us in turn had little chance of getting along with me. Ten mentors took their turns in that role during the first year. I wore them out one by one with my refusal to conform. The Risali teaching method aimed to adapt to each student's psychological profile, with the goal of stimulating their awareness rather than imposing anything by force. An individual who convinces themselves demonstrates a mental superiority over someone whose will has been forced or violated. According to network members, everything should come from within. An ambiguous principle, 
since at the same time, under the guise of religious education, we replayed and discussed the incantatory speeches from the audio and videotapes at our disposal. If I had succumbed from the start to my mentor's teachings, I might have been classified as a bomb maker. My resistance to rules and the string of teachers it exhausted, on the contrary, led the Rasali leaders to entrust me with a task more in line with my inflexible character, organization. Mohammed Taqi el Mudarisai, the school's leader, was nevertheless perturbed by my outrageous attitude, which he labeled as tasteless. I later understood that his frustration was all the greater because, planning to send me abroad for a very particular mission, he was beginning to doubt his protege's real capabilities. Could he truly trust such a troublemaker? He reproached me verbally several times, to no avail. But he eventually found the gem that would set the rebellious me back on the right path. My new overseer was named Abu Mustafa. Of Saudi origin, dressed in traditional attire, in his forties, stout, with brown and supple hair, and a tan complexion, his presence exuded a sea of calmness. Even hurtful words couldn't erase his smile. When he spoke, his head remained still, only his mouth moved slightly. His soft voice required attentive listening. However, when addressing an important gathering, he could raise his tone like a speaker. A keen psychologist, he spoke tactfully and gently. He managed to quell my protesting tendencies. Unlike other teachers, he tended to show me trust and gradually revealed to me the medium-term objectives of the network's policy in North Africa. But before getting to the point, he took detours. I've been observing you for several weeks, young man, but I don't know how to judge you, he said to me one day. I blushed. Previously, Abu Mustafa had been rather flattering towards me. Was he now trying to provoke me? Nevertheless, I am a simple boy, I retorted, not without irony. Let's say, an intelligent boy. That being said, you don't seem to like to reveal much about yourself. Am I wrong? Clearly, he wanted to steer the conversation on a purely friendly level, as if a new step had been taken in our relationship. This is the first time you've spoken to me this way, I replied, somewhat brusquely. Does that surprise you? I'm not used to it. There's a first time for everything. Learning is a long path, sometimes experienced as a trial by some. When harvest time comes, the horizon suddenly clears. But that can only come from you. Without your goodwill, I can't do anything for you. To approach God, you must first understand yourself. Dive into your own mind, and rise to the heavens. This man almost took the words right out of my mouth, as what he was saying exactly matched my philosophy. Was he reading my thoughts? Yes, I said, I also believe that God is first within us. But I doubt that everyone would agree with this idea. You're mistaken. Many of us share this intuition. So, if you think that God resides in the depths of your mind, why not express it more boldly? You know, usually, we're advised to keep quiet. I've heard that from reputable sources, much like yourself. It takes all sorts to make a world, Abu Mustafa replied, undisturbed. Yes, as long as you don't cross the boundaries of morality. Excellent. The master exclaimed. You see, you know how to let your heart speak. It wasn't my heart that just spoke, but the voice of reason, I retorted slyly. Reason is but a facade, my boy. Isn't every line of reasoning motivated by a broader dimension that curiously resembles that of the heart? I suppose, yes. I'd like to delve into your thoughts. Speak, go ahead, speak from your gut. About what you hold dear, your fears, your joys, awaken the God sleeping within you. Come, tell me about your plans. And in return, I'll share mine. Well. I would be happy to serve my people. Ah. The Maghrib. A distinguished land. A land of the future. Let me confide something in you now, the network plans to assist the peoples of North Africa, notably Tunisia. 
In what way? I asked, immediately and keenly interested. By helping them rid themselves of the tyranny of the ruling powers. Tyranny. The word is a bit strong, isn't it? Young man, the states of the Maghrib are pursuing an outrageous policy against their peoples. Their leaders are discrediting the Muslim reality. Justice doesn't exist in these countries because Westerners manipulate the governments with the sole aim of stripping the region of its wealth. Under the pretext of economic cooperation, the Westerners are, in reality, practicing disguised slavery. Really? Abu Mustafa continued his tirade. What we intend to do in the Maghrib simply responds to the deep aspirations of Maghrebians. Out of solidarity, the network has decided to support them, even at the risk of losing men. Sooner or later, you'll return to your country to realize your dream. I listened, half unbelieving. For me, faith had nothing to do with the economy. The intervention of Western countries didn't prohibit Muslims from praying or seeking God's word. Furthermore, Europe held knowledge in many areas that could help build future Muslim societies and apply an open and generous Islam, as Muhammad had taught. Resistant to the indoctrination of my mentors, I sought genuine dialogue elsewhere in order to deepen my knowledge through the experiences of others. With this in mind, I preferred to associate with the most unruly students. One of my comrades, an Iraqi, provided me with information about the network's secret activities that confirmed the suspicions I held. Thanks to him, I also learned what certain code names concealed. Both of us enjoyed theater. We participated in the staging of plays written by Muslim playwrights, mostly inspired by the life of Muhammad or heroes from the history of Shurism, such as El Afghani, a Risali spy who operated at the end of the 19th century. Assisted by an attentive teacher, we put on several performances that were a great success. Of course, we suspected that the drama teacher was passing on his reports to Muhammad Taqi el Mudarisai. Through this activity, the network detected future religious orators. The stage play prepared us to overcome our shyness. In addition to imparting a certain ideology through cultural entertainment, we delved into the art of mystical pleading, the mastery of speech. Thus, a vocation could emerge, and a cunning mind could find a new reason to take an interest in the Islamic revolution. It might be challenging for a European to grasp the reasons that led me to Islamism. As I've mentioned before, the spiritual dimension in which a Muslim is immersed from birth partly explains certain unfortunate deviations. The believer is a fragile being because to live in Allah's spirit, they must strive for perfection. Moreover, they often live in poverty. Thirst for the absolute and poverty are two very sensitive strings. This is where the power of the El Risali network and the Islamist International in general lies. Anyone who crosses their path easily gets entangled. What I was discovering about the network's activities was horrifying. No government had truly assessed the extent of this evil yet. There was no miracle solution to confront it, other than quickly creating a large-scale pacifist movement uniting democratic state from both hemispheres, whether they are Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, atheist, as long as they simply wanted to see their children grow up far from bombs and murder. The months passed like a slow agony, torn between the search for truth, disillusionments, and anxiety. How could I escape the trap that was closing in on me more each day? Sometimes, I felt as if a colony of rats was gnawing at my belly. Fear twisted my guts, exerting its blind torture deep within my soul. It would never leave me. I feared for my own mental health. I decided that the solution lay within myself, since I was learning the art of appearance, false compromises, lies, political intrigues, in short, all the baseness and tricks that turn a person into a war machine, it might as well serve some purpose. My only recourse was to sharpen my powers of observation and investigation to try to understand from within the monstrous organism into whose bowels I had stumbled. Access to the Archives 
becoming a regular visitor to the section of El Kames Library reserved for El Rosali activities, I realized that the network was involved indirectly in most cases, using a vast labyrinth of associations, moles, financial intermediaries, and relationships with other groups to do so. Thus, the infamous Algerian GIA knew the nature of the links it had forged with different Islamist networks including El Rasali. Go ahead, friends, slit the throats of your children and mothers. Don't hesitate. Soon, it will be your turn. Even Imam Khomeini himself was subject to their Machiavellian manipulations, just like the youth in the suburbs who are offered the keys to Allah's paradise. Who were the leaders of this sprawling network? Unfortunately, I could only know the names of those who operated in the realm of the overt. Indeed, the organization was structured in such a way that reaching the top of the hierarchy was practically impossible. Through numerous discussions with my schoolmates and religious mentors, cross-referencing and comparing each person's statements, I was able to piece together the puzzle. The most significant revelations came when I read the top-secret documents from the school's library, and yet, luck also took my hand in a nearly miraculous way. In any case, too good to be true. One day, while my group was out visiting the religious city of Qam to see the mausoleum of Imam El Ridha's sister, a modestly dressed man called out to me. Young man, would you like me to show you a marvel? Conditioned by months of brainwashing and revolutionary training, I remained defensive. I was now suspicious to the extreme. How could this person approach me, out of all people, when my comrades had just passed by the same spot two minutes ago? Wasn't this a trap? What marvel? I asked, my face impassive. It's a surprise, young man. I don't like surprises. This one will please you, trust me. And why? Because I see on your face that you are one of Allah's chosen ones. This kind of expression is very common in an attempt to gain trust. However, I felt flattered despite myself. I don't see what you mean, I replied. Listen, young man, you should follow me. Your future depends on it, the stranger insisted in a very gentle voice. Eventually, I consented to let myself be guided. We arrived at a humble building. This is my house, the man said. Come in. Once inside, he led me down into what looked like a dried up well. Where are you taking me? This well leads to old cellars. Come, have no fear. A string of light bulbs fixed to the walls illuminated our path with a feeble light. We walked through several narrow corridors until we reached a large vaulted gallery. What is this about? I asked, amazed at the rows of books that filled the space. It's a very ancient Shiite library. You'll find manuscripts dating back centuries, some even from the time of the caliphs. I can't believe it. Oh, but this isn't the only place of its kind in Iran. No, young man, that the ground of our country conceals hiding places where the archives of the greatest religious scholars of our history and numerous documents related to Shiite politics are stored. Now, I'll leave you. Make good use of what you'll discover. Come back to see me whenever you like. As payment, you can give me what you can. Fascinated, I didn't know where to start. I stayed in this place filled with mysteries for the entire afternoon, reading voraciously. According to the authors of some of these documents, the El Risali network originated from a very ancient religious order whose sacred texts advocated the use of force for centuries to come. Some claimed it dated back to the time of Muhammad. Indeed, some of these manuscripts seem to belong to a very distant past, suggesting that generations of scribes had spent their lives transcribing these scrolls over the centuries. I returned to this place several times during my time at El Kame, never ceasing to ask questions. How had such a wealth of knowledge managed to traverse the ages? Were they genuine in Kinabula? Wasn't I the target of a ruse intended to prove the legitimacy of the network to strong-willed individuals like me? Today, regarding this last question, doubt is no longer allowed. The Century-Spanning Journey of the El Risali Network 
Here's how the Rissalists present their origins. This is a story to be read with the utmost caution, but it is instructive regarding their mindset. Upon the disappearance of the twelfth infallible Imam, the renowned hidden Imam el Mehdi, in 878, the early supporters of the El Risali network, the Messenger, claimed that despite his temporary withdrawal from public life, he continued to send prophetic messages to believers. Through them, he would soon designate his successor, the sole religious scholar capable of shaping the future of the Muslim world. Pursued by their opponents and greatly weakened, the network members decided to also withdraw from the political scene, escaping torture and preparing in the shadows for the revival of the Shiite faith in light of texts derived from the words of El Mehdi. Thus, his disappearance marked the beginning of their clandestine operations. At that time, the first task undertaken by the Rissalist scholars was to preserve and protect for centuries to come the writings that formed the basis of the network strategy. These texts had two parts, one intended for the masses of believers and the other for the elite, which was to be kept secret. Religious schools were established, exclusively for their descendants. Network members retreated into these elitist schools, consolidating their organization. Before being admitted, each applicant was subjected to rigorous tests, and an investigation into their past and family history was conducted. The religious training consisted of seven stages, detailed as follows. The first stage took place over several years, during which the student learned the basics of Islam and fiqh, jurisprudence, guided by a mujtahid, an assiduous, or expert, who provided instruction in Shiite scholars' exegesis. The second elevated the student to the status of a religious scholar, yet still under the guidance of a master who taught the nuances of jurisprudence. In the third stage, the student reached the rank of Hujatu el Islam, where they could partially detach from their master. They then formulated their own jurisprudence, achieving the level of idiate, or prudent. In the fourth stage, the student defended their Risala el Amalia thesis on jurisprudential practices before the greatest Shiite scholars, who bestowed upon them the title of exegesis, allowing them to express their personal opinion independently of a master. The fifth stage elevated them to the rank of Ayatollah, granting them the right to lead their own religious school and send their disciples around the world to propagate their jurisprudence. Students owed them alms, el Zakat. The sixth corresponded to the rank of Grand Ayatollah el Wadhamma, the sign of the Grand God, the highest level of knowledge. Few religious figures could claim it. Finally, the seventh stage, known as Walayat al Faqih, crowned the supreme religious scholar. Yet, this degree remains largely theoretical. According to some, only Imam el Mehdi holds it. In practice, no religious figure has dared to claim it, except for Imam Khomeini during his revolution against the Shah of Iran. Thus, the Rissalist Shiite ideology managed to span the ages. The Rise of Modern Terrorism Around 1860, the emergence of Jamal Eddin el Afghani on the politico-religious stage marked the network's entry into the political domain, at the root of terrorism. This Afghan, born in 1839, under his real name Jamal Eddin Assad Abadi, was one of the first to participate in the infiltration of the Sunni body. Converted to the Shiite doctrine, he received religious education in Iran and joined the ranks of the network. He infiltrated among the Sunnis in Afghanistan to understand their logic and mode of operation. Later, he gained access to the famous religious school El Aza in Egypt. He propagated Shiite political ideas within this institution. This served as a test for the development of the science of infiltration that future agents would benefit from. He initiated Muhammad Abdu, 1849-1905, one of the first Sunni politicians to teach at El Aza and the founding father of Islamic reformism El Nada, the Renaissance. A precursor of secret warfare, El Afghani had planned since 1867 to establish an Islamist movement in Egypt and push it to seize power. From there, he aimed to unify the Arab world and expel Western colonizers from the land of Islam. Interestingly, this spy, operating throughout the Arab-Islamic world on behalf of the network, maintained excellent relationships with European colonizers, especially the British, to whom he provided various information about opposition parties, 
communists, nationalists, and Shiites, that were not part of the network. In the 1920s, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the partition of the Arab Islamic world between the British and the French, El Risali's leaders fully realized the power of the West. This led to a hardening of the movement and a reconsideration of its political strategy. Confronted with the enormous Sunni body in Western dominance, direct confrontation proved ineffective. Infiltration, manipulation, destabilization, in short, everything related to secret warfare, became the favored weapons. The leaders isolated themselves even more in their ivory tower, establishing a highly secured system of communication both horizontally and vertically. At the same time, they formed a secret apparatus intended to carry out terrorist actions against Western interests and to create Islamist movements within the Sunni community. They also developed the technique of the double agent, Takiya. With Egypt's independence in 1936, the Muslim Brotherhood movement, founded in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna, hastened the departure of the British. This religious fraternity had originated through the influence of El Afghani, but the lack of political experience among its leaders prevented them from attaining power. This failure forced them to reorganize. They developed a specific economic and social system, distinct from capitalism and socialism. At the same time, they preached a complete return to Islamic tradition. Gradually, they fell into fanaticism, endangering Rasali's plans. However, the network managed to regain control of the movement through said Kwat, a leader of the Muslim Brotherhood and a sympathizer of the network. He even provided them with significant financial support. As the politico-religious ideas of the Muslim Brotherhood spread across the Islamic world, the presence of El Risali became stronger. After said Kwap was sentenced to death by Egyptian authorities, the network continued to exert its influence over the Muslim Brotherhood until the 1950s, when they were eradicated by Nasser. This relative defeat pushed the Risalists to intensify their infiltration into the Sunni body in Egypt. Choosing a new strategic position, they maneuvered to develop Islamic movements under their agents' control while preserving the local religion. This way, they strengthened their positions in major Egyptian cities, from which they later established branches in neighboring countries. Through my Iraqi friend, I learned about Rasali's underground activity in North Africa in the 1960s, particularly in Algeria. Whether true or false, the answer is secondary as long as the movement's followers take it as truth. This student claimed that the El Risali network actively participated in Algeria's independence. Long before liberation, they sent soldiers to Algerian military camps. Mustafa Bouyali, a resistance fighter who opposed the National Liberation Front, FLN, to establish an Islamic state after independence, was, according to him, a member of the network. According to this Iraqi, the Risalists, faithful to their policy of all-encompassing infiltration, maintained excellent relations with Ben Bella and certain FLN militants. Through the leader of the Algerian insurgency and his armed movement, the network hoped to accelerate the Islamization of the country initiated by Bouyali. Ben Bella came to power in 1963. The understanding between the new president and the Risalists was well underway, but in 1965, Boumediene's coup thwarted the network's plans. A fierce anti-Islamist, Boumediene established a totalitarian socialist regime to suppress any politico-religious inclinations in the population. He assigned key military positions to Kabyle Amazighs known for their opposition to Arabization and their animosity towards Islamists. Nevertheless, a secret agreement was reached between the Risalists and Boumediene, a mutual non-aggression pact also accepted by the governments of Nasser in Egypt, Gaddafi in Libya, and Assad in Syria. The network committed to withdraw from these countries, which they had used as support and transit points. In return, the respective governments were to support Islamist movements, recruit Risalist soldiers into their own military camps, and turn a blind eye to their proselytism. Initially, these statements seemed far-fetched to me. However, in 1985, an Algerian economist who was at El Kaim School for Elite Soldier Training changed my perspective. My country needs warriors more than scholars, he told me. 
the network should help create military camps there instead of opening religious schools. Leave that to the Gulf people, who prefer the ease of jihad over wielding weapons. Upon hearing this, I had to admit that the links between the network and Algeria were indeed long-standing and solid. A year later, while I was in Syria, I met this Algerian again. What are you doing here? I asked him. The network should provide me with fake passports for compatriots who are going for military training in Algeria. Due to a technical glitch, I couldn't get them back into the country on my own, so I had to report to Buyali. Buyali? I repeated, trying to recall the name. What, you don't know Buyali? He's our leader, one of the prominent Algerian Islamist militants. After independence, he continued the fight for the establishment of a religious state. It's the Rissalist leaders who train our troops. We also receive financial aid from the network. I suppose he's in hiding. Yes, he moves constantly. The Algerian government wants him dead. Since independence, Algeria had remained a battlefield. The infiltration effort aimed primarily at erasing differences with the Sunni populations, who constituted 90% of the Muslim people. The Rissalists' idea was to work with these communities, encouraging them to create their own Islamist organizations and supporting thought currents closest to Shurism, such as the Quranic groups or the Sunni Islamic left that advocates a reinterpretation of the bloody Muslim history. Once the Muslim community was united under a politically accepted ideal, indoctrination into Shiite ideas could take place. The Offensive in the West After the first Rasali offensive in the Middle East, the next one was launched towards the West. The analysis of the El Rasali leaders, which I do not share, I must clarify, is that the Western world is infiltrated by Zionist Jews who control many financial, civil, and military institutions. Taking advantage of the naivety of Christians and their lack of understanding of the Jewish-Islamic conflict, they orchestrate a secret war aimed at annihilating Muslims. The fundamental premise of the revolutionary theory of the Rasalis, the one they develop for their troops and adapt as events unfold, is as follows, the struggle for global domination pits two symmetrical entities against each other, each composed of three ideological groups, one. Pro-Arab Shiites, El Rasali, the rest of the Shiites, and the Sunnis. 2. Zionist Jews, the rest of the Jews, and Christians. Within these two entities, the dynamics of influence are similar. According to their perspective, Christians are manipulated by Jews, who themselves are under the influence of the Zionists, just as Sunnis are manipulated by Shiites, who in turn are influenced by El Rasali the hardline branch of the Shiite movement that actively prepares the ground for the famous Mahdi through various underground actions. Therefore, the Rasalis and the Zionists are sworn enemies. Each Zionist offensive receives an equally or even greater sized counterattack. For instance, when the State of Israel was established after the Second World War, El Rasali decided to respond by creating an Islamist government. This was realized years later in Iran. When the Zionists acquired their territorial base, the Rasali Shiites decided to achieve the equivalent, always indirectly to avoid condemnation from the international community. At least, this is what their leaders claim. The Rasalis then dispatched spies to Europe tasked with compiling detailed reports on Zionist activities, meticulous and long-term work that did not intimidate the network, which operates with a very long-term view based on the predictions of El Mehdi. The leaders of El Rasali admit to having had contact with the Nazis. I have seen documents indicating their connections with the Nazis through the network and the support they provided to Hitler, facilitating his rise to power. Similarly, they appear to have supported all anti-Semitic organizations in France, Italy, and Spain, indirectly aiding far-right and neo-Nazi parties active on the European continent. This policy was clear, eliminate the Jewish presence in Europe, then strengthen the presence of popular Muslim communities and maintain their cohesion by preventing or delaying their integration to turn them into an intervention force, while simultaneously encouraging an elite to integrate and occupy key positions, all to prepare for the conquest of Europe at the right time. Wilayat al-Faki
The efforts of the Rissalists also extended towards the creation of their own state, indirectly led by them, with the principle of not appearing openly. They set their sights on Iran, where the supreme leader, the Shah, began showing signs of weakness in the late 1970s, while the influence of Imam Khomeini continued to grow. By that time, the Rissalists had already infiltrated various Iranian Shia factions, and their influence among the people was not insignificant. The supporters of Khomeini could not avoid dealing with them. In fact, in 1961, when this religious leader launched his initial calls for a popular uprising, the Rissalists swiftly orchestrated the political support that allowed him to establish his authority over the people. Leveraging Khomeini's popularity, the Rissalist agents worked on behalf of the network, their superiors wanted to bring Khomeini to power, designating him as a figurehead in the short or medium term. Negotiations between the Rissalists and the leaders of Khomeini's party began while Khomeini was in exile in France. An agreement was reached, involving the establishment of an explicitly Shia Islamic state in Iran. However, points of divergence remained. The pro-Khomeini forces were leaning towards a pacifist revolution, the future Iranian leader called for a popular uprising initiated by women and children holding roses, while the Rissalists advocated armed force. Khomeini was essentially caught in a dilemma. Al-Mahdi, the savior, had not yet revealed himself. Who could take his place in the interim? What non-religious message could be the foundation for the revolution? He had no other choice but to claim the highest spiritual degree, Walayat al-Faqi, not as a substitute for al-Mahdi, but as his representative among the believers. This seemingly simple move becomes much more complex upon closer examination, this title effectively positioned him above all other religious leaders, compelling his rivals to submit to his authority. Nonetheless, they remained free in the exercise of their faith. With the preservation of doctrinal plurality, he unified the entire religious spectrum of the country and its followers around two clear ideas, removing the Shah, seen as a traitor subservient to the West, and transferring power to religious scholars, seen as the only salvation for Shia and all Muslims. In the absence of El-Mahdi, and trusting the absolute power, which is typically reserved for an infallible imam, to a parliament comprised of religious scholars is called Walayat al-Faqi or Chura al fuqa the idea of a parliamentary power structure emerged after the disappearance of the twelfth infallible imam. Shiite teachings prohibit engaging in warfare or politics without being directed by such an imam, chosen by Allah himself. As long as the last imam remains hidden, no faqih can take his place. That's why Shiites have remained passive since his disappearance. The idea of Walayat al faqi resurfaced with the fall of the Ottoman Empire when Shiite religious leaders sought a way to exert political power in the absence of an infallible imam. Some, including Muhammad Sadiq al-Sadr and Khomeini, revived the idea of Walayat al faqi leading to a split in the Shiite political branch into two groups, one supporting Walayat al faqi the other for unofficial actions. When the revolution overthrew the Shah, the network presented itself under the name El Risali al Sharazi, named after its mastermind. Until then, only the second segment of the name had been emphasized. Its leaders continued their militant activities, so much so that most of the bloody actions commissioned in the 1980s were attributed to Imam Khomeini, who publicly claimed responsibility for some. If he failed gravely to stem the tide of violence that spread panic in the West, he must be considered more complicit than accountable. History is more intricate than simple minds want to believe. His supporters found themselves caught in a dilemma. By attacking the Rissalists, they risked precipitating the downfall of their supreme leader. The future leader of Iran eventually learned the true intentions of the Rissalists. Had he placed a spy within the network? Had one of their agents betrayed them? He kept his discovery secret and tried to gradually remove the Rissalist elements from his surroundings. However, he had underestimated their power, and he had to negotiate power sharing with them. The agents of El Rissali seized control of key sectors in the country, military barracks, television, radio, press, banks, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and hence embassies abroad, 
which would soon serve as bases for the development of their deadly war. Thanks to the success of the Iranian Revolution, the network achieved its first major victory and solidified its positions worldwide. They elevated Imam Khomeini to a mythical hero to accelerate the unification of the Muslim community, with the ultimate goal of seizing power. Equipped with exceptional media, military, and human resources, the Rissalists had succeeded in implanting their ideas in significant areas, the Middle East, Russia, Egypt, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe, and the United States. At the network's request, most of the leading Sunni religious scholars rallied behind the cause of the Iranian Revolution. Mind control reached its zenith. As the Islamist fervor grew since the early 1980s, Western nations finally became aware of the danger, albeit ignorant of the identities of the protagonists of this international rebellion. From within the network, I was able to observe the actions and deep motivations of its leaders. Driven by success, these leaders, disregarding international law, spread blood and terror through other movements like Hezbollah. Horrific attacks, such as the suicide truck bombing that killed 241 Marines and 58 French soldiers in Beirut in 1983, can be attributed to them, as well as hostage takings like those of Marcel Carton, Marcel Fontaine, Jean Paul Kaufman, and Michel Seurat. They funded drug networks destined for the West to weaken it. They formed the elite army Harris El Thaura, the guards of the revolution, leading people to believe it belonged to Khomeini supporters while it was led by one of theirs, Mohamed Montadairi, assisted by Hedi el Mudarisai, a key figure in the network. Officially tasked with protecting the interests of the Iranian revolution, it was ready to intervene abroad in the event of a serious conflict. The history of the El Risali network is symptomatic of the profound troubles that have shaken the world since the beginning of the century, namely the gap of misunderstanding between the North and the South, a consequence of a painful decolonization, and the entrenched conflict between Jews and Muslims. The strength of this constantly moving network lies in the diversity of its members, religious figures, intellectuals, bankers, military personnel, politicians, warriors, kamikazes, and a large mass of frustrated believers easily manipulated. Beyond this, its strength lies in its organization, all the more alarming because it seems more difficult to attack. The apparent leaders of El Risali are religious scholars or those presenting themselves as such, powerful figures I have met and can talk about. However, its greatest manipulators remain unknown, individuals I have spoken to, admired at times, and despised at others, without fully understanding their hidden power. The Organizational Structure of the Network Before delving into the details of the El Risali organizational structure as it appears, it is necessary to recall how this terrorist group perceives the world. This will provide a better explanation of its structure. The Rissalists view religion beyond the common interpretation derived from a traditional analysis of the Quran and Hadith. They place the human body at the pinnacle of their value system. To them, humans are a perfect machine, endowed with qualities borrowed from both the animal and plant worlds, yet unmatched in the universe. The spirit of this machine belongs solely to Allah. In the end times, it will rejoin the divine spirit. Emotions are merely expressions of a pretentious, misguided consciousness that hinders its function. Since the Rissalists consider humans as mere tools, their techniques of infiltration and manipulation take on a different perspective. This also explains why, in the face of adversity, the network needs to protect itself behind numerous screens. As I mentioned earlier, its organization resembles a human body composed of two symmetrical parts one apparent, the other secret. This structure, of which only one of my superiors gave me a hint during a private conversation. At the end of my first year of study, eager to forcefully confirm the existence of the network secret part, I dared and requested a meeting with Mohammed Taki El Mudarisai. Do you have a secret role? I asked him directly. What do you mean, my boy? I thought I understood that there are leaders whose identities should not be known. Be careful of what some may tell you. Allow me to insist. I am a fighter. As such, I have sacrificed my life for the network. 
Therefore, I believe I have the right to the truth. Falahi, I have affection for you, but I think you are putting false ideas in your head. A piece of advice, stay in your place, and everything will go well. Learn the Shiite doctrine well. A day will come when you will be a great religious scholar. You would be wrong to want to skip ahead. Think carefully about what I have just told you. I trust your wisdom. Now, leave me. This message seemed quite clear to me, the network secret entity was indeed real. I had to be patient before gaining access to it, or I would face serious trouble. This binary structure serves as a model of simulation and lockdown. Thus, a distinction must be made between the function and the position held in the Rissalus network's hierarchy. Indeed, an individual can be assigned a secret task without necessarily belonging to the hidden entity. The distinction is significant, as every member is susceptible to occupying both apparent and secret roles. This makes it impossible to know the true extent of each person's roles and powers. For example, one Rissalist may suspect another of conducting an underground mission when in fact they are not. Doubt constantly prevails, forcing everyone to hold their place and especially their tongue. This ongoing ambiguity ensures security on both a human and political level. Which Rissalist would dare confess their problems to a colleague, knowing that they might be the instigator? Because an apparent member can become a hidden leader while maintaining their primary activity. In such cases, their peers are unaware of this double role. When danger becomes too imminent, they abandon their external, official, functions, employing a strategy of retreat or masking. On the other hand, if a Rissalist belonging to the internal, unofficial, entity reduces their activities within it, they are forbidden from leaving. Membership in the secret realm is conceived as a priesthood, a total and permanent sacrifice. This organization is also inspired by a saying of Imam Ali, cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, who defined the notion of a state based on five pillars, social, cultural, political, military, and economic. The value of these terms diminishes, social service corresponds to the head, culture to the left arm, the voice of the heart, politics to the right arm, the voice of reason, military to the right leg, and economic to the left leg. This is the apparent hierarchy of the network. The hidden part presumably follows the same order, although it remains impossible to confirm, as it is inherently secret. It is somewhat the soul of the apparent entity, representing the eternal energy inaccessible to all. Its dimension is immaterial, in contrast to the visible body that is the apparent network. This organization also aligns with the theory of Imam 8, transcending the boundary between the visible and the invisible. Lastly, it intriguingly corresponds to the myth of El Mehdi, the hidden Imam. This operation may seem obscure, even bewildering, to a Western mind accustomed to Cartesian reasoning. One might even be tempted to think that its description cultivates a paranoid delusion. However, the complexity of the rules that govern the network is commensurate with the grandiose political and religious ambition of the Rissalists. By being in their midst, by being part of their organism, I have been a privileged witness to the transgressions of these men for whom religion is merely a pretext, and who are experts in the art of secrecy, concealment, and the game of masks. This account serves as a warning, just because something is difficult to conceive or disbelieved, it does not mean it does not exist. A secretive and compartmentalized network, El Risali therefore had visible leaders, whose portraits are as follows, Muhammad al-Husaini al-Shirazi, the social aspect. Muhammad al-Husaini al-Shirazi, responsible for the social aspect, was the official head at the time. The passage of information between the two entities of the network relied on him. He alone had access to the hidden domain through constant consultation with his phantom counterpart, also responsible for the social aspect. He would pass on information that came up to him and circulate among his subordinates in the visible network the information that came from the higher entity. He was thus at the heart of the Rasali octopus. However, he probably had only a fragmented view of the secret network's activities. Moreover, was his counterpart in the hidden entity necessarily the head of the network? 
The regime of Saddam Hussein claimed he was of Iranian origin for obvious domestic political reasons, but he came from a family of prominent Iraqi religious scholars. Members of this family had always opposed the ruling power, advocating for the creation of an Islamic empire uniting Muslim countries. In this regard, they shared Rissalist ideas, no surprise, as they belonged to the network. He belonged to the sixth degree of Shurism, that of the Grand Ayatollah. This title earned him the admiration and respect of all. He was a religious reference. He lived in Qam where he led a religious school. At the time, he was over 60 years old, married and a family man, of small stature, with a round belly, white hair, and a light beard, a sign of the nobility of his lineage. Usually dressed in a jalaba or kamis, he wore a black or a mima turban, signifying his affiliation with the Prophet's family. Paradox seemed to be the foundation of his personality, one day he would say white, the next day black. It was impossible to know what he truly thought. His gaze seemed to come from nowhere, sometimes warm, sometimes icy. His speech was always carefully considered. He never mentioned war. His cause claimed to be pacifist, apolitical, dealing solely with social issues. In reality, his secret activities involved directing for major Islamist movements through multiple screens, which he founded. When he issued a fatwa, an order to initiate a terrorist action, it was immediately executed without discussion, regardless of its nature, scope, or distance. To think that some saw him as an ethereal being, a pacifist, while he was planning one of the world's largest Islamist terrorist networks. Al-Shirazi presided over the seemingly social organization that served as the network's basic cover, the Harakat el jamahir el muslima the movement of Muslim populations, headquartered in Qam but with branches in London, the United States, Turkey, Tanzania, and India. Through this socially oriented movement, he primarily intervened within the Shia community, where his ideology was widely disseminated, encouraging people to unite in order to create an empire of a billion Muslims, echoing arguments used by the al tablai oua al dua movement, whose followers claimed to be apolitical and anti-terrorist. In reality, it gathered together proselytizing missionaries active across Islamic countries. Their goal was to play consciousness in a way that hastened a return to traditional religious practice. Al-Shirazi seized the work of these fervent preachers and also controlled it from a distance through his agents and channels. Anything that could directly or indirectly serve the El Risali network was collected and financially supported through underground channels. In this way, thousands of doubting young people were indoctrinated unknowingly. He also waged a secret war against the Sunni community and other religions. The order of priority was as follows convert Sunnis to Shurism, then Christians to Shia Islam, and finally remove Jews from economic and political circuits. His designated area of intervention covered East Asia, India, Pakistan, the southern part of the former Soviet Union, and Sub-Saharan Africa, that is, non-Arab Muslim communities. These communities, often living away from the international political scene and often unaware of the dangers of Islamism, were more easily swayed towards Shia ideas. During my stay in Iran, I met al-Shirazi on three occasions. During an excursion to Qam that I participated in with a group of students, the head of the official network received us in his offices. When my comrades and I were received by him, he sat in the lotus position and pressed his fingertips together under his chin to show that he was giving us his full attention. As soon as a sentence was finished, he would briefly tilt his forehead forward as if trying to penetrate the profound meaning of the words. Strangely, although my initial impression advised me to be reserved, he managed to gain my sincerity with astonishing economy. Quickly, I felt an irresistible desire to confide in him. He had the ability to address both the hearts of men and their unspoken desires. That's where his strength lay. What could be more reassuring for an Islamist network than having a man who had the power to probe the reins and hearts? During the conversation, he turned to me. Why did you decide to convert to Shurism, young man? While I was in France, I became convinced that the descendants of all al-Bayt, the Holy Family, 
are the only true representatives of Allah's word. He nodded his head with solemnity. Very well, young man. This is fundamental. The transmission of the prophetic message relies on the bond of blood, which holds the secret of the unseen and circulates it through lineage. Beware of the impostors that some Sunnis can be, my children. But I would like to take advantage of the presence among you of our Maghrib brothers to pay homage to their people. My thoughts go especially to the Algerian community, which has suffered so much from the Westerners' torture. But Shia doctrine is rapidly spreading in the lands of Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. I can only invite you to spread it around you. Visit me whenever you like, you will always be welcome. The second meeting took place a few months later. A new student using the pseudonym Ibrahim had just arrived at the El Kame school. He came from Syria, where he had studied theology for several years. As a Sunni, not yet converted to the Shia doctrine, he found me reserved, lacking personality, far from his own ideas. He even reproached me for converting to Shurism. Despite this animosity, I sought to win his friendship and invited him to meet Muhammad al Husseini al Shirazi. Upon arriving at the location, we had to wait as al Shirazi was in conversation with other visitors. I overheard one of them asking him for permission to kill guards from the Iraqi state security. Al-Shirazi dissuaded him, not out of kindness, but because he believed this act to be a serious political mistake that could jeopardize the network's balance and personally compromise the perpetrator. He used this opportunity to give these agents a lesson in the art of war. He knew the subject like the back of his hand. When Al-Shirazi was alone, Ibrahim and I were allowed in. What brings you to me, my children? The religious leader began. I wanted to introduce Ibrahim to you, I replied. He comes from Syria. I thought you would be happy to meet one of our Sunni brothers. You flatter me, young man. And how can I be of service to please you? In your capacity as the venerable master of Shia doctrine, would you perhaps be willing to enlighten Ibrahim with your wisdom? With pleasure. In my opinion, the key is to cultivate the diversity of doctrines within the Muslim community. That's the wealth of Islam. After all, the differences between Sunnis and Shia are slight, if not non-existent. Each can interpret the sacred texts in their own way, freedom of jurisprudence is inherent to Islam. I was left speechless. How could al-Shirazi defend ideas he didn't believe in for a single moment? How could he, a man of faith, a religious figure, say the opposite of what he had always preached? Those who seek to pit Sunnis against Shia are traitors, he continued. Open your eyes, my friends, it's the Jews who conspire in the shadows to divide Muslims, to sow war between our brethren and weaken them. This age-old technique can be highly effective if not guarded against. Sunni Muslims represent a massive force. We must help them as best we can. Our common goal is to unify Muslims to crush the Zionist enemy. Lastly, why would I acknowledge any superiority of Shia over Sunni, given that they both draw from the same texts, the Quran and the Hadith? I blushed with shame and anger. What humiliation! Ibrahim was overjoyed, so happy to hear the undisputed master agreeing with him. As we left, he undoubtedly thought that the Shiite scholars were great men. During my third and final visit, this time I was accompanied by an Iraqi student. With all due respect, I must admit, I began, I was shocked by the speech you gave to our brother Ibrahim last month. How am I supposed to interpret your words? Every situation has its context, al-Shirazi replied, a smile on his lips. That's a bit harsh. Harsh. Don't you want to practice your faith freely? That's my dearest wish. Well, this freedom comes at a price. Strategy, my dear. It's the only thing that can save us. You understand that if I had acknowledged the superiority of the Shiites in front of Ibrahim, he would have considered me an enemy. Those resistant to our doctrine must never be alienated, otherwise, they could become our fiercest adversaries. 
a religious scholar has the duty to adapt to each situation. His mission, I repeat, is to unify the Muslim community. Therefore, he is forbidden from publicly displaying his personal beliefs. It's war, my child. al harbu Kidan, war is a deception, as the Prophet said. I wanted to shout at him that he was mistaken, that Allah would not command the death of all humanity to save a single man. But I bit my tongue. Muhammad Taqi el Mudarisai, the political dimension. Next to al Shirazi was his right hand man, responsible for the political dimension, Muhammad Taqi el Mudarisai. In his fifties, with a thick beard and deep set eyes, he was al Shirazi's son in law. His composure was impressive. In truth, his entire demeanor exuded a kind of morbid gravity. It seemed that the role he held within the network did not allow for affectionate displays. His charisma stemmed from the seriousness that characterized every action he took and the quality of his speech. When he spoke, words flowed smoothly from his mouth, his sentences were fluid and precise, getting straight to the point. His father had entrusted the religious education of his seven sons to al-Shirazi. All had later become great religious scholars closely or remotely associated with the El Rasali network. As the right-hand man of the network, Muhammad Taqi El Mudarisai reported directly to his father-in-law. Like Al-Shirazi, he was a substantial spiritual reference and has now become an ayatollah. He presided over the Iraqi Islamic work organization, Maunathamet El Amel El Islami El Raqia. Under the guise of social work, it concealed a political function, the network's favored domain. The term, Iraqi, was used to muddy the waters, as this organization, within which major political strategies were decided, was based in Tehran at that time, today, it has been transferred to Iraq and operates internationally. Its activities revolved around three main areas, the publication of propagandist documents, the gathering of information on global state situations, and recruitment. The first journal published under its wing was El Amal El Islami, Islamic work, with a very limited distribution. The second, El Shahid, the martyr, on the other hand, was circulated worldwide, notably through Iranian embassies, locked down by the Rissalists. Their printing press was in Tehran. The offices of the intelligence service were also located in the Iranian capital, not far from the residence of Mohammad Taqi El Mudarisai. They were equipped with state-of-the-art equipment. Numerous agents around the world provided the massive amount of information the network needed. The Rissalists thus created an exceptional database. As for recruitment, it occurred within various organizations such as the now-closed Iranian Cultural Center in Paris, which he had founded, and continued within religious schools under the organization's control. So, Mohammad Taqi el Mudarisai was the spiritual master of the El Kaim school. Among the five major leaders of the visible network, he was the one I held in highest esteem. Certainly, this man was a dangerous Islamist, but who else could I rely on? He usually came on Thursdays to deliver a lecture on current political topics. It was an opportunity for mental realignment. He also regularly came to review school records. The principal and teachers would present their reports to him. Based on the conclusions in these reports, he might sometimes interrupt an ongoing curriculum to revise it. He also decided the fate of disciples, one would be dismissed due to incapacity, another sent on a mission to their country of origin, a third assigned to economic or military training, and the last propelled into a non-political religious school, like that of Qam, administered by al-Shirazi. In this latter case, the student escaped his tutelage. He also reviewed applications for prospective students. He was overly meticulous. He sometimes spent several consecutive days reviewing a case. He might even gather additional information about a candidate's personality before making a decision, this is how I understood the missed appointments, special conditions, and delays that led to my recruitment. He wasn't stingy with advice and repeatedly warned students against squandering the money given to them by the school. He lamented the frivolousness of those from the Gulf region, whom he considered dilettantes. 
according to him, this attitude contributed to the Muslims lag behind. But one had to compromise. When asked why he entrusted responsibilities to them then, he would reply that only donkeys are guided by donkeys. Our fight had to be followed by all, including the fools. And well, the wallets of these people weren't exactly empty. Hassan al Safar, The Cultural Dimension The cultural dimension was entrusted to Hassan al Safar. At the age of 30, a theology student by profession, slim with a budding beard, he looked more like a socialite than a religious figure. During our first meeting, I was taken aback by his voice, as delicate as a woman's. His duties required numerous trips abroad. Due to his Saudi origin, he was tasked, among other things, with infiltrating the Sunni body within the lower social strata. He lacked the charisma and persuasive power of someone like Mohammed Taqi el Mudarisai, and his religious writings were of mediocre quality. However, nothing here was without purpose, and the Rissalist leaders had calculatedly chosen him as a recruiter among the humble and the weak-willed. Nonetheless, rumors circulated that most members of the network did not hold him in high regard. I saw him as a weak and easily influenced individual who enjoyed flattery and was unreliable. Yet, he was the best Saudi Shiite I had encountered. It's likely that the hidden leaders closely monitored him, waiting for him to falter in his task to eliminate him. He had left the eastern part of Saudi Arabia at a young age for Kuwait, where he studied in a religious school affiliated with the network. After the success of the Khomeini revolution, he made his way to Iran, and the Rissalists had placed him at the head of the left arm of the network. Thus, he became responsible for a cultural organization named El Thawra El Islamia Literar El Jazeera El Arabia, the Islamic Revolution for the Liberation of the Arabian Peninsula, which served as a cover for a secret propaganda organ. Its official headquarters was in Tehran, though I couldn't confirm this due to the well-guarded secrecy. The absence of the term organization indicates that the political role played by this structure was secondary. Al Safar's underground work primarily involved transforming Muslim societies towards the Islamic ideal, without which the international Shiite revolution cannot take place. In summary, it involved discreetly substituting Shiite ideas for traditional practices, aiming for a worldwide population uprising. The method, repeated throughout different layers of society, was always the same but terribly effective. The main target was Saudi Arabia, a predominantly Sunni nation, with the network leaders not recognizing the legitimacy of the al Saud power or that of other Gulf emirs. Outside of Saudi Arabia, al Safar's activities extended worldwide. One of his significant operational places was the Center of Young Muslims in the United States. Under the guise of promoting Islamic culture, this center worked to recruit future Rissalist elements. Similar structures mainly existed in Europe. There were also such centers in Kenya, Tanzania, and Syria, particularly active in Sayyidah Zainab. Al Safar published a number of magazines, such as La Revolution Islamique in London and the Afef magazine in Lebanon, which discussed women's issues. These publications aimed to rival El Watan El Arabi and El Maustekbil. The newspaper El Alam, The World, based in the English capital, was also under the umbrella of the El Risali network, not the Iranian government, as some believed. The goal was to inundate the Arab Muslim world with widely circulated publications, some of which were even distributed free of charge to households. These primarily targeted Sunni Muslims, and their editorial line worked to smooth out ideological differences in the interest of unity. Among the five major intervention zones defined by the network since 1979, Hassan al Safar was the primary person in charge of the Arabian Peninsula, Oman, Jordan, and Yemen. Since the Rissalists were thwarted in Saudi Arabia due to strong opposition from Wahhabi Sunnis, they had to shift their focus to the latter two countries. To complete this picture, Mohammed Fauzi, a Shiite of Saudi origin and a prominent member of the network, was responsible for the four major regions of Africa, Northeast, Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, Egypt, the starting point of the revolution, Southeast, Kenya, Tanzania, Comoros Islands, Mauritius, Southwest, 
Cameroon, Niger, Senegal, Côte d'Ivoire, Benin. Special efforts were placed on the last two countries due to their significant population of Lebanese origin. Lastly, the Maghreb. When I completed my studies at El Kame, I had to collaborate with this man and with Sheikh Ahmed, a leading Maghreb specialist. Hedi El Mudarisai, the military dimension. Brother of Mohammed Taqi El Mudarisai, Hedi El Mudarisai was responsible for the military aspect of the network. He was a physically robust man, tall, slender, dynamic, a true champion of combat action, prone to furious outbursts of anger. His hoarse voice often carried threatening tones. His influence was significant, as was his passion for the revolution. He led El Jiba El Islamiyah Literir El Bahrain, the Islamic Front for the Liberation of Bahrain. The term Bahrain had not been chosen innocently, as Iran has long claimed, even under the Shah's regime, ownership of these 35 islands with a substantial Shiite Iranian population. The complete control of the Rissalist network over the country would put the network in a perilous position vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf countries. In fact, this armed front is responsible for the serious disturbances that the archipelago has been experiencing for the past few years, attempted coups, bombings, Shiite population riots. The Emir of Bahrain struggles to quell the growing unrest. Thus, Chaikh Ali Salman, a young 31-year-old mullah and sympathizer of the Rissalist cause, expelled from the territory on January 15, 1995, was preaching rebellion at the Khawaja Shiite Grand Mosque in the capital. This geographical area resembles a powder keg. The armed front located in Tehran has training camps in the northern part of the capital, as well as near Mashhad in Iran, Lebanon, and Afghanistan, as I learned from discussions with soldiers who were part of it. This is where the network's troops are trained. These are not just conscripts armed with bayonets, but true war professionals equipped with state-of-the-art weaponry, both psychologically and physically trained. The armed forces are divided into three groups. The first, El Joundi El Risali, the soldier of El Risali, brings together men prepared for suicide commando missions who live in isolation, kept in a state of perpetual religious trance. When a suicide attack or an assassination is decided by the network's leaders, one of these warriors is selected. On the day of his departure, he is given the details of the operation. Armed with fake documents, he crosses borders and waits for a month in the country before carrying out his terrorist action. During this time, the network provides him with the necessary information for carrying out his mission, such as contacts with agents in place who will provide him with explosives and other materials. When the attack takes place on the soil of a western country with a highly efficient police system, the soldier returns to his base once his crime is committed. This is called fugitive terrorist work. If the affected country is politically unstable, such as Lebanon, Afghanistan, or Algeria, the soldier remains in place to carry out new attacks. This is the permanent terrorist work. These soldiers stand out for their dedication and complete obedience. They are trained in a camp called the Suicide School. Everything is said in this title. They are named Safoin, after the surname of Navab Safavi, a former member of the network and creator of the Rissalist Armed Forces, executed by the Shah before the Iranian Revolution. To recruit the first Rissalist soldiers, Safavi drew inspiration from the methods of an ancient Islamic order called El Hashikin, the Assassin's Sect. This religious order had invented the suicide commando in the 10th century, based on the tragic end of Imam El Hussein, who allowed himself to be assassinated to save the Shiite cause. The second group, El Joundi El Risali El Kafi, the secret soldier of El Risali, brings together explosives experts responsible for making bombs, homemade chemical weapons, and transporting arms. They are fast, efficient, quick-witted, capable of making decisions within minutes. The third group, El Joundi El Halaka, the soldiers of the circle, forms the elite of this fight. They are organizers and serve as a link between the previous two groups. Once their training is completed, they travel around the world collecting information to enrich military databases and prepare the ground for future terrorist actions. 
They live a Western lifestyle, in legal status, often holding significant positions in European civil society. Consequently, they represent a latent terrorist threat that is all the more serious as it is difficult to detect. Intelligence is just another commodity that is traded among unscrupulous vendors. Thanks to them, the network holds vital information about European and American forces. Hedi El Mutarisai was propelled to the position of military chief because he had lived in Bahrain for a long time, where he was recognized as a prominent religious scholar with the degree of Hujatu El Islam. I know of no enemies he had. He's a respected and feared man. In his role as military chief, he operates numerous levers within the network structure. Furthermore, he has written several works on the meaning of religion, considered to have significant philosophical implications by critics. This individual of steely resolve could be gentle one moment and terrifyingly harsh the next. Fortunately, I never had reason to complain about him. It is true that he was capable of the worst. At the slightest perceived threat, he would eliminate the nuisance. In his eyes, only the success of the revolution mattered, even if it required massacring half the world. He was probably the bloodiest of them all. Shedding blood seemed to him the most effective means to hasten the downfall of enemy states. He incessantly pushed for more suicide commandos. In fact, he volunteered for a major operation intended to assassinate several Muslim heads of state in Morocco during a political meeting where he was to represent Iran. Since he enjoyed diplomatic immunity, he would evade border controls and easily approach the target. However, the leaders refused to sacrifice a man of his caliber. Believers, yet also calculating. Nonetheless, this did not prevent Hedi El Mudarisai from organizing a failed coup against the Bahraini government, fortunately. The operation ended with the arrest of 75 Rissalists. Like his brother Mohammed Taqi, Hedi did not hold people from the Gulf in high regard. He would say, the future of the Arabs is the greater Maghrib, and for non-Arabs, it's Persia. Conversely, he held Maghrib residents in high esteem. One day, he recounted his travels to me, particularly in Tunis, where he had met Islamist elements, whose names he naturally refrained from mentioning. He also visited Libya, where he had excellent relations with Abdesalam Jaloud, Gaddafi's advisor and the second most powerful man in the regime. Abdesalam Jaloud visited him in Iran to coordinate a joint policy regarding terrorist operations against Western interests. Hedi El Mudarisai proposed opening military training camps in Libya to cover the Maghreb region, and the Libyan gave his approval. However, Qaddafi ultimately rejected this project. In reality, the Libyan president had no trust in Islamists and did not want to risk becoming embroiled in an Arab-Muslim conflict. Especially since he desired to improve his image in the eyes of the international community. Nevertheless, the ties of friendship between the Rissalists and Abdesalam Jaloud persisted. The latter secretly provided financial, logistical, and military assistance to the network, even supplying individuals capable of carrying out terrorist attacks against Western countries, funded through Libyan state accounts. Based on the information I gathered or was permitted to see, the El Rissali network thus participated in the Pan AM, Lockerbie, and UTA plane bombings with the complicity of Libyan intelligence services and Abdesalam Jaloud. These horrific attacks were conceived as retaliation against the United States, whose military had mistakenly shot down an Iranian airline a while back, and against the French authorities for their neo-colonial policies in African countries. Upon discovering he had been double-crossed, Qaddafi ousted Jaloud from power, but he continued to refuse to hand over the suspected Libyan spies involved in the affair, as he was keen on avoiding exposure of his former advisor's criminal activities, though it doesn't absolve him of other wrongdoings. While he was betrayed on this matter, he remains a tyrant with blood on his hands. Kadim el Mudarisai, The Economic Dimension Finally, the last visible leader, Kadim el Mudarisai, held the position of the left leg, overseeing the economic aspect. The younger brother of Taqi and Hedi El Mudarisai, this man of then 35 years, with a somewhat fragile appearance, didn't often adopt the Islamic attire, unlike his elder siblings. 
he preferred the attire of a Western businessman. There isn't a specific organization dedicated to the financial aspect. In reality, each branch of the network has its autonomy in this matter and sets its budget according to its needs. The Islamic Revolution for the Liberation of the Arabian Peninsula, the branch led by Hassan al-Safar, derives its resources from funds coming from Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries. The movement within al-Shirazi's population survives thanks to private donations such as Zakat and Qums. The Islamic Front for the Liberation of Bahrain led by Hedi el mudarisai is funded by wealthy Iranian merchants. Muslim Work Organization of Iraq, headed by Mohammad Taqi el mudarisai inherits its finances from wealthy businessmen affiliated with the Iranian government. To avoid budget disparities among the various branches of the network, its leaders decided in 1982 to create an economic department responsible for managing revenues. A placement office was established in Tehran. It invested in the East and in Europe in various sectors such as real estate and hospitality, and then distributed the profits generated among El Risali sectors. Thanks to Kadam El Mudarisai's managerial and negotiating skills, assisted by his brother Ali Akbar, the network's revenues reach staggering amounts. It trains its own businessmen who go on to open branches in Scandinavian countries, the United States, the Gulf, and especially in Kuwait, a country that serves as a cover for launching extensive financial operations. The West is the sworn enemy but also an excellent cash cow. Money from the Gulf countries reaches Iran and Lebanon via Syria. From Lebanon, it is directed to Lebanese individuals in Africa who are responsible for integrating it into the drug circuits in Europe. Once multiplied, the money is used to buy weapons and cutting-edge technology to provide the network with top-notch logistics. Apart from the placement office in Tehran, it appears impossible to locate the nerve center of this activity. Undoubtedly, the El Risali network holds a significant number of shares in internationally renowned financial institutions through a network of shell companies. It also maintains close relations with less scrupulous Arab banks, as money knows no bounds, even in the realm of God. These funds are intended for the network soldiers, terrorism is a profession, and despite hiding behind a religious facade, the God of money is also revered. Every new member of El Risali is granted a lifetime salary, a bank card, accommodation, household staff, with keen ears, a tutor for children's education, and many other benefits. I myself enjoyed a salary and the largesse of the network for a while. The Prospect of the Return of the Hidden Imam an incredibly organized, notably entrenched, and even tentacular organization, El Risali pursues a single goal, to dominate the world in anticipation of the return of the hidden imam. This pursuit is carried out through an exceptionally long-term strategy that very few individuals in the West can fathom, as it has been plotted, according to them, for centuries. The Risalists firmly believe in the righteousness of their harmful endeavor. They are malefactors with unparalleled determination. I witness that any order originating from the leadership is executed to the letter and without delay, as it is believed to come directly from Imam el Mehdi, the holder of hidden truth, who entrusted his powers to Shiite religious scholars before disappearing. As a result, every member of el Risali considers themselves as his soldier, his knight protected by the hand of Allah. Here lies the essence of their fanaticism. Imam el Mehdi is regarded as the true secret leader of the network, who continues to enlighten men from the shadows and perpetually convey his will. The idea of insinuating that the network emanates from the founders of Islam, and therefore from Allah, is cunning as it fosters confusion among the feeble-minded and frustrated, lulling them into the illusion that they touch divine power by obeying orders. The Hadith proclaims that any soldier of Allah who perishes in the execution of their duties reincarnates alongside Mahdi to fight the enemy with him and spread Islam across the earth. This prophecy is successfully disseminated among both Shiite and Sunni populations, a hope of reincarnation for the former and a promise of a higher place in paradise for the latter. As seen, I managed to approach certain sacred texts purportedly transcribing the words of Imam el Mehdi, buried according to tradition near the mausoleums of the infallible Imams. 
This is evidently a devout imposture that has been woven over time, and it is likely that the network intentionally allowed me access to these texts to make me adhere to its alleged religious legitimacy. Convincing the followers that the network is an emanation of Prophet Muhammad constitutes the ultimate weapon. The art of mystification works here in full force to induce a sense of enlightenment among the young terrorist recruits. These works trace the history from Adam to the end of the world. Their content is intended to be clinically precise. They determine the network's rules of life and its strategy within the framework of the holy war that is meant to lead to the advent of the Muslim Empire. This war, which is said to have begun on the day of Muhammad's birth in 571 and is expected to conclude in the year 2299, is of an unimaginable scale and duration when considered within an individual's lifespan. It is divided into twelve generations spread across four periods. Each generation lasts for 144 years and consists of twelve twelve-year plans, which are further divided into four three-year periods. The tenth generation covers the period between 1867 and 2011. The actions undertaken by the network in the 36 years leading up to its end, according to Rissalists, aim to demonstrate to the international community that Islam is an invisible and indestructible force, the last religion of the last prophet, and its civilization, the last of all. According to them, El Mehdi will resurface when the flags of the following nations are united, Iran, the Black, the Greater Maghrib, the Yellow, and Yemen, the White. At that point, Israel will be encircled. Here are, loosely translated, the ten hadiths that announce to the Rissalists the return of Imam el Mehdi and on which they base their strategy. 1. After me, Muhammad, there will be caliphs, Arab kings, non Arab kings, then despotic kings, dictators, and tyrants. According to Rissalists, this sacred utterance materialized when the Abbasid dynasty collapsed and the Ottoman Empire, the non Arab monarchy, Ajam, triumphed, subjecting Arabs to Turkish dominance. 2. The union of the two greatest enemies of Islam, Jews and Christians, will take place to combat and weaken Islam. Christians have long condemned Jews for allowing the assassination of Christ. Conversely, Jews reproach Christians for their rejection of Judaism and their failure to recognize the coming prophet. Rissalists believe this ancient rivalry ended after World War II, uniting adherents of the Old and New Testaments in a shared will to combat the Muslim threat. 3. A time will come when there will be towers and when space will be subjected to the laws of men. The development of modern society, skyscrapers, airplanes, telephones, etc. could be seen as the fulfillment of this prophecy. 4. A time will come when the Islamic world will be fragmented under the domination of the Romans. The colonization and division of Arab Muslim countries by the West after the fall of the Ottoman Empire constitute the fourth sign. 5. When Jews and Arabs are seen sitting at the same table to negotiate a peace treaty, it will herald the imminent fall of Israel and the return of El Mehdi. The creation of the State of Israel in Palestine after World War II is another herald of the return of Imam El Mehdi. The Quran and Hadith specify that Israel's fall will happen under the pressure of the Eastern Persians, Iranians, and the Western Berbers, Maghribis. Muslim countries would then be governed by despots with whom it would be forbidden to negotiate, and this period would witness the emergence of two global powers, one atheistic and the other non-practicing. The former would correspond to the ex-Soviet Union, and the latter to the United States and Europe. Finally, another prophecy predicts that a significant federation, seemingly referring to the USSR, will collapse, allowing some of its former republics to unite with the Islamic world. 6. Small black flags will rise in Persian land under the authority of a descendant of the Prophet's family, whose supporters will be soldiers of God and El Mehdi. He will destroy El Basra, Basora, a significant city in Iraq during the Abbasid era, without being able to conquer it, and he will die in bitterness. Rissalists see in this word the announcement of Khomeini's Iranian revolution. Another prediction indicates the appearance of large black flags raised by El Khurasani, named after the Persian city of Khorasan, today's Mashhad in Iran, who will destroy El Basra, 
colonize Iraq, and stop at the gates of Jerusalem. This would herald a new revolution against the Iranian government in the near future. 7. Beware of the Egyptians of Berber descent, they will eliminate so many Egyptians that only one man will remain for every ten women. They will then establish themselves on the throne of the country and head towards the gates of Jerusalem to join El Khurasani's black flags. This sacred word would reveal the creation of an Islamic state in the Greater Maghrib, in Berber land. Rissalists, relying on various hadiths, see this happening as follows, first, the sidelining of the despot of Afrikia, Tunis, an enemy of Islam and Muslims, in other words, President Bourguiba. This happened. He will pass away when the Islamic clamor resounds in Tunis and throughout the Maghrib. King Hassan, considered the last strong king of the Moroccan Alawite dynasty, will also die, leading to significant political instability until El Kindi arrives in his country. El Kindi, the lame or of the Kindi Berber tribe, will proceed to unify the Muslims. Raising the yellow flags, he will gather Morocco and the neighboring countries into an Islamic state. Egypt will tremble, just like the Western countries. 8. White flags will emerge from Yemen under the leadership of El Yemeni. After a long period of political instability in Yemen, a leader will unite the people, he will invade Saudi Arabia and head towards Jerusalem to join the black and yellow flags. The Jews will then be massacred, and the holy city will be liberated. 9. The reunification of Islamic states will occur under the banner of Imam el Mehdi. In reality, the Rissalists have already begun this reunification. 10. The Antichrist embodied by El Sufiani, of Jewish origin, will colonize the five cowardly states, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. The state of Israel will cover the region between the Nile and the Euphrates, and corruption and injustice will reign. At that point, Imam el Mehdi will emerge to liberate Jerusalem. Christ, who, according to Islam, did not die, will be by his side. During this period, Muslims will be united. El Mehdi will declare war on the West, conquer it, and dominate the planet, where Islam will remain the sole religion. These, according to the Rissalists, are the ten heralds of the return of Imam el Mehdi. Thus, the manipulation continues through the biased interpretation of sacred texts. Religion becomes, in the hands of exegetes, a more formidable weapon than bombs and cannons, an entire bewildered and galvanized populace risks rising up in the name of a sacred cause shamelessly distorted. The Network Strategy I had access to the detailed interpretation of the 10th generation, 1867-2011. The period 1975 to 1999, in particular, is instructive. These pieces of information should not be taken literally, especially not their dates, which can advance or recede depending on the evolution of the global situation. The main goal is to present the internal information provided by the network. 1975 to 1987 the El Risali network increases its support for Islamic movements and intensifies the spread of revolutionary ideas throughout all layers of the Muslim community. The end of this period marks its first major victory, the establishment of an Islamic state in Iran. 1987-1999, the objective involves several points. First, to trigger the creation of a second Islamic state in Asia, even if it is not Shiite. The targeted countries are Iraq, Lebanon, and Afghanistan. Then, to continue destabilizing North African states to bring forth an Islamist regime that appears Sunni but is allied with Shiites. The targeted countries are Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, and Sudan. Next, to intensify terrorist acts against Western countries. Eliminate opponents of the Iranian revolution, pro-Israeli and pro-Western individuals. Finally, to reorganize the network, redistribute key positions, and unify various Islamist movements under the control of El Rasali. As we have seen, after the Iranian Revolution, most of the strategic branches of power were monopolized by Rasali terrorists, radio, television, print media, intelligence services, barracks, embassies, banks.
Khomeini retained only his supreme title of Wilayat al faqi the seventh spiritual degree according to Shiite doctrine. The network then hoped to pass on this title to Hausin Ali el Mountadairi, a full-fledged Risali member. Iran would become the state of all Muslims, the fifth Islamic empire, with Qam as its capital. After tense negotiations with the ruling party, the Risalis had to revise their ambitions, realizing the need to protect the ongoing change in order to progress more surely towards the universal propagation of Shurism. Here are the details of these negotiations. Khomeini appoints Hausin Ali el Mountadairi as his legitimate successor, the heir to the title of Wilayat al Faqi. El Risali withdraws its non Iranian agents from the Revolutionary Guard, which comes under el Mountadairi's command. This armed corps becomes an elite force dedicated to defending the supreme title of Wilayat al Faqi. The network returns control of audiovisual and print media on the condition that it can continue to propagate its ideas through them. Its members are now allowed to run for local and national elections. The network agrees to release embassies but retains the right to use them as needed. It has complete freedom to support Islamic movements worldwide from Iranian soil. The Iranian government contributes to the network's funding and provides it with state tools and military aid. The network retains ownership of real estate acquired during the revolution, land, schools, facilities, etc. But participates in defending the state and supporting it in its struggle against the Iraqi regime. If the Iraqi regime is overthrown, El Risali will assume power. These agreements strengthened the power of the El Risali network in Iran. The public image of Iran was officially preserved, but the concessions were minimal, if not non-existent. This allowed the network to create a microstate within the Iranian regime that could secretly buy weapons abroad and carry out all sorts of illegal operations. Henceforth, it could use the regime as a shield and a springboard to accelerate the global Islamic war. The network strategic plan covering the period 1987 to 1999 is divided into four three-year periods, which starkly illustrate the madness of these individuals who are intoxicated with the blood of their victims. 1987 to 1990, the network accelerates the establishment of Islamist movements in Muslim countries. A selected group of individuals from each country comes to Iran to receive comprehensive training. Subsequently, these individuals return to their respective countries with a mission of propaganda, recruitment, and destabilization. The selection criteria were as follows, candidates had to be between 17 and 24 years old, open to various Islamic doctrines, fascinated by the Iranian revolution, interested in shurism, hold disdain for the West and the current regime, possess a liking for travel, have a sense of risk, sacrifice, and obedience, and be intellectually sharp and independent from their families. Several terrorist groups were formed in Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and Egypt. The network focused its efforts on Algerian territory to strengthen the Bouyali movement, which ended on February 3, 1987. This attempt was unsuccessful, as the organization was banned by the State Security Court in June 1987. The network then formed the Islamic Jihad in Egypt, where it apparently orchestrated the horrific attack of October 6, 1981, which ended the life of President Anwar el Sadat, a fervent advocate for peace. The method was simple recruit supporters within countries from all layers of society to weave a network for propaganda and espionage. Prepare an elite group to take power. Store weapons and explosives near sensitive areas to arm a hardcore group of illuminated soldiers capable of executing suicide commandos at any time. Simultaneously, monitor any Islamic movement that sprouted independently from revolutionary initiators and infiltrate it quickly. This work was made possible by observation offices spread all over the world. Alongside the destabilization of Arab Muslim countries, moles infiltrated most Western countries, fanning the flames of future chaos in the impious lands. 1990-1993, the objective is to shake the West through the multiplication of terrorist acts and regular dispatch of threats to political leaders. The goal is to demonstrate the unwavering power of Islam. The war was declared. 
The attacks targeted plotters, neo-colonists, but also women and children. No one was spared. This was a test for both the West and the network, if vulnerabilities appeared, they would adjust their fighting methods. This new war pitted shadow forces against millions of defenseless innocents who could become human torches at any moment. It sowed devastation and panic in families. I will never forget the speech given by a speaker at El Kaim School, a few hours after the heinous attack that killed nearly 300 people in Beirut in 1983, 241 Marines, 58 French soldiers, let us rejoice, for this day marks a great victory. We have turned Lebanon into a graveyard for the Westerners. Soon, an Islamic State will rise here. It's young people like you who made the success of this operation possible. They sacrificed themselves in the name of Allah and now stand by his side. Soon, it will be your turn to fulfill your soldiers' mission against the infidels. This phase, marked by a rising spirit of vengeance and lingering suspicion, also saw the annihilation of rival Islamist movements, either through denunciation or outright elimination of their leaders. Contacts with terrorists of all stripes multiplied, as did the deployment of moles to the West. According to the figures I had access to, 10,000 agents infiltrated territories in France, England, Belgium, Spain, and the United States. They appeared to be pacifists and anti-Islamists, studying in universities, managing hotels, restaurants, working in banks, and so on. 1993-1996, the network revises its relationship with the Iranian state. A few years earlier, in early 1985, a conflict had erupted with Khomeini's People's Party supporters, who had taken over the government. The network then decides to undertake a purge called reorganization within the house. Weapons and explosives are sent to the West, particularly through Italy and Germany. Destabilization operations continue within Arab Muslim countries, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine. The network acts formidably in Afghanistan, a springboard to Russian Muslim countries, and orchestrates a coup in Tunisia. Egypt resists, but it achieves notable success in Sudan. This arms convoy, in which the network collaborates with ETA, IRA, and Nazi groups under the rule, The Enemy of My Enemy is My Friend, which began in 1984, apparently concludes in 1996. It is difficult to estimate its importance. 1996 to 1999, Analysis of the International Political Situation to Prepare for the Next War Plan. The second wave of terrorism is expected to extend until 2004. In fact, it has already begun, especially in France. Similarly, the program of infiltrating foreign countries is well underway. Moroccan members of the network are sent to Spain, Algerians to France, Tunisians to Libya, Gulf militants to the United Kingdom and the United States of America, Egyptians to Greece, Turks and Kurds to Germany, Iraqis and Iranians to Eastern Europe. Fortunately, not everything the Rasali terrorists boast about is necessarily true, they don't win on all fronts. The greater Maghreb still stands. While Algeria is drowning in blood, there is still no indication that clandestine Islamist forces will prevail. Afghanistan, which was so coveted, slipped through their fingers, when the Soviets withdrew, Borain Eden Rabani, a staunch opponent of the network, seized power. On this occasion, the network suffered a severe defeat. Some readers might be tempted to think that the events recorded here are deliberately exaggerated. How I wish they were right. But El Risali is in no way akin to a simple Islamist movement. It is a secretive organization whose supporters are strategically distributed across all continents under various covers, ranging from isolated regions to major capitals, sometimes occupying high responsibility positions. Their desire for domination is even stronger as they believe they are rivals with the Zionists in their quest for world conquest. It is a relentless struggle that they claim to have been waging for centuries. Thus, the terrorist madness is far from being over, and it continues to torment us. So, this is what I discovered between my 18th and 20th years during the months spent at El Kame School, what I discovered or what I was allowed to discover. 
Through readings, interviews, deductions, I managed to piece together a part of the puzzle of El Rasali's secret organization and strategy. All this while continuing to believe, despite everything, in the justification of an Islamic revolution, with the fear that its leaders might discover that I knew things I should have been ignorant of, and with the rising anxiety of being manipulated myself. This testimony is directed at the slumbering consciences of the Western Bloc's politicians. What are governments doing to stem this deadly tide? With each passing day, war draws nearer. Without peace returning to Muslim countries, the West cannot contemplate the future with serenity. Let's just imagine for a moment that our children might see the sky covered in ashes tomorrow. Let's forget the differences in race, skin color, the wounds of the past. Let's think about life. Let's face this grim reality with a resolute heart, a reality that only steps aside to strike even harder. Special Missions The leaders of El Rasali are attentive to global events and have noticed that it is opportune to assign me a mission in Tunisia. This occurred after my brother-in-law Sulla Karker assumed the leadership of MTI, replacing Ganucci. For them, this opportunity must not be overlooked, as it would pave the way for establishing direct ties with Tunisian Islamic movements. After realizing that my recruitment and training at the El Kame school were not a matter of chance but meticulously planned for this mission, I left Iran heading towards Europe. That's where I began to establish contacts. This included not only my brother-in-law but also all Islamic groups or individuals, whether Shiite or Sunni, that I could meet during my journey. This hands-on experience allowed me to understand precisely how Islamists operate and think. I also grasped how they formulate long-term plans, placing the concern for individuals at the core of their actions. Their religious ideological goals take precedence over any other aspect, regardless of the cost. My new supervisor. The second year, the school administration replaced Abu Mustafa with Sheikh Jamal by my side, a Moroccan considered a grand master of politico-religious matters, who regularly collaborated using the pseudonym Mehdi Atlas for the journal El Shahid belonging to the network. This decision was deliberate. In the eyes of the school leaders, they needed to silence my hesitations and prepare me for action. Under the skilled guidance of my new mentor, I would eventually yield to the Rasali order. Indeed, this change bore fruit. As my mentors taught me the art and manner of conducting myself in all circumstances, I became a diligent student, ready for war, religious war, certainly, but above all, war. I learned how to write a coded letter, falsify a passport, tail an enemy without their knowledge, set up eavesdropping, evade police pursuit, respond to an interrogation. They also taught me, someone who never had any taste for violence, the basics of handling weapons and explosives. In short, I was initiated into all the techniques useful for a novice Islamist spy in the field. In reality, it excited me. This training presaged an extraordinary life for me, one subject to danger yet exhilarating. Violence, when adorned with the allure of adventure, has the power to stir even the most phlegmatic individual. Worse, it places them on a pedestal. From there, on the heights, the sense of belonging to a singular elite goes to your head, so much so that common mortals, those helpless insects, seem infinitely mediocre to you. You feel like a superhuman, wielding considerable power. You have the sense of belonging to a united family, the only one that matters now, the family of theory and arms. The Rissalists are well acquainted with this kind of ecstasy that flatters the pride of young people, and they know how to play it in a thousand ways. Infiltration Plan Hedi El Mudarissai summoned me one morning to his office in Tehran. The room was decorated in an oriental style, with trinkets and intricately carved wood panels, creating a subdued atmosphere with dimmed lights and delicate scents. Quite the opposite of the harshness of terrorism. In the corridors roamed a strange array of individuals, silent and with closed expressions, gliding across the floor like sleepwalking felines. There were religious adherents of El Rasali, but also figures resembling businessmen, children playing cards while waiting for some unknown reward, elderly women mumbling prayers, the needy. 
In fact, the building housed agents of the network's secret services. This is where activity reports from Rissalists all over the world converged, to be processed, analyzed, and archived. Without quite understanding why, I felt a sense of pride being in that place. Perhaps I was suddenly becoming aware of the significance the leaders attached to me. Have a seat, began Hedy El Mudarisai. I've been observing you for several months. You've made great progress since your arrival at the school. However, I must mention that you easily succumb to daydreaming. I suppose that's the manifestation of your love for God. But our Lord also demands vigilance, activity, in other words, defending Islam. I'm simply trying to understand God's message. His message is clear, the words of Imam al mehdi leave no room for doubt in this regard. Now, it's a matter of how you envision the future. Do you want to fight alongside us, or do you think our efforts to make you an honorable being will be in vain? At those words, I felt fear prickle at me, sensing a threat in the words of the high military chief. Hedi el Mudarisai had just given me an ultimatum. Since I had been living comfortably on their expenses for almost two years, I owed them answers. I. Of course, I want to serve Islam in the name of Imam el mehdi I cautiously replied. But what exactly do you expect from me? That you become an honorable being, as I've already mentioned. I'm listening, sir. Master Sheikh Jamal has spoken to you at length about the Maghrib countries. We want to help Tunisia break free from its predicament. For that to happen, it's necessary to overthrow Bourguiba and establish an Islamic state, of which you will naturally be one of the pillars. I will provide you with a comprehensive dossier on local revolutionary movements. You'll also find a detailed account of the political life of Tunisia and its neighboring countries. We are well aware of most factions linked to the MTI party, with one exception, the one led by your brother-in-law Sulla Karker. Ah! The excellent Sulla Karker! I exclaimed ironically. Does he appreciate you? Yes, I believe so. But I, myself, don't trust him much. In my opinion, trying to deal with him is a mistake, I dared, happy to offer this sage advice to one of the network's highest leaders. Be assured, we have the means to control any type of situation, Hedi El Mudarisai whispered, a satisfied expression on his face. Know that I have significant plans for your future. Ah! Are you worthy of serving Tunisia? I do love my country, indeed. Then you will be one of its most notable leaders. You flatter me, I don't deserve such honors. Come now, dear Falahi, take your destiny by the horns. What will my mission entail? You will need to persuade your brother-in-law to collaborate with us. But I will provide you with more details later. Read this dossier first. We parted, warmly shaking hands. Hedi El Mudarisai had further enticed me, I was elated, electrified, ready to take up arms, eager to depart, to guide my country down the paths of freedom, to serve God and his messenger, Imam El Mehdi. In fact, I had just stepped into the grave. I didn't imagine for a single second that I was now an armed apostle of the forces of evil and that I might have to shed the blood of innocence on my sacred land. The next day, my position was transferred to Tehran. Every morning, I took a taxi, as discretion required, to the offices of El Risali Secret Services to receive further training. This training included all sorts of ethnic, political, economic, military, and psychological data about the Maghrib, its heads of state, its main Islamist leaders, and personalities within the police, high administration, and finance. During these sessions, my instructors described the specifics of my future role as an organizer, including forming bomb-setting cells, spreading revolutionary ideas within Sunni communities, preparing popular demonstrations as a prelude to religious revolt, and so on. On this occasion, I once again realized the power of the network and its almost neurotic concept of global Islamism. But now, the only thing that mattered was the hope of soon seeing a religious state born in my country. The rest mattered little to me. 
My discussion with Hedy El Mudarisai had struck me like an electric shock, Tunisia was waiting for me. A few days later, Hedy El Mudarisai called me again. When I entered the chief's office, I had the pleasant surprise of finding my friend from Paris, Abu Ahmed, there. What are you doing here? I exclaimed, opening my arms wide. I've come specifically for you. For me, really? And how? Today, you're going to take an oath. What do you mean? You're one of us now. In a few days, you'll embark on your first mission. But before that, you need to pledge allegiance to our cause for the rest of your life. Hedy El Mudarisai maintained a religious silence, but his smile testified to his inner jubilation. He seemed to experience a physical pleasure from this. A new recruit was about to bow his head, submit to the Risali order, and sacrifice his life for the holy war. This ritual of the oath rewarded him each time with his own sacrifice. Revolutionary blood merged with the blood of God. What a moment of grace! I stepped back. Tell me, Ahmed, did you plan everything from the beginning of our meeting to get me into the network, is that it? Aren't you happy to serve your country? Rejoice instead. Now listen to how we'll proceed. For the execution of your mission, you'll act under the authority of three comrades, Hassan El Safar, responsible for the cultural aspect, Mohammed Fauzi and his brother, El Sheikh Ahmed, both in charge of directing the Tunisian and Greater Maghreb Rasalis. How? I refuse to be commanded by those individuals. I exclaimed. What's happening to you? Have you lost your mind? Abu Ahmed asked, surprised. El Sheikh Ahmed has a reputation for never keeping his word. Students call him, the liar. As for the other two, they're lazy, they lack the weight and seriousness of our venerable Hedi El Mudarisai here. If you start trusting rumors, you're doomed, you know that. And besides, you won't have to deal with them. In reality, you'll be under my direct supervision. I'll be your intermediary. Ah, uh, I see. That changes everything. So, are you going to take the oath? Abu Ahmed asked, coming closer to me. I decided to go all out. I can't pledge allegiance for my entire life. To be completely honest, I doubt the usefulness of our objectives on some days. An oppressive silence spread. Only Hedi El Mudarisai, eyebrows furrowed, tapped his fingers on his desk. Finally, he addressed me. You're an intriguing young man, Falahi. Would you reconsider your decision? I can't pledge allegiance for my entire life because I'm not sure the network is entirely truthful. I want to commit for a period of one year. I also want the freedom to choose my missions. This procedure is unusual, Hedi El Mudarisai responded. That said, I'm willing to make an exception. All I ask is that you convince Sulla Karkar to collaborate with us, for him to understand that, without the network's help, he'll never succeed in overthrowing Borguiba's government. Trust me, I'll manage to convince him. The rest of the discussion was more relaxed. I took an oath of allegiance to the Rasali cause for a year, as I had requested. Return to Europe once the fake passports and visas were prepared, the day of departure arrived for Abu Ahmed and me. The wife of a Rasali agent living in Brussels was also traveling with us. She pretended to be Abu Ahmed's wife. Under her black chatter, she hid top-secret coded documents on the network's activities in Europe for her real husband. A taxi took the three of us to Tehran's airport. I was going to travel under the pseudonym Falahi Hassan Mohammed, dressed in Western attire, posing as an Iraqi student. To perfectly fit into this role, I had been trained to behave like them, using the same language quirks. Additionally, I had learned a set of magical phrases to say mentally in various situations, like handing my passport to customs, before boarding the plane, or when contacting certain individuals, all to ward off bad luck. As we've seen, the network also delved into the irrational. When the Lufthansa plane took off, 
I felt immense relief. While I had been happy during those two years in Iran, the religious fervor of Iranian shurism, excursions to historical sites, meeting illustrious personalities, studying Quranic exegesis, the beauty of certain landscapes, and strolling through Tehran streets in search of the unknown, I cherished the prospect of returning to the vibrant colors of the West, its modernism, and the bustling population. The flight attendants removed their chatters, revealing their golden hair. What beauty! God had indeed crafted things perfectly, or so I thought in October 1984. We landed in Amsterdam via Frankfurt. For security reasons, agents heading on foreign missions never took direct flights. Even when I had first journeyed to Iran, I had made two stops before taking a bus from Istanbul to Tehran. Upon arriving in Dutch territory, Abu Ahmed called a network member to set up a meeting at the train station. A few hours later, we boarded a train bound for Brussels. Beforehand, Abu Ahmed discreetly handed over some of the coded documents to his Rasali contact in Amsterdam. During the journey, he attempted to broach the subject of my reservations about joining the network, but I pretended not to hear. From then on, an awkward silence lingered between us. Once we reached our destination, the young woman's real husband, a man named Abu Ali, welcomed us without excessive enthusiasm and took us to the Rasali Cultural Center in Brussels, where I stayed for two days with Abu Ahmed. This facility was an apartment in an old building in the city center. The entrance was guarded by a man who pretended to read the newspaper. His gaze scrutinized every newcomer before returning to the crumpled pages of his newspaper. A door led to a service staircase, typically used by individuals who didn't want to be seen by the building's occupants. Inside the apartment, there was a library containing most of the publications of Islamist networks. I observed some prominent figures frequenting this den of criminals, including the son of Rafsanjani, a member of El Rasali, the leader of compatriot students, a representative from the Iranian embassy, a Belgian member of the communist terrorist group, the CCC, who had come seeking logistical support from the network. These encounters underscored the significant role played by the Iranian state in terrorism. The details of my mission had not yet been specified. Before we parted ways, Abu Ahmed, my superior, informed me of it and added his recommendations. Now, you will reunite with your family members. Be cautious. Apart from your sister and her husband, no one should know that you are returning from Iran. You can say you're coming from Syria, where you studied at a religious school. Begin your report as I've instructed, and contact me in a week. I landed in Paris in an indescribable state of pent-up excitement. Finally, I was back in the city I loved so much. Memories of walks came flooding back, but also, with less pleasure, memories of the long days spent at the Iranian Cultural Center, where unknowingly, I had sealed my fate. I headed towards Vagram Avenue and entered an upscale building. I rapidly climbed the seven flights of stairs, walked along the narrow corridor of the maids' rooms, and knocked on the door of one of them, my heart pounding. It was my elder brother who opened the door. Mom, Mom. Kareem is back. After such a painful separation, words were unable to escape our lips, but we exchanged melancholic and intense looks for several minutes. What joy it was to embrace each other again and again. My mother, a woman of heart intact, didn't interrogate me about my past. Nevertheless, she was not naive and suspected that I would lie to her. Life had not been kind to her, and she preferred not to know, simply praying for God to help her children, especially me, who she believed to be the most fragile. On the other hand, my elder brother, naturally curious, questioned me incessantly, but I skillfully evaded his inquiries. A few days after my return, I settled into the maid's room next to my mother's, bought a typewriter, and regularly, in the evenings, I started typing on the keyboard everything I had seen and heard during the day. I write whatever comes to mind, I claimed. In reality, I was beginning my espionage work. At the end of the week, I handed my first report to Abu Ahmed, who sent a copy to the Cultural Center in Brussels, which then forwarded it to Tehran. 
For several months, I meticulously combed through the capital, noting numerous addresses of interest to the network, mosques, cultural centers, embassies, bookstores, and high schools of Muslim communities. At the same time, I tried to observe the habits of the people frequenting these places. I also examined the Jewish and Arab neighborhoods, assessing the situation of their businesses. I even delved into the pasts of certain individuals. Any element that could destabilize public order was meticulously noted. I compiled a dossier for each district. When an individual posed a potential threat to the network or served as a political target, I opened a special file on them. In such cases, I investigated their private lives and conducted an in-depth analysis. Once in action, I had no doubts anymore. I carried out my mission as an Islamist cadre with zeal. Apart from that, I prayed whenever I pleased. Sometimes I listened to religious chants, other times to rock music. Occasionally, I drank alcohol and smoked cigarettes. I wore jeans, sneakers, and a leather jacket. A real hipster. I didn't ask anyone for money. I claimed to have earned a living during my travels and saved quite a bit. I was a mystery to everyone. However, having received no news regarding the follow-up to my Tunisian mission, I had to establish a cover for myself. I decided to enroll in a school in Paris attended by affluent Libyans, the sons of ambassadors and industrialists. To do this, Abu Ahmed provided me with fake academic certificates. From then on, the mornings were dedicated to the network's leaders, who seemed very satisfied with my work. I was particularly meticulous, not hesitating to accompany my reports with plans and all sorts of seemingly insignificant details at first glance. Furthermore, I was instructed to convert members of my family to the Shiite doctrine gradually, in a detached manner, through subtle means, avoiding abruptness. My skills as a preacher were finely honed. I took them aside to create intimacy or gathered them in groups to better expose their contradictions. When I had successfully sown doubt in their minds and they no longer knew what to say, I proposed an alternative solution. With them, I had found a sensitive point, Sunnis, I would say, prohibit women from leaving the house. What nonsense! A reactionary practice. Shiite Islam places great importance on women's empowerment in society. They can engage in politics. In fact, they are considered equals to men. So, my role as a Rasali agent had three aspects, espionage, underground preaching, and the development of the El Taqiyya method, which involved integrating into French society without arousing suspicion. Al Taqiyya. I will try to summarize this vast and thorny subject to the best of my ability. Many people think that Taqiyya is limited to the realm of religion, often associating it solely with Shia Islam. Others attribute it solely to dissimulation. In reality, Taqiyya applies to all Islamic currents, whether in politics, economics, the military, or religion. Dissimulation is just one of its forms. There are essentially two forms of Taqiyya, A, defensive, B, and tactical. A, defensive Taqiyya is used to protect oneself from external aggression. It is commonly practiced on an individual level to limit the influence of one's surroundings. It is employed in cases of legitimate defense by any minority seeking to preserve its right to be different. This form of taqiyya also applies at the level of sectarian orders like Shia or Sufism in order to survive. There's no need to dwell on this approach as it falls under classical simulation and is harmless. B. Tactical taqiyya, on the other hand, has a strong political connotation, aiming to seize power in a country and eventually over all of humanity. It works towards the extinction of human diversity and richness through sophisticated techniques that can be divided into three main points. 1. Methods used to reach as many followers as possible within the diversity of a population. 2. The application of a step-by-step -step procedure to gradually infiltrate minds and gently subject them to control. 3. Adaptation to different situations based on their severity and the available means. 
the renewal of tactical taqiyya emerged with Muhammad. He wanted, with the support of his tribe, Bani Hashim, to form a kind of opposition to the social, political, and religious power monopolized at the time by the rival tribe of Bani Umayyah. The goal was to regain control over the region and unite the Arab tribes around Mecca in the name of one God, Allah, and one religion, Islam. Muhammad exploited the absence of a sacred book among the Arabs to impose a despotic scriptural ideology on them. The totalitarian nature of the new belief contained a highly efficient germ of domination at the local level, and which turns out to be disastrous on a global scale, but its implementation required subtlety. Muhammad bet on tactical al taqiyya to achieve his dominating will. It was thanks to his mastery of this art that he succeeded in introducing Islam and that it slowly but surely spread throughout the world. This delusion exists in all Islamists, whether Shia or Sunni, with the difference that among Shia, only al albayt can take control of all Muslims to establish the caliphate on earth, while among Sunni, this right of command belongs to religious leaders. The visions differ, but the goal is the same. I will only talk about taqiyya among the Rissalists to understand how it works and draw appropriate solutions to identify and counter it. Before discussing tactical al taqiyya I would like to say a word about my legitimacy to speak about it as a former extremist who belonged to an international Islamist network. This experience allowed me to understand the logic of taqiyya and grasp the threat that this practice represents on a global scale. To those who might think that, given my young age at the time, a four-year experience is insufficient to gather so much information about the Islamist threat, I would reply that one can obtain a master's or even a doctorate in four years. A student who devotes four years to a thesis topic with targeted education, reading hundreds of carefully selected books, watching hundreds of tapes, ends up delving deep into the subject, especially if they have the opportunity to apply their knowledge, as I did during missions for the network in the West and, above all, in Tunisia. With 20 years of hindsight and an analysis of the functioning of the Islamist octopus, I measure with anxiety, in light of current international events, that what I have learned applies to all existing Islamist movements. My experience ultimately amounts to an understanding of one tentacular system among others. Each of them presents itself as the legitimate representative of the Khalafa, God's will to spread Islam on earth. Their only difference lies in the thought current through which each network claims to achieve this goal. I do not ask to be believed on my word, but that you reflect on what I denounce and become aware of the magnitude of the threat, regardless of the form my testimony takes. I draw attention to the hundreds of young people who have acquired the same training as me. If I manage to get out myself, many of them, now adults, continue to work tirelessly around the world to realize this inhuman plan. And I'm only talking about the network I knew up close, not to mention all those I am unaware of. Because knowingly or not, every Islamist feeds on this idea of the global domination of Islam. The longer time passes, the more the danger amplifies and becomes difficult to combat. Everything must be done to prevent the evil from spreading further and to eradicate it. Whether within governments, associations, intellectual elites, media, business, or artistic circles, we must all fight against this fanaticism that murders freedom of thought in the name of a certain Allah. Al-Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, the sixth infallible Shiite Imam, said this, al taqiyya as I understand it is our true religion and that of our parents. Whoever does not practice it should be considered a non-practitioner of authentic Islam. At first, I thought that the course called El Taqiyya consisted of intensive training in simulation techniques, like in any classical secret service training. But over time, I realized that it went far beyond a mere circumstantial practice of dissimulation. It was, in fact, a complete belief, an unwavering faith in a foolproof tactic that would eventually lead to the desired outcome. Taqiyya is more than an attitude. It's a sectarian behavior that becomes second nature. It's a religion in itself and a practice at all levels, supported by unwavering faith. In El Risali, it is more important than the five pillars of Islam and takes precedence over everything else to keep its members constantly elusive. 
a political rather than religious approach, it is only assimilated by those who have the opportunity to practice it diligently. A true circulatory network of this international octopus, it reaches even the most obscure members who work in the shadows to pull the strings. The emblem of this network is the quote from Imam Ali, be among them without being one of them, so as not to be singled out and eliminated at the first opportunity. The origin of al taqiyya as taught by the network dates back to the creation of man. It was the first knowledge imparted to Adam after his creation in order to unmask Satan, an expert in this technique, by distinguishing him from the angels among whom he hid. God was aware of his vile intentions, but Satan's extreme skill in the practice of taqiyya prevented him from taking action against him due to a lack of clear evidence. That's why he created Adam and taught him this technique to reveal the falsehood of Satan's submission, to dissociate him from the other angels, and to justify his expulsion from heavenly paradise. This version is derived from the following Quranic verse, chapter 2, verse 30, when your Lord said to the angels, I am placing a viceroy, Khalifa, Caliph, on the earth, they said, will you place in it someone who will cause corruption in it and shed blood, while we declare your praises and sanctify you? He said, I know what you do not know. The network claims that the one who speaks in the name of the angels, named Iblis in Islamic tradition, is none other than Satan, who occupies the highest position in the hierarchy due to his apparent exemplary submission to the divine will. It is through his extreme mastery of al taqiyya that he succeeded in holding such a prestigious rank. The angels support him in his opposition to the divine will out of ignorance of his true intentions, he wants to be the sole representative of God on earth, and mankind may steal the spotlight from him. That's why God responds to them, I know what you do not know. The divine decision to create Adam aims to unmask Satan to distance him and replace him with man. So that the latter can thwart Satan's tricks, God first teaches him the art of taqiyya. If Adam eats the fruit of the tree of knowledge, it is with God's consent because he could not violate a divine order like Satan did. He defies the prohibition to touch the tree with divine permission to appear to have sinned and thus reveal to the angel Satan's bad faith and his scheming to lead him astray. It must be believed that Adam learned his lesson well since he passed on this knowledge to his descendants through the generations to the present day. According to the network, only the direct descendants of Muhammad and the children of Israel know this truth, the Jews use it in the service of Satan, while the Muslims use it in the service of God. In this secret complicity with God to confuse the tracks, Adam uses Eve, a symbol of weakness and ignorance, to strengthen his image as a sinner tempted by the devil. This is why the first rule of El Taqiyya is to use the weakness and ignorance of the other. Here, the other refers to El Ama, the simple-minded popular masses, one must blend into the crowd to go unnoticed. This mass has no choice, either it submits to the imams, or it is exploited by the enemy. Right from the start, this illustrates the modus operandi of Islamism, where the human being is of no importance compared to the intended objective. Another example of the application of taqiyya according to the network is the story of Joseph, where Jacob maneuvers with the complicity of his eldest son and Joseph to bring his people into Egypt. As a prophet, Jacob is a righteous man among the righteous, so his apparent favoritism towards Joseph is part of taqiyya, he deliberately favors him to make his other sons jealous. When they conspire to murder Joseph, the eldest suggests throwing him into an empty well, knowing that he will be picked up by the caravanners. We know the rest. The story of the Exodus is similar, Pharaoh, having refused to grant freedom to the Jewish people, his wife, who is of Jewish origin and has infiltrated the top of power, arranges with her sister, Moses' mother, to adopt the child and raise him as a future leader. Once he has become an adult, informants working for the Jews warn Pharaoh of the danger posed by this people, who have become too numerous and too wealthy. This initially prompts Pharaoh to oppress the Jews, and subsequently to accede to Moses' request to let them leave Egypt, something he had previously refused. So, thanks to Tekiya, Moses is spared and raised in the palace until the Jewish people, enriched but worn down by oppression, decide to leave Egypt for the promised land. 
These biblical episodes are studied at El Kaim School as examples to follow and as a lesson in the use of Al-Takiya by the Jews, by divine order at the time, but which continues to this day in the service of Satan to satisfy personal ambitions. According to our teachers, the same scenario is repeated by the Zionists to create the state of Israel, after the Jews' exodus to Europe, where they became rich and multiplied, Hitler is warned about the danger they represent so that he initiates their massacre, which encourages the survivors to flock to the state of Israel. According to the network, without the deliberate provocation of the Holocaust, the Jews would never have agreed to leave Europe. Following in the footsteps of his ancestors, Muhammad used Takiya to fulfill the mission he had undertaken. The gradual revelation of the Quran demonstrates its use through the principle of El Nasgul Mansauk, which involves abrogating one verse with another meant to erase the effect of the first. Abrogation is based on Takiya to deceive the enemy and lead them astray. Muhammad was not randomly supported by the people of Medina during his exodus, several branches of his followers were eagerly awaiting there, hiding behind the mask of Takiya. Similarly, the message of tolerance at the beginning of his prophethood was tactical, it only lasted long enough to strengthen before he could change his rhetoric. Later, after his death, the use of Takiya was adopted by his cousin Ali, who temporarily accepted the caliphate of Abu Bakr, one of Muhammad's disciples, for his own protection. In fact, it is necessary to re-examine the entire history of Islam in light of Takiya to truly understand its course and intentions. The Practice of al takiya Today It is reported from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq that he said, Dissimulation, al takiya is my religion and the religion of my ancestors. He also said, One who does not have dissimulation, al takiya has no religion. This is an example of how takiya is practiced. Many interpret this hadith as a call to positively consider the diversity of religions, but if this might be true among Muslims, it is by no means the case towards non-Muslims, meaning, at that time, the followers of the religion of Rome who absolutely had to fall under the control of Islam. The real question is what different Islamist tendencies, from the most barbaric to the most moderate, mean today by, Rome. al takiya reappeared in modern Islamism with the fall of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, with Jamal al din el Afghani, the father of political Islam to whom all Islamists refer, whether Shiite or Sunni. Faced with the weakness of the Muslim world and the emergence of the West as the new international force, the Islamist international community then takes a hit, but it does not lose sight of its objective, which is to implement divine will on earth. Islamists then believe that it is the slumber of Muslims that allowed the Jews to invade the West and turn it against them, destroying the Arab Muslim world, and allowing Satan's voice to prevail over that of Allah. According to their mode of reasoning, Muslims are being punished by God for straying from their basic objective. It is their fault if Satan's will has prevailed. Indeed, the average traditional Muslim assumes that nothing exists or can exist outside of divine will. It is God who orchestrates his life down to the smallest details, and he must submit to his order without questioning anything. It is God who guides him on the right path of Islam to save his soul from any deviation and admit it to his heavenly paradise. Therefore, there is no room for free will. The slightest catastrophe is interpreted as a divine sign. If it occurs in the enemy camp, it is a sign of support for Muslims, but if it falls on them, it is a sign of divine anger and a reminder to obey. To make up for lost time and return to the international stage as an unstoppable force, all means are fair. It is simply a matter of tactics, of takiya. This is the beginning of Islamist movements with a clear political connotation in order to regain control of power. The Arab world is targeted first, then the Muslim world in general, and finally the entire planet. Here are some examples of the modern application of takiya. This shows how difficult it is to collect evidence in this regard. On the other hand, if we continue to wait for evidence, we will have more than we can handle the day when speech will only be granted to the so-called representatives of Allah, but it will be too late. Moderate Islamism Some Shiite scholars, clerics, may appear as moderate as Ayatollah al-Sistani. His followers are accepted worldwide as representatives of a tolerant Islam. 
In this regard, all doors are open to them in Asia, the West, and Africa to create associations and recruit freely. However, it is forgotten that these adherents are Mughladin, mere followers, who simply advance on the path their spiritual leader indicates, and their leader holds unquestionable authority over them. In other words, as long as the master calls for peace, they are pacifists, but if he changes his tone and calls for violence, they will obey without hesitation. If he asks them to give their lives to God, they will turn into an army of uncontrollable and devastating suicide bombers. Moreover, in Shurism, which has a clergy and hierarchy similar to Christian churches, the death of an ayatollah leads to the emergence of his successor. It is enough for a pacifist leader to die and be replaced by a fanatic to reverse the situation and create a catastrophic one. What does Al-Sistani's approach consist of, apart from the fact that he is not currently calling for war against the West? His position can be compared to that of Orthodox Jews who refuse to recognize the state of Israel until the Messiah arrives. Among Shiites, a significant fraction believes that they should not act until the Mahdi returns to spread divine word across the entire planet. I leave it to your imagination what will happen the day an Ayatollah issues a fatwa announcing the return of the Mahdi and demanding that all Muslims worldwide follow his instructions. This time bomb can explode at any moment. We should also mention Sunni Islamist movements, such as the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt or those in Jordan, Kuwait, or North Africa, which advance in the name of democracy to reach power but, once obtained, transform it into a lifelong theocratic dictatorship spanning generations. State Islamism Countries considered Islamic, such as Saudi Arabia, Iran, or Sudan, or pro-Islamic countries like Syria or Lebanon, claim to respect international laws while providing support to Islamists on a global scale. At the forefront of this list are Saudi Arabia and, in general, the Gulf countries. They clandestinely encourage the actions of Islamists in three ways. 1. These states make no effort to help their respective populations break free from the orthodox religious influence. On the contrary, they ensure that their populations remain in ignorance. Political and media propaganda portrays Arab Muslim countries and the Islamic Ummah as victims of a Judeo-Christian conspiracy seeking to dominate them. Simply watching a few programs on Arab satellite channels reveals the negative sentiments that this interpretation of the current situation can provoke among the average citizens. This keeps the general population in this part of the world on high alert, especially given recent events in Palestine and Iraq. Jews and the West are presented as scapegoats in the streets, mosques, and even on the Internet. The result is unsurprising, there has never been such a resurgence of religiosity, more as a form of opposition to the enemies of Muslims than out of genuine conviction. Islamists have never recruited so effectively and found so much support among the middle class. 2. Arab Muslim territories serve as a platform for various logistical and financial operations of extremist and terrorist movements. While this may not involve state-level funding, governments often turn a blind eye to the financing networks operating within their borders. A clear complicity has unquestionably developed between certain Arab governments and Islamists, the latter can operate with impunity as long as they do not threaten the existing regime. I am thinking in particular of Syria, which serves as a transit point for safe passage to Iran or Lebanon. 3. Terrorist extremists are tolerated. The main concern is the foundation of their belief, regardless of their unacceptable methods, their implicit state of religious war against the Judeo-Christian alliance, and their assumption of the right to sow religious tyranny among their own and terrorize others. In other words, these various actors work to make Islam a formidable force against the Judeo-Christian camp. Once again, a qualitative minority instrumentalizes a quantitative majority. The Islamist International Through the attacks perpetrated worldwide It is not the number of victims that matters, but the medium and long-term repercussions. Muhammad proclaims, Islam has become powerful thanks to its strong capacity to terrorize the enemy. Indeed, the primary goal of these attacks is to sow terror within the adversary's camp, 
creating a neurosis and destabilizing them with minimal effort. The strikes are sporadic and do not follow a particular logic to remain elusive. The aim of these attacks is nothing other than a reminder to the enemies of God that jihad is always present on the international stage. The international Islamist terrorism aims for the maximum by exerting the minimum. It adopts two parallel strategies in the East and in the West. By practicing terrorism in the West, Islamists provoke the populations against their governments due to the lack of security and local policies. The immediate result is the negative and weakened image that even powerful states display, losing their credibility day by day in the eyes of their citizens. This policy of terror allows so-called moderate movements to be better accepted within host societies. I know of no worse case than France, which legitimizes the actions of Islamists by creating a French Islam under state patronage to represent the Arab Muslim community, which neither identifies with nor endorses this CFCM. It is, if I may say, thanks to the attacks that France began to take an interest in this community to better regulate it through the attempt to create a French Islam. In the case of Arab Muslim countries affected by barbarism, extremist terrorism targets the economy, especially tourism, and foreign investments due to the climate of insecurity it instills. There, too, at the government level, there is a return to Islamic practices to block the path for extremists, indirectly responding to their demands. It's a way of saying to them, we retain power, but what you want to do, we will do it in your place. Thus, instead of helping populations free themselves from religious influence, the existing states keep them there, as long as they do not lose power. Instead of moving towards modernity by further separating religion and state, they multiply speeches, in the name of God, and official representations during religious holidays, and they reinforce the masses in their ignorance. Disinformation circulates at all levels to achieve the impossible. Thus, it is not necessarily the actual instigators of the attacks who claim responsibility. This is a way to confuse the trail and further disorient the enemy, both in the East and in the West. The international network calls upon foreign forces when needed. The most glaring example is the attack on Iraq by the Americans. Everyone knows that the Islamists had a sworn enemy in Saddam Hussein, who knew all their machinations and represented a significant obstacle to their access to power in Iraq. Alone, they would never have succeeded in overthrowing this dictator. The September 11th attack provided the ideal opportunity to involve the Iraqis and provoke a war aimed at toppling Saddam Hussein with the help of the Americans, who continue to err out of ignorance. Saddam's fall represented a gain in time and an unprecedented victory for the Islamists. A counteroffensive from within. Therefore, we should not underestimate the capabilities of Orthodox Islam. One only needs to look back in history to see what it has achieved in a short time thanks to Takiya. As seen, it indirectly benefits from moderate and state-sponsored Islamism, and all these branches of the same tree consciously or unconsciously work towards global domination. What solutions do we have to thwart its plans? Once we realize that the ultimate goal of Islamism is to dominate humanity in the name of a single mass ideology, several alternatives remain. First and foremost, we are in the realm of science fiction. This oversized goal cannot be achieved in a sustainable way, the most colossal powers all eventually crumble, as the need for autonomy and diversity is ingrained in the souls of nations. However, it can develop considerable nuisances. The counter-objective should, therefore, aim to limit these nuisances. Muhammad, who knew the weaknesses of his religion, said himself, I do not fear for you the external enemy, but I greatly fear the one from within. This hadith reveals the way in which Islamism can be attacked, by bombarding Arab Muslim countries from the outside, it only strengthens it. Consequently, the change must come from within. Since Islamism is based on five major networks, military, cultural, political, social, and economic, mobilization must occur in these five areas to block these networks sooner or later. The fight will bear fruit as long as many physical, moral, and state actors as possible participate, each according to their means.
several key ideas can already be proposed, which seem common sense among others, to outline an action plan. 1. Military Domain First, eliminate external factors that fuel hatred within Arab Muslim countries. Concerning the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, quickly create a Palestinian state alongside the Israeli state. We must remove this significant argument that Islamists use to stir up the masses and gain sympathies. Initially, we should stick to the borders recognized in 1967, with the status of Jerusalem being re-evaluated and resolved in the medium term. Stop American interference, which seems boundless in its selfishness and misunderstanding of the Arab and Muslim world. Thinking only of their immediate interest, they continue to support the Wahhabi regime in Saudi Arabia after having fomented the Al-Qaeda movement there, which turned against them before spreading globally. They are now opening a new gulag in Iraq, all in the name of fighting the axis of evil. After Iran, we will witness the creation of a new Afghanistan, and a few years later, we will see Islamist terrorists from Iraq springing up all over the world, as was the case with Arab-Afghan terrorists. The damage is done, now we must limit the harm. For this, Americans and their allies must withdraw from Iraq and let the country rebuild itself from within under the control of the United Nations. Strengthen international cooperation in the fight against terrorism. Under the leadership of the United Nations, establish an international counterterrorism unit composed of specialists and endowed with unlimited resources to safeguard the planet from this threat that concerns us all. This unit will have two structures, one for information collection on behalf of an independent intelligence service, with the aim of infiltrating, observing, and monitoring the different movements and their mobilization methods to create new networks. The other is a rapid response unit under the control of the United Nations, ready to intervene to neutralize terrorists worldwide with the collaboration of local intervention services. 2. Political Domain Free-thinking individuals from the Arab Muslim world possess the means to eradicate evil in the long term. We thirst for freedom of expression, but the most urgent need is not to establish democracy, which we unfortunately are still far from. Today, this would lead in the short term to Islamist dictatorships from which we would have even more difficulty extricating ourselves. Islamist dictatorship risks further stifling the masses to secure power. To avoid falling into such excesses, several measures are necessary, prohibit the creation of any political movement with a religious connotation. Even those that present themselves in the most moderate guise should not be allowed to stand in free elections. Only secular parties that respect the right to difference will be admitted representing a nation with a secular constitution that speaks on behalf of its people and their needs, not in the name of a religion and its dictates. Close down print or broadcast media outlets that propagate Islamist and pro-Islamist propaganda and enact laws to prevent indoctrination campaigns from reaching populations unable to distinguish fact from fiction. Stop sparing religious sensitivities at the expense of freedom of expression and conscience. Every time an atheist raises their voice, the sentence of apostasy falls, followed by a death sentence, without anyone daring to oppose it. The actions of free thinkers in this part of the world must be protected from any abusive censorship. Ex-Muslims should be able to express themselves safely, just like religious individuals, without being labeled as Islamophobes, traitors, or infidels because they dare to think for themselves without reference to a deity. Eliminate laws that interfere with citizens' private lives. Freedom of morals encourages people to adopt responsible behavior instead of living under guardianship like perpetual minors without judgment. Be wary of Islamist and pro-Islamist countries that profess openness and tolerance without meaning a word of it. Put pressure on such regimes to encourage them to respect and consider all components of their society. Isolate them if necessary. Marginalize religious leaders and officials who call for proselytism to strip the gullible of their identity. Solicitation, which is prohibited for cults in public places, should also be prohibited for religious adherents. 3. Cultural Domain 
The elite must work towards a cultural revolution that respects the sacred right of peoples to self-determination in the face of intellectual and religious enslavement that keeps them under tutelage. To achieve this, several points must be implemented, launch campaigns against obscurantism that will be broadcast unanimously across all media to raise awareness of the threat that this scourge still poses in the 21st century. Give voice in the media to secularists, free thinkers, atheists, whether they are scientists, historians, writers, artists, or any open and tolerant individuals, so that public opinion becomes aware of the lamentable narrow-mindedness to which it has been confined until now. Revise national educational programs to bring them in line with the requirements of our time. Allow and encourage the publication of works discussing the foundations of Islam, whether in Arabic or other languages. Finance the creation of secular television and radio channels, as well as press outlets, to awaken populations from their ancestral lethargy and free them from Islamist influence. 4. Social Domain It is essential to differentiate between a terrorist and an Islamist. The former is a criminal against humanity, whether active or not, they must be struck without hesitation wherever they are found. As for the latter, we will do them a service by keeping them under surveillance so that they do not join the ranks of the former. It is also important to distinguish between a Muslim and an Islamist, to avoid falling into a confusion that feeds the rise of religious extremism. The systematic apprehension of any woman wearing a veil and any man growing a beard fosters rejection and misunderstanding. All conspicuous religious signs should be banned in schools and government offices but in public spaces, everyone should be free in their attire as long as it is decent. In the West, people are stopped in the street because they have a beard and fit a certain profile. While I personally remain understanding in such situations, others have a hard time accepting it and become easy prey for Islamist recruiters. Law enforcement must be made aware of this danger so that they can cooperate as much as possible. The fight is against an archaic ideology not against individuals. It is not about replacing one form of intellectual terrorism with another but about defending the right to difference and freedom of conscience in every sense of the term. The majority, which has remained silent until now, must be able to show solidarity inside and outside of Arab Muslim countries to confront the fascist terrorist minority that only recognizes itself. Instead of publicizing the horrors committed by Islamists, which only gives them more publicity, we should support those who call for peace among people, far from religious influence. Extend a hand to those who have fallen into the traps of Islamists. Encourage them to desert the enemy's camp, to denounce it, and to partly make amends for their misguided actions due to their youth and ignorance of the harmful consequences of their commitment to humanity. Encourage them to testify to bypass evil instead of refusing their rehabilitation and labeling them shamefully for eternity. Protect children from parental dictates so they can freely seek their path. Paternal religion must cease to be imposed. Everyone should be able to choose their religion, change it, or have none without risking their reputation or life, whether they are girls or boys. Encourage the creation of non-governmental organizations to fill the gaps left by the state in defending human and citizen rights. 5. Economic Domain In this domain, the urgency, in my opinion, is to limit the self-financing of the extremist faction by creating control and management organizations for charitable donations. Islamists have no shortage of sources of funding, between the financial support of Arab Muslim states, the religious obligation of zakat, charity, comms, religious wealth tax, and the donations of a wealthy business class looking to absolve itself of sins. This system leads to the proliferation of mosque constructions worldwide under the pretext of promoting Arab Muslim culture and identity, while advocates for the separation of religion and state receive only lukewarm encouragement. We must reverse this trend and provide them with the means to match their responsibilities. Money should be redistributed to new secular organizations in need of guidance and support. An international monetary fund should also be established under the auspices of the United Nations to involve states in funding projects that contribute to the eradication of Islamism. al taqiyya is both a philosophy and a strategy applied. Fully exploring the topic is difficult 
which is why I limit myself to relatively simple examples, whether occasional or permanent. I do not wish to plunge the reader into unnecessary paranoia but rather want them to become aware of the situation. I readily acknowledge that the East does not function like the West, when the West demands evidence in the name of rationalism, the East dispenses with it in the name of intuition. When the West accuses the East of obscurantism, the East accuses the West of being naive, hovering over the surface of things without discerning their complexity. One is too distant, and the other too close to effectively assess the Islamist threat and understand its mode of operation to counter it. However, it should be known that Islamists do not disdain learning the Western mode of reasoning while retaining their own, which puts them ahead in this regard, underestimation only goes in one direction, making the situation critical. Indeed, education does not necessarily reside in the number of diplomas. In the West, there is a crucial lack of knowledge of neighboring cultures. This lack of information constitutes the ideal ingredient for fueling fanaticism and obscurantism in third world countries, but it also applies to the West. Even at the highest levels of government, notorious Islamists are sometimes granted political refugee status on the pretext that they are victims of the dictatorships in their home countries. Whether we are born Muslims or not, we want our children to be born free and to live in peace. So, whether the Islamist attitude is logical or not, the essential thing is to admit that thousands adhere to it without a shadow of a doubt. Even if it is pure fiction, we must face it concretely. The struggle must apply to all the domains mentioned. The primary weapon is to dispel ignorance and raise awareness in society of the threat posed by the rise of Islamist fundamentalism. To confront it, we must deprive it of its two major assets the unawareness of the vast majority and that of the international order, which only takes into account the concrete aspect of things. The solution is in the hands of free minds. All actors, whether individual or collective, must work simultaneously and on an international scale to eradicate this destructive scourge of the rights of peoples and individuals. Otherwise, we inevitably become part of the ingredients of this rise of obscurantism nurtured by human folly. Sulla Karkar's Approach in Tunis In early April 1985, Abu Ahmed informed me of my upcoming departure to Tunisia because the revolution against the government of Bourguiba was about to be launched. I felt some reluctance to participate in this operation, having regained some of my past doubts while in Paris. Truth be told, I harbored no hatred towards the Tunisian president. On the contrary, I considered his political track record favorable, even though I deplored his anti-democratic stances. However, I didn't share these thoughts with my friend. Once on the ground, I would assess the situation. I've always been extremely carefree, and while it sometimes caused me trouble, it also saved me on many occasions. I faced danger in the gravity of my actions with insouciance, walking through life like a tightrope walker who had forgotten he was on a wire. This often led me to unexpected places and helped me avoid numerous pitfalls, often without even realizing it. Abu Ahmed gave me his instructions, the top priority of your mission is to establish contact between the network and your brother-in-law. Be cautious, as he will likely be suspicious. We don't know exactly what he's up to. Upon your arrival, you will wait to be contacted by the Tunisian leader and hand over a certain number of documents to him. It's crucial that no one knows about your trip, this is very important. Your stay will last 10 days. Here's how you will proceed, first, keep an eye on Sulla Karkar and try to gather as much information as possible about his activities. When you talk to him about your religious experience in Iran, carefully analyze his reactions and note the questions he asks. Act like a skilled tactician. Then, through your sister, request a private meeting with him. If he refuses, do not insist. We will decide accordingly. If he agrees, set the meeting three days before your return to Paris. Why? I interrupted. It's a matter of security. That's exactly what I was coming to. It's imperative that you be alone with your brother-in-law. Turn on the radio to interfere with potential listening devices. 
Don't forget that the National Gendarmerie Station is just a stone's throw from your place. When all this is verified and trust is well established, ask him the following question. Do you want to meet Mohammed Fauzi, the leader of the Islamist movement in Iran? He is ready to collaborate with you to overthrow Bourguiba and create a revolutionary Islamic state. If he accepts, inform us immediately. On the eve of your departure, one of our agents will provide you with a report on the network's activities in the country and a list of the needs necessary for the continuation of the revolution. Tell this man to select 10 Tunisian Shiites and send them to Iran. We bid each other farewell solemnly. Everything was about to accelerate. This did not prevent Abu Ahmed from giving me a dark look before leaving, expressing some lingering resentment. He had still not forgiven my lack of enthusiasm during the oath. The idea of returning to my homeland filled me with excitement. This time, I was traveling with my real passport. No need to deceive. On May 2, 1985, I flew to my native land. As I stepped off the plane, the sense of Tunis stirred my blood. Happy and slightly dazed, I spent a few moments at the airport cafeteria, watching the crowd. I particularly enjoy these places where thousands of travelers cross paths every day. Half an hour later, I got into a taxi that took me home. Is that you, my son? My father exclaimed as he opened the door. But why didn't you let me know about your arrival? I wanted to surprise you, Dad. Well, you succeeded. Come here and let me hug you. Despite the little affection I felt for my father, I gave in to the pleasure of our reunion, unable, however, to completely dispel a certain distance. It was stronger than me, I couldn't forget his paternal cruelty from the past. I was struck by the state of neglect in which the Ariana house found itself. Just like my father, whose face bore the marks of time, the villa had aged considerably. The hedges grew crooked, the trees were thirsty, a layer of dried moss covered the veranda's tiles, objects were scattered everywhere, paint peeled off the walls, and the gate was falling apart. Clearly, since my mother's departure, nothing had functioned normally. All of this saddened me. I was delighted to return to the land of my childhood, but it reflected a gloomy image back at me. What kind of miserable life had my family led in recent years? When Samira spotted me, she rushed across the garden. The closer she got, the more I was moved by the changes evident in her body. There was something fundamentally neglected in her appearance. Her hairstyle was a mess, her clothes poorly patched, dark circles marred her face, and her skin seemed dehydrated. The weight of religious obligations that denied the expression of the body had transformed her into a poor woman. What a waste! Now the mother of three children, subjected to the abhorrent Islamist laws, she continued to descend into a confined hell of renunciations and unspoken remorse. Behind her, her husband moved forward with slow steps, looking up. He was still the same, with his round face, receding hairline, short stature, short legs, massive thighs, protruding belly, and a dark gaze. Dark with hatred, dark with power. At first glance, he seemed to be doing very well. His time in prison had evidently been kind to him. Some seeds withstand the wear and tear of time and deprivation better than others. Sulla Carker was taking his time, probably wanting to show that he wasn't easily moved. Rivalry, after all, had resumed in this setting that resembled the end of an era. How happy I am! said Samira. What joy to see you again! I exclaimed. Assalamu alaikum, Karim, said Sulla Karkar. So, you must have plenty to tell. I needed to keep my distance. Following the lessons instilled in me, I didn't respond immediately, as if I were wary of him. Well, continued Sulla Karkar, a bit disconcerted, have you lost your tongue? Let me enjoy some time with my big sister. I retorted. Let's cool off a bit, my father said cheerfully. The next day, I confided in my sister. Do you remember when you used to cradle me in your arms? 
I said to her. Oh yes. That seems so long ago. Now, it's my turn to comfort you, Samira. How so? By talking to you about God. God? Ah. You know I'm in a tough school with Sulla. Has your religion made you a happy person? Happiness, you must wait to get to heaven to know it. I've learned many things in Iran, and I'd like to share them with you. Do you take me for an ignoramus? Samira snapped. One never stops learning, my dear sister. That's obvious. Do you know about Shiite doctrine? Yes, I've heard of it, but not much more. For the Shiites, faith is freedom. The freedom to love God not only based on the scriptures but above all by listening to the voice of your heart. The nuance is significant. Someone who forgot to look at themselves before turning to God wouldn't truly be a believer. Is that what Shurism is about? She said, incredulous. I could talk to you about it for hours, and still, I would only distort Shiite thought because God cannot be explained, He is. All paths lead to Him as long as you live in respect for others and your own will. All of this seems quite confusing, Karim. But just look at yourself. Your eyes seem so sad for a woman of your quality. Your dark clothes reflect a soul dried up by a religious practice that is far too removed from human realities. Samira lowered her head. Deep down, my words must have been shaking her. But her husband's intense pressure prevented her from existing as she had dreamed when she was a child. Admitting her failure would have been unbearable, as it would have meant suddenly acknowledging the madness of her years of emotional distress. A terrible shock. What exactly did you do in Iran? Tell me about it, she inquired to hide her embarrassment. I saw a people marching towards a just and better world. You see, over there, women are active, working alongside men on an equal footing. People are happy, all children go to school. Solidarity is in full swing. The poor are less poor, and the rich know how to share. I spoke to her at length about the El Kame school, Iran, my fellow revolutionaries, extolling the virtues of Shiite doctrine. I didn't really believe everything I was saying, but I needed to impress her, provoke her, touch her unconscious so that she would change, and also to make her my ally. Not far away, Sulla Karkar was reading the newspaper. Occasionally, I raised my voice slightly so that he could hear some remarks that might pique his curiosity. Samira, would you do me a favor? With pleasure, little brother. Tell your husband that I would like to speak to him privately. Very well, I'll arrange that for you. Thanks to my sister's intervention, the private meeting between Sulla Karkar and me was able to take place two days later, on May 5, 1985. On that day, the Ariana house was empty. My father was in Tunis, probably with a few playmates. So, we settled in the kitchen. Before sitting down, I took care to turn on the radio to discourage any prying ears. What are you doing? We can't hear each other, protested Sulla Karkar. A bit of music, it'll relax us, I replied with a conspiratorial smile. If you insist. So, what do you have to tell me? In the end, we don't know each other well. All the better. I love discoveries. So, how is the revolution progressing around here? Sulla Karkar frowned. My sister had given him her report. In fact, he was wary of the young wolf of Iranian surism that I appeared to be in his eyes. Hadn't I been corrupted by Western powers? Wasn't my entire history in Iran just a pretext to approach and trap him? The revolution is moving forward, he replied. It's the people who will decide when it's time for its culmination. The people. You know very well that they're nothing without the power of leaders. You're mistaken, the people have a soul. Leaders are only there to show the way. Then, they must step aside. Oh yes. I said knowingly. It's Marxism applied to Islamism. 
Well done. God and his people in power, the disappearance of the elite, the abolition of classes. In a way, yes. But tell me, you're quite cultured now. Reading has never harmed anyone, I retorted. You still need to understand what the books say. I approached my brother-in-law as if I were about to entrust him with a matter of the utmost importance. Wasn't it you who told me a few years ago, one day, you'll become a soldier of Allah? Well, here I am, well armed now to fight the impious. But that's another story. Between us, who would know better how to lead the country than those who have learned to love it and who understand the course of history? I don't see where you're going with this, Sulla Carker said, leaning back in his chair. I don't believe that the people are capable of governing Tunisia on their own. Let's not kid ourselves, the country needs people of your caliber. You must fulfill the mission that God has seen fit to give you. Do you think I waited for you to act in this direction? Sulla Carker exclaimed proudly. I don't believe that the people are capable of governing Tunisia on their own. Would you be willing to meet Mohammed Fauzi? Mohammed Fauzi. He's an Islamist leader responsible for the Greater Maghreb. He's very powerful. He would like to talk to you. The fish took the bait even faster than I had imagined. Sulla Karkar was already in a state of furious agitation, he could see himself in the spotlight, rallying the crowds with frenetic speeches. I immediately called my superior to inform him of the good news. The meeting between Sulla Karkar and Mohammed Fauzi took place the very next day at the Ariana House. But just as negotiations were about to begin, Mohammed Fauzi whispered in my ear that my presence was not welcome. My pride took a serious blow. I strolled in the garden for the duration of the meeting, my nerves in tatters. On May 10, 1985, at the end of my stay, I was contacted as planned by one of the local leaders of the network. We arranged to meet in Tunis at Le Diplomate Café, a modern hotel located in the city center. I'm really happy to meet you, the Tunisian Rissalist began. In his thirties, dressed in the fashion of young people at the time, a light beard, a sign of his Shiite affiliation, the man didn't seem to be in his element. He pressed his lips together in a nervous grimace. It's like I'm your messiah. I said with a broad smile. This is no time for jokes. I have serious problems. We all do, I said, surprised by this unexpected panic. Isn't the continuation of the revolution in Tunisia one of the network's top priorities? That's correct. I've sent several messages to Tehran. I still haven't received a response. I'm desperately short of resources. What do you need specifically? Money, of course. Like everyone else. Why do you want additional funds? Because the number of Shiite recruits keeps increasing. It's a real success. I've done my job well, you see. And I'm alone in training our future soldiers. Without money, how do you expect to retain the young people who have given their lives to the network? I need new premises, more equipment, and above all, trainers. I see. Where are the new recruits coming from? Shurism is gaining a lot of traction among the intellectual and affluent classes, as well as in the working class communities. There's no middle ground. In the hinterlands, we are also very influential. Many people are willing to take up arms to defend our cause. That's why the network needs to send me money, and quickly. I must admit, I don't understand the slowness of their response. I don't either, I admit it. The Rissalist pulled at my shirt sleeve. Make a move. Did he think I was the El Rasali banker? Had Abu Ahmed introduced me as a high-ranking official? Listen, I'll take care of resolving your problem, I promise you that. In exchange, you can select the ten best individuals from your ranks. Send them to Tehran for ideological and military training. Training future Tunisian revolutionaries in Iranian camps is one less worry for you. And besides, it's essential that we can test them, know their resilience. 
The revolution is in motion, things will soon accelerate. Deal. Declared his interlocutor, now reassured. He handed me a detailed dossier of his activities and needs. The matter had been swiftly handled. I flew back to Paris with my head held high, like a glorious warrior whose destiny was now intertwined with the thoughts of the Lord. Agent Recruiter Mission in Paris Upon my return to the French capital on May 12, 1985, I didn't change my routine. In the mornings, I attended classes at the school, mathematics, physics, etc. All in Arabic. In the afternoons, I worked for the network. I also obtained a temporary residence permit valid for three months. At the end of the week, I visited Abu Ahmed, curious about the developments. How did the meeting between Sulla Karkar and Fauzi go? I inquired. Perfectly. Sulla Karkar firmly believes in the success of the Iranian revolution. He sees no objection to collaborating with a Shiite Islamist movement. He has shown remarkable flexibility on this point. For him, the future leaders of Tunisia must base their politics on the fight against the West, with Islam at the forefront. Fauzi claims that Sulla Karkar is the right man for the job. There are many people in this world. I grumbled. I agree. But for now, we are obliged to follow orders. Fauzi and Sulla Karkar have begun to devise the two-year coup plan, from 1986 to 1988. Borguiba will be outwitted. Borguiba may be a rat, as you say, but he's also a respectable man, I continued. Have you lost your mind? Borguiba is a puppet, an agent of the Western enemy. All right, all right. But does the religious revolution require systematic use of force? Isn't there another path, one that would make Islam a true place of encounter and exchange? Are you aware of the absurdity of your words? It's impossible to negotiate with anyone because the Islam we understand is not recognized by Borguiba or the Western countries. But keep your head up, open your eyes a little. Be careful what you say, my friend. Is that a threat? Idiot. You know you're my friend. Just moderate your language, as some walls have ears. Be patient, things will get better. I hope so. Now, the most important thing, our superiors are asking you to go to Brussels as soon as possible to meet with the key leaders and discuss the details of our attack plan. Your stay should not exceed three days. Very well, I concluded soberly, flattered to my core. The day after next, I flew to the Belgian capital, where I mainly met with Mohamed Fauzi's brother, whom I had already met at El Kaim school. His pseudonym was Abu Waji. Together, we developed a plan with the following main points. For one month, I would guide Abu Waji and introduce him into the Islamic milieu in Tunisia, without being his hierarchical superior. Once in Tunisia, Sulla Karkar would be responsible for selecting about 20 Islamists from his network who would be invited to receive a six-month religious, political, and military training in Iran. They wouldn't be able to return to Tunis before this period. I would be responsible for these future young terrorists, whose character and combat aptitude Abu Waji would study. My excitement grew day by day. Although I remained divided on the relevance of the objective set by the Rasali leaders, my ascent in the hierarchy, at least as I perceived it, continued to dazzle me. When I returned to Paris, I hurried to Abu Ahmed's place. I have excellent news to share with you, my friend announced immediately. The bosses have agreed to your plan. Well, it seems I've moved up the ranks. I exclaimed, enthusiastic. However, Abu Ahmed's face turned gray. He remained silent for a few moments. I'm not sure we're on the right track, he finally said reluctantly. This coup against Borguiba seems premature to me. Now you're having doubts too, you, the most ardent supporter of the Rasali cause. To be honest, I don't trust the MTI. This sudden mistrust betrayed a much deeper pain. Clearly, my friend was not feeling his usual self. 
I assumed he was hurt that the leaders had sidelined him from the process. Trust me, I said reassuringly. I'm your friend, and I know my brother-in-law well. It's all good. Certainly, Sulla Carker is one of its main activists, but who knows what lies behind this nebula. Do you know, perhaps? Abu Ahmed angrily retorted. The conversation ended in confusion. In the days that followed, I inherited a bank account on which the network had deposited the sum of 2,000 US dollars, an international credit card, and travelers' checks amounting to 1,000 US dollars. This account was opened at the Credit Lyonnais branch near Avenue de Vagram. My mission was to receive the Islamist candidates sent by Sulla Karkar, interrogate them, and verify their sincerity. As a recruiter, I would finally put into practice what I had learned from my mentors in Iran, namely, to test the personalities and verify the motivations of the future Rasali soldiers. I took a certain pride in this role. This initial group proved, in any case, that Sulla Karkar was keeping his commitments with Fauzi, namely, respecting parity between Sunnis and Shiites. I first welcomed a couple, Sami and Samia Ayed. The young woman claimed her affiliation with the Shiite doctrine, just like her husband, Shiites accept women in armed cells. Their goal was to acquire a solid religious and military education to serve the revolution at all levels. They claimed it was the dream of their lives. Sami had studied in Paris before being expelled from the country, suspected of involvement in a train bombing near Marseille. He claimed not to be connected to the incident, but he knew the perpetrators, whose network had been dismantled by the police. Since his arrival in Tunis, he had been actively involved in the MTI. After subtly questioning them, I prepared a report that I sent to the Cultural Center in Brussels to Abu Ali, one of the local leaders. In my opinion, Samia's revolutionary passion was genuine. She had a strong personality and spoke enthusiastically, but this fiery energy could push her to act too hastily and make mistakes. Furthermore, while she showed a form of independence, she couldn't bear the idea of living apart from her husband, which was paradoxical. In summary, she could prove to be a loyal revolutionary due to her strong and rigid nature, but also a fierce opponent if she felt deceived. As for Sammy, her husband, he expressed himself lightly and presented his ideas in a simple and incoherent manner. However, his courage and hatred for the West were remarkable. He welcomed risk and was the kind of person to accept the most perilous missions without seeking revenge if there was a disagreement. A man of action with a big heart, he would discreetly withdraw if needed. Shortly after that, I received two new recruits in Paris, Abd Eltif El Tlilai and Mungi El Fatnasi, who were devoted supporters of Sulla Karkar. Here again, as the guardian of strict Islamic principles, I had to test their convictions and commitment to the revolution. When I informed Abu Ali of their arrival, he instructed me to implement the desperation plan for three or four days. When the two soldiers approached me, I appeared sorry. I apologize, but I don't have the money necessary for your accommodation. I already live in a small room that I share with another companion. I'm in a hurry, I have to leave. Call me tomorrow morning. Not having anticipated such a reception, the two young men had to spend the night under the open sky. The next day, they contacted me as agreed. From postponed meetings to abruptly disconnected phone lines, I made them wait the whole day. In the evening, I finally joined the two budding revolutionaries. Their condition was pitiful. Hungry, with dark-circled eyes, they trembled with frustration and despair. I judged them unfit for combat but, remembering the similar treatment I had endured in Tehran, I sympathized with their pain and composed a glowing report. At Abu Ali's request, I accompanied them to Spain, to the cultural center in Madrid, where the responsible person would take charge of them to obfuscate their trail. From there, they would be sent to Syria, a friendly country to the Rasalis, before eventually reaching Iran. A few days later, I took care of two other Islamists, Abdullah and Ibrahim. This time, 
they were mature men in their thirties who belonged to the Tunisian Islamic Front movement. Possessing significant financial resources, they wanted to ensure the seriousness of the operation planned against Bourguiba's government before investing funds in the terrorist network. Sulla Karker had invited them to meet me in Paris so that I could provide them with the desired information. After a detailed presentation of the situation, I led them to Spain. Since airports were under police surveillance, we traveled by train. I had reserved all the seats in the compartment to prevent the intrusion of strangers and had drawn the curtain over the door. The landscape passed by the window like scenes from a silent movie. During the journey, I continued to gauge their revolutionary zeal. How do you envision the future Islamic State in Tunisia? I asked. I hope for a strong government entirely focused on the people, Ibrahim replied. Yes, but on what religious basis? Sunni Islam is the only possible path. In the meantime, Abdullah, the other Tunisian Islamist, examined us with clenched jaws and an exasperated look. He seemed to suffer from having to wait for many more months before taking up arms. He remained still, but the swaying of the train made his head move with the regularity of a clock's pendulum, like that of a prehistoric insect ready to deliver its deadly poison to the enemy. What do you think of Shurism? I continued. I have no attraction to that doctrine. The diversity of beliefs doesn't matter, I replied. What's important is to carry the revolution to its conclusion beyond our differences. I was obviously using the method advocated by Mohammed al-Sharazi, the leader of the network's apparent entity, resorting to deception rather than risking division among the troops. Ironically, I had despised the treacherous rhetoric of the great Risali leader, but now I adopted it without the slightest hesitation. The country has been drifting for too many years, Ibrahim continued. It's important to restore order, to instill in the people the values of Islam. How does the network plan to help us with that? First and foremost, through training. If you accept, your men will receive military and political education in Tehran. Believe me, the network is powerful and has excellent instructors, solid experience, and significant arms reserves. All right. But on the ground, I mean in Tunisia, for the coup and afterward, what support will the network provide? I couldn't tell you the details, this is currently being discussed between Sulla Karkar and the Rasali leaders. However, I can tell you this, in the preparatory phase, the network will provide its soldiers. After the coup, its economists will come to assist you in establishing the new regime. Will we have guarantees about the withdrawal of Rasali forces once the operations are over? To know that, you should address your chief, Sulla Karkar. But the country will remain in the hands of Tunisian revolutionaries. The network never appears on the front stage. It prefers to work in the shadows for security reasons. I think you've understood the essence of my question, Ibrahim insisted. Abdullah and I, as well as a few others, are going to contribute significant funds to this revolution. It would be regrettable if we lost our investment. The Risalis will also contribute from their own pockets. In this regard, they rely on the MTI's rigor to successfully carry out this coup. This response silenced Ibrahim's suspicions. Abdullah, who had been silent until then, leaned forward and shook my hand enthusiastically. Let those who love the Lord know their moment of glory. Upon arriving in Madrid, I introduced them to the local leader, said El Mausab. Following negotiations, agreements were reached, in exchange for financial support, El Risali agreed to train the supporters of the two Islamist businessmen while allowing them the freedom to practice Sunni Islam. It was within this framework that I later examined the candidacy of Mohammed El Harith. I strongly disliked this individual, I found him narrow-minded, ultra-fanatic, reactionary, refusing to listen to anyone's ideas. However, as Sulla Karkar reminded me of the terms of recent agreements, I was compelled to direct him toward Syria. Tour for the Preparation of the Coup in Tunisia In May 1986, Abu Ahmed suddenly reappeared to inform me that my role as an intermediary was temporarily postponed. 
I had to quickly go to Tehran to welcome the Tunisian elements and provide on-site training. I wasn't pleased with this new assignment, and I immediately expressed my discontent. I hope you haven't forgotten that I should be free to choose my missions. I protested. No, but there are certain imperatives that cannot be avoided. You can't indefinitely be both inside and outside the network. My friend exploded, clearly tired of my constant reservations. I have not failed in my duty. The leaders have no reason to complain about my actions. After an animated exchange in which I didn't yield an inch, Abu Ahmed referred the matter to our superiors, who accepted my demands. However, in return, I had to first go to Tunisia with Abu Waji, Mohammed Fauzi's brother, to introduce him to the local Islamists on a reconnaissance mission. I needed to find a way to leave the Libyan school without arousing suspicion, so I decided to adopt an Iraqi stance by openly insulting the Iranian government and its people. As Palestinian and Egyptian students began to support my viewpoint, it worried the school director, who eventually expelled me. My maneuver had worked splendidly. A few days before my departure, a student's father approached me. Would you like to join an Iraqi school? He asked. I won't say no, but for now, I need to return to Tunisia. My father is very ill. Could we discuss it again in early September? Of course. I am officially a journalist and a political refugee, but in reality, I belong to the Iraqi Baath Party. Would you be willing to join us? With pleasure, I replied. That's how I attended secret meetings of the Baath Party in Paris, taking on the role of a double agent as established by El Afghani. One of the Iraqi supporters even entrusted me with documents intended for a Tunisian correspondent, documents sealed in an envelope, the contents of which I didn't know. For security reasons, I immediately informed my superiors, if I were to be arrested by Bourguiba's police, it was better to appear as a Baath Party member than an Islamist. I must admit that I was secretly thrilled. Organizer, recruiter, emissary, double agent, I wore many hats. Upon arriving at the Ariana house, I introduced my Saudi friend, Abu Waji, as visiting the country for some business affairs. This allowed him and Sulla Karkar to work in peace on the future coup against the Bourguiba government. The house saw a parade of the region's top terrorists, military personnel like said El Firjani, as well as businessmen and unknown individuals whose identities weren't disclosed to me. As agreed upon in the Brussels Accords a few months earlier, I took on the task of introducing Abu Waji into the Tunisian Islamist milieu. For a month, we met numerous religious revolutionaries, both in the most remote villages of the country and in Tunis. This journey was akin to a political campaign conducted at breakneck speed, analyzing the troops' morale, explaining the rationale behind Islamizing the country, encouraging, unifying, distributing roles, resolving disputes, training spies, making pacts, establishing connections, disseminating propaganda materials, preparing for future demonstrations against the current regime, organizing the war machine down to the smallest details. Abu Waji and I returned to Paris armed with numerous reports assessing the needs for Shiite forces in Tunisia. We scheduled a meeting in Syria as per the agreements concluded in Brussels. Return to El Came School When I landed in Damascus, I was hosted for a week by a former student of El Came School while we obtained visas for Iran. The crossing of the Syrian border presented no difficulties, neither for me nor for my friend. In June 1986, I found myself back within the walls of El Came School. I immediately noticed that new nationalities were among the students. North Africa was now strongly represented. For the rest, nothing had changed, the atmosphere of tension, simmering war, and suspicion remained just as heavy. Upon my arrival, El Sheikh Ahmed, known as The Liar, outlined my new mission, to train the Tunisian elements sent by Sulla Karkar, gently steering them towards the Shiite doctrine, disregarding the agreements made with Sulla Karkar. At this point, my doubts grew, and I reiterated my wish to return to the French capital within the next four to six months. 
El Sheikh Ahmed assured me of this. The group of students I was responsible for consisted of ten individuals. The first four were supporters of Sulla Karkar, the next belonged to the Tunisian Islamic Front movement mentioned earlier, two were Shiites, two were recruited by me, and the last was part of the European network. I was approaching my twentieth year, which barely exceeded the average age of the group. However, the influence I had gained over most of them during the recruitment phase made me confident. Initially, I met with them individually, with each of these interviews resulting in a report that I sent to my superiors to assess the level of training that would be suitable for the entire group. I had grand ambitions to turn them into intellectuals in the truest sense of the word, rather than bloodthirsty killers. I inherited an office located in the school garden, equipped with high-quality computer equipment, a luxury I promptly put to use. Soon, I began publishing a newspaper titled, Information on North Africa, with the Quranic motto, When a wicked person brings you news, ascertain the truth. Through this publication, intended for the students' information, I didn't hesitate to disseminate encrypted messages here and there about the network secret activities, such as the one at the beginning of my newspaper, which meant in my mind, beware, the network may deceive you. This publication featured general news articles about the political, economic, and cultural life of North Africa, a sort of press review. Its reputation grew rapidly within the school. My increasing desire to distance myself from terrorism had led me to play multiple roles. However, due to the success of my newspaper, my work as an editor consumed more and more of my time, leaving me less time to attend to my own studies. In addition to this overload, for which I was partly responsible, I soon had to address complaints from my students, who now demanded to receive training solely based on political and military education, rather than inspired by Shiite doctrine. One of the students, belonging to the Tunisian Islamic Front movement, considered Shiites as atheists and accused them of neglecting the religious aspect in favor of social and political military concerns. During classes, I had to tread carefully, fearing the catastrophic incident that would erupt within the group. Students criticized my lack of realism and accused me of limiting my classes to theoretical teaching. Most of the time, classes ended in a furious cacophony, with students banging on tables and throwing projectiles across the room. This near-mutinous atmosphere concerned the school administration. Teki El Mudarisai, the headmaster, had to intervene several times to calm tempers. However, it was the arrival of an eleventh student, Ibrahim, to whom Sulla Karkar had given full authority over the Tunisian group, that triggered their division into three factions. The Shiites, led by Sami Ayed, refused to submit to Ibrahim's authority, the official representative of Sulla Karkar, arguing that they did not belong to the MTI, and since Sulla Karkar was thousands of kilometers away from the school, he could not appreciate the actual circumstances. They demanded to be repatriated to Tunisia. I later learned that a compromise was reached, the followers of Rissel accepted to provide them with rapid military training, after which these Tunisian elements would consent to go on missions in the West on behalf of the network, albeit indirectly. Mohammed El Harith, the recruit from the Tunisian Islamic Front movement, also refused to recognize Ibrahim's authority. In his view, Ibrahim was merely a figurehead. Furthermore, he had no respect for the Shiites, whom he deemed too far removed from true Islamic values. He even went as far as to insult the infallible Twelve Imams. His opposition was so vocal that the Rissalist leaders contemplated eliminating him. I intervened at the last moment to prevent bloodshed, and the opposing Tunisian was sent back home unharmed. On the other hand, Sulla Karkar's supporters, led by ABD Eltif El Tlili, willingly obeyed Ibrahim's orders. For them, the network had to honor its commitments, namely, to train them militarily rather than doctrinally. Consequently, they were directed to another school to receive training specifically for terrorist activities. Thus, discord had reached a point of no return. The initial reports I had sent to Paris regarding these young recruits had hinted at the possibility of conflicts erupting, and this confusion actually stemmed from the underground war between Sulla Karkar and the Rissalists, a war further complicated by religious antagonisms. 
But regardless of the reasons, the cohesion of the Tunisian group had shattered, I had failed in my mission. The network's leaders began to view me with suspicion. On my part, completely cut off from the preparations for the coup in Tunisia, I sometimes wondered if my new assignment in Iran had been a ploy by the network to keep me away, which only exacerbated my frustration. I asked El Sheikh Ahmed to relieve me of the role of trainer, as I seemed to lack the required skills for it. I received a categorical refusal and was tasked with training Shiite elements sent by my friend Abu Ahmed. In the initial classes, I tried to explain the importance of the ideological struggle to convert Sunnis to Shurism, but these zealous youths only cared about armed conflict. War, blood, the smell of explosives, that's what they aspired to. Had the youth become a machine for grinding up human flesh? I gave up, facing a second failure. The management promptly replaced me. In the wake of this, the Grand Maghreb School was established, a special school located in both Damascus and Tehran, dedicated to instructing Tunisian elements, among others. From that point on, my relationship with the network deteriorated significantly. The Rissalists might have been willing to accept my constant demands if I had appeared as an effective teacher, but as my defiance was not matched by major teaching skills, they found me increasingly burdensome. The resentments from the past resurfaced on both sides like a deadly venom, infecting minds and breeding suspicion to an unprecedented degree. They demanded all the passports in my possession, including my own. I refused, knowing I would need them to return to Paris. Although I believed I had hidden them safely, they were stolen shortly afterward. I protested loudly, accusing my leaders of being thieves, while they reproached me for my inability to follow orders. The strength of my commitment to the network, already tested several times, was cracking further. I saw my freedom shrinking day by day, and my convictions followed the same path. The authorities prevented me from returning to France, and spies shadowed my every move. Indirect death threats constantly hung over me. One person told me that a friend had just died in a tragic accident, another had been stabbed by an unknown assailant. It was a genuine nerve-wracking experience, a constant psychological pressure. For the first time, I realized that I was on the verge of becoming estranged from the network. El Sheikh Ahmed further humiliated me by assigning me a dirty job, selecting addresses from a file of several thousand references and sending propaganda materials to the Greater Maghreb. The sample had to include a specific number of selections per country, Mauritania, 50, Libya, 50, Morocco, 150, Tunisia, 400, Algeria, 3000. So, I was sending nearly a thousand packages a week containing pamphlets, newspapers, books, etc. Either directly from Iranian territory or through centers in Brussels or Madrid. It was an unrewarding, subordinate job, far removed from the role I had held until then. After two months, El Sheikh Ahmed ordered me to prepare to go to Belgium for one final mission before returning to France. Despite my reservations, a glimmer of hope began to emerge within me. Was purgatory over? Was I going to rejoin the cell tasked with overthrowing the Bourguiba government? As I had to cross borders under a Saudi identity using the alias Hassan Ali El Maroun, I made an effort to assimilate the customs and traditions of the Gulf country. My thoughts were becoming clearer, I had somewhat distanced myself from the Rissalist doctrine. But nothing was set in stone yet, I could still permanently distance myself from it or relapse. For a person, whether it's religious or otherwise, sectarianism is like a drug, an almost incurable virus that becomes a part of you. Even when doubt creeps in and the desire to break free gnaws at you, you are still susceptible to falling back under its influence. Return to the West and break with the network. On the day of departure, I felt a deep sense of relief. It was at the beginning of November 1986. I made the journey with Ali Akbar El Mudarisai, his wife, and his mentally handicapped daughter whom he had decided to have treated in Brussels. Since he spoke no language other than Arabic and Persian, I had to serve as his guide and interpreter. Wasn't that the only reason motivating my repatriation to Europe? 
In any case, I wanted to free myself from my obligations quickly in the hope of returning to Paris, but every time El Mutarissi assigned me a new mission. The last thing he asked me to do was to serve as an interpreter for a network member who had had an accident. A bomb had exploded near him, and he risked a serious hand injury. He had come to Belgium with fake papers, officially sent as a military personnel. I had to translate all the lies he told so that the doctor wouldn't realize he was an Islamist agent. Late December was approaching, and my passport's validity was expiring on January 1, 1987. If I continued to wait like this, I would soon find myself stuck in Belgium. However, I desired more than anything to return to Paris. That city was like my second home, I had taken my first steps there as a man barely out of adolescence, and my mother, the person I cherished the most, lived there. I loved the bustling and cosmopolitan atmosphere of its streets. Furthermore, according to the agreement with my superiors, I was officially allowed to settle there. So, why did it seem like the network was blocking me? I wanted to get to the bottom of this. When can I return to Paris? I asked Abu Ali once again. I don't know, he replied. What do you mean? I haven't received any directives regarding that. Some directives are unshakable. It has always been said that I should be based in Paris. The situation is different today. The revolution takes precedence over personal interests. We all must comply with the demands of our common project. Patience is necessary. I'm useless in Brussels. I don't like being idle. And what about the coup against Bourguiba? I have no information on that last point. As for your activity in Belgium, we are considering it. You're making a mockery of me. Not at all, I have a great deal of respect for you. Besides, the leaders also appreciate you. Flattery is not the response I'm expecting. Don't be offended. It seems like you're looking for trouble just for the sake of it. Don't think I don't see where you're going with this. You want everything to be under your control, that's the truth. I hope you're joking. Take a few days to rest, and we'll discuss it calmly. Oh yes, we'll discuss it sooner than you think, trust me. This conversation had put me in a black rage. I felt betrayed, humiliated, as if I had been deceived. The ambiguity in which my superiors kept me compounded my frustration. Until proven otherwise, I had kept my promises. But had they kept theirs? What were they up to? Were they working against me? Once my passport expired, what would become of me? In any case, I realized that I was just a mere puppet in their capricious hands, a victim of their changing and incoherent desires. This wasn't the first offense I had suffered, and I had known for a long time their penchant for sedition and their desire for destruction, but this time the desire to harm them began to take root in my mind. As often happens in tales of high-level crime, it takes a tiny detail for everything to tip over, a misplaced or misinterpreted word for dedication to suddenly transform into a spirit of vengeance. Amid past grudges, shattered dreams, false justifications, I rebelled. And the more I rebelled, the more the idea that the Rissalists were the worst enemies on earth imposed itself. Almost without thinking, impulsively, I decided to change my destiny. I made the painful decision to escape and lead my own battle. On December 27, I withdrew a sum of 1,000 US dollars from my account, took a number of secret documents about the network's activities, Abu Ali's fake passport, and video equipment. In the afternoon, I called Abu Ali. I've had enough of your scheming, I told him, my nerves on edge. I'm leaving the country. A piece of advice, don't do anything to try to corner me, or I'll give your passport to the police and reveal your secret activities. Understand? And I hung up. With this blackmail, I was employing the very method of the Rissalists, inspired by the old saying that you must fight fire with fire. I had deliberately put myself on the sidelines of the network, now the worst could happen to me. Forced to engage in a power struggle with the network, 
I was at a disadvantage because the battle pitted me, a lone twenty-year-old man, against an indoctrinated army. Putting into practice what I had learned from my masters was the only way to fight against them. The next morning, I took the plane and landed in Madrid under cold but dry weather, under a metallic blue sky. I had no choice. First and foremost, I needed to assess the situation. Like a tightrope walker with a knot in my throat, I entered the cultural center building, ready to flee at the slightest suspicious movement. Sitting in his office, Saeed Mausab, the local leader, seemed to be expecting me. The leadership has just contacted me. They want you to join Syria immediately. He declared. In what tone are you telling me this? Do you think this is a time for jokes? No, but I'm not just a commodity. You are a soldier of Allah. A soldier who is mistreated. The network guaranteed my return to Paris. According to Hedi El Mudarisai, I was going to become one of the pillars of the future Islamic State in Tunisia. What about that today? I'll turn the question around, what about your fight for Islam? You know well that personal interests must be set aside for the sake of the revolution. You acted like a spoiled child. Abu Ali was only following instructions from above. He was about to send you to Syria, where a school for training residents of the greater Arab Maghrib is about to open. That's why your presence there is crucial. But the leaders know that I'm not fit for that kind of work. They are giving you a second chance. I have already paid a lot. Not nearly enough. As I didn't respond, Mausab added, give me your passport. I will get you a new one for your departure to Syria. I found myself trapped. Danger was inexorably closing in on me, I could feel it without being able to explain in what form it would appear. Mausab had lost his smile, he was tapping his fingers on his desk, indicating that his patience was near its breaking point. His gravity had reached a point of extreme tension. There was no doubt, I had to submit before taking the initiative again. I handed him the document. Come by tomorrow at 2 p.m. Where will you be staying tonight? With a trusted friend. I left the cultural center, a little dazed. The Rissalist's grip was tightening. But the next morning, after regaining my strength, I was firmly determined to defy my superiors. Without further ado, I called Mausa. I've thought it over. I refused to go to Syria. I had committed for a limited time, and that time has expired for some time now. I won't go to Iran either. From now on, I will only accept to operate on French territory. Listen, the leadership regards you as far superior to Abu Ahmed. They want to deal directly with you. Furthermore, the plan to overthrow Bourguiba is now operational. The leaders insist that you actively participate in the Tunisian revolution. Oh really? First, you tell me Syria, then Tunisia. You see, none of this is serious. Do I have to go to Syria or Tunisia? In any case, I'm going to Paris. My decision is final. But you have to go to Syria first. After that, they will tell you what to do and how to participate. A chilling shiver ran down my spine. I wasn't the type to tremble in the face of danger. I had been trained for it, and as I said, I had retained from my childhood a kind of carefreeness that made me downplay tragedies. But, knowing the cruelty of the Rissalists, I felt an unspeakable fear take hold of me for the first time. Perhaps we got a bit carried away, I muttered to calm things down. Give me a few days to think. That's all I'm asking. Of course, I was maneuvering to buy time, I had no intention of reversing my decision. The leadership of El Rasali only thought of its own interests, there was no doubt that the human being I was had no value outside of serving the cause. I went to the Tunisian consulate and explained that my passport and money had been stolen, and I needed to return to my country as soon as possible. I was pleasantly surprised by the kind reception I received from the official. Three days later, I returned to collect my laissez-passer. 
one of the consulate employees drove me to the airport. I was so astonished by the courtesy with which I was treated that I feared it might be a trap. But, after all, I preferred dealing with the administration of a state suspected of atheism rather than with Islamist terrorists. In fact, it was not the case. The consulate officials had genuinely believed my story. Contrary to what the Rissalists had been trying to instill in me, there were open-minded individuals within the Tunisian government willing to help. The Learning of Fear I landed in Tunis on January 2, 1987, without any issues and as free as a bird. However, as soon as I set foot on native soil, I felt a strange sense of unease. It seemed like a civil war could erupt at any moment. National police agents patrolled everywhere. People hurried along the streets as if a storm were imminent. Sirens wailed in the city streets. Had the day of revolution been moved up, or was it a projection of my troubled mind? When the taxi dropped me off in front of the Ariana house, Sulla Carker emerged from the villa and approached me briskly, as if he had been watching for me for hours. As I later learned, he had been elected president of MTI in 1985, but he had also formed his own group of loyalists within MTI. He was thus playing a double game, both in his responsibilities within MTI and as the leader of a secret group with a hidden agenda. If the situation during the revolution were to be stalled, this group, consisting of men wholly dedicated to his cause, could intervene to tip the balance in his favor and seize power in Tunisia if the opportunity arose. With this backup plan in case of MTI's failure, Sulla Karker, cautious and mistrustful as he was, had secured his position. In the struggle for power, all means are fair. After brief greetings, he immediately got down to business. So, what's the news? Naturally, I kept my dispute with the Rissalists to myself. The goal was to reassure Sulla Karker and buy some time. The network leaders are pleased with the progress of negotiations with MTI. But what else? Be more specific. Without wanting to sing your praises, I continued cautiously, I believe you are highly regarded in high places. My superiors are counting on your combat skills to change the fate of the country. What is your role now? In what capacity? I asked cautiously between the network and Tunisia. It hasn't changed. Alongside Mohamed Fauzi, I am the official representative of El Rasali. Sulla Karker placed his hand on my shoulder. I've always known that you are a true believer and a fighter, he said with an obviously staged seriousness that I saw through. The future is ours, I replied with the necessary solemnity. When I woke up, I paced around the garden. That day, I understood how bleak my future was. Despite my withdrawal from the network, I remained, in the eyes of the law, an extremist liable to a heavy sentence. Moreover, the idea of declaring war on the Rissalists was taking root in my mind. The time for retaliation had come. I called my Moroccan friend from Madrid to have him send me the secret documents taken from the cultural center in Brussels, which incriminated several high-ranking network members. When I received them a few days later, I buried them deep in the garden. Then I went to visit ABD Eltaf El Tilly, also known as Samir, who had just arrived from Tehran. Tall, slim, mustached, with a dark complexion, El Tlili was Sulla Karker's right-hand man, undoubtedly his most loyal soldier. A mechanic by profession, like many young people manipulated by the admirable promises of Islamists, he had left the security of his job to join the Islamist camp. Experienced in the use of weapons, he had received military training in Iran. I distrusted him like the plague. When did you return from Tehran? I asked him. About a week ago, Tlili replied. What's new in Tehran? The same old routine, nothing has changed. You seem a bit bitter, I said to provoke him. Do you regret your involvement with the network? Let's talk about you instead, he replied, apparently trying to divert the conversation. Do you know when the revolution will be triggered? It shouldn't be much longer. 
but you should have information through Carker, right? Ah. Sometimes, I feel like they're mocking us. I'll confide in you, I continued, sensing that Tlili was waiting for just that. I, too, am filled with doubt. Never a moment's peace, vague situations, orders from above with no explanation, whispered Tlili, implying that he implicitly shared my discouragement. To tell you the truth, I've lost trust in the network. We're just puppets in their hands. You're absolutely right. I'm disgusted too. By the way, you should be careful. Mausub has contacted your friend Elias to have him spread the word in Shiite and Sunni circles that you're a spy working for Iraq and the Tunisian government. This news left me speechless. The network's objective was clear, to close all doors on me completely, isolating me entirely. Elias was one of my best friends, also a Shiite. We had met a few years earlier and had never stopped corresponding since. If there were some people in my life I trusted, Elias was one of them. I couldn't believe El Tlili's allegations. Elias. I finally said. Are you sure? Absolutely. After I had left El Tlili, I hurried to call Elias to get to the bottom of this. Can you imagine me being a spy? El Tlili is exaggerating, Elias told me. What do you know? Elias. Tell me honestly. I heard that the network had assigned someone to tail you. Unfortunately, I don't know their identity. If you think it's me, I'd be very sad. The person assigned to tail me is El Tlili. That's likely. Be careful, my friend, I wouldn't want to lose you. For me, there was no doubt, El Tlili was indeed the agent tasked with monitoring me. For the first time, I felt fear in my bones. The network could do anything in its interest. I didn't know what, but everything was possible, and I had to expect the worst. It was like an enormous, monstrous machine that had just been set in motion against me. An invisible, blind machine programmed to harm me in one way or another. From now on, I couldn't fall asleep without risking waking up in a startle, senses alert to any suspicious noise, or walk down the street without constantly looking over my shoulder. I would never again know which path to take to avoid traps. I would always be suspicious of my friends, a passerby searching his coat pocket, a car breaking suddenly. I went to see Tlili a second time to try to unmask him. All Rissalists are corrupt, I declared. I'm going to report them to the Tunisian government. Wait a moment, El Tlili retorted. We still need them for now. Let's be smarter. The network has promised to supply weapons via Germany and Spain. So far, we haven't received anything on that front. Let's wait for the delivery, and then we can expose them. Do you think they'll do it? Listen, a first shipment from Libya has arrived. We immediately hid it in the forest. The most important part is yet to come. What do you think of that? El Tlili was trying to make me talk so he could report back to Mausab, undoubtedly. I cut the conversation short. From that day on, I took enormous precautions whenever I had to leave the house. Every day, I feared the stab in the back or the gunshot that would cut me down on the street corner. To protect myself, I made appointments at the last minute, constantly changed my route, never made phone calls from home, and trusted no one. My father had no idea of the situation I was in. We lived in two different worlds, as we always had. I continued to secretly meet with Elias. Through him, I used the network for my own purposes. He and I had gathered young Shiites with the idea of leading a religious revolution based on peaceful resistance, much like Gandhi. By doing so, not only did I not admit defeat, but I also outmaneuvered El Rasali. It was a way of shouting in the face of my former masters that I, too, could manipulate them. Because deep down, I still believed in creating an Islamic state in my country, but in my way, without resorting to force, solely through the will of the people.
At my request, Elias asked the Rysalists for permission to expand his group from 7 to 14 individuals. The network agreed on the condition that his supporters would back MTI while spreading the rumor that Sulla Karkar had converted to Shurism and had become pro-Iranian. In the Islamist circles where information spread rapidly and passion reigned, a rumor could indeed ruin the most solid reputation in no time. Sulla Karkar, the MTI, and al Rasali. As a reminder, the Sunni Islamic Organization, founded in 1928 in Egypt by Hassan el Banna, outwardly advocates non violent resistance against secularism and Western values but promotes a totalitarian ideology that encompasses all aspects of social, political, economic, and military life. For its members, Allah's religion contains everything and remains valid for all people, at all times and in all places. Known for their traditional attire, they form a brotherhood whose goal is to strictly apply Orthodox Islam to counter the departure from Islamic precepts in modern society. This ideology has spread in the Middle East and North Africa. In Tunisia, Rajd el Ghanouchi, the founder of MTI in the 1970s, followed the example of Hassan el Banna, the Muslim Brotherhood, and Sayyid Qat, who are the reference in political Islam. The movement influenced academic circles. Like El Banna in Egypt, El Ghanouchi created his own secret network. He sent young graduates from the movement to infiltrate state institutions, including security and the military. In 1981, following several acts of violence, the government recognized the danger posed by the movement. About a hundred members were arrested. El Ghanouchi was sentenced to 11 years in prison, and Karkar to 10 years. El Ghanouchi, more moderate, negotiated with Prime Minister Mohamed Mzali, which led to their release in August 1984. At that time, Tunisia was facing a severe economic crisis. The increase in bread prices due to the demands of the International Monetary Fund had sparked the bread riots in December 1983, causing more than 70 deaths. Afterward, given the government's fragility in his own health, Bourguiba had to accept an agreement with the Gulf countries that included a return to Islamic values in Tunisia, including the Arabization of education. This agreement allowed Islamists to indoctrinate society under Mzali's control, who was close to Saudi Arabia and vying for Bourguiba's succession. The MTI returned to occupy mosques, multiplied associations, and, with Mzali's complicity, became the main opposition to Bourguiba's regime. Since their release from prison, Sulla Karkar accused Ghanouchi of betraying the movement's values. According to him, the MTI should not have accepted reconciliation with the enemy of Islam, Bourguiba. He presented a plan to change the structure of the movement and establish the rules to be applied within the MTI. This request was ignored, which fueled his resentment. According to him, the MTI had become Ghanouchi's private property, and he made decisions alone. Unable to openly counter Ghanouchi's actions as he had strong support within the movement, Sulla Karkar began to create his own network. This put Ghanouchi in a difficult position, given the agreement with Mzali not to work secretly, which had led him to put his own network for infiltrating government bodies on hold. But he turned a blind eye to Sulla Karkar's activities and continued to strengthen his relations with the Gulf countries. As for Sulla Karkar, he tried to raise global public opinion and human rights organizations against Bourguiba's policies. My sister told me that he wrote letters to organizations like Amnesty International to denounce the scandalous situation faced by Islamists in Tunisia. Within the movement, he had the support of young activists. This approach allowed him to lead the movement within a year, with Ghanouchi stepping back in 1985. When I contacted my brother-in-law again in 1985, he was the absolute leader of the MTI. He discussed and concluded agreements himself with El Rasali as part of his approach to reconcile with any Islamic organization, even Shiite. This did not please Ghanouchi, who was moving closer to Salafism and relying on the Gulf countries at the expense of the Shiites. In contrast, Sulla Karkar dealt with all social or political organizations that represented the interests of Islam. Jama'at al-Tablai, the Muslim Brotherhood, Ibadi businessmen, he had connections everywhere. 
He advised young people to learn the art of combat by joining karate clubs, while my sister led a women's network. If Ganucci's network was oriented toward state institutions, he was developing his own within society. Based on the information I gathered from several sources, here are the agreements that were concluded between the Rissalists and him, the network provides 50% of the material needs. It commits to training MTI soldiers in political and military matters and makes explosive specialists available to coordinate field operations. It takes responsibility for delivering the necessary weaponry to the MTI and ensures its distribution across Tunisian territory. Supporters can use the network's channels to conduct a campaign of denunciation against the government of Bourguiba in Arab and Islamic countries. The Rissalists already present, about 200 to 300 elements, make themselves available to the MTI. If necessary, this force will be reinforced by tapping into the pool of 2,000 pro rissalist Tunisian Shiites. In case of success, the network sends its instructors to help with the training of the new government and the management of the country's affairs for a period of six months. Finally, in case of defeat, it guarantees the safety of MTI leaders and their escape abroad. In return, El Risali is allowed to distribute propaganda materials within the country that downplay the points of disagreement between Sunnis and Shiites. The MTI itself has a significant stock of weapons and substantial financial support from Tunisian businessmen. It has 2,000 supporters ready to take up arms at any time, dispersed within the Tunisian army, the National Guard acting as the police, and the Ministry of Interior. Among these supporters is a hardcore nucleus of 200 individuals capable of circulating weapons, inciting the population, and organizing support demonstrations during the coup, as well as executives and engineers experienced in wielding power and an elite troop skilled in the use of weapons and terrorist actions. One million people support the MTI throughout the country, including 200,000 directly linked to the grassroots cell ready to initiate protests on the territory. A map of strategic sites is developed in anticipation of occupying central Tunisia and Bizerta to counter a potential foreign offensive. These were the secret agreements negotiated between the Rissalists and the MTI, especially during the two meetings between Sulla Karkar and Mohamed Fauzi and then Abu Waji. I should clarify that Sulla Karkar negotiated these agreements in his own name, in his capacity as the military leader of the MTI. It was only later that he informed Rachdel Ganucci and Abdel Fattah Muru to obtain their approval. By 1985, the Rissalists had laid the initial foundations for this action by training about a hundred terrorists from the Tunisian youth in Iran. Isolated cells of three individuals, detached from one another, were formed. These cells, in turn, created new cells of the same size, no more than twelve individuals, and so on. The criteria for selecting individuals were as follows, they should be attracted to holy war, but more importantly, they should be suffering from family problems, academic failure, discord. This selection targeted outcasts, malleable individuals to whom the path to paradise was opened by proposing that they die for Islam. After thorough brainwashing, they were released into society and began operations, carrying out attacks against law enforcement, tourist sites, and so on. Their lack of experience and the emotional deprivation they experienced pushed them to make mistakes, and the police arrested them quite quickly. Once imprisoned, the majority of them regretted their actions, but it was too late. In fact, this scorched earth policy constituted the second phase of the plan organized by the Rissalists in association with Sulla Karkar, with no limits to Takiya. These arrests were desired. The Islamists did not hesitate to accuse the government of chasing poor adolescents excluded from society without regard for human rights, thereby reaping the benefits, the popularity of religious opponents grew in the country, from the capital to the most remote regions. The Betrayal of El Ganucci and the Coup When I returned to Tunis in early 1987, Bourguiba, aware of the plot being prepared by Mzali, had dismissed him and replaced him a few months earlier with Rashid Sfar. Zine El Abidine Ben Ali had just joined the Sfar government as Minister of the Interior. 
The confrontation between the state and the Islamists had begun, with protests led by Sulla Karkar's men erupting everywhere. I was able to closely follow the situation because my brother-in-law was commanding his groups from our house in Ariana. He was sending men for military training in Iran and Sudan, but some were trained in Ariana itself, in the Nali forest, near a stone quarry. No one suspected this because dynamite explosions were common in the area. Through his connections, Sulla Karkar was clandestinely importing weapons from Germany and Libya. Unlike Ganucci, who allowed his cells to act independently, he did not engage in terrorist acts against civilians and tourists. He personally directed the protests. I saw him giving orders for the major demonstration in the Bab el Qadra district. His project was to foment a widespread popular protest movement in the country. When the situation deteriorated, as it did in Iran, he would intervene with the armed groups whose loyalists already held key positions within the state. Pinucci was under house arrest at the time. In March, he was officially arrested, along with thousands of Islamists. However, Sulla Karkar went into hiding in Ariana with an Ibadite person and continued to pull the strings of the protest movement. In the summer of 1987, the protests escalated, and on August 2, the day before Bourguiba's 84th birthday, a series of bombings occurred in hotels in Sousse and Monastir. Following these horrors, many members of the MTI were arrested. I was arrested in September, along with 16 members of my group. The first to be arrested was Fauzi El Wartini, who was severely tortured. The rest of the group followed, and I was the last to be taken into custody. I was transported to the Wardia police station and then transferred to Bachucha. In the El Churuk newspaper, journalist Kamal Labidi wrote, the leader of a terrorist group, Mohammed Karim Labidi, was arrested with 16 individuals. This pro-Iranian terrorist group was working with the MTI to spread panic in Tunisia. Following this arrest, Tunisia severed its relations with Iran, and its cultural attaché at the embassy was expelled. I only learned about everything that happened during this arrest afterward. The leaders of the MTI were sentenced to life imprisonment on September 27, 1987. Seven of them were sentenced to death, including Sulla Karkar, who was on the run. Ganucci, who was incarcerated at the time of the events, was not sentenced to death, although Borguiba had requested his execution. Ben Ali, promoted to Minister of State in charge of the Interior in May 1987, was appointed Prime Minister on October 2 of the same year while retaining the Ministry of the Interior. Through my arrest, he obtained evidence of my brother-in-law's involvement with Iran. After giving the order to arrest Sulla Karkar, Saudi Arabia, Iran's long-standing enemy, supported his rise to power. The agreements with Saudi Arabia promised a transition of power without deviating too far from the constitution's laws. Ben Ali had the situation under control. With foreign country support secured, the constitutional coup against Bourguiba proceeded. Ben Ali separately met with Tunisia's two important forces, the Bourguibists represented by Habib Omar and the Islamists represented by Rajd el Ganucci. He convinced Habib Omar that Bourguiba was too old to govern, that the country was in danger, and that if it fell into the hands of the Islamists, Bourguibism would disappear. Habib Omar was persuaded and helped Ben Ali, who nonetheless dismissed him eight months after the operation's success and his rise to power. On the other hand, he spoke with Rajd el Ganucci warning him about Sulla Karkar and the dangerous nature of his involvement with the Shiite network. I'm not sure if the meeting was direct, but the information I have comes from a source close to its organizer, Abdel Fattah Muru, a key figure in the MTI. Abdel Fattah Muru was a lawyer. He was the first to meet Ganucci. He maintained good relations with other founders of the MTI like Hamida Enefer, as well as with the sheikhs of Zidouna and influential political figures within the country. Known for his multiple trips to Europe and the Gulf countries, he had foreign relations with important leaders such as Qadhafi, as well as in Saudi Arabia and France. He was arrested in 1981 with the leaders of the MTI. Despite a heavy sentence, 
he was released before the others and contacted Mzali with Ganuchi's blessing to find common ground with the government. It was the famous letter in which he promised to protect the constitution and not threaten the republic, which, when transmitted to the presidency by Mzali, convinced Borguiba to release the leaders of the MTI. Sulla Karkar nicknamed Abdel Fattah Muru the Wolf. He spoke of him as a dangerous man with many facets who played on all sides. If you wanted to transmit information to the enemy, you just had to mention it in the presence of Muru. At the same time, the balance of the MTI was maintained through him, he prevented the rupture between Ganuchi and Sulla Karkar. The latter relied heavily on Muru, despite the little trust he inspired in his close relationship with Ganuchi. Abdel Fattah Muru left Tunisia in 1986 when the situation became critical between the MTI and the government. He held a series of meetings in France with Francois Mitterrand and in Germany, then settled in Saudi Arabia. He now worked within the framework of the constitution. In this new context, he abandoned Sulla Karkar, aligned himself with Ben Ali, contributed to Ganucci's release, and organized support for Ben Ali with the complicity of Ganucci in his armed network. In return, he changed the name of the MTI to Anada. Therefore, Ben Ali succeeded in his coup on November 7, 1987, with the help of foreign countries, Habib Omar, and the moderate branch of the MTI. My sister Samira later told me how it happened for Sulla, he followed a well-defined program to incite the people without a coup or bloodshed by organizing protests from July to December 1987 until a nationwide revolution occurred. Then, his groups would occupy the country's cultural and economic strategic points. Simultaneously, Ganucci's branch would infiltrate the police and the army, disrupt radar systems, and use military aircraft to attack the Carthage Palace, the Ministry of the Interior, and free the prisoners. But Ganucci's security group informed him that they wouldn't wait until December, and a coup was planned for November 8. When Sulla asked for an explanation for this change in plans, he was told that Ratched's life was in danger as he would be executed beforehand. Sulla did not take this response into account and continued his action, unaware that Ganucci and his group had betrayed him and were colluding with Ben Ali to overthrow Borguiba with the blessing of Saudi Arabia and international opinion. But Ben Ali was cleverer. He did not trust Ganucci, the Borgibists, or other opponents. He betrayed all his allies and carried out his coup alone, a day in advance, by manipulating the Tunisian constitution. During this period, I was in prison in Buchucha. The inspector who interrogated me informed me that Borguiba had requested the death penalty for me and my group, and that I faced capital punishment. I was barely 21. I saw my life flash before my eyes, yet I couldn't believe I was going to die so soon. What disturbed me more was not knowing who had betrayed me. I had been very discreet, and no one knew me. Could it be a matter of chance? At first, I believed the inspector's version, which claimed that it was a phone call from Spain, from another Islamist network that had learned that I was working against them in Tunisia. After that, I suspected Sulla Karkar. But over time, I understood that our arrest must have been part of the agreements concluded between Ratched el Ganucci and Ben Ali. During my arrest, I saw men belonging to Sulla Karkar's group being incarcerated one after the other, day after day. What was most intriguing was that the Tunisian government could not have known these people. I saw Samir Tlilai, who had joined me in Iran before, arrive at the prison on a stretcher with bullets in his body. All of this confirmed to me that Ratched el Ganucci, who knew everyone around Sulla, had sold him and his entire network. He had become a servant of Ben Ali, as summarized by this little phrase uttered during a political speech, we have trust in Allah and in Ben Ali. What surprising coming from a man my sister told me had amassed a fortune in prison with the donations from prisoners' families, claiming that the Tunisian state confiscated the money sent. Ratched el Ganucci had betrayed his own, he wanted to lead the MTI all by himself, and in turn, he was betrayed by Ben Ali, causing the downfall of both branches of the MTI. In 1988, Ganucci was given the green light to resume his activities with Abdel Fattah Muru under the name Inada. 
said El Firjani resigned from the army and went into exile in London, where he prospered in business thanks to his contacts in Turkey and the Gulf countries. As for Sulla Carker, who had fled to France, he was sidelined, and his group was scattered among those who were arrested, silenced, or exiled. At the end of December 1987, I was pardoned, along with others, by Ben Ali and left prison. For your information, I knew before my arrest that Rachdel Ganucci had a group of loyalists infiltrated into the army and security forces from the 1970s, including my brother-in-law Abdesalam Kamari. A second group was under the command of my other brother-in-law, Sulla Karkar. These soldiers appeared to be civilians integrated into society, but they could turn into fighters to incite crowds and occupy key positions at any time. The Tunisian intelligence services were aware of this, as was Ben Ali, but they had more information about Ratched's branch than Sulla's. Upon coming to power, Ben Ali's top priority was to eliminate the Bourguibists. Then, he settled his score with Sulla Karkar by manipulating my testimony to clear Ganucci and blame Sulla for all the MTI's crimes. After that, he waited for four years and in 1992, he banished Ratched's infiltrated members who had participated in the coup with him, accusing them of preparing a new power shift. I know that Sulla Karkar was not involved in the terrorist acts in Sus and Monastir, the acid attacks, the 1991 Bab Suika bombing, or other less publicized attacks. In my opinion, these acts were indirectly ordered by close associates of Ganucci. Indeed, Islamist leaders could take initiatives to add to the prevailing confusion. They would then use submissive and naive young people, as was the case in the Bab Suika incident, where Abdel Ghani and Hisham Benour, two of my cousins, were sentenced, one to 25 years in prison and the other to life imprisonment. They were not active members of the MTI but simple sympathizers who wanted to burn documents. The Tunisian state took advantage of the situation to eradicate Inada from its territory. Having thus disposed of all his opponents, Ben Ali became the absolute master of Tunisia in 1992. Rajdel Ganucci had anticipated Ben Ali's plan. He left Tunisia for Algeria in 1989 and then moved to Sudan after Omar el Bashir's coup. He worked with Hassan el Turabi to lead a Sudanese Islamist movement. In 1990, he went to Turkey to stay with Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Having obtained political refugee status in 1993, he ensured the elimination of his rivals for control of Anada. He organized a meeting in Germany to permanently exclude Sulla Karkar. This decision was postponed following an agreement between Charles Pasqua and Ben Ali to repatriate the Islamists to Tunisia, where Sulla Karkar risked the death penalty. However, in 2002, the news came, Sulla Karkar was excluded from the Islamist movement. He withdrew from political life in 2005 after a stroke, and Ganucci remained the supreme leader. In 2005, opponents of Ben Ali united under the leadership of Anada to work for his downfall from abroad. Nobody likes to talk about all of this, but this account might help to better understand what happened after 2011. The uncertainty. Doubt leads to reason. Avaros. I have reached a very important moment in my life, the critical period I went through between 1987 and 2001. My arrest in the last days of Borguiba's rule deeply disturbed me, I began to doubt everything. Distraught, caught in an inner struggle, without guidance and without help, I plunged into a true existential crisis. I don't like doubt and do not flee from obstacles. Upon my release after Ben Ali came to power, I decided to return to Syria, even if it meant risking my life, hoping to find an answer or truth in the East. There, I completely freed myself from Orthodox Islam and banished Islamism from my mind once and for all. This led me to turn to mystical Islam and Sufism upon my return to the West. Finally, my doubts about the foundations of Islam and my meditations in the isolation of a mystical journey in Morocco led me to atheism. Imprisonment In March 1987, tensions were rising in Tunis. It was not safe to linger in the streets. 
secretly organized demonstrations by Islamist forces erupted regularly, ending in panic and screams. A sense of impending doom filled the air as the police ruthlessly charged the crowds, arresting dozens of people. At the same time, they raided the homes of suspected Islamists, smashing everything in their path and making new arrests. An air of bloodshed and war seemed to hang over the country. Tunisia was on the brink of a civil war. The government feared that the agitation would spread everywhere. Islamist terrorist forces were secretly finalizing preparations for a revolution, positioning themselves in all the hotspots across the country. In a few months, they would launch hostilities, and nothing would stop the wave from surging through the streets and stirring up the people. The country was heading toward a bloodbath. Faced with this explosive climate, I observed things with a mixture of fury and compassion. I felt sorry for my brothers who had been promised the world, only to soon discover the harsh reality of the situation and witness many deaths in their families. I was torn. Should I collaborate with the authorities to avert the impending massacre? Should I, at the last minute, involve myself in the popular revolt to help rescue my country from disaster? In fact, the police had an eye on anything related to Islamism. The meetings held in Ariana were infiltrated by moles from the Tunisian secret services. On the night of March 12, Rashid Ghanouchi was arrested and placed under house arrest. My brother-in-law was interrogated and then released due to lack of evidence. Cautious, he went into hiding before fleeing to France during the following summer, thanks to his brother, who was a gendarme and used his official vehicle to take him to the boat. The Tunisian Islamic Revolution had lost two of its leaders. After this setback, the Rissalists, followers of the Rissali network, respected their commitments and organized the escape of the main leaders. This was how Sulla Karkar obtained political refugee status in Paris. However, they withdrew their trust from the MTI, movement of the Islamic tendency, and the criminal activities of the network were redirected toward Algeria. There, after the civil war between the Algerian army and clandestine Islamist militants, the Islamist forces were in hiding, biding their time. The surviving Tunisian cells, saved from Bourguiba's raids, were sent there. The Islamist agents resumed their painstaking work, aiming to overthrow the Algerian government, establish an Islamic state, and eventually conquer North Africa. This mission was entrusted, among others, to Sulla Karkar, despite the distance. In Tunis, tensions between the government and Islamist forces continued to escalate. The situation was fraught with risks for both sides, given the numerous moles operating everywhere, from within the police and Islamist ranks to the MTI, Sulla Karkar, and the Rissalists. As for me, I continued from March to September 1987 to organize a revolutionary pacifist party, mainly composed of young Tunisian Shiites. My fear was suppressed by my unwavering belief in Allah. Some kill in the name of the Lord, while others survive through him. My friend Elias was my most loyal ally. He retained his position within the Rasali network and used its mechanisms for our benefit. He did not hesitate to manipulate the reports sent to his superiors and send false information to Tehran, following the decoy technique taught by our masters. We knew that danger was lurking around us, but we had no idea of the intricate interplay of forces at play, turning the political and military landscape of the country into an unbelievable game of pick-up sticks. With agents wearing multiple hats, corrupt police officers, profiteers of all kinds, professional informants, repentant Islamists, the situation was immensely complex. In this web of rivalries, who could have made sense of it all? On September 10, I had a meeting with my friend at around 4 p.m. I had been waiting for a good 10 minutes. I kept an eye out for Elias but also for any potential trouble, as in the eyes of the Rissalists, I was still a marked man. My friend and I had established a common rule to ensure our safety during meetings, if one of us was more than 20 minutes late, the other should return home and wait for a phone call over the next two hours. If there was complete silence, it meant that an arrest had probably occurred, and it was time to flee. After 25 minutes, there was still no sign of Elias. 
I returned home and waited for the agreed upon two hours. Elias didn't call. I had to prepare to leave for hiding in Gabe's, further south. But something strange held me back. No matter how much I told myself that I was putting myself in more danger with each passing minute, it didn't matter. Hearing the creaking of the gate, I looked out the window. Three police cars blocked the way, and law enforcement officers surrounded the house. It was over. I had wanted to confront the unknown, and I was caught. Strangely, the police officers didn't seem in a hurry. They walked leisurely, as if it were a routine operation. It was nothing like the raids I had witnessed in the preceding days. Later, I learned that Sulla Carker, who was in Paris closely monitoring the political situation in Tunisia, had denounced us as dangerous terrorists. In a way, it was fair game since I had managed to convince the Shiite community that the MTI was working on behalf of an international terrorist network. When I disclosed my identity, the interrogating police officer was surprised by my age. So young. What a pity, he muttered. My father couldn't believe his eyes, he looked at me with a bewildered expression. He, who had mocked me throughout my life, suddenly realized that his son's life had taken an unexpected turn. The years had dissolved almost unnoticed in the relentless hourglass of time. A passive spectator until now, he suddenly realized that his child had grown up without him, like a wild weed in a field. He hadn't seen anything, too selfish to take an interest in other people's lives. Destiny caught up with him in a matter of seconds, throwing the result of his years of absence in his face. A harsh awakening for a father. The wheel had turned, it was too late. During the search, no weapons, no pamphlets, not a single piece of evidence was found. Only a few books about the Iraqi Ba'ath Party were confiscated as evidence. I was relieved and even went so far as to facilitate the police's work. My composure was exemplary. However, something seemed amiss to the police officers. Are you really an Islamist? Insisted the one who had interrogated me. To reassure him, I gave him a smile. Think what you want, I retorted. It was as if I wanted to defy death, to push my own limits. After an hour, I got into the police van, where I found Elias, his face marked by worry. Our dreams were definitively shattered. My fear had dissipated, but this respite was short-lived. Sitting in front of the police commissioner's desk at the El Wardia police station, I didn't flinch. The commissioner, sitting across from me, stared without saying a word. Long minutes of silence passed, heavy and unforgettable. In the corridor, I could hear raised voices, screams. The commotion was at its peak. Other young people who had just been arrested were undergoing interrogations with a different fate. In such a situation, a simple, unwavering gaze directed at the suspect can be an extremely effective form of torture. What would the representative of the law finally do? What irrational and bestial act was brewing in the mind of this man about whom I knew nothing, a man who might be capable of the worst? Would he beat me? Leave me in suspense for days on end? Should I break the silence? I don't know exactly how long this silence lasted, but suddenly, I saw my past flash before me at such a speed that I felt dizzy. Finally, the commissioner decided to speak. Are you proud of yourself? Not particularly. The commissioner got up from his chair, closed the office door behind me, then approached me from behind and began to berate me. So, here's Mohammed Karim Labidi. Look at this Islamist seed, dressed in leather and styled like Travolta. I can't believe my eyes. Ah. When they say you have to track them down even in the discotheques, they're absolutely right. Accustomed to blending into the crowd to avoid drawing attention to myself, I adopted the fashion of young people of the time influenced by rock music. It had become a reflex, as soon as I settled in a place, I adopted the locals' habits. Do you agree to tell the truth? The threatening voice continued. I didn't dare turn my head. Everything is in your hands, 
I have nothing more to say. Then off to the slammer, young man. When I entered the cell, an abominable stench of filth choked me, as if the air hadn't been refreshed for months. I heard a man moaning and coughing. He opened his mouth, but no words came out. I sat down beside him to comfort him. I'll never know what he tried to say. Water, water, please. Shouted detainees in nearby cells. It was true, we were suffocating. The lack of air and the dust burned our lungs. When I managed to fall asleep, I woke up every hour, feeling as though my end was near. I was transferred shortly afterward to Bachucha Barracks. As soldiers were taking me for questioning, I saw others bringing Elias back in the opposite direction, looking terribly battered. He and I were on opposite sides of the bars now. I tried to catch his eye to give him a sign of friendship, but he was lost in another world. I had the feeling that I would never see him again. In the room where I was taken, two police officers began to harass me. So, you little bastard! shouted the sergeant, you want to start a revolution? Take this! And he kneed me in the stomach. I lowered my head. What? Did I hurt you? What do you say to that, you bastard? Then, speaking to his colleague, do you think I hurt him? I didn't see anything. When are you really going to deal with this dog? I'm already bored. Did you hear, troublemaker? My friend is getting bored of seeing you as silent as a fish. And the police officer started beating me again. I rolled on the ground, continuing to receive kicks in the kidneys. Get up. You're making your lord pity you. I got up. My mouth was bleeding. The police officer rubbed my ears vigorously. Can you hear better now? Yes, sir. I'm not sure. We'll see how we can unblock your ears for you. Afterward, my friend will probably want to have a little fun with you. You know, you have to understand us. Life in the police isn't always fun. After an hour of torture, I was thrown into a cell, nearly unconscious. I didn't know where I was or if I was still alive. When I came to my senses, all the prisoners in the cell, about twenty of them, were gathered around me. Are you okay? One of them asked. I've had better days. They beat you. Yes, and how, I said, trying to sit up as best I could. You're not the only one. I figured. Are you an Islamist or a communist? Continued the prisoner who seemed to be the leader. Neither one. Really? Then what are you? Why do you want to know? We're all detainees. You have to reveal your identity, or none of U.S. will speak to you. You could very well be a government spy. In that case, I'm playing my role perfectly. Did you see what they did to me? It's not difficult to fake appearances. We've seen worse. I'm Shiite, and Sulla Karkar is my brother-in-law. At these words, some prisoners distanced themselves, while others, on the contrary, drew closer to me. By mentioning my brother-in-law's name, I had garnered admiration but also suspicion. This duality in the prisoners' reactions illustrated the rivalries within the Tunisian Islamist milieu. From the beginning, the dice were loaded. Over the course of the days, after witnessing many prisoners tortured, I managed to gather them around me and began to talk to them about the conflict between Sunnis and Shiites. My argumentation started with the origins of Islam to try to explain the stupidity of certain interpretations. I emphasized the notions of brotherhood and sharing, which were, I repeated, the very foundation of the Muslim religion, the people must bury the hatred of the past, build a generous Islam through renewed unity, or else Muslims would remain indefinitely isolated. Prisoners were summoned one by one by the barracks authorities. They would leave in the morning and return in the evening, humiliated and battered. Every morning, everyone dreaded hearing their name shouted through the cell's vent. A month passed before I was interrogated again. 
deprived of visits, forced to wash myself with a thin trickle of water from a rubber hose, undernourished, I was a pitiful sight. I was stripped naked from head to toe except for my underwear, then the guard forced me to lie on the tiled floor, handcuffed. I remained in this position for several hours. Among Islamists, the body should not be exposed, modesty is required. By forcing me to undress, the military thought they would humiliate me further. However, I didn't care. Nudity mattered little to me, unlike the other prisoners. When I entered the chief inspector's office, my limbs were stiff. Have you thought about it? The investigator asked me. I've done nothing but. Your friend confessed to everything. So, Elias was alive. This news gave me hope. I have no intention of denying the truth. Did you work for the Iranian terrorists? Yes, but I left that network before returning to Tunisia. Why? I no longer believe in their ideas. I was wrong all along. They are murderers, no more, no less. Yet, the investigator continued, you continued to engage in terrorism by creating your own revolutionary party. That's true, but I had no intention of shedding anyone's blood. Don't play the frightened pacifist. You did plan to overthrow Borguiba's government, didn't you? What can I say? I'm full of contradictions. Do you think this is a time for jokes? No. But it's true, I had no intention of killing anyone. That's not what your friend told us. What did he confess, exactly? If you think I'm going to tell you. Just know that he hates you. Letting me believe that my best friend had told the worst things about me was probably meant to psychologically destabilize me. It was well played, in the pure style of mental torture. In fact, I felt betrayed, but this feeling only lasted a short moment. I doubt it. We received a report about your activities, an anonymous report. Ah, Sulla Carker. I said, clenching my fists. Sulla Carker. That's an interesting subject. He's on the run, and I'm in prison. Don't you find that curious? Justice isn't the same for everyone. Are you insinuating that the government made secret agreements with your brother-in-law? No, I'm just stating the facts. It's always the same story, the poor people pay for the big bosses. You're not here to philosophize but to tell the truth. Do you want to cooperate with us? Admit to the facts. Brutality is unnecessary. I will tell what I know. We can work together then. Do you want something? Yes, a cigarette. And above all, sleep. The next day, the guard came to get me, and I had to lie down half-naked in the corridor next to the investigator's room again. I spent the day in that position without being interrogated. This treatment repeated for three consecutive days. Finally, I was heard. I then revealed everything I knew, trying not to implicate the MTI or the Iranian government too much, out of solidarity with the supporters who had been deceived. I was asked to be a mole in the prison, but I refused. Under no circumstances would I have accepted the dependence on an authority, even a respectable one, again. Now, I wanted to be free, independent, owing nothing to anyone. This painful experience had revealed to me the madness of my crime. My actions had been all the more absurd because I appreciated certain aspects of President Borguiba's political work, especially concerning women's rights. The marriage as a reintegration attempt. Very weakened for several months, Borguiba no longer had the strength to govern and was sorely lacking in lucidity. The Islamists had sensed this for a long time. Despite the raids, they had not given up on the coup planned for December. The streets were overflowing with protests, the police were making more arrests, which led to new protests. The El Risali network was carefully preparing its operation on its side. From Paris, Sulla Carker was monitoring the maneuver. Was he pulling the strings? Some have said so. In the end, 
history did not want their coup to succeed. Zine El Abidine Ben Ali replaced Borguiba on November 7. He deposed the potentate in a very legal manner, already prime minister, he replaced the deficient president through a kind of chic coup, waiving the promise of free elections. These elections never really took place. Some claim that the American secret services had warned Ben Ali that an operation was in the works. In any case, he tightened the police and made new arrests in Islamist circles. In early November 1987, my Islamist accomplices and I appeared before the investigating judge Hassan Ben Fela. As I climbed the steps of the courthouse, the ultimate symbol of state authority, my heart was heavy. Do you want a lawyer? I was asked before entering the courtroom. No, I replied. Are you a member of the MTI? The judge began. No. Do you have an organizational relationship with Carker? No. Did you participate in the training of MTI members? No. But I trained supporters of Sulla Carker. Weren't these supporters members of the MTI? No, they were exclusively under Carker. Does the training of the armed forces of the MTI take place in Iran? Yes. Was the political and military objective of the MTI to overthrow the Borguiba government? Yes. Do you know how to handle weapons? Yes, the Kalashnikov. And bombs? No, only the Kalashnikov. Despite all these wrongdoings and especially thanks to your cooperation, you will soon be free, the judge continued. Tunisia has just turned a page in its history. A new era is dawning. Learn from your mistakes. Practicing the Shiite or Sunni religion is not a crime, but trying to impose it on others by force in an attempt to overthrow the government is an attack on public order and the security of the state. Such acts will be severely punished in the future. Never forget it. I nodded my head, looking the judge in the eyes. Such acts now seem to me to be criminal childishness, and I knew I would never fall for them again. But many obstacles would still be in my way. The prison where I was held had about a hundred prisoners, all Islamists. My father and one of my sisters were now visiting me regularly, bringing comfort and food. I had become friends with another inmate, Monir, to whom I confided one day that I would like to get married when I was released from prison. But it would have to be an independent, autonomous woman, so that I could fully devote myself to the fight against Islamist terrorism. I know someone who fits that description, Monir told me. I promise to introduce you to her someday. In reality, after these years of madness, I longed for a quiet and settled life. I don't think I was ever made for marriage. It was, above all, a means of integration for me, as marriage is in most societies the strongest model of social reference. A married man is a normal man, and therefore more likely to be accepted by his surroundings. Afterward, I could envision the future in a completely different light. That was my ambition at the time. On December 30, 1987, I was released. When I arrived home, I asked the taxi driver to wait a bit while I fetched the money to pay the fare. He told me that he was a sympathizer of the Islamists and, therefore, a friend. I didn't have to pay anything. The family reception was cold. Samira, Sulla Karkar's wife, barely spoke to me. From what I understood, the rumor was that my arrest had been a pretext to clear me. Most of my former associates accused me of being an agent of the Tunisian government, which was completely false. After my release from Bachucha, I was approached by the inspector who had interrogated me. We got to know each other better. This man knew everything about the MTI because he had been a part of it in the 1970s until he realized that they posed a threat to the country. He then turned against them by working for the state's intelligence services. He fought firmly, severely, and relentlessly against Islamist movements. He promised to help me reintegrate into society and even suggested that I work with the police. 
Of course, I refused, while promising that if I learned anything concerning the country's security, I would inform the authorities. After that, I was summoned to the Ministry of the Interior several times to talk to him, and we stayed in touch. He helped me through the difficult period after my release from prison, but when he saw that there was no chance of me working with the police, he left me to my fate. I soon received a call from my brother-in-law, traitor. Sooner or later, you will be punished. Punished, did that mean eliminated? I hung up on him. Although hurt in my pride, I decided not to pay attention to these threats. Despite the risk of the defamatory rumors about me growing, I continued to see Elias. During our meetings, we tried to persuade young believers to stay away from Islamist movements, you are sacrificing yourselves for individuals whose only goal is to satisfy their personal ambitions, we repeated. They don't care about your work. They are cowards. Remember what Carker said, no matter what happens, he would never leave Tunisia. Yet, he was the first to flee as soon as the revolution failed, and El Tlilai did the same. One day, my friend Monir, whom I had met in prison, invited me for coffee. I have a surprise for you, he said. I've arranged a meeting with the girl I told you about. I rushed to the meeting, dressed in my best shirt. When I saw the young woman sitting next to Monir, I decided instantly to make her my bride. I spent the afternoon with her. In the evening, I asked her to marry me. This eagerness might seem strange, but I needed to compensate for the emotional void created by my family's rejection. A few days later, she accepted the marriage proposal. On May 28, 1988, we celebrated our union, and then we moved into my father's house in Ariana, where he lived alone. My marriage helped me stabilize and ignore the rumors that still circulated about me. Soon, I found a job as a sales agent at the Africa Hotel on Borguiba Avenue, in the heart of Tunis. The first few weeks there were happy. However, at the end of the probationary period, my employer asked me for a copy of my criminal record before hiring me permanently. Just when I was starting to believe that a normal life was still possible despite my past, my doubts resurfaced. The tortures I endured during my arrest had affected my mental balance. Deep down, I still believed I was guilty. Guilty to my country and my people, guilty to the Lord, guilty of plotting an insurrection that could have caused many deaths. I called my contact at the ministry several times to find a solution regarding this cursed criminal record, which surely contained my former involvement in Islamism, but he didn't answer or gave me excuses. He always found a reason to evade it. I saw no end to my dark thoughts. I was going through this ordeal alone, with no one's help. Everything was uncertain, hanging by a thread. Society, as is well known, is not very open to former inmates, especially ex-Islamists. My employer repeated his request. I wanted to buy some time, fearing that producing this document, which surely indicated my previous association with Islamism, would cost me my job. I kept my boss waiting for six months, and then, fed up, he fired me. I found myself without money and the responsibility of a family. This failure devastated me, and I felt rejected. In desperation, I requested my criminal record, which, ironically, was completely clean. I then went through very tough times. Without money, soon to be a family man, with no future in sight, surrounded by scoundrels who spent their time slandering me, my days passed under the weight of remorse and guilt. I searched for God everywhere but couldn't find Him anywhere. Moreover, my married life bored me, just as I was bored with being nothing, aspiring to nothing. Just a few months earlier, I belonged to a large family, admittedly a criminal one, but they provided me with shelter and took care of me completely. If I had stayed, I would undoubtedly have become a millionaire, I would have been one of the dignitaries of El Rasali with all the privileges that came with that caste. People would have respected me, rushed to seek my advice. At the age of 40, I would have become an adored patriarch. How far away all of that seemed now. Far away. Not so much. 
psychological fatigue, a backlash from my years of brainwashing in Tehran, of suspicion and humiliation, confused me. One day, my nerves gave way. Like a heroin addict deprived of artificial paradise for too long, I seriously considered relapsing, to become someone again, to regain the political status assigned to me, to reconnect with the thrill of danger, to no longer be a solitary beast hunted down, I decided to reconnect with El Rasali. Many examples show the complexity of the violent syndrome, how difficult it is to cure oneself of this ailment that functions like intoxication, just like a drug. Part of me remained aware that it was heresy, I was heading back to the hell of terrorism, this time with full knowledge. After successfully leaving that bloody sect, I was preparing to jump back into the lion's den. In an attempt to ease my conscience, I settled on the following pretext, did the Rasali leaders know about the lax behavior of their base's leaders? Maybe not, after all. In any case, I absolutely had to check this point. Although this decision may seem inconsistent to those who have followed this story, it should be noted that I had hardly any other choice. Living was like a Chinese puzzle for me. I was rejected everywhere, my future was bleak. Moreover, the Rasala certainly hadn't forgotten me. They would soon order my execution, if it hadn't already happened. At least, by going to meet them, I retained a chance at redemption. In Syria in the clutches of El Rasali. A short while later, I retrieved my new passport and immediately left Tunisia heading for Syria, defying death, whether in the form of a knife in the back or a gunshot to the head. I landed in Damascus. I made my way through the city to reach the neighborhood of El Sayyid Zainab, where El Sheikh Abu Mustafa lived. He was a religious scholar who had been my teacher at El Kaim school, and I appreciated him for his kindness. I had no doubt about his generosity. Indeed, he welcomed me with open arms. He didn't seem to be aware of the dispute between the network and me, or at least, he didn't mention it. At forty years old, dressed in religious attire, Abu Mustafa was a renowned Shiite pacifist. He belonged to the network but was unaware of its criminal activities, as everyone made sure to hide the truth from him. To Abu Mustafa, El Rasali was a charitable religious movement. In fact, like many others, he was the subject of extensive manipulation by the Rasalis, who used his pacifism as a facade. In certain circles, the network boasted having this honorable personality among its members. I called my wife to reassure her. Then, having settled in, I went back to my studies in religious school after a week, at the new Maghrib school under the guidance of one of the greatest Shiite scholars, El Sayyid El Tib Tabai, a Syrian of Iraqi origin. The serum of extremist ideology flowed through my veins once again. The Risali leaders would soon be informed of my presence in their stronghold. From then on, how would they come to meet me? Would I have the courage to express my true thoughts to them? In any case, I was ready to face them. With each passing day, I regained hope. Life at the school seemed promising. I was provided for and taken care of. Abu Mustafa allowed me to bring my wife, who had given birth to a little girl on April 3, 1989. When she arrived at the airport, I gave her a headscarf to cover her head and blend into the crowd, then I embraced my child. Thanks to Abu Mustafa's financial support, we rented an apartment where we lived modestly but happily. I had my daughter baptized by my teacher, El Tib Tabai, in the Zainab Mausoleum, and I took her name from there. During the ceremony, the religious scholar placed a bit of El Hussein, son of Ali, soil in my child's mouth, poured water on her head, and recited some Quranic verses. In short, I was at peace. I even reproached myself for my poor attitude towards the Rasalis. I thought I had been mistaken about them. Poor me. My naivety, which had sometimes saved me from madness, had now completely misled me. How could I hope to change the behavior of these bloodthirsty monsters? My ambition was akin to crucifixion. One morning, as I was heading to school, I witnessed a peculiar sight, there was not a soul outside. 
The wind whistled through the streets, lifting dust from the sidewalks. Silence enveloped everything, and the light cast an eerie glow on the walls. Did this atmosphere herald the return of God to Earth? Had a nuclear war just been unleashed? I froze for a moment and then, panicked, I ran back to my apartment. I knocked on my neighbor's door. The man appeared, his face in tears. What's happening? I asked, my stomach tied in knots. Imam Komiani has died. I went to the mausoleum where El Tib Tabai had baptized my daughter just a few days earlier. People were weeping, lamenting, some even fainted. All hearts seemed to have joined in solemn communion. I too broke into tears. The mourning continued for a whole week. Schools, offices, and government agencies were all closed, and black flags were lowered everywhere. Syria behaved as if it were Iran's little sister. Shortly after, Abu Mustafa informed me of the arrival in Damascus of a delegation from the network, consisting of Mohammed Fauzi in El Sheikh Ahmed, Hassan El Safar's brother, and apprehension once again took hold of me. The network's approach was slow. They started sending me cryptic messages, Dear Karim, has Tunisia been profitable for you? A few days later, I was told, We think about you. Then another time, Death is just a passage. And the next day, what does the smile of a wounded man hide? How should I interpret these little words of love? After a few days of this regime, silence fell again. The network gave me no sign of life for more than a week. The Risalas were playing with my nerves. The game was just beginning. Finally, my last secret tutor at El Quaim School and one of the leaders of the new Maghrib school, El Maghribi Jamal, a Moroccan who despised me, let me know through an intermediary that I would be interrogated. I chose to plead guilty. I wrote a report in which I admitted to all the accusations against me. In conclusion, I requested the establishment of a tribunal at El Quaim School, composed of all the Rasali leaders, with Hedi El Mudarisai as the supreme judge. I would come before this court to present my defense. In fact, I was trying to create an exceptional event that could later set a precedent for my comrades. I hoped to be able to reveal during this plenary meeting the dirty tricks and atrocities I had witnessed, in order to provoke an internal confrontation. I wanted to somehow foment a coup in the realm of these specialists in manipulation. On paper, the operation seemed clever. A good countermove, indeed. But once again, my naivety betrayed me. As expected, the leaders refused to go along with such a procedure. Worse, Hassan El Safar's brother reported the following to me, Hedi El Mudarisai has no trust in you. From the first days of your arrival here, he considered you a traitor. He ordered your execution. It's a chance for you that this order has not yet been carried out. Another person told me, if you want to be judged, it will be done in a small committee, and your judge will be El Sheikh Ahmed. In that case, I request to be permanently excluded from the network. For the moment, I was still alive, but in what state? From then on, my wife and I felt the flames of hell approaching us a hundredfold. At night, someone would knock on our door to wake us up. I would get up, but there was no one there. This happened several times. Then this persecution stopped, only to be replaced by another of the same kind but more insidious, we would hear people walking on the roof of the apartment, making mournful moans, and creating all sorts of strange noises, as if it were a black mass. My wife was terrified, and our baby couldn't sleep. Later, we received death threats through third parties. As I resisted, the telephone was cut off, then the water and electricity, as the building belonged to the network. My wife and I found ourselves on the streets, with no resources. As a last resort, I requested a meeting with Hassan El Safar, but I learned that he wanted nothing to do with me and had already issued orders concerning me. I appealed to the Rasalis once more. My wife and daughter are innocent. Give them food. You can all die of hunger. 
In a matter of days, we sank into poverty once and for all. Our marriage fell into total degradation, forced to beg near the Zainab mausoleum. We were hungry and thirsty, living in filth amid the cries of our baby. In addition to destitution, fear gnawed at us. I stayed awake day and night, trying to spot in the crowd the one who would come to slaughter us. We lived in horror. I never would have imagined how fear could reduce a person to a pleading worm. My throat was perpetually constricted, my legs shaky, my pulse sometimes slowed, sometimes racing. The harassment by the Rasalis took on new forms each time. So-called protectors would give us food. Spoiled. Firecrackers were set off in the middle of the night just steps from our baby. We were insulted, pelted with projectiles. I became so thin that I could barely walk. My wife and daughter cried all day long. Their cries pierced my brain like red-hot needles. They were going to die before my eyes, a terrible torture. I felt so guilty. And still, these cries that tore at my heart, pounded my soul, and reminded me of my wrongs. Why wouldn't death come to take me away so that this torment would finally end? I tried to sell my child's stroller. With the money I could collect, I could buy two bus tickets and reach Istanbul. A passerby offered me a hundred pounds for the stroller, eight times less than its value. I refused to sell off the only semblance of comfort that remained for my wife and daughter. Fortunately, unlike the Saudis, the Iraqi residents were generous, women from the neighborhood, although impoverished themselves, gathered five hundred pounds and gave them to my wife without expecting anything in return. We were going to be able to leave, to escape death. Unfortunately, fate was against us. The travel agency had no available tickets for a week. Then, the next day, I received the following message, we give you 48 hours to leave Syria, or you will be eliminated. I didn't tell my wife, but this time, the end was near. Around us, the crowd moved slowly, mothers strolled with their children, life went on. Without us. I need to pray, I thought, looking up at the sky. That's when the faces of my family came back to my memory. How foolish I had been to leave. There was only one thing left to do. I got up and told my wife to follow me. Like a sleepwalker, I cradled my little Zeneb in my arms and headed to the United Nations office, determined to tell my story and seek help. Sorry, sir, we only deal with Palestinians and Lebanese, the official told me. So, what can I do? I asked, revolted. Ask to meet with the head of human rights at the French embassy. We went to the French embassy, where we were warmly received. The senior official took my confession very seriously and eventually offered to repatriate my family to Tunisia. In the meantime, he provided us with accommodation. That's how we managed to escape death, in the heart of the Arab world, a Frenchman lent us a hand. On July 23, 1989, while my wife waited a few more days in Damascus for a direct flight to Tunis, I landed in Paris. At the airport, two policemen welcomed me and took me to a hotel not far from the Eiffel Tower. Do you have any important information to provide us regarding terrorism? One of them asked me. Yes. Don't worry, everything will be fine. Rest up, we will contact you in a few days. Let your beard grow to avoid being recognized. Wait a while before contacting your family. Don't tell them we intervened. You can say you returned from Syria by land. On the day of Eid, I rang the doorbell at my mother's house, where she had just moved to in Bagnolet. What a surprise for my mother. What a surprise also for Sulla Karkar and Samira, who were present that day. My brother-in-law was left speechless. Yes, I was still alive. And the struggle was just beginning. In the following days, I re-established communication with my sister. After Sulla Karkar arrived in France, Samira had settled with the children in Oban near Paris. 
Although she was still with her husband and had joined him with their six children, she was timidly becoming aware of certain realities. She had abandoned Islam after an overdose of Islamism. Now, all she aspired to was to hear no more about Orthodox Islam or politics. She continued her quest for truth individually, without resorting to any brainwashing dogma. When I had regained my strength, I went to see Abu Ahmed, the one who had recruited me. Karim, my brother. He exclaimed. I was less tender. Do you want to convey a message from me to the network? Of course, but. Karim Labidi declares war on the Rasalis. Forget about them and start a new life. How could I forget those who destroyed my life and who are also destroying the future of thousands of young people? They are many, Karim. You are alone. One man can defeat an entire army if Allah is with him. But Allah is also with them. What are you talking about? If these monsters are promised paradise, then I'd much prefer to join the devil and hell than end up with them. They let my wife and child starve to death before my eyes. And they call themselves Muslims. It's enough to disgust you with Islam. I poured out my heart with rage, my eyes bulging. I had never experienced such anger. My friend didn't know how to calm me down. Having not followed the same path as me, he couldn't understand. It's true, they acted very badly, Abu Ahmed replied. But to err is human. They're not human, they're demons. Listen, it's a misunderstanding. I can still fix things. I'd like to reconcile you with them. Let me handle it. That's out of the question. The harm is irreparable. Abu Ahmed had to face the facts, I had finally and definitively crossed over to the other side. He had to stop meeting me under pressure from the Rasalis, as he moved shortly afterward, and we never saw each other again. I confessed to the French intelligence officials everything I knew about the El Risali network, including the plan of destruction that these fanatical terrorists had prepared for the years 1999 to 2011, of which I had learned just before my imprisonment in 1987. So that the reader can gauge the horror that hangs over our heads if we continue to turn a blind eye, here is a summary. During the Ramadan month in 1999, the network would officially announce to the religious elite the imminent return of Imam el Mehdi. The march toward international revolution would be meticulously organized. Russia would fall into chaos, leaving the United States as the world's great masters. The transport of weapons to the USA and European countries would be renewed, especially through the Franco Spanish, Franco German, and Scandinavian borders. From 1999 to 2004, the network planned to weaken most Arab Islamic countries in Saudi disorder, fear, and division in the West. They would discreetly support far-right and neo-Nazi parties, as well as Basque, Corsican, and Irish nationalism, to incite civil war. The plan also included circulating significant quantities of hard drugs in Western countries to destroy the family unit. This would overwhelm politicians, and Muslim communities would have a free hand to organize rebellion. A wave of major attacks would occur. Orders, fatwas, would fall in the suburbs and elsewhere, and uprooted young Muslims, promised paradise by the zealots, would commit constant murders. Various forms of terrorist actions would be implemented, including the use of bladed weapons. The key dates of this plan, some of which have been revised since, were as follows, between 1992 and 1999, trigger a possible change in Iran and ensure the weakening of as many Arab Islamic countries as possible, Algeria, Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Morocco, Afghanistan, the five Russian Islamic countries, Yemen, Pakistan, Iraq, and the new internal revolution in Iran. From 1999 to 2011, practice a policy of alliance among all Islamic countries while destabilizing the West with internal and external strikes. In 2011, war against the Westerners would be officially declared. This is when those preparing the return of Imam el Mehdi to unite the masses would appear. They would lead hostilities for several years until they dominated the entire world. 
All of this was merely a prelude to the reincarnation, El Raja, of the other eleven infallible imams around the year 2299. I explained as clearly as possible to the French police officers how the threat posed by this terrorist sect remained more present than ever over France and Europe. I didn't hesitate to express my opinion that Islamists should not be treated as religious figures but as pure criminals. However, they responded that, lacking evidence, they couldn't consider arresting these wrongdoers before they acted, which seemed to me like an admission of powerlessness. They suggested that I become an informant for them, offering payment for my services within international terrorism networks. I refused. As I mentioned, I no longer wanted to depend on anyone. However, I agreed to collaborate with French intelligence services and provided them with multiple pieces of information. I was also in contact with Belgian police, who appeared to take my account very seriously. I pointed out cultural centers and secret bases of Islamists, as well as the names of their leaders. During that time, I resumed writing my confession, which I had started during my imprisonment, so that my experience would not disappear with me. During the year I spent in Paris, I used all my leisure moments to write. I was driven by the need to put it all on paper. It was stronger than me, it had to come out, to come into the light. I had to get rid of it. Return to Origins and Spiritual Quest My wife had chosen to stay in Tunis. While I was still in Paris, she gave birth to a boy named Hausam. At the age of 24, it was time for me to return to the reality of men and build something solid. I decided to wipe the slate clean of the past and start over. I gathered the manuscript in which I had written in Arabic the account of my struggle with Islamism, and I entrusted it to Samia, my fifth sister, who was studying sociology and social and political economics in Paris. She agreed to translate it into French and publish it under her name. Since she needed an expert to turn to if necessary, I gave her the contact information for Inspector Bachucha, whose extensive knowledge and dedication to the fight against Islamist movements I admired. In August 1990, I traveled to Spain to reach Tunis via Morocco and Algeria. In Spain, I met a Moroccan with whom I began a beautiful and promising friendship. My new friend invited me to Meknes, and I stayed there for some time, enjoying the sun and the relaxed lifestyle, finally feeling at ease. After this refreshing break, I returned to Tunisia by train. Traveling by rail allowed me to observe the catastrophic situation in Algeria. In Tunis, I faced the harsh reality, the Tunisian intelligence services didn't trust me since I had returned from Syria, and I was constantly under surveillance, summoned to the Ministry of Interior for routine interrogations. This situation became unbearable for me. The following summer, as the Gulf War raged on, I decided to turn my back on the evils of political Islam and embarked on a journey through Berber countries. This escape from the complexities of the world lasted for several months, I traveled along the southern coast of Tunisia, then crossed Algeria and Morocco from south to north before returning to Tunisia through northern Algeria. I made this journey using local transportation and by foot, with almost no money, like a vagabond but infinitely rich in my freedom of movement. Upon returning to Tunis, I stayed with my mother-in-law for a few months before finding a small apartment to rent, where I intended to resume a normal life. However, I felt unsafe in Tunisia. Whenever an Islamist was arrested, I was asked if I knew them and what I knew about them. Sometimes, I was detained just to provide information. On top of that, I always feared potential revenge from either the network or my brother-in-law's followers. The idea grew within me to start anew in a place where no one knew me. I chose Morocco and decided to settle in Agadir. I did so on January 27, 1992, without hesitation, boarding the first train. I reached Anaba in northeastern Algeria, from where I planned to enter Morocco by road. When my bus left Anaba on January 29th, I heard on the radio that President Boudiaf had just been assassinated while giving a speech in Anaba itself. All the passengers were shocked, and perhaps I was even more so, secretly. I felt that horror was following in my footsteps. 
For me, it was a sign that I needed to find inner peace, rid myself of my demons definitively, and progress in spirituality to rediscover a connection with God through Sufism. The journey took several weeks, passing through various Moroccan cities. When I arrived in Marrakesh, I had spent all my savings, and I had nothing left but the clothes on my back. I had to sell my belongings to buy a bus ticket to Agadir. I arrived there at night with nothing but the clothes I was wearing. The following months were miserable. With no money and no job, I wandered the streets of Agadir, surviving only on the charity of passers-by. I remained in this situation for several months. Life had lost its meaning for me, and I lived day by day among beggars and the forsaken, pursued by the townspeople and the police. In the depths of this initiatory fading, I experienced what it means to be alone, with nothing to expect in this world but a revelation from heaven. However, during my dreamlike visions, a profound contemplation on the question of God began to take shape, God in the absolute sense, no longer the God whom Muslims call Allah. I eventually retreated to the hinterlands, primarily in Inezgain, Kaira, Pergola, the suburbs of Agadir. The Agadir region in southwestern Morocco is poor and agricultural, predominantly inhabited by an Amazigh population with an unwelcoming demeanor towards non-Amazigh individuals. It was challenging for anyone who wasn't Amazigh to engage in profitable activities there. However, one day in Inezgain, a small town adjacent to Agadir in the Sus Valley, a man at a market offered me work in the fruit and vegetable trade. As our rapport grew stronger, we decided to establish a company in wholesale trading. The business started to take shape in early 1993, my new friend handled the commercial relationships, while I managed the accounting and dealt with administrative issues. From there, I was able to begin documenting my spiritual experiences. I met a young man from the city of Tarudent with whom I became friends. He had delicate features, a slender build, clear eyes, and an open mind. He became more than a friend, he became a confidant ready to help and accompany me in my quest. Thanks to this friendship, I gradually discovered the Sus Valley, its beauty, and its people. My friend introduced me to pious Sufis who lived in the mountains and remote regions. I was able to spend time with them and learned a lot about life and their worldview. It was a very enriching experience that lasted nearly four years and freed me from preconceived and inherited notions. During those four years, I dedicated myself to my spiritual quest, with my commercial activities merely serving as a cover and a means of sustenance. My thirst for deepening my spiritual knowledge continued to grow. I wanted to unravel the mysteries that were kept beyond the reach of ordinary mortals. I sought contact with every person I knew or believed had spiritual knowledge in the region. I even approached eccentric old men at the markets who served as healers or miracle workers, as well as sellers of medicinal plants. I sought to learn their knowledge. Sometimes, I offered to be their student, and at times, I accepted being a humble servant under their guidance. In this very secretive field of folk tradition infused with magic, I learned a great deal. Of course, I purchased every old or recent book I could find that discussed Sufism and mysticism. I wrote tirelessly, living modestly, eating little, and immersed in tranquility. Gradually, the foundations of a work that went beyond mere confession began to take shape in my mind. I delved into the development of an essay that started not from sacred texts but from number theory. I devised a mathematical system that determined the existence or absence of divine nature. What might seem at least fanciful out of context was based on strict deduction from my experience. In my thirtieth year, I gradually freed myself from all the constraints that had hindered my personal growth. I became allergic to all religions, sects, or political affiliations from any side. I had only one idea left, to become myself and nothing else. Realizing that it was time to normalize a situation that had become unsustainable, I decided to settle permanently in Morocco. To do so, I needed to obtain my residence card. In November 1996, I went to the Tunisian consulate in Rabat to request a passport renewal. Do you have your residence card? 
asked the Tunisian official. Of course not. In that case, I cannot renew your passport. But this is absurd. You know very well that I cannot obtain a residence card without a valid passport. Sorry, but that's the law. Please be understanding, I continued. Listen, I might be able to do something for you. I'll talk to my supervisor. Come back to see me in a few days. I left the consulate with an indescribable anxiety. Since I had arrived in Morocco, I hadn't mentioned my past to anyone. I lived like an ordinary person, a simple Muslim without an Islamist past. I was known as something of a mystic, and many sought my advice. Suddenly, memories of my troubles in Islamist terrorism resurfaced. The old traumas were far from erased, and their burning blades returned to irritate my nerves. Is the Tunisian state seeking new charges against me? In a panic, I presented myself at the Inezgain police station without really understanding why. The commissioner received me, all smiles and full of benevolence. Your situation is not simple, he said. But rest assured, I am ready to help you. Really? You've been working in Morocco for several years now. You have a job and don't bother anyone. We should be able to obtain an exception and give you a residence card within a reasonable time. I'll discuss it with my superiors tomorrow. At the consulate, they told me the same thing. You see, the problem will be resolved quickly. I left the police station feeling just as uneasy. Upon returning to the fleeting calm of my home, I reflected at length. I had a friend who had many connections and a well-paying job in a company. I had done him many favors, and he had done the same for me. However, he knew nothing about my past, I had only ever discussed my professional experience with my Amazigh friends. I convinced myself that I needed to tell him everything to get his opinion. I went to see him, invited him to lunch, and told him I needed to talk to him. He readily agreed to listen. We shared the midday meal. Amicably, almost jokingly, I began to tell him about my past. My friend was astonished, to say the least. In the end, I felt that he was afraid of me without wanting to show it. He advised me to tell everything to the police. I have never seen him since. On December 5, 1996, I was invited to the police station, where the commissioner welcomed me with great joviality. The management has ordered me to treat you with care. Wasn't I right to be optimistic? Perhaps. Without being able to explain it to myself, I felt uneasy. There was a perverse tone in this man's voice, as if the friend to whom I had revealed my past had come to see him the day before and told him everything, which must have indeed happened. I began to regret getting involved with the local police and confiding in my friend. But what else could I do? I absolutely needed my residence card to regularize my situation. Everything happened quickly on Wednesday, December 20th. While I was quietly at home in Pergola, I heard knocks on the door. I didn't have time to react before two police officers burst into the room, grabbed me, and put handcuffs on me. By what right are you doing this? I shouted. Shut up, you filthy traitor. The officers searched the house and confiscated my manuscripts and anything else they deemed valuable, including money. Then they put me in a large car. They blindfolded me so I couldn't see the road. I just knew we were headed towards Rabat. The violence with which I had been arrested made me fear the worst. This time, I might not make it out alive. The vehicle drove for about three quarters of an hour before stopping. When they made me get out of the car, I smelled the sea. The place was calm, with the sound of birds singing and the trickle of water jets. Where was I? The police officers pushed me in the direction they wanted me to go. I stumbled. Immediately, I received kicks in the back. Come on, move, vermin. I got up and walked hesitantly, afraid of losing my balance again. We entered a building. I had the impression of walking through endless corridors. 
I climbed a staircase. A door creaked. Get in there. They shouted at me. I took a few steps into what seemed to be a room. The police officers first made me sit on a bed before tying me to a chair. Then nothing. Only silence, a heavy silence that smelled of death. Outside, there was no noise except for the sound of a fountain or an automatic sprinkler. Obviously, I was being held captive in an imposing residence. Bound, blindfolded, I remained in the same position for over half an hour, my heart pounding, my shirt soaked in sweat, dreading the blow from a baton that was about to come. After this dreadful wait, the door reopened. A man approached. Perhaps trying to impress me even more, he started by slapping me. Who are you? Who do you work for? I don't work for anyone. I'm an honest worker who wants to establish himself in your country. Liar. My tormentor shouted, punching me in the stomach. His breath reeked of alcohol. My God. This man was completely drunk, he had lost his reason, he was going to kill me. Then, you confess, and we'll finish it. Yelled my torturer, pulling my hair at the temple. I told the truth. I whimpered. You continue to lie. Scumbag. We verified your statements, you're a spy for the Tunisian government. It's not what you think. I used to belong to an international terrorist network based in Iran. But I realized I was wrong. I left it. Since then, I've been trying to rebuild my life. I don't depend on anyone, and I want to remain free. Then why did you flee Tunisia? My life was in danger there. Islamist terrorists want me dead. I needed to hide somewhere to start over. My tormentor began to beat me even more vigorously. Then another man who hadn't shown himself until now began torturing me in turn. While threatening to burn me with his cigarette butt, he kept hitting me with the flat of his hand, apparently to leave fewer traces. A true professional in tough interrogations, he combined physical violence with psychological torment with ruthless precision. The two men left the room before returning a little later to question me again. This must have repeated about twenty times. Blindfolded, hands and feet in handcuffs, I suffered immensely. I spent the night writhing in pain. The next day, the man with the alcohol-laden breath continued to interrogate me. The boss doesn't believe your story, he said. Morocco can't accept atheists like you. Ben Ali is in the same boat. We know he doesn't observe Ramadan fasting. Besides, all the political leaders in your country are dogs, sellouts, infidels. You're a spy sent by Ben Ali's government to track down Tunisian Islamists who are political refugees here. Are you finally going to confess? It's not true. If I were the spy you claim, why would I risk contacting the Moroccan police? To infiltrate us better. Do you take me for a fool or what? The writings we found at your place are unequivocal, you want to distort religion. You're an enemy of Islam, just like Ben Ali and his gang. If you were a Tunisian Islamist, we would have given you your residence papers. I'm telling you I'm not a spy. And, thank God, I'm no longer an Islamist. I'll make you an honest proposal, you agree to work for Morocco, and I'll give you your papers immediately. Not a chance. I am a free man. I repeat, I don't work for anyone. I'd prefer to die. Ah, before you die, you'll experience hell, believe me. Insulted, tortured, I fell into a state close to a coma after three weeks of this treatment. When I came to, my body was in agony. I felt my face disfigured, my eyes swollen, dried blood on my mouth. Daylight blinded me, they had removed my blindfold. Gradually, I discovered the walls of my prison, quite different from what I had known before. I was in a luxurious room. Across from me, on a table covered with an embroidered tablecloth, was a plate of food. 
From the open window came the scent of flowers and the smell of the sea. What had happened? Why this change in treatment? Leaning on the edge of the bed, I sat up with great difficulty. Before me stood a man wearing a mask, like those puppets that became popular in French television satire shows. Beside him, an individual with a moon-shaped face was sitting in an armchair, dressed in traditional religious attire. In the background of the room, I discerned a third person dressed in civilian clothes. So, you've regained your strength? Asked the masked man. I didn't answer. His voice was the same as that of my tormentor from the previous days, the one the alcoholic called Sidna, the boss. But who were the other two characters? The religious man rose slowly and approached the bed. A powerful gleam emanated from his eyes. I specialize in religious matters, young man. And the other person is a psychiatrist. Do you think I'm insane? I asked, struggling. Do you write the manuscripts we found at your place in Pergola? The religious man asked. Yes. Where do these writings come from? Only from me. I don't believe you. These writings are much too learned for someone your age. If I really reveal their source to you, you won't believe me. In Morocco, we take supernatural phenomena very seriously, the religious man replied. Speak openly. I receive these ideas from the wise people I meet. I learn from them what they know. Then, based on what I understand, I give free rein to my pen. At these words, the religious man widened his eyes and fell silent. Do you have any questions to ask him? The masked man said, addressing the psychiatrist, who had not moved from the back of the room. No, none, the psychiatrist replied. As they prepared to leave the cell, I noticed depigmentation spots on the hands of the masked man. I later understood that it was Idris El Basri, the Minister of the Interior under King Hassan II himself. Change of Tactics After this exchange, I was treated better. They gave me what I wanted while still keeping me confined to my room. From the window, I could see an immense garden stretching as far as the eye could see. Only an extremely wealthy man could maintain such a property. Over the next four days, the masked man continued his interrogation. This time, my account of my Islamist past in Iran was taken very seriously. Do you know these men? He asked, handing me several photos. Yes, some of them. That one is said El Mausab, the Rissalist leader in Madrid. This one, Sheikh Adif, is his brother, and Sheikh Jamal, responsible for Morocco, is the brother of the latter. At first glance, the photos appeared to have been taken recently, except for Sheikh Jamal's. About ten days later, blindfolded, I was taken to the central police station in Rabat. Locked in a cell, sleeping on the floor, I plunged back into the misery of incarceration for over two weeks. I endured the same fate as the undocumented immigrants I shared the cell with. To the Moroccan authorities, I had to be treated as an illegal immigrant so as not to arouse suspicion. On Wednesday, January 8, 1997, the commissioner called me into his office and told me that I would be sent back to Tunis. I would be escorted to Agadir to retrieve my personal belongings. Then, would board a flight from Casablanca. On Thursday, January 9, 1997, two police officers took me out of my cell and handcuffed me. I had been told that I would be able to retrieve my belongings, but it was a lie. I found myself at the airport, where I was handed over to officers who, after routine procedures, put me on a plane heading to Mauritania. The plane stopped for a few hours in Nouakchott and then resumed its flight to Tunisia. I arrived in Tunis on the night of January 9 to 10, 1997, with nothing more than the jeans I was wearing at my arrest, a torn shirt, and a single plastic sandal on my right foot. But the most important thing was that I was safe and sound. I was back home, and life could regain its course. I could hardly imagine experiencing another great misfortune in my life after this.
return to the realities of the modern world. What had become of my parents? After years of arguments, separations, and false reconciliations, they had finally remarried, each maintaining their independence. My father had spent a period in France with my mother, but he couldn't endure Parisian life. He was living in Ariana. As for my mother, she still lived in France in her house in Bagnolet. After settling in with my father and regaining my strength, I was able to see my children, who came to the house periodically. My wife had given birth to our third child, a boy named Mehdi Hedi, who was now four years old. We mutually agreed to initiate divorce proceedings, which we obtained after a few months. The entire family had gradually but surely distanced themselves from Islamism. Awareness had penetrated our minds after that sad experience that had shaken each of us. Everyone was working, more or less, to thwart the irresistible rise of political Islam. On September 1, 1997, the first edition of my book, translated into French and signed by my sister Samia, appeared in bookstores under the title, Karim, Mon Frere Exintegrist Terrorist, to be honest, I didn't read it upon its release because I didn't want to relive those memories. I trusted Samia. Nevertheless, I was unhappy with the title. I told her that the title was not accurate because I had never been a fundamentalist or a terrorist, just a convinced Islamist who believed that Islam was the only good way of life. My sister assured me that it didn't matter, it was just for marketing. This first-hand account from inside a family and a Shiite Islamist sect from the international Islamist movement was groundbreaking. Despite the release of The Yan Payat Affair, which had shaken the publishing house and occupied minds for a while, the book found its way into Islamist circles, which were tracking any information in this area. Shortly before the expiration of the statute of limitations for defamation, allowing for a lawsuit, Sulla Carker attacked the book and the publisher Flumaria from his place of house arrest in Digny Les Bains. I had to travel to France to testify in court. After losing the case in the first instance, we eventually won on appeal and in the court of cassation. I began to feel that I existed again. As in my childhood during the first days when it had happened, I advanced rapidly in my observations to make up for lost time. I realized how deeply Europe was plagued by Islamism. Of course, I knew that Islamist sects were determined to destroy freedom and democracy in the West, and we saw every day how freedom was shrinking in Europe out of fear of terrorist attacks intended to terrorize the population. I have already talked about this reality several times. We saw how Islamist political parties fled to Europe, grew there, and indoctrinated young people from immigrant backgrounds. Islamist terrorists clearly used Europe as a platform for propaganda. But it dismayed me to see the results materializing. In the 1990s, the use of the Internet as a means of expression began. Freedom of speech took a leap forward as censorship became practically impossible with the emergence of proxies, anonymity, and countless ways to express one's views without being recognized or prosecuted. I got my first computer in 1997 and then discovered an infinite virtual world. In those times, a few blogs and forums were discreetly beginning to criticize Islamism. This immediately led to a strong backlash. For years, there was a heated debate about the right to criticize Islam. Islamists accused those in favor of free criticism of all sorts of ills, racism, intolerance, and so on. Behind them, moderate Muslims protested against open criticism of Islam and its symbols, and the European left, under the guise of humanism, lamented that this criticism affected the sensibilities of a religious community. This, for show, debate came to an end after the September 11, 2001 attacks. There, everyone agreed that the application of Islam according to the Quran, the Hadiths, and the Sunnah was a crime against humanity. This launched an unprecedented wave of criticism of Islam on the Internet and in the media, leading to what is now called Islamophobia, to describe the fear of Islam and its criminal ideas. This criminalization put Islamophobia on par with anti-Semitism. This was the pretext that Islamists used to reject any criticism. Since then, anyone who criticizes Islam is labeled Islamophobic. 
It's important to know that accusing someone of being Islamophobic is, according to the Quran, a death threat. Indeed, it is clearly stated that those who fight against Allah and His Prophet, here in the form of criticism, their punishment is death. Here is Surah 5, Al-Ma'idah, the table spread, verse 33, the punishment of those who wage war against Allah and His Messenger, and strive with might and main for mischief through the land is, execution, or crucifixion, or the cutting off of hands and feet from opposite sides, or exile from the land, that is their disgrace in this world, and a heavy punishment is theirs in the hereafter. Therefore, this accusation should be taken seriously, and anyone who labels someone else as Islamophobic should be held accountable, as it is an indirect death threat. In those days, I would say, I am Islamophobic, and I am proud of it, it is an honorable and humane stance. I explained in an article that one should be Islamophobic because Islam is a murderous ideology that leads to crimes against humanity. However, as I look back on the nearly 20 years that I have been fighting Islam and Islamism, I now reflect that the success of this criminal ideology is not solely due to its actors, those who are supposed to fight it are partly responsible. Firstly, moderate Muslims denounce criticism of Islam but rarely its crimes. They position themselves as accusers but do not engage in self-criticism. However, it can be observed that, to this day, the sacred texts of Islam have not been purged of their criminal passages. Secondly, the European left claims to have humanitarian goals and pretends to defend Muslims. This is false. The discourse it presents to defend Muslims insidiously aims to keep these peoples dependent. It regards Muslims as welfare recipients and political wards. It denies them the basic right to exercise their own self-critique. For the left, they are intellectually minors. Thus, it displays a hidden racism towards them and keeps them in barbarism. Thirdly, other organizations, under the guise of humanism or for personal reasons, disrupt the debate and create discord instead of uniting their efforts to push back the danger. Among them, ex-Muslims who leave their loved ones subjected to submission and fanaticism, considering them as ignorant and incapable of thinking for themselves and evolving. These three groups, far from contributing to genuine work for freedom and respect for humanity, become accomplices of the Islamists instead of doing their utmost to limit their actions. They must prove to humanity that they are not complicit in crimes against humanity being committed before their eyes. They have an obligation to make an effort, if not to achieve a result. It's up to them to prove that they are implementing these means. Who is humane and civilized, and who respects others when we call on a Muslim to face the morbid reality of Islam? We do it out of fraternity, esteem, and respect for their discernment abilities, so they can know the truth and exercise their freedom in relation to Islam, unlike all these pseudo-humanitarians who treat them as mentally handicapped. Today, criticism of Islam encounters indifference from Muslims, as many of them do not feel concerned, for them, the Islam they practice is not the one being criticized. Indeed, the religion they practice is a substitute for true Islam. Despite this, they are part of the Ummah, they protect this Ummah, and, more seriously, they are a source of propaganda and constitute an important reservoir of people, money, and resources for the Islamist offensive. This must stop. They must choose, either be part of the Ummah or separate their personal belief from the sources of Islam. They can have their own God, but they must know that the Islam of Muhammad, the Quran, the Sunnah, and the Hadiths is an outdated and detestable history, a global danger for our time. Every passive Muslim must realize that they fuel Islamism and indirectly participate in crimes against humanity through the following behaviors. 1. The veil. The wearing of the Islamic veil is first and foremost an indirect support for Islamism, a kind of free advertising to assert the subjugation of women, the fact that they are subhuman under male authority. Everyone is free to wear traditional clothing or not, but not the Islamic veil, which carries a sexist connotation. A woman who wears it affirms her adherence to what Islam asserts, that women are evil and the source of evil, that they are not respectable, and therefore legitimately despised by men. The wearing of this veil should be prohibited in civilized countries because it perpetuates the inferior status of women. 
Any woman who wears it participates in crimes against women. 2. Circumcision and female genital mutilation. Male circumcision and female genital mutilation have well-known devastating effects, both physically and psychologically. These practices disrespect the rights of children and violate their bodies. Any mutilation of a child must be prohibited in civilized countries, and anyone defying this prohibition participates in this interference and crime against childhood. Those who wish to be circumcised should do so with full knowledge at their legal age. 3. Halal Meat Anyone in favor of halal meat, who buys it or permits it, contributes to animal cruelty and finances the rise of Islamism worldwide. If you look closely, the distribution networks of halal meat, especially in Europe, conceal hardcore Islamists who use the money to fund Islamist extremism. Therefore, halal meat must be boycotted. 4. Dual Nationality A Muslim cannot integrate if torn between two cultures and two countries. Taking on the nationality of a country entails embracing its culture, values, and principles. Consequently, the Muslim must choose a single and unique nation. If a North African wishes to retain their original nationality, it does not prevent them from obtaining a residence permit and living in Europe without necessarily becoming European. Any Muslim who claims dual nationality must deny their belonging to the Muslim nation and respect the values of their new country. They must, under no circumstances, impose their religious practices. How can we accept that a person holds French nationality if they themselves do not acknowledge French values? 5. The Prohibition of Apostasy We know that thousands of ex-Muslims hide their apostasy from their parents, who are supposedly moderate Muslims. I ask, if these parents are moderate, why do they reject their sons, daughters, brothers, and others' apostasy? If they do not accept it, it means they follow Islam that punishes apostates. Therefore, they are not moderate at all. The law must criminalize anyone who refuses apostasy or insults apostates, as anti-racism laws do. Apostates need protection from their intolerant and sometimes even criminal families. 6. The Prohibition of Criticizing Islam those who oppose criticizing Islam, the Quran, the Hadiths, or the life of Muhammad in the media concede to being against the criticism of any religion or ideology, which they nevertheless do not refrain from. This hypocrisy is glaring. On the contrary, we must admit that any injunction can be examined and debated. We particularly assert the right to denounce texts that incite hatred, war, and murder, to proclaim that they contain retrogressive ideas, and to classify the Quran as a harmful book for humanity. 7. The Impunity of Activism in Mosques Mosques are places of propaganda, recruitment for future Islamists, and even criminals. These places of worship that manufacture bombs must be rigorously controlled and placed under state authority surveillance, including those who attend them, the speeches delivered there, and the income, often used for Islamization. These places must be restricted and declared to the municipality. Illegal mosques must be closed. 8. Hajj Agencies Hajj and Umrah agencies to the Muslim holy sites are money laundering bodies and vehicles for the spread of Islam. Anyone using these agencies indirectly contributes to the financing of Islamism. Therefore, these agencies must be monitored, controlled, and limited by the state. 9. Alms giving. Giving money is mandatory in Islam. In theory, it is to redirect surplus wealth to the needy. In practice, whether the annual Sunni one-tenth, Shiite twenty-one-hundredth, or almsgiving at the end of Ramadan, all the money collected is used to build mosques and promote Islamism. Anyone who donates money, even in good faith, participates in the spread of Islamism and its crimes against humanity. This vast scam must be exposed and prohibited. 10. Muslim Identity Claiming to be a Muslim and belonging to the Ummah means that you adhere to the values of Islam and the criminal laws brought by Islam. 
This is by default defining oneself as an enemy of civilization, progress, and science. To avoid participating in this disastrous denial, we must acknowledge that Islamic laws are outdated, that the Quran is merely a history book, and choose our own belief far from the criminal laws instigated by Orthodox Islam. In conclusion, anyone defending these ten practices contributes to Islamization, which means the destruction of humanistic values. Those who seek progress and evolution must abandon these practices, and they will be welcome in civilized society. As for those who wish to follow Orthodox Islam, they should go to a country where this form of Islam is practiced and not impose it on others. Then, we can find a national destiny of which we can be proud as Tunisians, Moroccans, Algerians, French, or any other nationality. I believe this is clear enough, the goal of Islamists is to implement Allah's law by any means, physical and intellectual terrorism, legal and illegal methods. They are also willing to use humanistic principles to destroy humanistic achievements. It is urgent to limit the Islamization of youth, who benefit from these achievements in Europe, and mobilize them against Islamist interference ready to destroy them. Objectively, everyone is involved in one way or another. We all directly or indirectly participate in the spread of this scourge, and we are responsible to varying degrees following the logic of those who sow the wind reap the whirlwind. The United States of America now positions itself as a leader against terrorism, but it was the first to finance and host Islamic terrorist personalities and groups when they were a weapon against the former USSR. Europe claims to be free and democratic, but it has hosted Islamic political figures convicted in their countries for crimes against the people. By offering them asylum, it allowed them to move freely and speak on behalf of human rights. The results speak for themselves. Most other countries behave as passive spectators, like people watching their neighbor's house burn without doing anything until the fire reaches their own. Self-interest is their motto. They forget that in today's world, they can be affected without being directly targeted. No country is isolated anymore. The smallest event has consequences worldwide. Muslim countries still believe they are in the time of Muhammad. They live with the Quran and the Hadiths. Islam governs every action. Gulf state magnates finance Quranic schools and so-called humanitarian organizations in former USSR countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Malaysia, Indonesia, using it as a pretext to invest in economic development. They do not do this for God but to have an army at their command through the brainwashing of young beneficiaries. Among the Arab countries, those in the Gulf are the leaders. The political establishment supported by the USA keeps the people in ignorance by providing them with an education based on Wahhabi Islam, one of the most Salafist sects of Islam. As long as an Arab is not affected, they don't care about the world's misfortunes. Some countries live under terrifying dictatorships, like Syria. Others have controlled freedom. Fearing that Islamists will seize power, they don't allow anyone to speak out. They believe they can control things by creating a ministry of religious affairs and broadcasting the call to prayer on TV. In reality, they do what the Islamists want, even though the Islamists do not consider them legitimate. They prove incapable of establishing constructive dialogue, leading to the division these countries are experiencing. The wealthy in the Arab Muslim world fund terrorists, either out of fear or to seek forgiveness for their sins. They are made to believe that God will forgive them if they act this way. The rich from the rest of the world indulge in consumer goods, preferring to forget that everything can be destroyed in a terrorist attack. Free thinkers in the Western world, who are mostly individualistic, rarely support their counterparts in Arab Muslim countries, even morally. The latter are the black sheep of society. If their government doesn't silence them, the Islamists take care of it with fatwas. They end up either staying silent, hiding, or being killed. The global population without Islamic culture swallows the manipulative discourse of Islamists. The peoples of the Arab Muslim world live in poverty, endure oppression, and languish in ignorance. They are forced to become soldiers of Allah to access food, self-esteem, and paradise.
The last culprits are humanitarian organizations and the media, press, radio, TV, which support Islamists by publishing their books, putting them in the spotlight and turning them into media personalities. Terrorist attacks also receive extensive publicity. In contrast, free thinkers in the Arab Muslim world are largely ignored. It turns out that terrorism feeds on our weaknesses, and everyone bears some responsibility for what we are experiencing today. The populist shift parallel to the terrorist wave is favored by the vicissitudes of international politics and behind it by major powers who exploit the situation to serve their own interests. All of this contributes to global insecurity. But it's not too late to correct our mistakes. With a clear awareness of the danger, every state must optimize its legislative apparatus, and every individual or organization must contribute to the general awareness. This is the responsibility of each and every one of us. From abandoning the idea of God to atheism. I can say that, upon my return from Morocco, I had left Islam. I no longer believed in the God of Islam, I was no longer a Sufi. After deep reflection, I had decided to believe only in my own God, the one who resided deep within me. Over the following months, my eyes were gradually opened. I was progressively discovering the extent of the deception called religion, imposed in the name of a supposed creator God, when in reality, it was a human creation. I eventually concluded that religion, whatever it may be, is a diabolical creation that hinders human progress and self-improvement. This lie that keeps individuals in bondage and under tutelage for life cannot be a divine work. In my view, it would rather be evidence of the existence of Satan. Of course, I kept this to myself because the idea of God clung to me, and I couldn't completely get rid of it. While renouncing dogma and religious control, I began to identify myself to my friends and family as a deist. I had come to the conviction that to eliminate Islamist evil, a widespread movement had to oppose it from within the Muslim community. My experience was just one example among millions of others. After my expulsion from Morocco, I tried to rebuild my life in order to better combat this evil with full awareness. It had become my primary reason for being. If I were still among the living, it was to devote myself to awakening the unaware masses to the danger of political Islam. In Paris, for several months, I participated with Samia in the creation of an association of former Orthodox Muslims called Daler's OUDICI Maze Ensemble, AMI. The basic objective was to mobilize people against the rise of extremism and terrorism. Our action was aimed at the Muslim community, where political Islam was causing the most damage. Faced with belligerent and extremist Muslims, we wanted to create open, generous, pacifist, and reformist Muslims, as well as agnostics, atheists, and converts. This association would have two poles, one in North Africa and the other in Europe, precisely in Paris and Tunis. It would bring together, without discrimination, all dogmas and modes of thought, Muslims, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, atheists, leftists, and rightists, as long as everyone had one idea in mind, to fight against terrorism and build peace in our societies. Already, we had invited all organizations to support our action unequivocally and without diplomatic courtesies, based on the following scheme, peace is a tremendous political opportunity. Nurturing our differences and fighting censorship is the best way to achieve peace. From elsewhere or from here but together, we can fight against the scourge of political Islam. On July 4, 1998, on the day of my younger brother's wedding in Paris, my mother was rushed to the emergency room after a cerebral incident that, after multiple tests, was found to be due to brain cancer. She passed away five months later at the age of 60 in the Ariana house, surrounded by loved ones, on December 8, 1998. Unfortunately, I was in Paris at the time. I immediately returned to attend the funeral. My mother's passing in just five months was a terrible shock for me. I had a hard time accepting the weakness and helplessness of human beings in the face of death. Feeling the need to turn to the imaginary to cope with this death, I embarked on writing a novel in which the protagonist, Mazel Azel, stopped believing in a possible divine existence. 
he understood that this was only a human creation, that humans had created God to reassure themselves and strive for a supreme ideal. God is a human dream that our ancestors tried to realize through the generations, but this dream has turned into a nightmare from which we find it difficult to awaken, was the subject of this mystical tale. My spiritual journey then led me to pure and unadulterated atheism. I dismissed all religious moral crutches. After years of questioning and tumultuous searches, I finally reached my equilibrium and my own philosophy. I was enraged, I picked up the phone to call a friend to console me. He began to speak to calm me down. He reminded me of distant years in my childhood, people recognized me for my piety and I prayed every day in the mosque. I memorized the Quran by heart and observed fasting day after day. In my adolescence, I traveled far and studied in Islamic schools to become a renowned imam and guide the lost. Teaching them your sacred word. In my youth, I wanted to prove to you my limitless love. My blood, I would offer to you. My body, I would sacrifice to meet you. And one day, unlike the others, my eyes opened and doubt overtook me. Now I am lost from you. Now I am free from you. I refuse to believe in you. You no longer exist for me. I refuse to prostrate myself again. I live my life as I see fit. You have no rights over me. I have forgotten all my past. I live the present as it should be and I will wait for the future. Until my death, I will confront you. It's my choice, and I will continue. Since then, life has become a fantastic stroke of luck for me, one to be fully cherished. I am now the master of myself, free to pursue what I deem right. I believe in the tangible, never again in imposed dogma. I've come to the idea that each of us is free to choose and follow the path that suits them best, in accordance with their nature, consciousness, and knowledge, without imposing our beliefs and principles on others. Humanism and pacifism allow for the exchange of ideas and knowledge peacefully, without conflict. Discussion and dialogue become an inexhaustible source of understanding where we can find answers to our questions. Everyone has their own truths, but the closer we come together through exchange, the better we can understand and make the right decisions. By listening to others, regardless of their origins, skin color, or beliefs, we eliminate ignorance, racism, and mistreatment, we combat hatred. Where humanism reigns, ideas can evolve, and the concept of the sacred shifts towards humanity and the earth that sustains life. For me, religion is not the exclusive domain of God, and certainly not the absolute truth for the human condition. I consider Buddha the most humane among the great figures in history because he understood that everything comes from us, independently of any divine intervention. We should believe in humanity, get to know it, and help it think for itself instead of stifling it with dogmas. Theological discourses are invented by humans to manipulate their fellow beings for the purpose of exploitation. Turning to the divine, an external entity whose existence or non-existence no one can prove, is the ultimate pretext for subjugating people. Yet, who makes an angel makes a beast. Religions created by human ingenuity have a more diabolical than divine effect. They regress humanity by preventing it from believing in itself. It seems to me that a god worthy of the name should watch over this world to make it better, deserving of honor, and not just self-proclaim as its creator. I cannot accept that a god would demand that I believe in him and make me his slave. Faced with the dishonesty of such control, I tend to do everything to break free from it. If this god existed, I would refuse to submit to him because, until proven otherwise, he would not deserve it. As a Gnostic, my Gnosis reduces God to absolute neutrality, making him a neutral zero, with no influence on our individual and collective existence. Nevertheless, this does not prevent me from respecting those who believe in God, as long as they do not seek to impose their personal belief and keep it in the private sphere. Each of us is our own prophet and conceives our own religion. No one should claim dominance over another. I know that the process of faith is inherent to the human being. 
I do not renounce the other half of myself, intuition and feelings play as big a role in my reflection as concrete ideas. However, in my view, faith in God is in no way superior to belief in His non-existence. By embracing what I call atheistic faith, I reconcile the spiritual and the material without grounding my thought in the existence of a God. In fact, believing in humanity alone is not enough to find oneself, one must also renounce God to think for oneself. State Censorship of Atheism Under Ben Ali After the funeral, I announced to my family that I had become an atheist. Some didn't understand it, others stopped talking to me, but many of the younger ones tried to understand my decision. I began to preach atheism to my cousins and nieces and nephews. Many were convinced that religion is nothing but a human creation. Some came to support the associative work done with my friends to raise awareness in our community and counter the influence of Islamist extremism, which was causing a moral decline among our people. Between 1998 and 2001, within my means and as part of AME France, I worked to sound the alarm and dissuade young people from falling into the trap of extremism, which was feeding the conflict in Iraq. A new Shiite state had emerged there after Iran, demonstrating the United States' ignorance of Islamism. With war and escalating violence only worsening an already critical situation, I began to believe that the solution in the Middle East lay in the hands of free-thinking individuals from the Muslim community. The regained freedom of expression and conscience by atheists, agnostics, reformist believers, and secularists from this culture is an unprecedented obstacle to the insidious return of the religious. We must allow for constructive criticism of religions, unveil the so-called sacred and its sterile discourses that keep us stuck in the Middle Ages. Islam, as a highly invasive religion, is evidently a source of misery. How can we expect progress in the Muslim world if national constitutions continue to refer to it as the state religion and prohibit any critique on this basis? Where are the rights of conscience and human rights that we constantly refer to? Change must come from the grassroots. A government cannot establish freedom of expression in a people who live under their own self-imposed prohibitions and censorship. The cultural revolution must start with the individual, the family, the streets, before reaching the highest level of the state, which is nothing more than the executor of the people's will. Unfortunately, even though Islamism has not taken hold in some countries with a Muslim culture, it still succeeds in keeping the population in ignorance. The Islamists, realizing that they risk being attacked for their outdated and indefensible ideas, opt for camouflage and present themselves as moderates or as opposition to the existing regime. Which changes nothing about their ultimate goal. It is regrettable that this awareness is not yet unanimous within Western intellectual circles. They continue to view Islamists as victims of the powers that be and extend a hand to them, enabling them to spread their deadly poison. It is in no way legitimate to walk hand in hand with fanatics who only reason through retrograde Islam and personal interests. This alliance in the name of human rights only tarnishes the image of secular institutions. The Iranian experience makes this abundantly clear, when leftist parties allied with the opposition embodied by Khomeini, he massacred them after the revolution. Today, Iranian freethinkers regret this alliance, but the damage is done. So, we must remain vigilant and not fall for their deceitful tactics. These criminals have no place in society, we must combat them through every peaceful means, marginalize them as the scum of humanity that they are. Instead of seeking to disrupt a country's political stability, it is better to work from the ground up to change mindsets. Let us not mistake our battle, in Muslim countries, dictatorship exists within families and neighborhoods. Those who demand democracy in these countries do not realize that this luxury is unknown in everyday life. How can it be demanded at the state level? I tirelessly advocated for a secular state that bans religious political parties, a state without Islamic veils with political connotations, without calls to prayer on television and in the streets, without closing bars during Ramadan, without prohibiting alcohol consumption, homosexual relationships, or premarital sex. I repeated that the call to prayer should be made inside the mosque without disturbing others. I said, 
practice Islam if you want, but do it at home, in private. Part of my family, especially the young ones, sided with me to support this struggle and raise awareness within our community. After three years of relentless work around me, in cafes, and on the internet, especially on forums, I created a website and forum with friends under the name of the AME France Association. In 2000, I contemplated establishing a branch of AIME France in Tunisia. I realized, after consultations, that I couldn't do it. However, I could create an independent association similar to AIME, but adapted to Tunisian laws. So, I prepared everything necessary and submitted an official request to the Ministry of the Interior. My request was initially denied because you couldn't create an association that promotes atheism in a Muslim society, it wasn't allowed by Tunisian laws. So, I submitted another request in the name of AME, an inter-Mediterranean association with the aim of spreading knowledge and exchange between the two shores of the Mediterranean. Acceptance only became effective after September 11, 2001. I was contacted by the Secretary General of the Ministry of the Interior to receive approval for the establishment of the association, where I held the position of Secretary General. On this occasion, he warned me that we should not attempt to promote atheism. Firstly, the people were too ignorant to assimilate these ideas, and secondly, we ourselves would be accused of atheism. According to him, if that happened, the minister would be forced to shut down our association to avoid being accused of combating Islam. We can't govern them with moderate Islam, he told me. Imagine, with atheism, it would become a real jungle. The people need belief to hope for a better life after death. Atheism is for a cultivated and intelligent class. Why not work on educating people? The fight against Islamism is an intellectual one, so why not open public debates in the media so that the people are informed and can choose? My host barely refrained from laughing. You don't know anything. You can't understand how much religious sentiment is stronger than any logic. If we do that, the Islamists will incite the people against us and accuse us of fighting Islam. And believe me, the majority of the people will be with them. Borguiba tried to educate the people. Have you seen how the Islamists have become increasingly opposed to the state and progress? They are now working to destroy all the cultural achievements that Tunisia has made since independence. I know, religious sentiment is stronger because most people are very ignorant. But precisely. I protested. We must open television studios to public discussions and end censorship because all this works for the Islamists they function through censorship and prohibition. We need to express the problem, address it head-on, draw them out of their holes, and expose them in public. My interlocutor, with a stern face, called his secretary to escort me out, indicating that the interview was over. If you want your association to function, I advise you to live your life and avoid confrontation, he told me as he left. I left that discussion content that I finally had my authorization but aware of an indirect threat. In the early years, things went as planned. I worked on an association magazine called Tem at Tick, initially electronic but later in print in France. I had the idea to publish it in Tunisia, and I even managed to distribute it in Morocco and France at newsstands. I transformed my house into the association's headquarters. I organized meetings, debates, and parties there every Saturday. I even organized cultural trips between Europe and Tunisia and excursions within Tunisia. At that time, I had hope for change. I believed in the Tunisian government's willingness to change mindsets. Unfortunately, neither the government of Ben Ali nor the West had the will to wage this battle. They condemned Islamism in appearance, but deep down, instability and ignorance suited their interests. The association and its magazine were becoming popular and uniting more and more people. The state had adopted an active observer position. I was summoned to the Ministry of the Interior several times and subtly or directly warned to be more discreet because I clearly declared myself an atheist, and the association was known on the internet and in the field as an atheist association. It was even frequently accused of being pro-Zionist. 
Starting in 2003, I noticed that the magazine was hidden in newsstands. Vendors did not display it for sale, and sales were declining every month. I did not lose hope and continued my action, but I began to question, were we truly free in Tunisia? In fact, censorship was not directed solely against Islamists but against any opposing ideological currents that contradicted the state's interests, whether they were nationalist, secular, Islamist, or otherwise. You were free to express yourself as long as you worked for the government. The censorship that ostensibly protected Tunisian society from Islamism actually targeted all forms of opposition, be it political or otherwise. The government clung to power by all means without regard for the people or future generations. This realization was a shock, but I continued with my usual activities nonetheless. I noticed plainclothes police officers following my every move, but I was too focused on preparing issue 40 of TEM at TIC to pay much attention. At the beginning of 2003, just after printing issue 40, I saw the police raid my home and confiscate everything. I contacted the Ministry of the Interior several times without receiving an explanation, my magazine had been unofficially banned without valid reason. So, I continued my work in the association without the magazine. This did not discourage me from organizing meetings and discussion circles. However, I noticed over the days that the number of interested people was dwindling. They stopped coming. In fact, they were being arrested and harassed by the police after leaving my place. Activity in Tunisia came to a complete halt, leaving only the association's legal status. At this point, censorship tightened its grip, demanding complete submission from the media to the government. Information became less and less accessible. A climate of fear settled over Tunisia. Protests against the government's restriction of freedom of expression were on the rise. Opposition political parties denounced its dictatorship. Ben Ali changed tactics. Supposedly to combat the Muslim Brotherhood, he drew closer to Saudi Arabia, promoted Salafist and Wahhabi Islam, built the largest mosque in Carthage, and positioned himself as a modern caliph protecting Islam. Having shifted my focus to the Internet with the AME Association from France, I was advised several times to stop my activities, citing the well-being of the country and my personal safety. I had lost all trust in the Tunisian government. I contemplated leaving the country. The Paris conference and controversy surrounding the book, Karim, my brother, former fundamentalist terrorist. In 2005, IME France organized a conference in Paris called Islam vs. Islam. I was invited to participate. I went to the French embassy to apply for a visa. I was told that this request would only be accepted on the condition that I sign a document obliging me to return to Tunisia at the end of my visa rather than stay in France. Surprised, I signed, as I had no intention of staying in France anyway. The conference went well, and I made a presentation on the danger of Islamism, its methods of infiltration, and its use of taqiyya. Afterward, I had a meeting with the members of the association in France about the problems I encountered in Tunisia due to state censorship, the sabotage of the magazine, and indirect threats from the Ministry of the Interior. At this point, my sister Samia shared her opinion. It's normal. It's because you threaten public order. What public order? I asked, surprised. I work day and night on the magazine and for the association. Yes, but you shouldn't cross the line. What line? I work within the framework of an association. Certainly, there are many members who support the association and are active. Myself, I never imagined things would reach this point. When I return to Tunisia, I will discuss this with our leaders. I hope we can resolve the issue. I began to question my fifth sister's new way of thinking. Upon my return to Tunisia, I immediately immersed myself in reading, Karim, Mon Frere ex Integris Terrorist, the translation she had made of my book. I was shocked by what I found, especially when I came across this sentence, and yet, my brother Karim lived, saw, and even read everything reported in this book. 
I had never read what she had written in the book before its publication. I was in Morocco, and I had trusted her to convey my message as I had written it. After reading it all, I began to better understand the behavior of people who, after reading the book, looked at me as if I were a victim. I was sure of what I had said in my testimony, where I had conveyed my experience as I had lived it. But now, years after the book's release, I discovered that these accusations were not so trivial. I'm not saying that everything in this translation was false or invented, but my sister had manipulated the text for an obvious purpose, to incriminate Sulla Carker and, in doing so, portray me in the book as a simpleton, deluded victim of his dreams. In the original version I had written in Arabic, I had not wanted to talk about myself or my life but rather about my involvement in Islamism from a young age, the role our brother-in-law had played in it, my experience in the Islamist Shiite sect, and finally my doubts about political Islam. In contrast, my sister drew from her own childhood perspective, presenting imaginative events as truths. She reveled in a psychological construct reminiscent of fiction. It lacked logic and made the narrative non-objective. I couldn't help but call her immediately to ask for explanations. She didn't want to answer me right away. She told me she would explain everything when she came to Tunisia. She did come shortly after, sent by the association, as I was concerned about improving the magazine's work, I needed more resources and professionals to assist me. Samia was not against the idea, but she repeated that I had to be more moderate, not cross the line. Not knowing how to interpret this, I asked her for an explanation, which she delivered bluntly, if I wanted the association and the magazine to continue to exist, I had two choices, either not expand the association, remain as discreet as possible, and be content with what little we had, or change my discourse according to Ben Ali's political norm and conform. Without one of these two choices, I risked having problems. I could imagine the worst if I didn't follow the rules of the game. Following the discussions I had with her, I understood many things that had been confusing to me in the history of my book's release until then, the fact that the text I entrusted to her in the early 90s did not come out until 1997 and the accuracy of certain accusations made against it. From Sulla Carker, I had always considered at the height of cynicism that he would try to downplay the role he played in the narrative by convincing journalists that the book was infiltrated by Ben Ali's government. A magazine close to the Islamists had launched this accusation against the book, but I hadn't paid much attention to it at the time, knowing their habit of always portraying themselves as victims. This was also the thesis defended by Nicolas Beau of Le Canard and Chain and Jean-Pierre Tukoy of Le Monde who had dedicated a chapter of their book Notre Ami Ben Ali to one of the victims of this regime, Sulla Carker himself. However, my brother-in-law had only given these journalists the first part of the information, carefully concealing the epilogue of the story, his house arrest for being an avowed Islamist and terrorist. Indeed, some of the information I had included had been manipulated and interpreted specifically against my brother-in-law by Ben Ali's secret service. To fully understand what had happened, and what I only discovered in 2005, we need to go back to 1990. When I had decided to publish my book and entrusted the Arabic manuscript to my fifth sister for her to translate, I had put her in touch with the agent of the Bourguibis Tunisian Secret Service who had interrogated and questioned me, so that he could lend a hand if necessary. I was convinced that he had understood the danger of the Islamists in the country. After my departure to Morocco, this man had therefore read the book with my sister. Shortly after coming to power, Ben Ali had drawn closer to the Gulf states and so-called moderate Islam, presenting himself as the protector of Arab Muslim identity. Following this new policy, the government had divided the Islamists into two groups, the pro ganucci with whom it could find common ground, and the pro karker with whom it refused to negotiate. As a result, my manuscript was a windfall for our friend in the Secret Service. Not content with using all the detailed data inside to strike at the hardline branch of EMTI, he closely monitored the rewriting of the book from 1992 to 1997. He came to France several times to oversee and direct the book's writing with the aim of the Tunisian government, to discredit Sulla Carker and convince the French Secret Service of the danger he posed. 
He also put my sister in contact with French personalities to help with publishing. Another family dynamic played a role in the story, Samia had reconnected with Samira. After all, they were sisters. Cunningly informed by the Secret Service guy, she didn't let Samira remain unaware that Sulla Karker had religiously married a second wife in Morocco, whom he saw during his absences. She even provided evidence of this. Samira obviously knew that Islamic law gave a man the right to marry a second, third, or fourth wife without any obligation to inform the others and also allowed him to lie to them. However, she completely refused to accept it. She saw her sacrifices and support for her husband reduced to nothing by him. Driven by anger, she searched through Sulla Karker's belongings and found a fake passport in his name filled with stamps from various countries like Sudan, Algeria, and Morocco. She made a copy of it along with other documents related to her husband's illegal activities within terrorist Islamist networks and passed it all on to the secret services. The French state took the content of the manuscript seriously, as well as the information from the Tunisian government confirming what I had reported about Sulla Karker's connections with terrorist groups in Iran, Sudan, and Algeria. Despite this, they couldn't do anything as they had no concrete evidence of his activities on their territory. With this latest tangible proof that Sulla Karker was using his political refugee status in France for unlawful and dangerous activities, the case was now complete. Sulla Karker was finished, destroyed. His Islamist political life was shattered. Interior Minister Charles Pasqua signed an expulsion order against Sulla Karker on October 11, 1993, based on suspicion of active support for a terrorist movement. An appeal filed by Sulla Karker before the Administrative Court of Paris was dismissed on December 16, 1994, with the court stating that he had maintained close ties with Islamic organizations using violent methods, justifying the ministerial decision in the interest of public safety. Unable to be sent back to Tunisia due to his refugee status, he was placed under house arrest, awaiting a third country to accept him. He stayed in Finisterre, Brest, St. Julien Chapteau, Cairez, and finally Digny Les Bains, where he was required to report to the police once a day. On January 15, 2005, a cerebral hemorrhage left him in a long coma from which he emerged diminished and aphasic. The house arrest was finally lifted in October 2011 after Ben Ali's escape, and he briefly returned to Tunisia to attend an Adidas Congress, where he was elected an honorary member of the Shura Council on July 17, 2012. He passed away on October 18 of the same year. The Scam and the Disappointment In 2005, I finally understood the whole story, my manuscript had been manipulated to serve the interests of the Tunisian government and personal vendettas. The accusations of collusion with the Tunisian government that the book had sparked upon its release were due to the interventions of the inspector who had helped Samia write it. During the trial that followed, when I had to go to France to testify in court after my return from Morocco, everything had been facilitated for me. At that time, I had neither an identity card nor a passport, but it had been resolved within a few days, and I had obtained a visa for France without any problems. I naively believed that the Tunisian government was finally taking me seriously. I hadn't thought that my testimony was being used for political purposes. I understood this belatedly when the Ministry of the Interior had reversed its refusal to authorize our association in 2001, it was to improve Tunisia's image in the eyes of the international community, to show that it was a free country participating in the fight against Islamist terrorism. They did not imagine that my work in the association would be so successful. They did not hesitate to put obstacles in my way afterward. Now, I was faced with a fait accompli, if I wanted the association to continue to operate, I had to support Ben Ali and call for a moderate Islam. That, never. I refused the idea of being part of Ben Ali's or the government's machine. Furious, I didn't send this message to my sister. I had gotten rid of Islamism to live freely without depending on anyone, be it Ben Ali or anyone else. I continued to work, waiting to see what procedures would be used to silence me. 
Indeed, in 2003, when I started to be very active on the internet and on Tunisian forums and others again, I was deprived of the internet many times and for days. This did not deter me, on the contrary. I worked even harder without forgetting to continue my social activities in the association. I was summoned by the police, this time in Ariana, where I was told that I was too active and that it needed to stop, but I did not lose courage. However, I noticed that there were fewer and fewer active members, only the people close to me remained loyal to the association. In the end, I decided to work alone. In February 2005, I created my own website and forum, Islamlaw.com. Pro Islamists followed me on Islamla and did everything to sabotage the website, without success. Nevertheless, I continued to criticize Islam and demand the right to speak in Tunisia for ex-Muslims. I wrote dozens of articles denouncing the criminal principles of Islam such as the prohibition of apostasy or the non-recognition of individual rights, including those of children and women. I warned of the danger looming over Europe and our countries due to the interference of Islamists in society and their low methods of spreading their venom. I was gagged and placed under house arrest but everything I had predicted happened, my country was Islamized, and I was forced to leave. I still hoped that the Tunisian government would understand that fighting Islamism is not done through censorship. I had tried several times to convince them that the middle classes needed the means to participate in the fight against this Islamist danger. Unfortunately, according to them, the state had to fight the Islamists alone by calling for a so-called moderate and open Islam without touching the Islam of the popular masses. Ben Ali had even gone on the Hajj to present himself as a good Muslim and defender of Islam. He allowed Saudi-style Islam to spread in Tunisia. Criticizing Islam only meant for him allowing the Islamists to turn the people against him. That was the whole problem. Nevertheless, I still believed in educating the Tunisian people to debate and freedom of expression. I thus addressed the question on my website in May 2005, the Tunisian mentality places great importance on the head of the family, and by analogy, the leader of the country. The leader embodies what is known in Arabic as El Haba, the prestige of the leader. This prestige is essential for being respected and feared, and therefore for exercising power. In our culture, without prestige, there is no respect, and when there is no respect, there is disorder. The day when we can criticize our fathers, elders, teachers, or business leaders without being accused of disrespecting them, at that moment, we can claim to criticize those who govern us. To do that, we must learn to criticize ideas without questioning the individuals. It's an art that Europeans have mastered but didn't acquire overnight. The struggle for this freedom of thought was a long one. In Tunisia, it's enough to visit a so-called political opposition website to understand that the people expressing themselves there don't understand what opposition or freedom truly mean. In fact, they call for a freedom that they themselves deny in the name of freedom. They impose their ideas forcefully and don't hesitate to insult anyone who disagrees with them. For them, the righteous camp is the one that stands against the current regime. Otherwise, you're not only a declared supporter of the government but even paid by the state. As you can see, the choices are limited. If these people who claim to be political opponents of the regime genuinely want freedom for all, they must show more discernment and learn to listen to the viewpoints of those who disagree with them. They are against the government, which is their right but they should allow others to give their personal opinions on the matter without showering them with insults and launching ridiculous accusations against them. That's where true freedom lies. Shouldn't you give to receive? If these people were more open-minded, public opinion would have sided with them a long time ago. Instead, they are enemies of freedom and humanity. What's the point of this so-called opposition if its goal is to replace one dictatorship with another? I am particularly targeting the Islamist opposition here, which endlessly whines and shouts about the lack of freedom it encounters in Tunisia. This criticism is directed 80% at individuals, in most cases without providing evidence, this minister is a thief, the president's wife did this, his daughter was seen wearing a miniskirt in a nightclub.
This is the kind of attack that these so-called opponents engage in, what we call in Arabic, takti wa tariq, and in French, gossip. Is this really criticism? Is it a valid way to express one's opposition? In these hateful rants, do we see a political and social project? Islamist opponents have the audacity to claim that there is no freedom in Tunisia, but since when, in any country, does defamation represent any form of freedom? In Europe, people do not dare to defame political leaders or ordinary citizens in this way. Defamers face legal action. Even scandal magazines are sometimes condemned. Unfortunately, at the same time, European media allows the same opponents to defame everyone on their websites. Due to ignorance of the reality on the ground or ideological interest, they do not hesitate to call those who are, in fact, Islamist terrorists opponents. Some of these media outlets search for scandalous scoops to retain their audience, thereby supporting these so-called opponents, presenting their arbitrary conclusions as an absolute truth, namely that freedom of expression is being violated in Tunisia. The problem cannot be separated from its context. We must take into account the social factors and teach from an early age what the terms critique and freedom mean so that they can be used wisely. The West, which considers itself so free, must also engage in self-critique. In Tunis, journalists are imprisoned or censored, that's true. But, not to mention the United States where they outright kill and bomb them, information in Europe is distorted and or minimized by the media that present it, despite Europeans advocating freedom of expression and human rights. It's forgotten that after Saudi Arabia, Europe was the first to support and provide refuge to Islamist criminals. European intellectuals also exhibit mistrust towards free thinkers from the Arab Muslim world, as if freedom can only be seen through European eyes, or if democracy can only come from the West, or if the East can only give rise to military or religious dictatorships. A country is accused of being a dictatorship because it fights armed opposition. On the other hand, the United States arrogates the right to assassinate fighters whose only fault is wanting to free their country from foreign colonization. Civilians are bombed, but they swear they're doing it for the best cause, combating terrorism. Some justify such acts with democracy and human rights. What is the difference between Saddam, who fought and assassinated his opponents, and the United States, which fights and assassinates these same opponents because they refuse a new dictatorship and foreign occupation. It's difficult to assert that there is one, especially since, as we know, the Americans were Saddam Hussein's protectors before becoming his staunch enemies. All of this should make us think twice before launching baseless accusations, and those who give lessons, such as Europe and the United States, should question themselves before judging other powers. European-style freedom is but a vast lie that makes citizens believe they are free when they only have a very limited space of freedom. They think they live in a democratic country when the truth is quite different. They believe they choose their representatives when they elect them following a brainwashing orchestrated by the media. However, in Europe, things are done delicately to present an appealing appearance. We are far from mastering this art. Consequently, either we also learn to excel in appearances to give the outside world the politically correct image expected, or we become free by applying our own values. The subject is complex. Nowhere in the world is politics transparent. Populations, religions, and sects are manipulated at will to dominate, speeches are directed, and culprits are arbitrarily designated. Personally, I avoid getting into this game. I don't rely on just one source, I inform myself and gather information, and above all, I don't make baseless accusations. Everyone has their own perspective, faults, and qualities. Hence the need for discussion and, therefore, freedom of expression, the only guarantors of progress. Certainly, I don't claim that Tunisia is a free country, and Europe isn't either. However, European society has evolved a lot, especially in the 18th century, and therefore, it manages to form supposedly democratic governments. 
In contrast, in Arab Muslim countries, our societies are far behind in terms of civic education, and all the rulers take advantage of the situation to maintain or even increase this lag. Our societies do little to help the people establish and maintain power built democratically. This is very serious, both socially and politically, it should not be taken lightly. Taking into account parameters such as the social situation and political and economic stability would help clean up the situation. Before accusing any country of dictatorship or censorship, the priority is to reach a consensus on what freedom represents. We must stop considering such a precious commodity according to European, American, or Saudi standards, definitively admit universal norms, and grant each country the freedom of its own thinking. Free minds from the Arab Muslim world alone know the terrain well enough to propose suitable solutions. It's important that some revise their definition of the word freedom. Freedom must extend everywhere and to everyone, men, women, and children, except towards those who contest the right to sexual, ethnic, and religious differences, that is, the Islamists and the majority of religious fanatics. In the case of the Danish cartoon of the Prophet in September 2005, I supported the freedom to criticize Islam through several of my articles. I expressed my point of view on Tunisian forums. As a result, I was banned. My work in the association was read and commented on less and less. The agreement made by my sister Samia to undertake another edition of my book was nothing but empty words. Consequently, I cut off all contact with her and with AME from France, which closed shortly after, and I submitted my resignation to AME from Tunisia. The Certainty My decision to leave my associative activities and work independently, relying only on myself, led me to a deep conviction, no one can be the master of another, only of oneself. Until now, I had no moral responsibility for the statements made in my name. I felt solely responsible for what I personally expressed through my articles, writings, and videos, whether on my websites, social networks, or in my books. This approach gave me confidence and encouraged me to take control of my own destiny. I realized that I could shape my future and make decisions in line with my convictions and personal integrity. This new approach allowed me to regain my confidence and reaffirm my uniqueness as an autonomous individual, capable of charting my path with determination, while recognizing that change is the only certainty in life. In this quest for independence and fulfillment, I learned that the ability to adapt to change is essential to evolve and fully realize my potential. From House Arrest in Tunis to Exile In early 2006, I was no longer in contact with my sister. I was becoming increasingly isolated, my internet was constantly being cut off, my websites were being censored, and every time I found a proxy to participate, it was censored a few days later. I even faced censorship from Google, which prevented me from advertising my website. In February 2006, I launched a petition against censorship in Tunisia on the websites islamlaw.com and elabdikm.com. Here is a summary of it. How much longer must we wait for the establishment of freedom of expression as a fundamental right in Tunisia? Freedom is being trampled upon to please certain religions or beliefs, let's have the courage to denounce it loudly and clearly. My website islamlaw.com and my Arabic website elabdikm.com, along with other blogs, were censored on February 18, 2006, following the Danish cartoon controversy, which I mentioned in the context of my support for freedom of expression. What is sacred, true, and untouchable for some is not necessarily so for others. Words should be criticized with words, not censorship. I created the website islamlaw.com under this right. This personal portal aims to promote and disseminate analyses and critiques of Orthodox Islam. This initiative aims to enable Orthodox Muslims to review their cultural heritage and free themselves from dogmatic tutelage. Islamlaw.com offers a privileged space for free minds of all origins and beliefs to participate in collective reflection. It aspires to be a database of constructive critiques from reliable sources and people of interest. I live in Tunisia, and this is where I launched this petition. 
I ask the Tunisian authorities to lift this censorship, which has lasted long enough. My website has proven its tone of absolute freedom. Never has an article or post been censored, and no one has been banned from my forum. I ask you to sign this petition to show the relevant authorities that many of us defend freedom of expression. I hope my call will be heard. This petition had little effect. Being deprived of the internet and with my website censored, I tried to continue my activities in the cafes of Tunis, especially the one in Etoile du Nord, frequented by atheists. In March 2006, plainclothes police officers came to my home to deliver an official summons from the chief of police of the Ariana Governorate. When I presented myself, the commissioner politely ordered me to stop all activities and stay at home, claiming that I was endangering my life by criticizing Islam and that the state had to protect me. He asked me not to move without informing them, to focus on my work, and to cut off all contact with others except to earn a living, nothing more, nothing less. He even said he could help me find a job to turn the page. He spoke at length, emphasizing that Islamism is the state's battle and that ordinary citizens cannot be allowed to touch Islamic principles. Although he himself did not believe in it, he considered religion to be socially useful. The state protected it so it could govern the people and not be accused of being against Islam. He also reminded me that Tunisian law punished anyone who attacked or criticized Islam with imprisonment. Starting in March 2006, a plainclothes police officer was stationed near my home. No one could visit me without verifying their identity. I couldn't even move without being followed, and I had to report my every move. Between 2006 and 2011, I found myself isolated at home in unofficial house arrest. I accepted this harsh reality and confined myself to my home. I was summoned multiple times by the Ariana police. Additionally, I no longer had the means to sustain myself with what little I had. I took on odd jobs to make a living. During this period of physical and moral censorship, I once again questioned my struggle and tried to live like an ordinary individual, with no dreams or hopes other than survival. It was a nightmare. During this period, I laid down my weapons, abandoned all my fights, and resigned myself to living a mundane life. Throughout my life, I had changed my ideas several times, and it was possible that I would change them again because ideas are neither sacred nor unique, and everything evolves in this world. We judge based on who we are at the moment, not who we were in the past. I had come to this conclusion, since we are all different, we cannot all think alike, the only certainty was the evolution of ideas. This conviction made me more flexible while remaining very firm in my choice, atheism or nothing. I contented myself with writing without publishing, revisiting my life and reflecting on three subjects that seemed essential to me, where Sunni Islamism leads, where Shiite Islamism leads, where the policies of the West and its allies lead, these three international forces fighting to impose their respective dogmas on the rest of the world. In early 2007, I was invited to an anti-Islamist symposium, but my visa was denied. There, I understood that I was in prison in my own home. After this setback, in August 2007, I tried to travel to Algeria. I was arrested at the airport and detained in the Mornagia prison near Tunis on the pretext that I was wanted. I was released after a few days of detention, claiming there had been a mistake, but I understood very well it was a maneuver to dissuade me from leaving Tunisia and force me to stay at home. I had started a web design company that allowed me to work from home. I withdrew into myself, waiting for a solution to leave the country. However, during the popular uprising of 2011, I realized that I could not continue to live like this. All religions and beliefs had withdrawn from the political and social scene except for Orthodox Islam, which continued to thrive and would take advantage of the opening to achieve its evil goals. As long as this factor of imperialism, injustice, censorship, and lies persisted, there would be no peace, and we would lag behind in terms of progress and dignity. Most of those who called themselves Muslims did not know anything, the truth had to be revealed to them so that they would not fall into it. 
I started going out again and participated in protests for freedom and against Ben Ali. After his escape, I continued to work with my neighbors to protect our neighborhood. For almost 15 days, we all worked together side by side, Islamists, homosexuals, atheists, there was no difference among us. However, after a few weeks of fraternity following Ben Ali's flight and the lifting of censorship on January 14, 2011, things changed with the return of Anadida's Islamists from abroad. I faced several strong encouragements to return to Islam, accompanied by death threats if I did not comply. I continued to participate in protests for freedom and secularism without losing hope, but given the way things were going, the resurgence of Islamists in Tunisia, I was truly in danger. After a few months of freedom, it became increasingly serious day by day. Islamists were staging demonstrations across the country to demand the implementation of Sharia law. Violence was being committed against any form of freedom, such as the attack on Nadia El Fani's film or the attack on Nesma TV. I received serious and direct threats from Islamists I knew well, and close friends advised me to leave due to the climate of insecurity caused by the absence of authority. This time, I seriously considered leaving Tunisia. However, before making such a decision, I wanted to wait for the elections. If things improved and we could live in freedom and peace in Tunisia, I had no desire to leave the country. In early summer 2011, an inspector from the Ministry of Interior came to my home several times to ask me to work with them to combat the Islamists because everything had to be done to prevent them from seizing power. I told him I wasn't interested because I had no trust in the former regime, for years, I had been fighting for freedom in Tunisia, and no one had taken my warning seriously or helped me at the Ministry of Interior. On the contrary, I had been confined to my home. It was in the ranks of political parties advocating secularism that I actively participated in the elections. Unfortunately, as we know, the Tunisian people, too influenced by Islam, voted in favor of Anadida, leaving me with no choice but to leave the country as soon as possible. Everything I had predicted had come true, my country was becoming Islamized, and I was forced to leave. At the end of 2011, I reluctantly decided to leave for France via the Netherlands. I began the procedure to obtain a visa for the Netherlands following an invitation from a friend. I obtained the visa without any problems after a month, and I left Tunisia in January 2012, before the Islamists came to power. Upon arriving in the Netherlands, I stayed with my friend for a period. I was preparing to go to France when I learned that, according to the Dublin regulation, I had to apply for asylum in the first European country I reached. So, I went to the asylum center in Turaple, in the north of the country, to officially request political asylum. That's how, after a little over a year, I finally obtained refugee status in the Netherlands. Reconnecting with Amazigh Identity In June 2013, once I was well settled, I began to organize myself and re-establish my contacts through the internet in Tunisia and France. I resumed criticizing Orthodox Islam through my forum, my website, and social media. Finally, I created a YouTube channel that I named, No Allah's Religion. It was during these online discussions with North African nationals that I realized the importance of the Amazigh identity specific to this region. This identity is based on a millennia-old land and culture rather than on race or belief. I understood that this identity alone could save us from the impasse our people were facing, burdened with an Arab-Muslim identity that wasn't their own. From there, I realized that the myth of the Arab-Muslim identity was largely responsible for our problems because a people without an identity cannot progress, evolve, or contribute to the advancement of humanity. This reflection led me to discern that if Orthodox Islam fights against national identities and Arabiaizes peoples, it is to forever bind their fate to Islam. Consequently, I considered that the identity crisis experienced by the North African people, both within their own territory and abroad, is due to Islam's efforts to strip them of their identity. Deprived of their true identity, they are forced to embrace the Arab Muslim identity along with Islam. It goes without saying that a people whose identity is imposed upon them is a people without dignity, 
subjugated and kept in bondage. Many political parties in Tunisia or Egypt consider the Arab Muslim identity as an essential factor on which the constitution must be based because it genuinely represents the people. Since independence and up to the present day, the issue of the Arab Muslim identity has been a general demand, a sacred truth, the only way to protect ourselves from any cultural erasure, even after the uprisings against the dictatorships. But are we truly Arab Muslims? What if the idea of the Arab Muslim identity is nothing more than a lie perpetuated by pro-Arab Islamists? The conspiracy of identity erasure by Western Europe, denounced by Islamists, can easily be turned against the Arab world. Before we can determine who we are, we must first define the notion of identity. On what criteria is a people's identity based? Does it concern the people, the group, the country, or individuals? Identity is what defines an individual or a specific group and sets them apart from others. It encompasses the ways in which an individual or group defines itself and how it is defined by others. Humans need to identify themselves individually and socially in order to move forward, otherwise, they experience an identity crisis that blocks them in all aspects of life. A people's identification is similar to an individual's. A person who does not know their gender cannot choose their sexual orientation, and a people who do not know their identity cannot choose their cultural orientation. Identity is not only what we claim or what is imposed, it is an inherent truth that emanates from within and influences external behavior. It is not enough to profess an identity, it must be fully experienced in the present as well as through the people's history. A people or group is defined by several criteria. Let's consider the most important ones mentioned in history, the criterion of blood or skin color is the oldest, dating back to prehistory, like the differentiation between animal families. It has been used in history to distinguish peoples based on hereditary and physical characteristics. This criterion is responsible for genocides, slavery, and racist crimes. Today, due to the evolution of human thinking, this criterion is considered inhumane. Anyone or any group identifying solely based on this criterion is condemned by civilized minds. The criterion of religious faith and ideological affiliation is an evolution from the previous one. It opposes the racial criterion and defines a people's identity based on their beliefs. This can be observed among Christians and even more clearly in Islam under the notion of El Loma. In history, this criterion has allowed for the creation of despotic and imperial empires in which religious or ideological minorities are oppressed and silenced by the majority. This criterion is to be considered as dangerous as the racial criterion, even though it is based on ideas rather than appearance. The criterion of language and culture emerged later to distinguish between peoples. It does not consider physical appearance or belief but rather the spoken language and what that language conveys in terms of social and cultural behavior. This cultural and linguistic preservation results in the division into nations. Despite its evolution compared to previous criteria, this criterion remains imperfect as it creates closed groups and limits individual freedom to choose their identity. This leads to nationalist states that reject cultural and linguistic diversity. When a state enforces a single or predominant cultural identity and an official majority language, it tends to suppress cultural and linguistic minorities, leading either to the disappearance of languages and cultures or the creation of explosive core groups, which foresees a dead end for the future. The criterion of land and territory is more advanced than the previous ones. It is based on the right of the land, regardless of a person's religion, language, or culture. The individual is considered a full citizen in a country and a state that respects all cultures, languages, dialects, and non-totalitarian ideologies. In this diversified society, presence on the land is taken as the criterion of identity. Ideologies, beliefs, and people change throughout history, but the land does not. According to Ivorian writer Jean-Marie Diafai, nothing is as powerful as man's love for his land, his forest, his rivers, his mountains, his rocks, his trees, his birds, his stones. Based on this criterion of land, one can imagine that civilized countries accept the differences born of multiculturalism, 
which is the real richness of a country, and move towards a society without discrimination. Regardless of their origin, belief, language, or culture, citizens are recognized as full individuals in their dignity on the land they have chosen to live on. In the example of Tunisia, it can be affirmed that every citizen considers themselves a full Tunisian and North African in flesh and spirit, regardless of their origin and belief. Thus, my grandparents felt like full Tunisians despite their foreign origins. Contrary to the beliefs of those lost in racism or nationalism, the place and its culture shape us as much as our own origins. It is the bridge between people. Culture necessarily includes respect and understanding of the places where it comes to life. It is true that we are attached for the rest of our lives to our childhood memories, our homeland, the place where we grew up. But my grandparents had perfectly integrated into their host country because they felt love for that country. This plural identity, sometimes difficult to grasp, is not foreign to the imprints that mark our individual journeys. These imprints are genetic and genealogical, but also cultural, familial, and social, which it is up to the individual to consider in order to give meaning to their own story. This identity is in the nature of the land, this specificity is a wealth to preserve. I believe in the power of the land on which we live. Identity is ultimately linked to the place of life, the local culture, the common bond among the inhabitants. An individual's or group's belonging to a place is recognized by their respect, love, and intimate knowledge of that place, which gives them their identity and of which they are proud. Love for a country, a city, a village, a neighborhood is not just about getting along with one's neighbor, it requires dedication, a sense of responsibility, and self-sacrifice. In return, the land teaches us who we are and what we want to live for. Thus, the Phoenicians, Romans, Arabs, Turks, and even the French who decided to settle in North Africa and have been living there for generations are undoubtedly North Africans today. An African who has lived in Europe or America for several generations eventually becomes European or American. Similarly, I believe that the inhabitants of North Africa are Amazai, regardless of their origins, color, race, language, religion, or doctrine, simply because they have lived on this independent and proud land for centuries. The Punic or Roman periods did not make us Phoenicians or Romans, just as engagement with Islam does not make us Arabs today. This is not a rejection, but rather the search for an identity rooted in this land, one that takes into account both the reality of the past, that of the present, and the shared societal project. Our duty is to apprehend life in its entirety, not to overly develop our particularities. To claim that North Africa is Arab would be to deny its history before the arrival of the Arabs. North Africa existed before them and will remain after them. Considering ourselves Arabs would amount to denying the essence of our identity. Conversely, are the Arabs settled in North Africa the same as those in the Arabian Peninsula? Certainly not. They have mixed with Phoenicians, Turks, Romans, French, in short, all those who live on this land, to form the North African people. Logically, Maghribis, Libyans, and Mauritanians are not Arabs but North Africans, although different in terms of race, color, language, religion, or beliefs, they live on the same land and breathe the same air. We do not reject our origins, we do not deny where we come from because previous civilizations deserve respect and recognition. But let's also think about current life and future generations who will interact with the world without caring about borders and limits. To say that North Africans are only Arabs or Maghribis would be to deny our history and fall into the illusion of false identity. Today, the majority of inhabitants display a single Arab Muslim identity due to ignorance, religious dogmatism, or even nationalism. This identity is a myth. It is an unjust discrimination against the Amazai who claim the older presence of non-Muslims on this land. The values of Islam and Arab Muslim identity erase our local identity and prevent us from being proud of our country beyond Islam. We have been Arabized and Islamized without being given a choice. However, the Tunisian people are diverse and varied in their values, origins, and opinions. 
they want to feel legitimate through the rights of their land without shame or fear. Tunisian citizens want to be full citizens, individuals who love this land, its air, and its soul, without belonging to any particular majority. Every person has the right to evolve with respect for others without being accused of betrayal. Our peoples need to be informed that we do not owe everything to the East. We are not Arabs, that is clear. Many of us are not Muslims, and the majority has nothing to do with Orthodox Islam that came as a conqueror to occupy us almost 1,400 years ago. Everything has been done to subjugate us. We were lied to, claiming that we were barbarians without a history, to whom the Arabs and Islam brought civilization. We had a culture before the Islamic occupation. To liberate ourselves, we must know who we are. The first thing to do is to reconnect with the Amazigh past that Islam has made us forget. That is where our identity lies. In the word, Amazigh, meaning, free man, I have personally found the freedom I have been seeking since childhood. It's this thirst for freedom that pulled me out of the clutches of Islam, that is, submission and conformity. Yes, freedom is our identity. Throughout history and despite their differences, the Amazigh have known how to live together on this land, under these skies. I have experienced this freedom intensely during brief moments, before the arrival of Islamism in my family, after the escape of Ben Ali, before the return of the Islamists to once again subject our country to this foreign Islam that is alien to our North African nature. These moments are short, but they are enough to mark my inner journey, the path of freedom. The Path of Freedom For 17 years, I have left Islam and freed myself from Islamic influence, and I am still convinced that freedom of thought is the number one enemy of Islam. Islam thrives in censorship and oppression from its very inception, as we saw in Arabia, where Islam spread like a virus once it was banned. It's no coincidence that Islamists portray themselves to the world as victims and the oppressed. They lament the lack of freedom, but once they come to power, they are the first to censor criticism, kill apostates, and refuse dialogue with non-Muslims. In fact, Islamism hides behind civilized and humanistic principles like freedom of thought simply to gain power and subsequently restrict that very freedom in the name of God. Muhammad himself was tolerant and open in Mecca, but he changed his tune once he seized power in Medina. The difference between the Quranic verses of Mecca and those of Medina is proof that Islam uses doublespeak to achieve its goals. This is a characteristic of all dogmatic and authoritarian movements, they put on a tolerant and altruistic facade to convince the masses. We should not fall into the trap of believing the Islamist speeches in the name of freedom. In reality, Islam doesn't understand what this word means. This religion contains no freedom it implies complete submission. Unfortunately, the majority of the Islamic population is submissive and dominated by religious sentiment. Islamists take advantage of this to gain as many votes as possible by playing on the emotional side of Muslims. These individuals vote out of fear of incurring Allah's wrath and not going to heaven once they die, rather than to establish a political or economic program that meets their life expectations. To counter this unfair indoctrination, boundaries must be created and respected. This must happen through legality. Clear and defined laws are needed to punish defamation, lies, exclusion, violence, or the incitement of verbal and physical violence. Anyone who wants to restrict freedom of thought in the name of any ideology should not find a place in a civilized society. Those who do not respect these rules, whether Islamist or not, will be punished without discrimination for breaking the law. This is how freedom will extend to everyone. Otherwise, Islamism will continue in the shadows to keep the populace ignorant and submissive. Freedom of expression is a right. Everyone has the right to speak, criticize, and express their point of view through speech, writing, art, or cinema. However, there is no freedom for those who are against freedom or seek to prohibit it in the name of something sacred. Anyone opposing it through violence in the name of their beliefs will be punished by the law. Censorship practiced worldwide to keep individuals and peoples in ignorance, under the pretext of preventing any slip-up, is not a solution. 
Prohibiting speech does not prevent thinking and opens the door to destructive impulses such as intolerance, hatred, lies, and violence. It seems to me that only total transparency, the clash of ideas, and public debate can pave the way for a humanistic evolution that eliminates all violence. This applies to all identities that the system tries to erase in the name of artificial, political, economic, or ideological boundaries. Globalization must acknowledge human diversity. Global dogmatism must take into account cultural and genetic differences, such as the Basques, Corsicans, Bretons, Catalans, Native Americans, Aborigines, Kurds, Amazighs, and everything that defines an individual or group demanding the right to exist. When a new world order tries to erase them in the name of economics, politics, or religion, Humanism requires recognition of the disparities between independent identities. I hope that this dream becomes a reality. I believe in the human independence from any divine intervention or unnatural force. I advocate for freedom of conscience and expression within a neutral framework. What is different from me enriches me. Nearly 50 years of my existence have passed, and I have recounted my daily struggle to find my dignity as a man. In the words of Pericles, there is no happiness without freedom, nor freedom without courage. This book is a testimony brought to the attention of all those tempted to follow the disastrous path of fanaticism. A testimony to prevent the worst. It is also an appeal to governments, political actors, and ordinary citizens of the so-called free world, misfortune crawls to our doors in the form of a vermin with a thousand faces. I also emphasize the importance of the struggle of women against Orthodox Islam, which deprives them of their fundamental rights. Women may be the strongest lever against Orthodox Islam and violence. Unfortunately, their presence has been limited so far. It is necessary that everywhere, in neighborhoods, cities, villages, and associations, they organize themselves and fight for education, peace, and dignity. Saving North Africa Work in Europe is not enough, the free world will not live in peace until its southern borders are pacified. We must also work in North Africa, a close partner of Europe. Freedom of thought is a right for every people, group, or human being, and when good comes, it comes for everyone. After more than two years of discussions and analysis of the situation on the Internet, we, along with a group of young people from North Africa living on both sides of the Mediterranean, created a movement for change in North Africa. We began sharing our ideas based on our Amazigh identity in early 2015. After several months of work, on May 15, 2015, we published a founding declaration of the Movement for Change in North Africa, MCN, addressed to all Amazighs or free men of North Africa and all free minds worldwide. Dear North Africans, dear free men, anyone observing the events unfolding in the countries of North Africa knows the gravity of the situation and the dangers facing this region. They also know about the malicious forces bent on destabilizing the autonomy, security, and freedom of its inhabitants, who consequently face unhappiness and despair. The North African region possesses an incredible potential with its natural resources, climate, strategic location, and breathtaking landscapes. Unfortunately, it is not immune to ideological conflicts and repeated conspiracies. The media war also incites rebellion and conflicts that do not benefit North Africa. Cultural decline began a long time ago, caused by submission to ideologies from elsewhere, whether from the East or the West. The extremism and terrorism this has generated have led to economic collapse. We have reached a point where our youth risk their lives by crossing the sea to escape this harsh reality or, even worse, join extremist terrorist groups, unaware that their actions will destroy them along with their homeland. The intellectuals who are supposed to be our elite and role models are focused on Western and Eastern ideological conflicts, posing a leadership problem in North African society and politics. This educated class forgets its duty to guide North Africa towards an ideological and scientific orientation that will lead to progress. The result is generations of graduates who have proven their memorization abilities but are, unfortunately, 
absent and unable to contribute to change in their home environment or assess the daily severity of the situation. They live off the remains of past colonizations, which deprives them of the opportunity to open their eyes to conceive a better future. This situation has caused intellectual and ideological recession in North Africa since the Middle Ages. Worse yet, given the general dissatisfaction, the university has become a bomb-making machine that will explode sooner or later. This alarming situation, exacerbated by the ignorance of the rest of the population, results in the decline of human rights, censorship, the absence of freedoms, and a lack of investment in local skills. As activists, advocates, and free citizens of North Africa, we have united to discuss solutions to counter this cultural and ideological decline. On May 15, 2015, which corresponds to the 27th of the month of Tazra Temswarit 2965 in the Amazigh calendar, we announced the founding of the North African Change Movement. This is a peaceful and independent movement that denounces the sad reality our societies are living in and seeks to remedy it by all means. This movement is exclusive to the North African identity, it is based on the cultural heritage of the Amazighs, or free men, and derives from a philosophy linked to the land and the civilization of North Africa, according to the following principles. 1. The North African identity is based on the land. 2. Freedom is a right for every human being, regardless of ethnicity, religion, gender, or custom. 3. Thought is alive, it must be able to evolve and flourish. Confining it is a crime. 4. Human experience allows us to choose what suits us to meet our needs, taking into account the characteristics of the North African identity. 5. Respect for the human being is the basis of any project aimed at the prosperity and progress of our civilization. Based on these principles, the movement has established goals and missions to accomplish. 1. Ensure the survival and continuity of the North African nation. 2. Defend its identity and authenticity. 3. Defend freedoms and human rights against all forms of abuse. 4. Consolidate resources and skills and support artistic and ideological production to develop a modern and strong North Africa. 5. Adhere to the principles of civility and defend them. 6. Develop and refine the moral principles and values of society by combating religious, regional, and linguistic racism. 7. Reconsider the nature of political regimes in North Africa and strive for a technocratic model. 8. Remove all kinds of borders between North African countries, unify the custom system and currency, and establish the free movement of people and goods. Nine. Sever all political, cultural, ethnic, and ideological relations with any region oppressing the North African identity and re-establish international political relations based on mutual interest and respect. 10. Strengthen the role played by North Africa in regional and international policies within the Mediterranean basin. Our movement embodies the will for change of many young graduates who have taken on the responsibility of building the future. A future based on human dignity and no longer on the whims of obscure political or religious entities. We firmly believe that this future is possible, attainable through change and positive criticism, so that the North African people can enter a new era, a new stage of their civilization and existence, avoiding the mistakes of our ancestors. We invite you to adopt this course of action to rehabilitate our land. To build a nation with real political and economic power, which will have a modern and influential society in the Mediterranean basin and the world. The North African movement for change is determined to combat the effects of decay and backwardness and to build a better future for future North African generations. This movement is yours, it is your platform, its success depends on you. Let us be a single hand to break oppression and obscurantism. Following the release of this statement, the support and encouragement received in Europe and North Africa led us to initiate the registration process for our movement during a second plenary meeting of the MCAN in September. 
The official authorization for the North African Movement for Change came on December 31, 2015. On January 13, 2016, which corresponds to the Amazigh New Year 2966, we chose as our first focus to disseminate knowledge within the North African community, both abroad and at home, to counter reactionary ideologies. The short-term goal is to create a space for debate, a platform free from racial and extremist discrimination, capable of promoting human principles and values as well as advancements in knowledge to North Africans. I sincerely hope that each of us will do what is necessary to counter war and economic recession, that North Africa will integrate into the civilized world, and that we will leave our children a better world. In this life, the most important thing is not to achieve our goals but to strive for them. It is the path we trace toward a goal that gives meaning to life, even if we do not necessarily see the result of our efforts. As long as each one works according to their abilities towards the common goal, our children will follow in our footsteps and complete our mission. I warn individuals, groups, associations, political parties, and governments of the danger of political Islam, of which my family's tyranny gives a taste. I dedicate this book and its future proceeds to the MCN, with the hope that a North African federation based on a humanitarian policy will liberate our countries from Islamist interference and contribute to building a more civilized future. Copyright My Life, My Tunisia Publication Year, 2023, by Moss Sin Kevin Labidi All rights reserved no part of this book may be reproduced, distributed, or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic, mechanical, photocopying, recording, or otherwise, without the prior written permission of the publisher, except in cases permitted by copyright law. The names, characters, places, and events described in this book are based on real events and people who existed. The author has taken all necessary precautions to ensure the accuracy of the information contained in this book. However, the publisher and the author disclaim any liability for any loss or damage resulting from the use of this information. This book is a work of the author's biography. Any unauthorized use of this work, including reproduction, distribution, or transmission, may constitute a violation of copyright laws. We acknowledge and respect the moral rights of the author as the creator of this work. Copyright 2023 by Mahsin Kevin Labidi Book title, My Life, My Tunisia All rights of reproduction, adaptation, and translation, in whole or in part, are reserved for all countries. The author is the sole owner of the rights and responsible for the content of this book. Notes the book was initially written in Arabic as a draft in 1987, revised and rewritten between 1990 and 1992. Published in French by my sister under the title, Karim, Mon Frere, Ex-Integrist ET Terrorist, in September 1997 by Flammaria, ISBN paper, 2-08-067462-5, France. First edition, Self-published in November 2023, ISBN paper, 978-9-083-34682-3, Netherlands. Discover, My Life, My Tunisia, available in paper and ebook format on lulu.com and amazon.com. Otherwise, follow the audiobook on the channel and subscribe to receive all the latest news. Or information. The complete book in audio format available in Arabic and French.